Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back to another very special edition of the Jim Cornette Experience, another of our omnibus collections, this of course being the best of 2020, the most popular, the funniest, the most rotten segments from the experience and the drive through over the year of 2020, looking at the world of professional wrestling. I am the great Brian Last, my pleasure to be with you once again, and a surprise here at the top of this omnibus. Usually it's me flying solo for these wraparounds, but we have a very special guest all the way from Louisville, Kentucky, Mr. Jim Cornette. Well, thank you very much, Brian, and ho, 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 Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays, Happy Chinooka, all of the festive holiday wishes and goodwill will from Castle Cornette to everybody out there in the Cult of Cornette listening audience. But I had to be here because you have just you have put our reputations, you put my reputation on the line, Brian Last, with what you have done, because you have claimed that this on the bus episode is going to contain, I believe you said, the most popular clips and comments and moments from the show, the funniest, the rottenest, the stuff that was so bad it was good, all the 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 greatest, the pinnacle of all of these topics and subjects and genres of conversation that we have had on the program in the year of 2020, which has been a crazy year anyway, you're going to have it right here in this one podcast, this one omnibus presentation. Is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying. And as you're saying that, I'm thinking, oh my God, how are we going to fit this all into one singular episode? This may have to be a two-parter at some point. Well, that that is the plan. One of the things I was about to say, besides the fact that that would take in a lot of territory, you might just have to replay every show from start to finish in order because they're all gems. They're all diamonds. But more importantly, Brian Last, who was it that determined this? Was there was there massive voting was and and that were Dominion machines involved? Was there a survey taken where people stopped on the street, frisked, patted down, groped, and then asked about their favorite moments? How did you quantify and determine the classics, the 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 ultimate episodes, the ultimate clips of all of these episodes that you could present here? Who who was on the board of directors on the panel? Was this studied? Did did Yale have a part in this? How was this determined? Well, fortunately, we have a very active audience, so I'm able to use the reaction that various segments, various episodes, various clips have received, either the podcast episode, of course, we have a very, very active YouTube community where I could see what specific segments are very popular. Also, I asked John Fell from Baltimore. Oh, well, there you go. You went scientific with it. Yes. Because he has all the algorithms and the logarithms and the rhythms and blueses. So, okay, I wanted to make sure that there was an expert on the case. As long as John has chimed in, then I I I feel safe in lending my my credence and my credibility to advertising that this omnibus will be absolutely 100% the greatest podcast in the history of the world. Cuz you know, we can't just be putting dreck out there. We got sponsors. We got fine sponsors out there, and if we were to be putting out the dreck they wouldn't appreciate it. You know, we got some highfalutin people involved with this program now. Hawthorne, for heaven's sake. That's right. They clean the dreck right off your hands, right off your body. Yes, they're the biggest dreck cleaners in the whole industry. Uh, the folks at Hawthorne, we've we've talked about this. It's a premium tailored personal care brand. It makes it easy for you to clean yourself and smell aromatic. Uh, you, you go to Hawthorne. H A W T H O R N E dot C O. And you start with the quiz and you answer the questions they ask. It's, it's not, it's not too personal. I mean, they're not going to pry into your tax returns, but wh- what do you drink? How do you like to spend a night out? Who do you associate with things of these natures? And, uh, uh then once you take the quiz, then they select for you or recommend for you, uh, the products uh, of, of theirs that would be most enticing to you. And Brian, we've, we've talked about your fascination with their soaps. You, 
people now, they think in your entire neighborhood, they think they live next to a nursery, not the baby nursery, the flower nursery, because you smell like gardenias and rosebuds and fleur de lises and all kinds of that, that rum soap that you've been drinking, I mean, using on a regular basis. The dark rum soap, which smells fantastic, which I use to wash my hands, not to ingest. But anyway, they got a variety of fine quality products and they take the risk out of it by giving you free shipping on your order and returns. If you don't like the stuff, they can even retailer it based on your feedback. So do what we did. Take Hawthorne's quiz today and then get started on your personalized self-care routine. Smell better, feel better, be more enticing to those of the opposite genre. Go to Hawthorne.co and use the promo code Jim to get 10% off your first purchase. Hawthorne, I already spelled it, .co, promo code Jim, 10% off your first purchase of something that's recommended and tailored especially for you. How can you, how can you lose there? You can't. Great products, and I told you before, the bar soap has become my favorite. You're always talking about the bar. You Adam Page idolizer. You, oh, you want to be on. just like your your hero. Will you stop it. You know, Adam Page, you know, he used to be a fine young man, upstanding. He drank milk. He worked out a lot. He got up in the morning. He had a fine, high-quality, healthy breakfast. And now he's just descended into alcoholism and insanity since he's joined the the kids over at all petite wrestling but folks if you want to start by the way your day with a healthy breakfast you look no further than the fine folks at magic spoon we've talked about this amazing cereal that is made from ingredients from another planet where they have somehow managed to make great tasting cereal like cocoa fruity frosted blueberry peanut butter cinnamon with zero sugar, 11 grams of protein, three net grams of carbs at each serving, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, GMO-free. But at the same time, it tastes great. The kids will like it. They think there's sugar in it. Lie to your children, folks. There's no sugar in this. Uh, you're going to walk around eating it like trail mix. You're going to start the day off with a fine breakfast. Pour the milk. You don't even need the milk. It just tastes so good. You can eat it like popcorn. And if you go to magicspoon.com, then use the slash gym and build a custom variety box. You can pick and choose the flavors that you like. Use the promo code Jim J I M at checkout. You'll get free shipping. And don't forget about the 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like it, and if you if you don't like it, you have no soul. I bet Jericho don't like it, but otherwise. If you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Magicspoon.com slash Jim. Use the code Jim for free shipping. I love their code. It reminds me of me. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this holiday on the bus edition and for starting the day off right for us all year long. That's right. And with that said, let's kick things off. Let's go to this clip right now, as chosen by the overwhelming demand of the listeners, and John fell in Baltimore. I have to say, I don't know if we've ever received as many questions for the drive through about something that happened the day before as we have about what I'm going to call the Tessa Blanchard controversy. Okay, so well, all I have, and, and you know, I, I just turned on because I actually separated myself from the outside world early yesterday. That's one of the reasons why I'm feeling so chipper because I'm having much less contact with people in the outside world. So I briefly turned on the Twitter this morning uh, before we started recording just to see what was going on, and now all the girls in the business are just hopping on Tessa Blanchard for something that she tweeted saying we should all support everyone, and now, now they're just all hopping on her. Is this correct? This is correct. I, I consider it somewhat similar to imagine if you just said, hey, why can't we all just get along? Why do we yeah. have problems with each other? And then people said, what the fuck? But anyway, uh, one of the questions that came in on Twitter using a hashtag corny drive through from James Cotto. Nice to see that Jim isn't in the middle of a Twitter firestorm for a change. Will you be discussing this on the drive through And then another question here from Matt Quick, hashtag corny drive through on Twitter. 
What are your thoughts on the allegations that Tessa Blanchard spit in a female African-American wrestler's face? Called her the N-word at a show in Japan? Does this change your view of Tessa? And obviously there are lots of other questions. And like you said, there was a pile on all these various women from various companies, various independent organizations came out. It seems that everyone has a horror story all of a sudden about Tessa Blanchard. And it probably wouldn't have come well, out if she hadn't tweeted, hey, why can't, why can't we all get along? Why can't we all support each other as women? <laughs> well, if it all of us, why hasn't it come out before all of a sudden? All that, you know, but uh, I don't know what to think. And obviously, because of the way that I have been, my name has been bandied about in the press of late, I'm not going to make any judgments on anybody. But... It, it, what is the action? Has anybody said the actual story? Yes, several Has, people. What is the actual story? And apparently there's more than one. So let me give you a little bit of a recap from the best I've been able to put things together. Tessa Blanchard tweeted out yesterday, as we're recording, at 1147 a.m. Hey, women, try supporting one another. Cool things happen. And then various people. Here's Priscilla Kelly. Remember publicly. Oh, wait, 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 now, wait a minute. This is the woman that that shoved her allegedly used tampon in somebody else's face, isn't it? That is certainly one of her gimmicks. Okay, let's just remind let's just remind everybody of that. Now let's see what she has to say. Remember publicly putting me down on Twitter last year for something that didn't involve you whatsoever, then continuing to drag my name to other people for it? Pepperidge Farm remembers. I she- wonder was that the incident? I don't know. Uh, you should probably delete this tweet. And then there's another reply. Chelsea Green. Do you know Chelsea Green? I, uh, she, was she in TNA when I did a week down there a while back? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with who she is. Uh, you've consistently put down, bullied, and belittled countless female coworkers, including me. Is that support? Do you know Allison K? Allison K is currently the NWA Women's Champion. Remember when you spat in a black woman's face and called her the N-word in Japan? Was that you supporting women? The audacity of this tweet. <laughs> uh, I love it when people use audacity. There no, is... that, that's where I was going with this. What is? Has anybody issued the story on that incident? It, it, there's a wide context, people. There's a wide disparity, d- disparity between... I just walked up to this woman in the locker room because she she said some sideways shit and spit in her face and called her the N-word. Or had they just had a match where this particular woman had possibly dropped her on her head or fucking potatoed her in some kind of way? In which case, yes, that is fucking understandable and often happens. So what? which one is it? Well, here's the actual person apparently that this instance happened to. Because again, a lot of these stories aren't even about that. It's about things that have happened to them, bullying to them. This is, uh, and it appears there's a little bit of a language barrier here because it's not perfect English. Uh, Puerto Rican wrestler La Black Rose, uh, I, I think that's the name here. Again, I'm not familiar with her. That story, yes, that happened in Japan. I- I'm translating as best I can. That happened in Japan, 2017. Tessa Blanchard does not remember. I can. I am not a mean girl with any coworkers around the world. Uh, be kind of racist is not ridiculous. It is a sickness. Again, it's a little bit of a language barrier. And then I see here lots of other people. I mean, it seems like every woman wrestler that's not <laughs> working an impact. Hey, well, here's Isla Dawn. Isla Dawn. I don't know who this is. As someone who experienced your bullying firsthand, received regular verbal abuse, was spat on, had rumors spread about me dealt with multiple attempts by you to blacklist me from other companies, plus more, I just pray you now follow your own advice. And it's just one tweet after another. I mean, it it seems like there's now countless people coming out and saying this. And Well, thank you, Tessa. You've taken the heat off of me. (laughs) (laughs) uh, I have met her several times and can't think of a more polite or delightful person to talk to. And I, as I said, I don't watch her on impact because I love her, her, what I've seen of her work, but I'm not going to go that far to watch that fucking show. Um, 
But uh, the few times that I've seen her, she's been an incredible fucking talent. And what intensity. And she works like a guy, which is the ultimate compliment. And uh, and she's been nice and polite and bubbly. And uh, I don't know what to think. Do you know a wrestler named Rebel? Uh, 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 no, uh, uh, a rebel from TNA. Uh, well, yes, yes. I like to think yes. people change over time, but I can confirm the bad behavior and non-supportive attitude in Japan. I was there. <laughs> Here's Shayna, who's now with AEW. She did more nasty stuff in Japan. <laughs> Never forget. <laughs> oh, Practice what you preach, sweetheart. What I the- stand by uh, the uh, La- Ab- Abusa Dorte PR. That's the wrestler who allegedly had uh, the N-word thrown at her and was spit in her face. She's a fun-loving person who would never disrespect anyone. Much love to you, Rosa. Well, <laughs> here's, yeah, Allison maybe- Kay. here's Allison K. again. The reason I've never said anything until now is because it wasn't my story to tell. I made it clear to La Rosa that I had her back, and today was the day she gave me permission. You can't force someone to come forward, but you can be there for them. That is supporting women. So that's her reason for not talking about this beforehand. Here's, well, here's uh, someone supporting. Well, God damn. Well, you know, T- Tully never had this much heat in the locker room. <laughs> well, sure he did. It's just there wasn't Twitter. Uh, here's a apparently- well, God damn, you know, yeah, I guess you are right. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for Manny Fernandez to chime in here. But here's uh, <laughs> someone defending Tessa Daga. Oh, what a perfect time to tweet about a woman that is about to make history. Jealous is a real thing, by the way. I'm the Mexican fiance. So apparently that's Tessa's fiance, Daga. He's well, I, well and, and also there is an element of, I mean, she's so much better than the other girls. <laughs> you know, there could be, the, there could be that as well, but holy shit. And you would obviously yeah, admit that she, would... she got Tully's people skills. She really did. Well, yeah. And again, you say she was always nice and kind to you. I would have to think that the way she treats someone like you would be different than other co-workers in the same division and yeah i yeah. mean it's one after another after another and she's wrestling you know my theory is always if you end up in impact there's probably a reason you end up in impact it's wrestling purgatory yeah it's like, you know it's a place to kind of repair yourself and she's not in wwe she's not in aew apparently a lot of these stories even though they're now publicly coming out have been whispered about do you do anything different of your impact wrestling where she's allegedly in line as we're recording today it may happen later today on pay-per-view who knew they still had pay-per-views she's in line to win their world's heavyweight championship from sammy callahan do you do anything differently just because she's insulted every girl wrestler in the business no what the fuck of course not if she if you may have trouble uh, trouble finding people to work with her or elsewise those matches could be stiff and interesting uh, but if she, but it, it, no, and just because once again somebody called someone a name while they potentially were in a fight with them, I can identify with that. If uh, if she walked up, what if they weren't the, though? What if they weren't well, in a fight? Well, if they weren't, then then that is a bit strong, and I think she owes the girl an apology. But if they were in some type of issue over the match or a, a fucking physical altercation or whatever the fuck, then we need more information on that. But otherwise, no, just because she's been a bully and or snidely uh, to all of the other girls that she's worked with is no reason to change her push if, if you're happy with her in your company, for fuck's sake. And once again, this is not only not ballet, but it's not fucking romper room. If everybody's getting their feelings hurt, maybe there's too many people with soft feelings and fucking wrestling. Or maybe, it's Tessa. Be, or maybe be, the problem is Tessa. Well, no, well, and maybe the problem is Tessa. As I said, if she's insulted and pissed off every girl, and as long as you're happy with her in your company and can find people to work with her, that ain't your fucking problem. You're not hiring nice people. You're hiring talent. I come from an era when the, the booker could more or less fucking smack you if he wanted to, and you were either going to fight him and get fired or fucking take it. So I'm not, I'm hard to fucking impressed with he she hurt my feelings and bullied me well then fucking knock her out what the fuck if you're gonna be wrestlers be wrestlers if a guy was that upset in a locker room at something that somebody had said or done to them they would fucking do one thing or the other they'd either not do anything about it or they would so either don't do anything about it or do well, don't this, fucking say, well, she's so mean that you shouldn't use her in a company I don't even work for. Well, no one's it's saying that, ridiculous. Though. But no one's saying that. And again, 
She brought this on herself by tweeting out, hey, women, try supporting one another. <laughs> cool things happen. I mean, maybe, 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 maybe the right word there for that tweet. You know what? That's that's probably that, – that she could have got to – if Twitter was around in 1984, that could have been said by Tully Blanchard or Gino Hernandez. It would have been great. I don't know. I have no idea. But, uh, yeah, that, that – uh, well, hey – it's maybe she's trying to be positive now. It's a new year. She's like me. She slept some. She decided she wants to be positive now. Like Sheik, that time he was positive. When they started the drug test, he turned up positive. They call him Sheik, you're positive. Oh, I knew I had to be positive. Yes, Sheik, always positive. She's trying to be positive. Was it one of the stories that he was like, was Don Morocco positive? Was Jake Roberts positive? I was with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's after he found out positive was a bad thing. You know, um, obviously Tully had his issues with people. Maybe to this day still has some people skills issues. I've never heard a bad thing about Joe Blanchard ever. Have you? No, he was. I wasn't around him a ton. We worked, you know, the the towns because he ran uh, obviously San Antonio and South Texas for so long. We worked some of his towns, and I obviously met him, but I never had a problem with him. But he he always seemed to be cheerful nobody i i recall ever saying anything bad about him i think you know tully had an element of you know rich kid star's son promoter's son high school football star college football you know fucking that whole thing and he just his his personality was what came over on television he was he kind of like if mjf really meant and he probably does at this point because he's so good but if he was saying i'm better than you and you know it and really meant it and looked like tully when he said it with that shit sniffing look tully used to get where he'd look at somebody just like i can't believe you're breathing my air holy fuck you want to take a swing at him tully just fucking you know just that expression and you'd get that in the locker room uh so yeah but that's what made him think about that tully was a normal sized guy uh, he was. He didn't have an incredible physique. He wasn't incredibly sizable. He didn't do anything spectacular in the ring like a Bobby Eaton or whatever. But he was a main event guy because he had the personality and he knew how to work and he knew how to put the match together and had psychology. And he was like a little fucking just an, an an annoying fucking nappy dog that would stay on you and grind you down and wear you down or whatever. He had that that quick way of working and uh it, and it was legitimate and believable he came off like just a regular fucking high school jock football asshole and a rich kid's fucking you know snotty greedy he just he was a, a, a heel that everybody could relate to it wasn't like you know the, the sheik got heat but nobody in real life knew a fucking guy like the sheik but everybody had seen or met or gone to school with or just been around somebody like tully looking through some more tweets here here's renee michelle oh, from good god beautiful <laughs> woman in the wwe apparently she had an issue with tessa apparently there's a video i don't know the backstory but i'm still what i'm starting now to feel like fuck i'm ashamed to be in the i, I like uh, <laughs> t i'm tully and magnum and poor tessa i'm i'm being a party to this i don't know anything about this what the fuck diona is it diona perrazzo is that her name she's one of rip rogers's young protégés here's an incident where i guess i'm reading between the lines i don't know the whole story someone correct me during a battle royal there was an incident with tessa and she got fed up and she slapped tessa in the face and they started fighting God damn it. Um, well, here's apparently I'm reading through this kind of quickly. A, <laughs> this is slightly off topic. Apparently there is something, you know, a lot of these women wrestlers nowadays, I guess to make some extra money, they do Patreon. And unlike, you know, if we did Patreon, we would have audio content or potentially video content. They do exclusive photos, you know, bikini shots, whatever it may be. I guess this kind of falls in line with that. I guess if I am to believe what I'm reading here, she took a dump for a fan. What? There's audio of it. What? I don't know if there's video of it as well. What? <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying? What? I'm trying to say that it appears. Well, wait, wait, that wait, how do you, that audio of a dump. 
Well, I guess there could be, but but would you really want audio of a? I don't. What? We're not playing this on the show. I will say that. But apparently, well, is this copyrighted? I, I <laughs> don't. Is it copyrighted? I mean, can we call Stephen P. New? I don't believe it's copyrighted. Uh, um, well, then let that baby fire. Uh, so to speak well hold on let me find the, the actual audio here i'm reading about it let me get the audio uh if you want well, to it seems like we should have some more fucking preparation going on here if you're going to malign somebody i was trying to defend until now there's recordings of her being fucking princess pooping house well, what while, the while i'm looking to see if this audio is indeed here what are your thoughts on female wrestlers doing Audio like, of themselves taking a well, shit beyond, I'm high. beyond the defecation in terms of like modern apartment what house wrestling. What and... is the definition of defecation? <laughs> Do you, does it have to, can it just be crowning? Can it just be peeping as Arn Anderson, Arn Anderson used to say whenever Arn had to take a shit, he'd say, can you hurry up and get to the store? I got one peeping. Um, but it, <clears throat> as far as, <clears throat> the custom video thing i i've heard that that people have custom wrestling videos i i don't know I, because to me if that falls into the category of kind of making the business be fake so i wouldn't be really in favor of that unless it was an actual video of a pro match in front of people in which case i would be for that i i don't I, why are you asking me these things this is a hot button issue. I did find here's a tweet from Tessa defending herself. Well, yes, let's get something from Tessa's point of view around here. Replying to Chelsea Green again, what Chelsea said was you've consistently put down, bullied, and belittled countless female employees, uh, co workers, excuse me, including myself. Is that support? Tessa responded, I've never been anything but kind to you. I've dealt with mean girls since I started. Not saying I'm a saint. Son of a bitch. Hold on. <laughs> or a son of a bitch. Someone from the wrestling business, too. They always got to fucking bother me. <laughs> Not saying I'm a saint. Hell, I've had my ups and downs, and I've made silly decisions. Such is life. You have zero merit in your comments. Instead, putting me down here for a little clout, you've got my number. There you go. All right. A denial. A denial. And call me up. Uh, hold on. Here's someone. Here's Travis Heckle actually commenting on Twitter. Someone said this audio or video of her shitting on a fan. What? what now, her? wait. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Just back the fuck up. No. No. <laughs> now, this is how that shit. No, I'm not going to be a party. That, but just 10 minutes ago, it was like there was an audio tape of her fart in somebody's face. And now there's video of her shitting on a fan on fucking Broadway. No, I refuse to believe all this horse shit. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting until there is more goddamn evidence come in on, on all of this stuff. Here's some commentary about. <laughs> this what the fuck? William Bozard in the Mothership Group. I heard a couple minutes of it. It was definitely going in the toilet because you could hear an occasional splash. Well, wait a minute. If you hear a a recording of somebody taking a shit, how do you, how do you pinpoint who that person is? Do is it like fingerprints? Does everybody shit sound alike? Oh, well, wait, I'd know that sound anywhere. That's Tessa taking that dump. What the fuck? Well, the other question is, if there really is video of it, did someone say, you know what? I need to capture the audio. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we don't want to show that video, but we need to get that audio out to the people. They need to know about this. This, this, if pardon the pun, this whole story stinks, in my opinion. All right. Your future impact champion, Tessa Blanchard. Well, she better watch out for Callahan, though, because he likes to fucking ask people to work with him and then gets mad at him without telling them. Do you want me to keep looking for this audio or do you want me to not play this? Well, I, well but, but I mean, here's the thing. Once again, now that I've said that out loud, hey, if you play, I've got a goddamn cassette recording of, 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 of a ridiculously offensive sounding shit that I bought. It's a commercial recording that I bought years ago. It's entitled The Big Shit. 
Got it at a truck stop. <laughs> what? And yeah, it's a cassette recording and it's got a picture of a toilet on it. It's titled The Big Shit. And it's just this guy taking his horrible sounding shit for like minutes and minutes. And I don't know who that guy is. I've heard him because I used to have it in the car. I used to play it for the boys. I've heard him shit 30, 40 times easily. But if I was standing right next to him in the, in the middle of a Wendy's, I wouldn't know it was him because you can't identify someone from the, so how is someone to say this is an audio of Tessa Blanchard or anybody else taking a shit unless a, a voice authorization has been given like, hi, everybody, this is Tessa Blanchard and the shit you're about to listen to is mine. <laughs> And then, and then you can run that through one of those voice authorization things. Cause you know, people would try to, well, it's like this one guy I know sold something one time that he wasn't supposed to have right for a lot of money and cash and shoe boxes. And before he, he turned that item over, he also had the people that purchased it sign a, a, a handwritten document that he had filled out that said, I certify that I did not get such and such item from so-and-so. And then they signed it. So he was covered, right? You can't identify a, a, a shit is all I'm saying. So we will not be playing this audio. Well, let's play the audio. Okay, hold on. I'm reading. We just can't. We just can't attribute it to one single human being. There's no evidence. Uh, I can't believe we're. Doing this, it. this may be. This may be the big shit. The, the tape that I've had for so many years. Maybe somebody's pawned that off again. But now this time they're saying it's it's a famous wrestling personality. All right, hold on. I'm pressing play. There's some noise happening. Now, this is a very somber situation. Would you shut up? Oh, there was a voice. Wait, wait, back up, back up. What was that? I see you. You're watching me take a shit. <laughs> you like it? <laughs> oh, you <laughs> fucking bastard. Ew, huh? You like to hear... You like to hear that? You think that's gross? You fucking find that turn on, don't you? Oh. oh you like... Dirty girls like to shit on toilets, huh? <laughs> That's gonna be hard, isn't it? You want a like, real piece of that action, don't you? I'm not worried about copy right now. I'm worried about Seems. fucking the FCC. <laughs> Is this the tape you got? <sighs> no, it doesn't sound like that guy. I thought he was a truck driver. Can you identify this voice? Well, no, I've never listened to Tessa. Fucking your face probably super hard right now, isn't it? Oh. You're probably like rubbing your balls or your cock and fucking get going on. Ooh, yeah, every time I take a big, nice dump, you know. Uh-huh. Oh, shit. Oh, man. Ugh. Oh, you're probably fucking jacking off. To the chair right now, huh? I'm a pervert, I'm a sicko. Oh, man. I don't think we're going to be able to put this on YouTube. I'm watching a sexy hot girl take a dirty, nasty, disgusting dump. Oh, having diarrhea. What the? Oh. Where did this come from? Who released this? This was, uh,. Posted online. Do <laughs> you have a situation like this? You think she should go to the finish, or do you think they should draw it out? I, I'm pretty. Go home. Go, home. Mr. Coffee, with his tie and toilet paper is just. Do you want me to fast forward? It's longer. You like to peek in on girls with your little counter spying on me. How long have you been watching me? Oh, I wonder how many times you watch me take a shit and a dump. All of those times I come in here and I don't think I'm no one sees me. I'm gonna fast forward. Probably like I wish you would. Yeah. You're just like, oh, you just want 
put all in her hand and use the jack off on huh? like jack off you want to just put oh, shit on her hand oh. like, <laughs> I know you do <laughs> maybe I'll put some in a baggie for you and like mail it so you can like put your hand like your dick in the bag and like use it to jack it off with like, oh, what? I'm going to your video while you watch me take it down <laughs> Where's she been, P.F. Chang's? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> well, that shit had to be at least 80 Curex. Oh. Damn. I'm going to get up that quickly. I'm not going to let you see that shit. <laughs> this is still pretty dirty. I think you should... You want to fucking see what that shit looks like, don't you? Can you come here and fucking lick it off for a bitch? Mm. Wait a minute, is the person actually there? I don't think so. I think she's making a video. Whoever this allegedly is. <laughs> Alright, I'm going back to my stuff that I was doing. I guess I'll see you soon because I should have <laughs> Oh, there's the finish. <laughs> well, that's the um, the end of the audio. The audio is almost six minutes long. Seven farts. <sighs> Can we air that? I had no idea when we started this bit because this was obviously not rehearsed. And I, I have no idea now what to do with this. <laughs> not exactly sure. But um, should, should we call Stephen P. New and let him hear it? I will double check with Stephen to make sure, because we're not exactly sure who this is. It's been alleged. Well, no, but, but once again, I don't, I I don't know what Tessa Blanchard's voice sounds like in when she's in the middle of that type of situation. So I cannot, you know, that's, I, but that if somebody's. <laughs> If somebody's putting that out, it's pretty low. It's pretty damn shitty for somebody to put that out and attach her name to it. If that isn't her, and if that's her, it's pretty damn shitty for her to have put that out. How much would you pay for a thing like that? I would pay zero. No, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the royal you. How much would a member of the royal family pay for? No, I'm. How much would just? How much would that be? <laughs> well, I would have to think if you're someone who's supporting female wrestling by paying for bonus content, this would be high on the list. This would be like the thousand dollar tier. I would think I would, I would, I would think, I don't know. I really don't know. I, <laughs> we've reached a new low, a new depth. <laughs> I, this I don't, we have absolutely no finish for this bit. It took a disturbing turn and I was all ready to, to just defend everything, but now I don't. I don't know. I don't know. All right, I don't. Well, let's uh, move on to another topic. <laughs> Do you think we really should run it by Stephen to make sure? I, I think <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it up to him uh, after the show when I have yeah, to talk right. with him. But take take two. This okay. It, it, by the way, if you don't hear that audio here, there's a reason for it. Yeah, Let, folks, if you didn't hear what we just said, then there's a reason for that, but you won't ever know what it was. See, if I came up with something that I think there may be something at the root of this somewhere. NXT is a show where you admire the athletes. AEW is one where you think you could be one of the athletes. Does that make any sense? Well, considering a few of the people on the roster, yeah, that makes sense. Well, but I think NXT is the show that you would watch like we used to if, wow, those professional wrestlers, those guys are tough, and we couldn't do any of that shit. Uh, whereas now, AEW has become the show where you think, yeah, I could do that because they're letting everybody else do it, where NXT is a show where, you know, these guys are obviously not only in shape, highly trained, they're hitting hard. And, I, and I've got to, I'm, I'm just, what am I not seeing? This is the cutting-edge wrestling show. 
their editing and their production, their music, the pace, the energy, the roster, the young guys, the 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 up tempo style. They do the modern style of you know too much, but they do it well. Why is everybody not going? This is the fucking uh, AEW is supposed to be the cutting edge, different wrestling show. How? What am I? What am I not picking up on here? It's marketing. It's promotion. It's hype. But who's better at marketing and promotion than the WWF? E. It's a different. <laughs> it's a different thing altogether. Because AEW and the wrestlers there position themselves as kind of being. The rebels. I mean, even though it's rather silly, <laughs> they position themselves like that. But that's the way they presented themselves. We are the new young thing. Even though, in a lot of cases, you'll see very similar type wrestling. There's on. nobody on the NXT roster that's as old as the Young Bucks. I wouldn't say that. Well, practically not. Champa, I would say, is older than them, probably. Well, she might be close. Let, look that up while I'm droning on here for a second. The point is, it, it this is a it, it. It seems to me NXT as a television program, whether it's the announcing or just the pace or the energy or those people there that the the, the audience they know all the fucking cues on the entrances and everything. But everybody, it's it's it makes sense as a program. I don't see as something on one segment and think, well, how the fuck did that end up on this program? Um, where the other show is all over the page. And the, the first tag match, Fish and O'Reilly against Zach Gibson and James Drake, the, the fellows from the UK. Bobby Fish is older than them. I know that. Well, Bob, yeah, Bobby Fish is a freak. He was old when we were trying to get him in Ring of Honor more than 10 years ago, and he was in his 30s then. But he's a freak. But I'm t I don't. I bet you Tommaso Ciampa's equal age or younger than at least one of the young bucks. Okay, you know what? I'm I'm a bit surprised by this. I have a few ages here in front of me. Let's see how many of them you can get. I'm going to ask you some NXT and AEW ages. All right? All, all right, we're just just we're just breaking off into something totally unplanned now. How old is Cody Rhodes? Cody is thirty-seven. Thirty-four. Okay. How old is Keith Lee? I really had never seen him before we started this project. So, but he obviously played football. He's almost 30? 35. Wow. How old is Kenny Omega? Well, fuck, I saw him have a bad outlaw match on a Ring of Honor show uh, uh, in 2000 and fucking probably eight-ish. So uh, let's say uh, 34. 36. Okay. How old is Johnny Gargano? 34. 32. How old is Tommaso Ciampa? Okay. I'm going to say he is 33 years old. Close, 34, which is younger than I thought. I actually thought he was considerably yeah, older. Yeah, yeah. How old are Nick and Matt Jackson, Nick and Matt Massey, the Bucks of old? 37 and 35. Matt Jackson, who's the older one, surprisingly, is 34. Nick Jackson is 30, the youngest of all these ah. guys. Ah, did not. I thought they were closer together. And that is the ages of the wrestlers. So everyone's so, in their thirties. So one though. Wow. one of the Bucks is older than Tommaso Ciampa, or the same age, or say same, same age. Okay, but Tommaso's younger than Kenny Omega, which surprised me actually. And Keith Lee, holy shit! Well, we'll get to him in a minute. Everybody's been asking about Edge's return to the WWE and. We, we've got several questions. We wanted to conglomerate it into just a little bit of a discussion because we talked about the if of it here last week, I think, on the program before we knew it was going to be a big surprise. You know, they were talking about it. It was it was the rumor was out that Edge was coming back, but we didn't know for sure yet. But I was in favor of it if he feels good and he looks good. And boy, he looked good. Did he not? Uh, he looks, as he said, like he's in the best shape of his life. You know, I saw him in the Royal Rumble the night before because I watched the Rumble with the kids. And A, he looked good, but B, I like that he didn't look young. I like that he kind of looked grizzled. He kind of looked like a guy who's been through something and he came back. Because remember, after he retired, yeah. he cut off his hair 
And all of a sudden he was like actor edge and he looked very clean. Yeah. Now he looks like a guy who's, who's really trying to get something. And uh, I don't know that's what it is. I don't know why they're so allergic to, to wrestlers with long hair. Uh, cause they make them all cut it off and then it looks like they're bad guy at fucking Kroger. But anyway, um, a bunch of people say, Oh, that Kevin Dunn, he missed the spear. He missed the spear. Cause apparently on the live version, I did not see that. Uh, they missed the spear. How did, how, what did they yeah. cut? Well, you know, I think the, the WWE production team is taking a cue from AEW where they just, for some reason, want to shoot the crowd. Oh no. At various moments during the show. And I think that was one of the moments where Edge came in, big moment, big pop, people were happy, big surprise of the Rumble, and we just had to see the faces <laughs> of a couple of fans as opposed so to it, seeing the action. Well, and, and but now, if, you know, if, there, if something's Kevin Dunn's fault, then I'm more than happy to blame him for it. But in this case, unfortunately, that is not Kevin. Kevin Dunn is still the head of production, but that call went to the director. The director, the, the, I mean, yeah, in Ring of Honor, when we first started with Sinclair, the producer was also the director. And I think in some cases, I don't even know if we had a technical director. He was punching all the buttons too. But the way this works is the producer is the guy who set, who lines up all the crew and the equipment and makes the, you know, everything. It's a hugely detailed job in television, especially at that level of making sure that, that you've got the crew to do things and the equipment to do things and worked with the building and et cetera, et cetera. But he's, Kevin Dunn is not sitting there calling the shots in the truck. That job goes to the director. And once again, if it's low budget, independent level television, and I've done a bunch of these, Danny Davis in OVW was our director for, you know, six years. Uh, you know, when I was writing the show there, because he was punching the buttons himself because it was a shoestring budget, but it, it, a real television production, the director also has a technical director and the technical director's job is to actually punch the buttons. The director, his job is to sit there and watch the bank of monitors and determine which camera to take. So in, you know, once again, normal, you know, independent television show, maybe there's three cameras or four cameras or whatever. It's not that hard to watch in the bank of three or four, maybe five. If you got one locked down somewhere, different camera shots and deciding which one to pick. I know for a fact, and I'm sure it's bigger today, but, uh, the best live event pro wrestling director in the world, in my opinion, is Timmy Walbert. Um, he's, he's from outside of Baltimore in Maryland. He worked for the WWE for years, did stuff for TNA, came over and did a Ring of Honor uh, clinic for our television crew for me one time just because he liked me um, and he likes wrestling. Uh, but he did a 22-camera live WrestleMania shoot one time. Now, not there's not 22 cameras on the ring, but in a live shoot like that, there's 22 cameras in play at least between backstage and the lockdown hard uh, hand or lockdown play by play and the handhelds and the zooms and the jibs and the blah, blah, blah. And that's a hard job. So the director will sit there and go ready three, take three. And the technical director's job is to punch the button that brings camera three up. When, when the technical or when the director says ready three, camera three has a headset on. If you got any kind of a budget and he can hear the director talking to him. Hence why that's the director. And when you say ready three, camera three knows he's about to get took. Ready three, take three, then three is up. And then the director can say three, go pan left or truck right or do whatever the fuck. Sometimes there's a bad switch. Did this crowd shot look like a bad switch or was it composed properly and, and uh, they just took it at the wrong time? Well, the crowd shots all look beautiful. It's just they were all at the wrong time. Well, but a bad switch is when the director says, ready three, take three, and the technical director hits the button for camera four. That's a bad switch. Oh, and I that's don't think it was that. I, I think it was okay. intentional, hey, let's show the reaction of the people. They did, okay. But anyway, um, and uh, other questions. Were, so I think it's great that that Edge is back. I, I think it's it's great that he was able to – come back and as he said in the interview and the angle he did with Randy Orton that we're also going to talk about 
um, that he's able to end his career on his terms because that was shitty when he just got the news. Don't do this. He's on top. He's in the biggest wrestling company in the world, making a ton of money in a main event position. Don't do this anymore now. That sucks. And he had just right? won the world title, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. The night before. The, the, which seems like a curse. Him, Daniel Bryan, everybody, you know. Stay away from that belt. But anyway, a lot of people asked about the angle with Randy Orton. And this summarizes why I love wrestling and why I hate modern wrestling. And this was both in the same place. And I'm going to illustrate this. Edge has a story that everybody knows is true with all the bullshit angles and -and so-and-so was injured and -and so-and-so tried to put me out and blah, blah, blah. They know he really was fucked up. He had neck surgery. He was told he'd never wrestle again. And they know this whole story that we just talked about. He couldn't end it on his terms. So here's a feel-good moment. A main event guy from the past. He's fresh again. He's been gone from the business for almost 10 years. He fucking comes back. He's got another chance at this. He can finish on his terms. And and so that's a, a tremendous story right there, and it's real. And you don't get those too often. And then here comes Randy Orton. They were a tag team. They were partners. The rated RKO, whatever the fuck. Hey, let's put this thing back together. And the people are going, yes, yes, yes. And both these guys in the ring, they look like athletes. Like you said, Edge, he looked grizzled and Orton's fucking chiseled. And they're big names and they had, they took their time and they didn't sound stilted in their delivery. And the offer is made and the people are into it. If I'd have been Edge, I w- or if them, I would have, I would have waited till Edge stuck his hand out for the handshake. That would have been perfect. But out of nowhere, out of nowhere, the RKO, boom, he took it tremendous. That's impact on the neck right there. And the people blew, and then they started booing, and then here comes Orton, and now this has been fabulous, right? I have loved this. This is fucking pro wrestling. This is a story. This is money. <clears throat> Here's where it all went to shit. As soon as Randy Orton plants him and the people are booing and everything, Randy starts walking off, but then he takes his time and he goes back and he gets the chair. And he comes in and he goes to set the chair down in front of Edge like he's going to sit down, which was a good spot. And then he grabs it and he picks it and he, bam, and he lays it across his back. And Edge is going, oh, oh, and you can hear him selling, oh, goddamn. That was good, too. But he was taking a lot of time, which I'll I'll explain in a second. Then he goes out and he gets the other chair and he comes in and he does the two chairs. Edge's head is on one chair. Now he does the big Paul Bunyan. Boom! The bell. Oh, Jesus! And then he sits there and he just looks at him and he slithers off. And now I hate the whole thing. And here's why. After the RKO and the boom, holy shit! The people are booing you, motherfucker. If he'd have slid out and grabbed that fucking chair and slid back in and done that sit-down spot like he's going to sit down in front of him and talk about it and Edge is crawling to him and then he, he hits him in the back, bam! Instead of taking so much time, because here is the thing now. Your clock is ticking. I used to teach the guys this in OVW. When you start your angle, the clock is always ticking. And where were the people to try to save Edge? Where was security? Where were referees? Where were all his friends and the baby faces in the fucking locker room? Where was somebody that was ringing the bell? Ding, 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 stop this, stop this. It needs to be chaos, not in modern WWE-style presentation. It doesn't. This is what they do, I know, which is why I hate modern wrestling. If after that RKO and he'd have slid out and he'd have whacked him with that chair, boom, and then here comes some fucking referees and pickle one off and pickle the other one off. Edge is selling. He's not going anywhere. And they start ringing the bell, ding, 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 and now you've got some chaos. And then here comes a goddamn couple of security guys, bing, bing. And then Edge turns to, or Orton turns to Edge and he starts pointing his finger at him like, and now I'm going to tell you why I did that. No, as a matter of fact, I'm going to break your neck. And he grabs him and he goes to put him in the pile driver. My God, the pile driver is obviously going to break Edge's surgically repaired neck. But at that point, here come the fucking baby faces and they slide in and Edge bails out with no contact. And the baby faces hover over Edge, who's selling and groaning. 
and you've created some chaos and some movement and some, it was so bland. Nobody was coming to help. Orton was taking his time. And then the second, the double chair thing killed it because now it's a work because unless Edge's brains splattered out and blood everywhere and he went into convulsions, that didn't really happen. <clears throat> and it's not, you don't get the heat from what you did as much as you get the heat in an angle like that from what you tried to do and were stopped from doing, but then swear that you will accomplish the next time. Next time I get you, if you're stupid enough to get in the ring with me, I will break your fucking neck. I will pile drive you. Nobody will be able to stop me. Instead of just, it just was like, what the fuck? It, it's like watching in slow motion, somebody rob a bank and nobody's trying to stop them. Did I mean, do you get that? Do you see what I'm saying? That was my big takeaways. I had three. One, this is taking too long. Someone should run in and make a save. You mean to tell me this whole time, no one in the back is sitting by a monitor. No one in the back is friends with Edge. And obviously in the post-match footage, which the WWE released, Rey Mysterio is with him as they stretch him out to the uh, ambulance. And Natalia is with him. I know she's a female wrestler, but various people care about Edge. None of them cared enough to run out no, there yeah. and try to <laughs> stop Randy Orton for five minutes while he's doing this. And the other thing, my big takeaway was the announcers. Oh, oh, oh my God, yes. No, they didn't no, say no anything. Announcers. Yeah, just, hey, we need someone out here. Someone needs to stop well, him. Get no, out here. But, but here's the thing, and I was gonna, I'm was gonna. i glad you brought that up because I know why. Because Vince tells him not to. Because he thinks, for whatever reason, he thinks it makes it real if the announcers don't say anything. And it with with some of the announcers they got these days who sound phony even when they're telling the truth that may you know there may be something to that but but no but that's why because Vince tells them to lay out that's modern wrestling presentation sports entertainment presentation Awful. but 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 yes the announcer oh my god why why that should have been the oh, question oh we get Eddie asking. out here oh why? you why? gotta stop it oh like, but yes yeah. and 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 registered it because. What would happen if if a fight breaks out in the fucking NBA final game? The announcers don't just stop talking, you know. But uh, no, that doesn't happen anywhere <laughs> other than WWE. But anyway, but yeah. So it, I loved the guys involved and loved where it's how it started and loved the the root of it, and then hated the way it came off because it's modern fucking sports entertainment presentation instead of wrestling, and it could have been so exciting, and instead it was just phony. But and so for there for all the people who say that I only knock all petite wrestling, no, it's it's basically all modern wrestling that does these stupid things that don't make sense and deprive me of enjoying what could have been a really good fucking deal. I like what you said. If you did the RKO and then immediately tease the pile driver and then the baby faces run him off, you have the fifteen second clip that you could replay over and over yes. and over and over again, as opposed to this endless silent because the announcers can't talk all of a sudden. They're so, Jerry Lawler is so shocked by this behavior that he can't say anything. <laughs> it's just, they, I like the concept. I hated the delivery and the execution. And I thought it was a missed opportunity, but. Well, and then also, here's the RKO, boom. Chair shot to the back like Paul Bunyan, boom. Then double squashing sandwich chair shot to the head. The fucking guy just came back after career-ending neck surgeries. Yeah, and yeah, they're calling me to complain right now. Hold on. Fuck off! So, <laughs> why would you do all that to him? He should never wrestle again. What are you going to have to do in the future to threaten his neck, which is the key to the whole thing of how you get sympathy on him? And how you get heat by working with him is threatening his neck. If his neck stood up under that, what are you going to have to do to this poor fucking guy? And then, and it's going to have to be shit that he ain't going to want to do because he really does have a bad fucking neck. And there was no so urgency. Why? Like, why is <laughs> yeah. Randy Orton so confident that no one is going to stop him that he could just casually? Because yes. he was in, because he was in the finish meeting and he knew nobody was coming to stop him. <laughs> well, obviously, yes. <laughs> but yeah, I. uh 
I, I liked the concept. I hated the execution. And I liked Edge's return the night before in the Rumble. And you didn't see the Rumble, but there was some stuff there with him and Orton. So they kind of worked together. And then he caught Orton getting ready to throw him out. And then he did it to Orton. So they, they didn't even really mention that or anything, but they teased a little bit of dissension slash friendship the night before in the Rumble with those two. Well, I, th- I think friendship's out the window. Once you, <laughs> you know, bashed a fucking guy's skull in, they should have had a watermelon hidden where he, when he hit him in the head to just fucking split. Anyway. Yeah, you never know. Michael Hayes and the Junkyard Dog ended up teaming up, which I always hated, years later. Yeah, well, that horse had left the barn at that point anyway. <laughs> Let's quickly get a non-wrestling question here on the show, Jim. This was sent in on Twitter. Using the hashtag corny drive through from Mark Gillette. During the reigning and defending greatest drive through ever, episode 122, <laughs> Jim Cornette teased the story about throwing change at a gas station clerk after Stacy had been sold, <laughs> after Stacy oh, oh. had been sold spoiled mayonnaise, ruining the potato salad. <laughs> Can we get the rest of the story? <clears throat> this will be a good one to close on. Do we have any song submissions? We do. I didn't know we were clo- we're closing on this one. We're we're closing on this one and going to song submissions. I may have to uh I may have to poop myself shortly. But um here's what happened. I'm sitting here one day and Stace's gonna make some potato salad. And she makes it and says, What the fuck? Wait. Come to find out the jar of, of mayonnaise that she'd used that she had just bought down the street at our Thornton's convenience store was expired and was the shits. And as she'd mixed it in and that messed up all the shit. Right. I said, when'd you get that? She said, I just got it. Like I just picked it up so I could make this potato salad. <laughs> I said, well, go down there and show the guy. Cause she's literally just been there. Right. I said, go down there and show the guy the expiration, let him smell it, whatever, and get your money back. So she comes back in a little while later. I'm doing whatever work. And she says, well, fuck that guy. Said, what do you mean? He was rude to me. He said, I didn't have the receipt because I didn't think to keep the receipt for the fucking thing. I said, wasn't it the same guy you bought it from? She said, yes. I said, he didn't remember you, right? At the time, that's when she had the flaming red fucking hair with the streaks or whatever. I said, he didn't remember you. He thought you were just trying to scam him for a $3 thing of fucking mayonnaise. Yeah, I said, now I'm hot. So give me that fucking mayonnaise. So I go down there, (laughs) and this was, this was, uh, I'm going to say 2006-ish or so, right? So there, there was, there was still some heat over the, um, the Al-Qaeda, 9-11, 9-11, the bombings, the whole nine yards, just so you know what frame of mind I'm in. And this guy is definitely of Middle Eastern origin. So anyway, he's working behind the counter. There's a line. There's two people. So I've got the mayonnaise. And I fucking wait in line. And when I got up there, I said, excuse me. I said, my wife just came in here with this mayonnaise. Set it down. I said, she was trying to get her money back because it's ruined. She just bought it in here. And you wouldn't give her money back. I'd like to know why. Well, she did not have the receipt. I said, do you think this is some kind of game that we're playing besides the fact that you're the one that sold her? Well, first, when I said my wife was just in here with the sport mayonnaise, he looked at me like I've just come in from Mars. Right. I said, do you think this is some kind of game that we're that we're playing around town that we're trying to get this money? I said, the mayonnaise is ruined. We just bought it in here. We just want three dollars back or whatever the fuck. And once again, he said, I said, my wife asked you and you, and you, you wouldn't give her money back. I said, she was ju-, and he's just looking at me, right? I said, she was just in here. He said, you calm down, sir. Now he's yelling at me. You calm down, you calm <laughs> down, you calm down. And you say, I, you want me to calm down, motherfucker? I'm being calm right now. You want to see not calm? I hope they bomb your fucking country next, you cocksucker. Oh. <laughs> and I picked up the goddamn change thing, take a penny, leave a penny, and I pegged it sideways at his fucking head, right? I said, no, because he's he's already, from the time he said, you calm down, you calm down, he's grabbed his phone like he's going to call the police to, to get me to run off, right? Like this, suddenly I said, she's just in here and she was complaining about the mayonnaise and you remember none of this in about that tone. 
And he's, you calm down, you calm down. He grabs his phone. That's why I was, I'll show you what's not calm, you motherfucker. And I fucking cuss him. I pegged that thing at him. I said, it's being the last time I spent a fucking dollar in here. I'm calling the police. I said, good, call them about this. And as I go out the door, it's the glass door, right? And I fucking turn around and I heave that thing with all my might. I, Because I have smashed three glass doors to put an exclamation point on thing in my t- as things in my time. And the last time, it was in 1996 in Tampa, at a goddamn off-brand hotel that had sold me a goddamn room that hadn't been made up and then didn't want to give me a refund. But, but I digress. Anyway, I slam this fucking door as hard as I can. It's one of those goddamn pneumatic jobs. It's got the air fucking thing on it. I slammed it. It went 100 miles an hour for about a foot and then slowed down and went. So I, I was like, motherfucker. So I'm getting in the fucking truck, and that's when I had just, that, as a matter of fact, it was 2006 because I just bought the Expedition. And I fucking back up, and I'm pulling out of the parking lot, and I see this fucking dickhead coming out with a fucking pad of paper and trying to write down my license number, right? And I'm thinking, like, you know, I could just back up and just back the fuck over you, and I wouldn't care a thing about it, you cocksucker. But on a theory that he's, call possibly going to write the number down and it'll be on his dead body. I just pulled out. So I come back home. I immediately call my good friend, Donnie P car dealer to the stars over at Paul Miller Ford in Lexington. Cause I still had a dealer plate, right? I just bought the truck. I said, Donnie, I said, can the, can the police trace one of these dealer plates to exactly whose, whose car it is? They said, no, they can just trace it back to Paul Miller Ford. <laughs> I said, well, good. In that case, I don't have to go hang out in the Anne Frank room for a couple hours. And then I just didn't go back into that. And you know, wouldn't you know who won the pony? Apparently I was not the only person dissatisfied with the service and merchandise at that store because it wasn't, I don't think it was several months after that. See, that guy was the fucking manager. He was always in there. He saw us all the time. He knew we spent money in there all the time. And he couldn't even be bothered to fucking refund us $3 for the mayonnaise from people he'd seen coming in there buying shit constantly. So fuck him and whatever country he came from that I hope they do bomb the next time they start bombing shit. But... He couldn't fucking track me down. Anyway, three months later, he's gone. The store closed down. It got a complete facelift, an entire brand new fucking staff, the whole nine yards. So I won out in the end. But I learned a valuable lesson. You cannot slam with any type of authority those goddamn pneumatic hinged fucking convenience store doors. Lesson learned. Which which is a very valuable thing to know. That's right. (laughs) You've often said that during the territory era, Ring rats were a necessary component of a successful business model. I'm a firm believer in the supply and demand principle, and as a longtime homosexual, I know there had to be a number of gay wrestlers throughout the years. So without naming names, oh, see now, goddamn, now you've you've made my now you've made my joke earlier now into something wrong. I didn't know that Sir Sir Gay was gay. Well, let's finish. His name is not Sir Gay. His name is David Miller. So without oh. naming names, oh. Well, he the, just gave his entire name. Did he want his whole name mentioned in public? Were there enough gay wrestlers <laughs> around to allow for gay rats? Were there any towns that had a suspicious number of extremely well-groomed male fans? And how about transsexual rats? <laughs> I don't think they did that back then, did they? Were, did, had they developed that procedure at that point in time? Uh, no, and, and no, unfortunately on all counts, um, I'm not saying there weren't, well, it's, remind me, I will finish with the, the story that I'm thinking of, but in it, there, there was, there were gay wrestlers, but they didn't, uh, uh, perpetrate with the, the gay fans as much as the heterosexual wrestlers perpetrated with the heterosexual fans does that make any sense yeah usually you hear about terry garvin trying to harass the wrestlers not other fans yes yes so you know so yeah but but there was (laughs) this one night 
when the fabulous ones because and and once again and it, it depended on who was on the cards also and i will say there probably there was a small but devoted group of rats in a territory like central states where you know bulldog bob brown was not exactly a chick magnet so you know it depended on the talent roster and in the territories you know would in Back in, in Indianapolis, they were, st- you know, the rats in the 80s still had bouffant hairdos because the average age of the roster, as Steve Regal, per, you know, mentioned here some time ago on the experience, was older. Uh, but in Memphis in the 70s, you saw the transformation to the 80s because the top baby faces, Jackie Fargo literally had his most ardent fan in Louisville was this woman that had this red beehive hairdo that must have been, she was seven feet tall with the hair. And she was in her late forties, probably, which Fargo was and had been coming to wrestling forever. And it was an older group of, of ladies because they were older baby faces and some of the heels, but then, and then Jerry Jarrett was the one, he was the one young baby face. And then Ricky Gibson a few years after that, but you started seeing, a, you know, a lot more of the younger girls coming, and it was still a family thing then, but all of a sudden, when Lawler really gets over as a baby face, and they switch Dundee baby face in 77, and then they start, and then here come the Gibson brothers, and then there comes Ricky Morton, and that, and Austin Idol was a good-looking guy, even though he was a heel most of the time, but Jerry Jarrett just got a much better-looking roster of guys and then when the the mtv explosion with the rock and roll express and the fabulous ones and and tommy wildfire rich was an early you know young uh heartthrob in 76 77 so over that five years by the early 80s the roster was much younger on average than it was and they were all the baby faces terry taylor bobby fulton was a fine looking young man they were all good looking guys and suddenly the the ratio with the matches, it, sometimes in Memphis or in Louisville, it would be 60% women under the age of 40. I mean, you could just see them everywhere and the screams. It was like in Charlotte in the 80s with the Rock and Roll Express when the, the screams of the crowd were so predominantly female that the pitch went up and it's like it was deafening. You couldn't fucking hear. Uh, so, yeah, that you know, that transformed a lot of the territories, but especially Memphis. But anyway, so one night when the fabs are at their hottest, right? We're in the locker room in the mid South Coliseum and, and they, they, Mr. Coffee would bring the fan mail in, right? If anybody wanted to read it and to pass the time, cause there was no cell phones, no, you know, Zabada video games, all that shit. Okay. Let's see what's in the fan mail. And especially cause the fabs used to get some good pictures and Stan opens this one envelope and he starts reading this letter. And I, I mean, it would be even distasteful for me with my vocabulary to read to you the thing, dear Stan, I think you and Steve are so hot. I wish that sometimes you would come to my house and break in my window and grab me and hold my your hand over my mouth and double team me in bed and then just graphic discussions of all the things that they could possibly do and God, how hot it would be and to have their blasted loads spread all across the blah, blah, blah. I mean, just, and Stan's getting, and then Steve has has come to the edge of his chair, right? Because this is some pretty interesting erotic fiction. And a few of the other boys have leaned over, and Stan's getting into reading this now to the guys because he's got an audience. (laughs) And he says, and the final part of the letter is something like, I'll dream of this every night and make myself come over and over until you and Steve could do it in person. Your biggest fan, Jack. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) And that led to the uh, elimination of the reading fan mail out loud in the locker room uh, for a while. Okay, they recapped Orton and Edge, and then a bunch of people dressed in funny costumes asked Rowan what was in his cage, and he pulled out a wind-up spider. And they all ran away in horror and fear. (laughs) A lot of people said, I can't wait to hear what Jim Cornette thought of this, the big reveal to what Eric Rowan had in his What the fuck? If it was a real spider that fucking big, I'd go, oh, shit, I'd go, oh, shit, too. I did the... The first time I met Dixie Carter, I've told the story. This fucking idiot goof 
guy that used to work for Les Thatcher in the HWA because he had had a brief cruiserweight contract from WCW, and that's where they sent the cruiserweights to train with Cincinnati. And I hadn't seen him in years because he wasn't very good and he was, you know, let go. He's there in TNA what, the, like the second time I'm there. Dixie wasn't even there the first time I was there, I don't believe. Second time I'm there, I'm walking in with some papers, trying to go to the production room or whatever the fuck, and this guy's there. And I, I see him and I say hello and walk up to shake his hand. And he sticks his hand out and he has in his hand a live, a real spider, as big or big as his entire hand. And it's within two feet of me. And I see that. And I pull back. I'm like, you stupid motherfucker. And he's smiling. I say, you fucking smile. I go get in my fucking truck and run your fucking sorry ass over, you piece of shit. You get that goddamn thing away from me. If I see you again, I will fucking attempt to kill you. And then I fucking storm through the hallway and I see Terry Taylor, who's supposed to be in charge of this goddamn bowl of mixed nuts. <laughs> and I said, Terry, <laughs> there's a goddamn job guy from Tennessee or from uh, uh, Ohio out there with a goddamn real spider as big as my fucking head. And if he fucking gets it near me one more time, I'm going to cave his fucking skull in the fucking piece of shit. And he's talking to some woman. He said, Jim, meet Dixie Carter. I said, hello, Dixie. God damn it, Terry. <laughs> so she knew early on, but that made me so fucking mad. What a, but, but this was not a real spider. So what the fuck? It's stupid. Stupid. Anyway, so that's what I think of that. What are the, how can you have grown people being scared of an obviously wind up fake spider? That's the whole point. The whole idea of Raw is grown people acting the way no grown ups act. As well, opposed speaking, to wrestling, which is to be adults acting like crazy adults. Yes. Like crazy violent adults. Well, what did you think of the debut of okay. Rob Gronkowski on SmackDown? Is this so this guy is a, a big star football player, right? I know nothing about football. I've heard his name as you know. In passing, I don't seek out any knowledge of any football players. This guy's a big star. He was a big star. He retired, uh, I think, a couple of seasons back. He was a big star with the New England Patriots, who have obviously won many, many championships in the NFL. And he's been a wrestling fan that's been talked about for years. I think well, he, I can tell that he got in the ring just like a wrestling fan that was getting in the ring on <laughs> fucking Paul. He's appeared on wrestling before, but now I believe he has signed a contract and obviously hosting WrestleMania. And apparently, it, it, is he supposed to be a goof, or did they just make him a goof for this? <laughs> I was watching this and thinking, is this his decision to come out and start dancing to an audience that isn't there? I did, but was that dancing, or was it epileptic seizures? Was it convulsions? <laughs> was it was it twerking? He humped the ring post for God's sake. That's why I said he, I, I was going to say he made Shane McMahon look like a cross between Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. I figured that was too old a reference for the room. It, are there any talented dancers these days? What, who's the most famous dancer in the world right now? I actually don't know. Maybe someone on that. Uh, well, there you what, go. What is the dancing show? Celebrities dancing. Uh, dancing with the stars. Dancing with the stars. That was hard. I don't watch What's that, that show where they dance with the stars? What's it called? <laughs> Well, I don't watch it. I'm assuming one of those dancers is probably the most famous dancer in the world right now. Well, apparently there ain't a lot of famous dancers anymore, so we're going to have to go back. And Ron Gronkowski is not one of them. What the fuck? He came out like a goof. He recited a memorized statement. I'm happy that he was a fan when he was young and et cetera, but that... That's what it, it looked like another instance of a guy that a fan that won a contest to come get in the ring on raw. And then for whatever reason, he that Mojo Rawley, I, I was going to say the same thing about him, but he apparently actually is, is a, alleged to be a wrestler. And he's the friend of, of Ron Gronkowski's that set this whole thing up. So they ought to fire him immediately. Uh, but he and Mojo Rawley assaulted Michael Cole for whatever fucking reason and not beating him up, but fucking grabbing his ass or whatever. He seemed like he was having a ball, Michael Cole. Uh, yeah, well, because he's a football fan. <laughs> See, 
<laughs> that's the th every time whether it was that who was the goddamn pac-man jones the football player in tna oh god yeah the boys were just over the moon that pac-man jones was going to come and be a part of their show and after they explained to me who the fuck he was i said wait a minute so a disgraced football player that is not allowed to play football is going to be a big addition to our fucking program and then that fucking guy he came with his entourage which was a bunch of fucking grown adult men dressed like john cena's worst nightmare with fucking chains around their neck and the floppy fucking shoes and the baggy shorts and the backwards caps. And I'm not being racial, racial when I say that because it was a mixture of white and black people that all looked like they were dressed like a goddamn of, of an explosion in a Salvation Army drop box after the rappers had dropped off all their goddamn uh, hand-me-downs. How big was the entourage? Oh, he must have brought 8, 10, 10, 12 guys with him. Pac-Man Jones, who was it, it, like he was somebody, and they're just wandered around fucking whatever. But the boys are all football fans, so they mark out, you know, to have these football players, whether they and Lawrence Taylor. <clears throat> Lawrence Taylor at WrestleMania, what was that, 22 or three years ago, or five, 25 years ago? WrestleMania 11. Yeah. Um, oh, the guys were just, oh my gosh, it's Lawrence Taylor. I'm like, okay, here's the problem guys. And, and that includes the office and Vince is obviously a football fan. He just started a football league. You put this fucking high profile fucking match on WrestleMania, a single match with a guy that's never had a fucking match before. He's a great athlete. I don't give a fuck. So, uh, you know, so is goddamn Olga Corbett was a great athlete. I don't know if she'd be winning any UFC competitions. It's different athletics. But they're, they're always over the moon when they can get – because all the guys are football fans. So they can get football players to come and they think hey. – Mike Tyson was worth the money. Mike Tyson, A, didn't act like he was a goddamn fan that won a contest. He was so happy to fucking be there. It was his lifelong dream. He was like, yeah, I'm the baddest man in the world. Now I'm on Raw. It worked. Secondly, they didn't have him work because he wouldn't have been able to. And thirdly, he was a huge goddamn celebrity. Well, that's the other thing. He was a worldwide star. One of the big failings with Lawrence Taylor, who all things considered did exceptionally well in that match with Bam Bam. I was going to get to that. Go ahead. But Lawrence Taylor was a Northeast star. He was a New York giant. So he was That's another thing. Rob Gronkowski is a New England Patriot. He's not known throughout the world. He's known throughout the United States, but he's only a big deal to fans of the New England Patriots. Well, and Lawrence Taylor was also because it was New York. That and I mean, Bruce is from Texas. He knows better, but he wasn't going to say any different. I kept saying, Bruce, he's a big star in New York. This is a pay per view all across the fucking world. Oh, but every you know, New York's center of the universe because that's what Vince thinks. And that's how they're, the, everybody in the office is taught. So, Lord, but Bam Bam Bigelow, to his credit, he thought, I'm going to get a lot of publicity out of this. It's a big fucking high-profile WrestleMania match. He took the incentive to make sure, and he was one of the better workers in the company at that time, At the, especially he was the best big man in the business at one time and still one of the better workers in the company at that time. And he made it his mission for that thing not to be embarrassing and to get as much out of Lawrence Taylor as could be got. And he did it. And I have, I was there when they helped Lawrence Taylor to the back. As soon as he got through that goddamn, uh, the entrance way, right. And it wasn't as majestic as it was then and as it is now. And it's still on the floor. He didn't have to walk up a ramp. He got through that entrance way and people had to physically help him to a chair. I have never seen a man as close to death as Lawrence Taylor was, and they were worried about him and calling the EMTs and like, do we need to hydrate him? Does he need some water? What the fuck is he? He was, he had, he turned white and that's not a racist remark either. He was ready to fucking pass out. I think it, he would have vomited if he could have got up enough energy and he got a fucking, um, healthy dose of re learned a healthy dose of respect 
for what the guys did at that point because here comes Bam Bam, 400 fucking pounds or whatever he was, smiling from ear to ear. Hey, that was great. And this big NFL football player is ready to be hooked up to a machine. So, but anyway, back to Ron Gronkowski. Rob, I swear to God, the only thing that could have made this worse was here comes Baron Corbin who has been appointed Grand Marshal of the Possum Day Parade (laughs) with that fucking outfit and that fucking (laughs) teeny tiny little head. What? You you can't escape him every time you watch now. I I know. It's like he's everywhere. And that's the most ludicrous visual I've ever seen. And, And with the head and the fucking face, even if he wasn't, reciting lines obviously that somebody else has given him he just looks so ridiculous it just screams it's it it doesn't even screen underneath guy it screams outlaw you can't take that seriously and and then here comes elias (laughs) and he performs some lines and he sings a song and the two goons are in the background laughing at Baron Corbin like everybody else was, but but he's still dancing, Ron Gronkowski, back there in the back. He's still dancing. I swear to God, I'm not lying to you. I wrote, I'm going to read you exactly what I wrote. I wrote, this is a fucking high school play. Less than 10 seconds later, they did the schoolyard push trip. Like they were six years old. The guy got down on his hands and knees behind Baron Corbin and old Ron Gronkowski pushed him over backwards. I just said it's a high school play. They haven't made it that far. We used to do that in fourth grade. And then somehow Gronkowski is told before he goes out there how to say the line that he was supposed to say, which was, I'm not you know, running the show at WrestleMania, but I'm going to... I'm going to really support a match between you, which was awkward anyway or whatever, and somehow he managed to mumble mouth that. I'm going to advocate for a match between you guys at WrestleMania. Read it, read it, read it, because there's nobody there. And there's the match no one is asking for. <laughs> there's a ma- Yes. <laughs> By absolutely no demand whatsoever, we have signed this match that's going to be embarrassing. And we signed it in an embarrassing way with our embarrassing host. Can you imagine how stinky, if this guy is the host of WrestleMania, how stinky it's going to be with with no people even there? If he does have fans, they won't even be there to cheer him when he fucking sounds like an idiot? I wish there were. I'm actually really curious how the WWE fan base will react to him dancing and acting the way he does and him and Mojo Rawley together. It's just like spring break. It's just awful. (laughs) It's like spring can, break I on can, the Jersey Shore. It's awful. I can tell you how they would have uh, reacted uh, at such a time when wrestling fans actually liked and respected wrestling. They'd have booed him out of the building and thrown shit at him. But with this audience, I don't know. They th- Everything's supposed to be a fucking joke. Everything's supposed to be a fucking hoot. It's supposed to be something you laugh at wrestling. And if you, if you take your business seriously or attempt to take – the business that you're a fan of, seriously, people laugh at you for it because it has become such a joke. So I don't know now how maybe they think that, okay, a guy, you know, dancing to the ring like he's just been tased by the fucking Parsippany, New Jersey police force is somehow entertaining. They, But eh, when you think of a badass football player, couldn't this guy have come down in some kind of halfway bad well i guess he doesn't really look like a badass but some kind of serious manner and done something serious to hype wrestlemania <clears throat> but but if, if, if what they're looking for is publicity and if he was serious about it espn wouldn't play it but now espn hey look at this fucking goofy football player acting like an idiot that stupid wrestling stuff so they'll play that and and They don't mind if shit like that gets played about their company now because everybody in decision-making power in the company was either never in the wrestling business or now no longer admits it. So they think that's good shit. I don't fucking know what to tell you. The more WWE I see, the more I understand a portion of the AEW fan base who just want wrestling and are very excited about AEW. There's people who just love everything AEW does. 
And there's other people who just want to watch wrestling. And I understand it. They can't watch this crap. The presentation, the tone, the commentators, the bad comedy, playing to crowds that aren't there. It's not just about the empty arena shows. We've watched shows with arenas that were at least half filled. Not good. This is really not, this is not a good television product. It's not a good wrestling product. And, and of all people, AEW proved it can be done with a few people in the building and just being serious instead of trying to win. <laughs> There's a reason why they added laugh tracks for all the sitcoms in the 60s. Because a joke doesn't sound like a joke if nobody laughs at it. And that's why they have to have Michael Cole laugh at it. But when it's not funny and he laughs at it, then it just it looks even, it calls attention to the fact that it's not funny. And I'm not advocating, there's a word, for pe- for them to go out and hire funnier comedy writers. I'm actually advocating for them to fire the writers they have now and don't hire any more. And let some wrestlers, preferably ones with 20 years experience or whatever the time was that they stopped taking the wrestling business seriously, book their fucking wrestling. <clears throat> Guy, you know, and it, if you had a bunch of guys like Cesaro and Daniel Bryan did the other week, or you had some guys that, you know, that, uh, I, who, who else? There was somebody else on one of the empty WWE shows that actually did pretty good and took it halfway seriously. I can't remember now, but otherwise you've got a bunch of people that have been trained that they are performers trained at a performance center and are used to doing athletic routines rather than simulating a contest. And instead of doing their own promos, they're used to being handed shit on a piece of paper and told to say exactly that. So they're fucked. They're completely fucked. And I, you know, that's the fault of, of them not being trained any other way. They're not in the wrestling business anymore. Therefore they're completely lost when they have to do anything other than what they've been doing. And that's why I didn't train guys the WWF way in OVW. I trained guys how to be wrestlers because then they could adapt to do shit, but they could still do shit when they had to. Our next question, a popular topic we've received many emails about, and I actually have a few of them in front of me because they all address different points of this. This first one, Jim, is from John in Cleveland. I heard Jake the Snake on a podcast called Flip the Script. And he said, in his opinion, Brett and Sean were the worst world champions and they couldn't put asses in the seats and they fought over Sonny's pussy. What's your take on that? Brett and Sean as champions. And is there any truth to what Jake said? So that's one of the questions. You know, let me just read a couple of these here so you get the general idea. Uh, this one was sent in to corny drive through at gmail.com from Thaddeus Armstrong in Washington, D.C. Jake the Snake recently appeared on Flip the Script and made claims that the Montreal screw job was essentially based around the fact that both guys were fighting over the pussy, talking about <laughs> Sonny, and didn't want to put the other over. Now, I thought I'd heard everything till now and was wondering if you had any knowledge of this. During the same interview, he claimed Bret Hart was boring and never had the it factor, and that Sean, uh, and that Sean had the it factor, I guess, though he did put him over as a great wrestler, and that both were never credible as champions based on the believability given that the example of see one of them against Andre the Giant. Good a, fucking God. As a guy who started watching during the Austin Rock era, I at least had a chance to witness Shawn Michaels, but only heard Brett's stories and accepted him as great. So my question is, how over was Brett? And then uh, one last one here, Jim. Jake Roberts did an interview and was asked who the worst world champions were. To my surprise, he answered Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart and went as far as to say that Bret was a good mechanic at best, but was a low mid-card, excuse me, was a low-card tag team guy, and that's what he should have always been. What are your thoughts? Do you agree, disagree? So obviously, Jake, a couple things there about where Bret and Shawn rank as champions if they were good enough to be champions and was Montreal all about them fighting over Sonny's pussy. Good God. Well, one thing is I understand Jake not liking Sean, cause that would be a large club he'd be a part of, but I wonder where the heat with Brett comes from. 
because when you say shit like that, obviously he's mad at both of them. I mean, we know what the story is. Sean was the best performer as far as performing of the fucking nineties. He was just a prick to deal with and a complete asshole and always pilled up or having a problem. Uh, he was selfish and didn't want to put anybody over except for the members of his own little treehouse club called the click. Brett was a better technical worker than Sean, but not as flamboyant with all the moves, but he liked it that way, but it fit his personality because he was more serious, but he was always serious about the wrestling business in some cases too serious about himself, but always serious about the wrestling business. Um, and Brett, you know, the thought can be that Sean and Brett didn't draw the crowds in the nineties that Hogan did in the eighties because it was wrestling was hot in the eighties, which through no fault of wrestling's own bad management from TBS and Vince, the steroid trial and just cracking up there the first half of the, the nineties shit was down. but. Jake didn't say that Diesel, Kevin Nash, was the worst WWF champion of all time because he really was, in terms of box office, the worst WWF, drawing WWF champion of all time. And he had the worst matches. And Jake himself saw the ultimate warrior. He was there for warrior. And warrior may have drawn money, but he was abysmal in every facet of fucking wrestling. So, and, and let's be honest again, neither Sean nor Brett could do a promo like Jake in his day, but to, and Jake psychologically was equal to Brett as a worker and probably ahead of Sean psychology wise, because Jake's shit would make more sense. But as an athlete and an in-ring performer, both Sean and Brett in their sleep could have better athletic matches than Jake and Jake also never got a run with the belt, not because he wasn't over at the time, but probably mostly because besides the fact that his heyday came under Hogan and they weren't going to take the belt off of Hogan. He may be mad because they, he may say they trusted fucking Shawn Michaels with his goddamn belt and they didn't fucking trust me with it. How bad was I? Part of, I, I watched the interview, part of his complaint seems to be, or I don't know if complaint's the right word, that he seems to be of the mindset you have to be a big guy, that wrestlers, and especially star wrestlers, should be bigger than Sean and Brett were. Well, but bigger, Brett could have kicked the shit out of Jake at any, probably any point in his fucking life, unless Jake got his hands on an equalizer. So that doesn't hold water. And it... <sighs> I I agree to an extent about size. I mean, we look at Marco stunted growth. That's just ridiculous. You have to look like an athlete and you have to look like you can whip somebody. And let's face it, unfortunately for himself, Shawn Michaels couldn't whip anybody in a real fight, as has been proven by every single fight he's ever gotten into with anybody in the business. But at least he was six feet tall and he was about fucking two or you could announce him at 215 or 220. Um, it was acceptable, especially given the 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 challengers or the opponents that he had at the time. Jake was never that physically fucking impressive. He's big because he got his dad's fucking height. So it, it's it's. If I can even say that Shawn Michaels was a great worker in his way all around acknowledging that he was still a fucking prick, then certainly Jake can, unless he's just mad. When you say something like that, I'd love to say Shawn Michaels was the shits, but I can't because everybody would know I was a goof if I said that. I'd be lying. And Brett was fucking very fucking good. Very fucking good. Better in the ring than Jake. Maybe not the getting the most out of the least, but Jake also had help from a 15-foot fucking snake. So it, it's... It's got to be personal because you would not say that otherwise. Look at the other people that have had that belt since then. For fuck's sake. The Miz. The Miz was a fucking <laughs> champion. That's a good point. You're going to knock Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. They put the belt on Miz. 
Jake was on the creative team in 96. Did he ever raise any concerns that you remember about Shawn Michaels being the champion? No, well, only the, the concerns that we all raised every time that Shawn was doing something stupid, but he was, how long was he on it? Did it last four months? Jake was just there to come to some meetings, get a fucking check. And I mean, he could, you know, toss a few ideas in from left field at one time or another in the meeting, but he never came with any paperwork. He never did any homework. He, you know, so, but no, he wasn't going to tell uh, Vince, Hey, the guy you decided to put the belt on, we ought to take the belt off of him because he's not big enough. Even if he felt like that, that horse had left the barn. He was smarter than, than to say that, but it, it, it that's personal to me. It has to be. And why, and why group bred in that? And yes, they were fighting over Sonny's pussy, but they fought over everything else too. That wasn't the bone of contention as to why Brett wouldn't put Sean over. That was the bone of contention of, as to why that Brett fucking took Sean down and was going to beat the fuck out of him because he had made that accusation on TV before Brett had split up with his wife yet. But that was just, no, it wasn't over Sonny is why the, the Montreal happened. That's ridiculous. And Jake, Jake knows that, but he's just saying shit to be on a podcast. Well, our next question, Jim, was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com. Well, you're laughing because I got gas now? I, I, the way you said it humored me, yes. yes. This was sent in by Stephen in Kildare, Ireland. On your most recent episode of The Experience, you mentioned that Vince McMahon, in his quest to kill the business twice over and move it away from wrestling, that he had accidentally created many Vince-isms. You've already touched on some of these before, such as medical facility and don't say belt and the like. Could you deep dive into that encyclopedia in that head of yours to cover as many of the Vince-isms and what they are slash mean as you possibly can? Oh, God. Um... Well, ever you know, everybody knows belt. You can't say belt, and wrestling has been banned and wrestler for a while. I mean, one time I was actually doing commentary on one of the syndicated shows. We're doing the voiceover commentary of pre-taped matches at the studio in Stamford, and it was I remember it was Taka Michinoku because and Jr. and I were calling the match, and I said something to the effect of, "Well." Taka Michinoku better concentrate on doing something or he's not going to win this wrestling match. And JR started to say something and Jennifer Good, the producer said, stop, stop. What? Can't say that. What'd we say? Can't say wrestling. I said, what? I didn't even realize what I'd said. I said, wait a minute. I can't say he's got better concentrate on winning this wrestling match. No. God damn it. And I hated to stop down because JR and I, for months in a row, would do two hours of television voiceovers every, I believe it was Thursday morning. We'd do superstars for this country, and then we'd do international heat. And everybody else that did those, they would stop down all the time and blah, blah, blah. And it'd take like four hours to do two one-hour shows, which are 45 minutes apiece without commercials. Well, JR and I did not like to stop down. We liked to do it like it was live. So we would see, and we would end up doing two hour, two one hour shows in an hour and 45 minutes with a 15 minute break to re rack tape in between. So I'm like, okay, well, I wasn't going to say sports entertainment. So I changed it to, you know, better to win this contest or just to win this match or whatever. But it was little shit like that back when, when I was there. But now they actually have an entire handbook of phrases that you cannot use. And it's been out on the internet and you can look it up, but like, that's how WWE universe came about. Didn't want to call them fans. Can't say the fans. Now you can't say the referees names. I'm told you're not allowed to identify the referees. They just, they are there on your screen, but they don't exist in real life because they don't have names. Um, it just, <laughs> Sometimes he would get boiling mad. I would understand this. This is something I would pick apart in a wrestling training class. <clears throat> but Vince would hate it when a guy would be backed up into the corner and another guy would choke him around the neck and the guy or be punching him in the face and the guy's hands would be on the top rope. 
right? You see a guy gets backed in the corner. He grabs it. Just it's nature. You grab the top rope on either side. But while you're being choked or punched in the face, Vince believed, and this is true, if it was real, you'd either try to be cover up, covering up your face or prying the fucking hands away. And that's true. And I would call that to everybody's attention in wrestling classes. But he would go on about it in meetings for fucking five or ten minutes. Look at this fucking guy. You know, it's at the fucking blah, blah, blah. Just certain things get under his skin, and over a period of time, they have now compiled all of those things, and so they give the announcers all these words. You've seen them. I can't even remember what what else they've banned now or suggested recommended verbiage for, but it's a whole goddamn list. And it's all about trying to remove phrases and terms that he thinks are wrestling. Which and he's done a pretty good job of removing all of the wrestling out of his wrestling program. But oh, and strap was worse than belt. He hated the word. You don't drop the strap. That was a phrase in the industry. If you're going to switch your belt, Brian is going to beat Jim for the southeastern title. You go. Well, I'm going to drop the strap to you. Oh, he hated that. And it it just eh. it's things that that in his mind make his program more associated with professional wrestling. Imagine that. <laughs> and I was there that time in the, in the meeting. There was Vince. There was Shane. This was before Stephanie. Shane came, Shane's older, so Shane was around the office before Stephanie was, after he got out of school. Vince and Shane and myself and Bruce Pritchard and Shitstain and Kevin Dunn and Jim Ross and a variety of upper management folks that worked in the office. They were having, I can't remember what the subject of the meeting was called about, but Shane brought it up. He said, well, that's a, what should we call our superstars besides superstars? I said, how about wrestlers? They all look at me because I couldn't help it. And they'll let, no, what do you know? Should we call it, you know, and I can't remember what his, his suggestions were but it was basically everything but actors at that point entertainers came up and this and that i said and i said this and i didn't give a fuck because this i that's why i couldn't wait to get out of there <clears throat> and i mean out of connecticut and out of that whole fucking office because i liked many of the people that worked there and i liked the wrestling business still at that point in time when it kind of still was the wrestling business and i wanted to work hard and do good but i would sit there and listen to these stupid arguments and stupid discussions of things that made no sense where they would try to pretend to be something different than what they were. And Kevin Dunn is another one. He would never, he, he didn't want you to say the word sport. He, he and, and he was offended when you drew analogies between that and real sports because he was a baseball fan and a football fan. But it, I said, they, they are, wrestlers having wrestling matches wearing wrestling boots and wrestling tights in a wrestling ring for a company called the world wrestling federation so why the fuck would we not call them wrestlers and then everybody ignores me and decides well should we call them entertainers or should we go it was maddening did they recognize the fact that the general public didn't do that i mean to the average person who doesn't watch wrestling, they're wrestlers, and the show is wrestling. Yes. No, they did not recognize that. They did not recognize Kevin Dunn didn't, not only didn't recognize that or wouldn't admit it out. That's probably why he's still there, because if, if you go along and even if you don't believe something, if you say it out loud so that they can hear you say it and assume that you're on board with it, then you're okay. But if you question it, then they're, well, he's not with the program. Well, guess what? I ain't with the fucking program. So you would actually hear them saying these phrases to each other. And that's the big problem I had with, with not a big problem, but just the problem I had with Bruce is that even when we were just speaking just ourselves, he wouldn't admit that this shit was bullshit and that we were calling stuff that was one thing by obviously another name. Because I guess they were afraid that Vince had the house bugged or whatever. But no, they did not recognize that nobody has ever said that I, I can't wait to get my sports entertainment tickets. 
Or did you see the sports entertainment matches last night? Or I think I'll go to sports entertainment. And Kevin Dunn was the worst one because he would bring the studio employees in. And I mentioned this before, the, 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 the documentaries that they do, the, the studio people and the, the technical folks and the producers and et cetera, the editors, they work very hard on those. And they don't even know that they're in a lot of cases that they're rewriting history. Some of them know, and they have no choice but to do so, but some of them don't even know. Back then, they didn't know a lot of things because they would have no wrestling background and be hired to come to work for Titan Television, <clears throat> and they would be educated on wrestling by Kevin Dunn. And, you know, and, and he would actually, he would say in production meetings when somebody was making a debut, Terry Funk, that famous time in Madison Square Garden where Terry Funk came out on Raw as Chainsaw Charlie. Um, is well, nobody's gonna know Terry Funk in Madison Square Garden. He wasn't a big deal for us, and he hasn't been here in 10 years. I said, Are you out of your mind? He's Terry Funk. Every wrestling fan in the world knows who Terry Funk is. It's not like he hasn't just been on fucking WCW a couple of years before and ECW just recently. And he was all over fucking TBS for years, and he was an NWA world champion. Everybody's going to know Terry. Well, we should do some kind of precondition. Nobody's going to know. Oh, oh, God damn it. And, of course, he went out and raised that chainsaw and did that fucking Terry sideways limp, and within five seconds, people were chanting, Terry, Terry, Terry. But Kevin Dunn would look at you dead seriously in the eye and say, any major superstar that was appearing for the first time for the WWF, we'd need to do a precondition or something because our fans are not wrestling fans and they're not going to know who he is. Didn't he stop that, you at one point from, was it, was it you mentioning the dynamite kid or you mentioning the Freebirds? Oh, the Freebird. No, he didn't stop me. He said something about it afterwards when they had the brood edge Christian and Gangrel together. And I thought those guys, I thought they looked great. The gimmick was good because they looked like the vampire guys that was hot at that time. And they were young. And I've always been a fan of Edge and Christian. And Gangrel was the veteran at that point. But he actually went and got the fangs. And so I'm putting them over on commentary. And I said some of the effect of not since the fabulous Freebirds has three men like this made such an impact or whatever the fuck, right? Kevin Dunn calls me over to the side later on at, you know, I think when, next to TV, he'd heard the show. He said, don't come. And this was when Michael Hayes was working for the company, but he was Doc Hendricks then. But he said, don't compare the brood to the free birds. I said, what? He said, it, it, it makes them sound old. Nobody remembers the free birds. I said, what are, I said, if these guys draw a 10th of the money as the free birds did, we'd all be turning cartwheels down fucking main street in Stamford here. Are you out of your mind? And, and another time, I drew a comparison uh, between, I don't know, somebody or other. And we were at a pay-per-view the, the next week. And in the production meeting, Kevin Dunn said, make sure to, it was Pete Rose was involved somehow. I was going up on that WrestleMania. And Kevin Dunn said, well, make sure to mention that last time Pete Rose was, I think, in Boston or wherever he hit. 47 home runs in a single game or whatever the fuck it was. Who gives a shit? And that was, this is 1998. That was in 1970 fucking three or whatever. So I went up to him afterwards over in a corner where nobody else could hear us. So Kevin, I got to ask you this. I said, you just criticized me for drawing a comparison between one of our talents and somebody else from 15 years ago in the same sport. And I'm trying to make my point. He breaks it. He says, Corny, this is not a sport. I said, maybe not the way you fucking do it, but it is the way I fucking do it. And then I got hot and I finished the fucking question. I said, the point is you blister me for comparing somebody from however long ago to somebody now that we've got in the same sport in the same business. But yet you expect people to remember 25 years later that this fucking jack-off baseball player that's going to take his fucking Hall of Fame payoff, I wasn't saying this, but it, that's what he did, and go to the casino, that's why he's asking for it in cash. I said, <laughs> you say that somebody is going to remember that 25 years ago this fucking baseball player 
hit fucking however many home runs, and that's something that we're supposed to talk about on a wrestling program. What the fuck is the difference? We're trying to get our people over, not this fucking baseball player. And he just looked at I said, you know what? Never mind. I said, never. And I just walked away from him. Because you couldn't even get through to the guy that what he was doing was basically contradictory to what he would say about the wrestling business. As long as it's a baseball player, a football player, give their entire goddamn background. But if it's a wrestler, well, nobody's going to remember that because that's years ago and they didn't wrestle for the WWF and our fans aren't wrestling fans. Well, guess what, Kevin Dunn? Now none of your fans are wrestling fans and you got a lot less fans than you used to. I found a list of some of Vince's banned words. There you go. Belt, strap. Obviously, yeah. you just said it. It says here, we don't have belts or straps. We have championships, titles. <laughs> the belt represents something. Well, it kind of defeats the purpose there. Yeah. Talk about what it represents. Hard work and dedication. Or it means <laughs> accomplishment of goals. Bullseye for others. Uh, don't say the business or our industry. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm with business. It should be sport. I like see Jr. came up with industry. And now that Jr. is gone, they won't let you say industry. Jr. came up with industry because they, they didn't want him to say sport and he didn't like to say business. So he came up with industry that or wrestling. They didn't want you to say wrestling. So he came up with industry and I thought that worked. Because it's, you know, it's not offensively phony, but now they won't, don't want you to say that. And for the record, the sheet I'm looking at appears to be from, at a minimum, 2008, maybe 2009. Don't say feud. Don't say war. Don't say performance or performer or choreograph. Well, that seems like a natural one not to say. Well, but wait a minute. Don't, didn't they just say perform about 172 times on one of these shows last week? I'm guessing Vince may have pulled back on that one. Don't say house show, use live event. Don't say backstage, use in the back or in the locker room area. I like that. Don't say pro wrestling or pro wrestler, use superstar, star, or athlete. <laughs> Don't say international. Use global. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, yeah. Hey, you know, that's, um, I guess now that wrestling is back on TNT and back under the uh, the Turner family, do they get to say foreign object now? Is that is that out of fashion and still down there? Was that a Jim Hurd thing or a Turner? That was thing? a Turner thing. And the, the, the announcers uh, started making fun of it. Because because it's ridiculous. Ted, well, Ted Turner had decided in the interest of us all being one people that things shouldn't be foreign anymore. So he banned the word foreign from being said on, I and mean, it was a great sentiment, but he banned the word foreign from being said on the network. However, foreign in wrestling had another connotation such as foreign object. Well, they actually legitimately told the wrestling announcers that they couldn't say foreign object anymore. So the announcer started calling it an international object because it was so fucking stupid. And that's how that happened. Don't say shot as in no title shots. Oh, I know that's that is why all these guys have this unwieldy verbiage where they say title opportunity, which sounds like dog shit. And remember the guy a couple weeks ago on Raw said, we're going to get a SmackDown tag team title match opportunity. Because he couldn't figure out. Just, it's a shot at the title. Take a shot at the, at the brass ring, pal. He doesn't like that, though. Don't say acrobatics. Don't say interesting. <laughs> What's up what? with that? <laughs> I don't understand that one. I guarantee you that some way or another, Vince, somebody used the word interesting in a way that Vince didn't like, and Vince found something wrong with it, and it's one of those things that he doesn't like. I, I don't know about that one. Don't say DQ. Don't say talent. Use star, superstar, or diva. Don't say me or I. Wait, wait a minute. DQ is another one of those wrestling terms that he doesn't like. Me or I is because he he wants the announcers to speak for the fans. How would the fans, he wants them to represent what the fans feel instead of what they think. 
Don't use inside terms like heel, baby face, blown up, shoot, rib, mark, etc. You'd agree on that one. I'd, well, I'd agree everything. Is blown up a, a, just a wrestling term? I don't know. Son of a bitch. Maybe, you know, every once in a while, I've said I'm blown up to fucking people not in the wrestling business if I'm out of breath, and they kind of look at me like they don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, maybe so then. It, that may be a wrestling. I don't know what some of these, I've been around this long, but some of these are, you know, non-wrestling terms people wouldn't know. But yes, I agree with most of that. Don't use U.S., Say United States. Uh, this kind of shows the age of this one. This is before the universe. Don't say fans. <laughs> when possible, refer to the audience as you. In other situations, <laughs> ID them. Raw fans, our fans, Cena's fans, etc. Don't and say now, it, now it's gone all the way to no fans. <laughs> Don't say hospital. Use medical center. <laughs> Don't say faction. Use group. Please use now available instead of on sale. We never want to use the term the title is on the line. Please use more creative terms like <laughs> the title will be defended. And then yeah. it has some recent additions as of 2008. A note from Vincent K. McMahon. Less is more. Lay out. Make what you have to say more important and make the audience listen to you. Use rhetorical questions, then lay out. Let the audience digest the material. And then another note from Vince. Per Vince McMahon, going forward, we never want to use the term, the title is on the line. <laughs> Please use more creative terms like, the title will be defended. He hates that. And then another one is a note from Big, per Vincent King. Oh, McMahon. God, that's when he was there. Please do not use the term sports entertainment. Going forward, please use entertainment in its place. So just take the sports completely out. That's another big John Gaborik, right? He was the guy on Tough Enough. Do you know that not only did fans think he was an ex-wrestler, but I found out when I went down there to do the week of TNA tapings for Jeff Jarrett in 2017, right? Summertime, because it was hot, even for Florida. So it must have been August-ish. He was working for him at that time because he had been let go from the WWF. He got, And some of the wrestlers thought that he had been a wrestler. That's why they were listening to him. I didn't have any problem with the guy, but I knew he was a friend of Kevin Dunn, so I knew he was a jughead. But that's what it, it was. He was a television production guy that was a friend of Kevin Dunn's that was out of work, and they brought him in and gave him a spot on Tough Enough. And put with him with that big head, when they put him out there, people thought that he was some kind of ex-wrestler or wrestling personality because he was grading the Tough Enough guys, right? You remember him. Yeah. And I said, no. I said, he doesn't. he's never had anything to do with wrestling besides being on that show because he worked in the production company at Titan TV because he was friends with Kevin Dunn from Baltimore. They, what? That explains a lot. Then they realize, what the fuck? I, like I said, I didn't have a problem with him, but it's just that he was speaking to guys and they were listening like he was a sage, you know, fucking wrestling coach. And so the only cross thing I had, and I just ignored it, was at that TNA taping was they wanted to have, who the fuck was it? John Morrison was there. And he was Johnny Impact then. And whoever the heel was that was working with him, could it have been Eli Drake? Might have been. I can't remember. They want they wanted to have him come into ring and jump John and just beat him up. And Johnny had just won a match. And plus they every other match was in and in a beatdown. I said, if you really want to lay him out and fucking make an impact and make it different from all this other shit, let's break the board over his head. They said, what? I said, yeah. So I got the board and I fixed it. I had ran them to the Home Depot and got the shit and fixed the board. Ran through with the guys because I'm helping produce the stuff. And right as we're about to go out, Big says, you can't do that. So what are you talking about? No chair shots and no head shots. I said, I fixed the board. No, 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 we can't do it. We can't do it. I said, it's already, and I had gone to Jeff and made this change, right? Jeff Jarrett had approved this. I said, here's what we're going to do. And he comes in, boom, boom, boom. Oh, that's better. That's good. Do that. And he'd even helped show 
the heel how to fucking swing the board and not to fucking hold back because you have to commit to that swing or it won't work and you will hurt the guy. I said, I cleared it with Jeff. He said, it doesn't matter. Now he's got heat with me because Jeff has come in to take this fucking company over again and try to get it back in fucking some state of affairs. And I'm there for Jeff and he's tr trying to overrule Jeff on something we're about to go do. I said, well, I got news for you. This is what we're going to fucking do. And he sat back down. So the heel comes in. I'm interviewing Morrison. The heel comes in. He turns around. I duck. He breaks the board over his head. The thing flies into a million pieces. The people fucking pop. Johnny goes down. The fucking heel standing over him. I'm checking on John, taking his pulse. And Johnny opens one eye, looks up at me and smiles and says, good call on the board, Corny. Because it was, <laughs> he didn't want to take another one of those giant fucking bumps. And it didn't hurt him because it was fixed. And the fucking goof thought we were really going to break something over the fucking guy's head. No, chair shot shots to the head are barred. Well, this is wrestling, motherfuckers. Sit back and let the professionals drive. And you just look at the fucking monitor. But they cut. I mean, we're outnumbered now. They all come from these environments. They come from the environment where you get paid to train and go to school to learn how to become a wrestler or you get you get hired to write wrestling despite having never been in a locker room before much less actually inside the railing that was a, i was there when shit stains gave me that immortal line we'd gone to do on cameras for some fucking he was doing commentary on the new york show right you remember that when they had wwf new york on wor or something late at night and they got shit stained to do the color my ex-wife one time accidentally watched it. She said, I can't understand a word he's fucking saying. I said, it only shows in New York. They'll get it. Nobody else would. But anyway, we're coming back up the fucking ramp after the on cameras were taped. He said, that was so cool. I said, what? He said, I've never been inside the railing while a match was going on before. This was the guy that was writing the fucking show. So that's what we got now after 20 years. That's all of them. All the writers, they were going through the men's locker room to be whistling Stranger in Paradise. A lot of the wrestlers think that it's normal to get paid to go to school and learn your fucking craft. And the ones that don't, the ones that are out there starving on the independents, well, they're starving because they're, most of these companies are booking the Invisible Man and JoJo the Dog Face Boy. And they think that that crowd thinks that it's okay to laugh and make fun of the business. And they're shocked at wrestlers or wrestling fans that take it seriously. So we're, we're all pretty much outnumbered here these days. I see some quotes here from a Chris Jericho interview that he did at some point uh, in the last few years. And this is, doesn't seem to be about something on camera. It seems to be about actually talking to Vince. Was it like this with you that you weren't allowed to use, or you couldn't use the word job? Instead, Vince would insist that you use the word favor. <laughs> Someone didn't job for you. They did a favor for you. Well, yes and no. I can see him doing Vince doing that with the talent. I started to say I can see him and then I'm hearing pronouns, pal. That's another thing. He doesn't want you to say, look, he drop kicked him. He wants you to say, Brian drop kicked Jim because he said he drop kicked him. Doesn't mean anything. Too many... Use pronouns, pal. That's something you can agree with, too. But if we're sitting around saying, can we get fucking Brett to do a job for Sean? He didn't mind the word job. But when he was there conveying to the top talent all the reasons why that they should be defeated in that match, he didn't want to call it a job. He wanted to call it a favor. So there's two different environments there. In a booking meeting, you job all day long because none of you in that meeting are doing the job. But when he's talking to somebody into doing the job, it becomes a fate. One last thing about this. When The Rock started using the line, the most electrified man in sports entertainment, was that written for him? Or was that something he started the, using the word sports entertainer there? Was that something he had decided to do? I, th I think he, he was on. He was, he was there for that because Rocky came in right as it was all changing and he was going to get with the fucking curve, especially when he got that second lease on life after die Rocky die, when they'd pushed him as that kid and play fucking baby face. Um, so he knew that you weren't supposed to say wrestling. So he was taking that upon himself. He was still going to be the most electrifying man in whatever the fuck he was in. 
So, you know, and I don't blame him for doing that. Uh, cause if, if, if he'd have said one time, I'm the most electrifying man in professional wrestling, they wouldn't let him say it anymore. But because he said, I'm the most electrifying man in sports entertainment, they let him say it all the time and he got it over. I was looking forward as I mentioned last week. Okay. Matt Hardy, here's another big star, right? And they need big stars and they need mainstream stars. And I want to see what, where this is going. Matt Hardy and Chris Jericho. How can this go sideways? We found out. I didn't even mind because Jericho, when he makes his entrance, Chris Dispenza, he's been a cameraman for fucking 25 years for wrestling. I, he's worked on a bunch of projects I've been on. I, you know, I thought that, that I got a kick out of seeing him doing that, singing Judas, blah, blah, blah. Jericho starts the promo offering Matt Hardy the chance to join the inner circle, just like he did Moxley. Any of the big stars, he wants them in the inner circle. That's great. Here comes a drone into the ring. Well, now, hold on. You didn't even address the fact that this drone had already made an appearance earlier in the episode. I don't even remember when it was. The Nick Jackson training video, or not even training video. He was training in his garage gym, and the drone... Did you, did you see this part? Actually, was that either going into or coming out of a break? It may have been. I don't remember when in the show it was. As soon as, as, soon as <laughs> they're going to break, I start fast-forwarding. If it... <laughs> If it doesn't look like wrestling, I wasn't stopping the fast forward. I may, I, now I come to think of it, I think it, I thought it was like one of those car insurance commercials, a guy standing outside his garage. Yes, I did see it. I just didn't know what the fuck it was. The drone was in Southern California. Nick Jackson was doing some chin ups in his garage. The drone drops down from the sky to film him there. And then when Nick Jackson goes, Hey, what's that? And walks out of his garage, the drone flies back away, just zooms up. Okay, actually, I thought that was one of those car insurance commercials with a guy out in his driveway because I was fast-forwarding. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, the general? The, <laughs> well, <laughs> you could save with the general. Um, so, Vanguard 1 comes into the ring, and Jericho's talking to it. And, I'm, you know, and he's making the best of this, but especially with no people. It might have... It might have worked better with people. And he was kind of, you know, I'll get you the best mechanical cigars to smoke and et cetera and all this stuff. And then he gets hot at the drone when the drone flies away and he starts getting. I'm thinking certainly to God, Matt needs to come out and we can have a good confrontation and or some good physicality. And this will just be a momentary silliness. And then Matt appears at the top of the arena. Okay, I, well, boy, it's going to take him a while to get down there if they're going to have any kind of, you know, that's the first thing I thought of. Tell the people what happened after that, Brian, when Jericho's in the ring and Matt Hardy appears at the top of this big-ass arena. At this point in the program, through several very clunky camera shots, Matt Hardy teleported down to the ring making several stops in each level, the Loge, the Loge Reserve, the Mezzanine, eventually ending up right at ringside. And Tony Schiavone had to sell it like he was seeing it in person. Not only that this is the most preposterous thing I've ever seen, that somebody is teleporting, and not only that it, it was done obviously as, as with multiple exposures of the camera, because at some point you can see Chris's head suddenly tick a different place and then tick <laughs> back again. Yep. And everybody knows how that's done. But Tony Schiavone actually said, am I dreaming? Look what he's done. Tony Schiavone had to call it like Matt Hardy was really disappearing and then appearing in different places simultaneously until he got all the way down to the ring. One of their announcers who is supposed to be their salesman. If you go to the fucking mall and you go to the appliance store and you say, I need a new refrigerator. And you ask the guy at the store to tell you about all their new refrigerators. And the first thing he tells you about this one refrigerator is, well, did you know that if you put a dead dog in the freezer and leave it overnight, it will come back to life. 
you're not going to buy that refrigerator and you're never going to go back in that store again because that guy's a lying sack of shit. So they just buried their announcer, made their entire program look fucking like idiocy. And before anybody else opened their mouth from there, I turned the TV off. While I still like Matt Hardy and Chris Jericho, I have given up on enough old friends for doing stupid, phony bullshit. I couldn't, I couldn't, no. I could not watch the rest of this or I'll hate both of them forever. So what did I miss, if anything? You missed one of the stupidest segments I've ever seen on any wrestling show. And this is everything I've complained about with AEW in the past. And I've really liked the direction they've gone in since the beginning of the year. I've liked the last several episodes. But I hate when it's stuff that if it was on WWE TV, everyone would kill it. But because it's AEW and they're Teflon with a certain fan base, people will say, oh, I thought it was good. Or, oh, I thought it was funnier. What do you mean you didn't like Jericho doing a promo on a fucking drone? Or what do you mean you didn't like him teleporting down to the ring? And then he started talking about the essence of the fans that are there. And he saw Abraham Lincoln in the crowd. And Martin what? Luther King in the crowd. Oh, no, he said this. Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy. I, I tweeted this out. You know what? Uh, Vince McMahon may have been right to limit Matt Hardy's creative input. And you may have been wrong last week when you said he could have been a booker for Jim Crockett. Because Matt Hardy's creative instincts certainly do not mesh with what I want on a professional wrestling program. And it's not sports-based presentation in any way, and they've been going in a direction, AEW's product has been getting so good lately, or at least much better than it was, and then you take a massive step back with this cartoon bullshit that may have worked an impact, impact, a few years ago, a show not known for being good, but now <laughs> a you show take- not A show not known! Just put the period there, a show not known. But now you take that and you take this awful community theater bullshit that Matt Hardy's oh, doing. Fucking hell. And you apply it here, and then eventually... So I, wait, I, I'm suitably chastened that I... that I attempted to say that Matt Hardy was going to be a big addition last week on the program. I'm suitably chastened. I take that back. If he... in his first appearance is teleporting to the ring and then sees Abraham Lincoln, unless he took a big fucking hit of fucking purple acid right before the fucking show. He shouldn't have been seeing Abraham Lincoln in the crowd. Uh, but I guess I apologize now for saying, I, that's why I didn't want to watch any more of it. I've always liked those fucking guys. I don't know why Jericho would put up with shit like this when he's really having to carry the fucking company on his back as especially as far as the heel side goes um and and why 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 would you do this i apologize for saying anything good about anybody i want an alternative to the wwe style of entertainment not their take on the wwe style of entertainment their take on comedy their take on supernatural gimmicks i don't want that i want sports-based wrestling and i think there's a lot of people who want that too and then you deliver this shit and then eventually jericho says you know abracadabra watch what i'm gonna do to you and sammy guevara comes in attacks matt hardy cody and omega make the save so now they're aligned with this supernatural goof and then we're supposed to believe that as jericho and guevara are escaping that matt hardy through the power of his mind is causing the pyro to go off on whichever exit they try to escape from so that they can't escape. So Matt Hardy not only teleports, he also controls the pyro mentally, telepathically. This okay, was... Okay, 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 hold on, hold on. That'll be the last AEW Dynamite review we ever fucking do. Because if they're going to start this shit, my blood pressure won't take it. I'm done with that. That's, that's what I thought was going to fucking happen. I just didn't think it was going to happen from their big stars. I thought it was going to happen from their fucking outlaw mud show stars. But now you're telling me that the guys who have actually been in the business long enough to know better are doing stupider shit than these fucking outlaw goofs, invisible man bullshit. Cody and Jericho were totally involved with this. And it was, it was pathetic. Matt Hardy's catchphrase is delete. I couldn't wait to delete this off my fucking DVR. <laughs> I couldn't wait. Awful. Just awful. All the progress you guys have made as a promotion. 
and then you you do this 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 bullshit and someone you know will go what? oh but it would get over if there were people there it's garbage it's not good it's community theater how would if there had been people there how would they have worked that teleporting business they couldn't have i don't know because it can't actually fucking happen. And if we're supposed to believe that Matt Hardy was on acid, and that's why you saw Martin Luther King in the audience, I guess we're supposed to believe that Tony Schiavone took the same acid yeah, because I... he saw the magic trick happening in front of him and couldn't believe it. I can't believe it. I, am I dreaming? No, Tony, you're fucking ruining your credibility and everything you've built in your announcing career, calling stupid shit on national television that you shouldn't be involved with because it shouldn't be being done. Now let's see what Fuck. happens. I'm I'm curious now what's going to happen next week because the last time there was something that was I, you know I shouldn't say cuz AEW's fans it's kind of like they're split on this. You hear a lot of people like, "Oh, did you not watch what he was doing at Impact? It was it was just like this. It's great." And other people are going, "No, this is complete dog shit." And I'm in that aisle, by the way. Well, no, I actually, I didn't watch any of the shit he was doing in Impact because people told me about it. And because I liked Matt and Jeff Hardy, I specifically didn't want to see it. <laughs> and, now, and now, unfortunately, we're having to see it on real television instead of it just Impact. What? And, <laughs> but Tony Khan apparently took the reins after that dork order beat down of the Young Bucks, which was the probably single worst episode of, of AEW Dynamite. Everyone. Even their hardcore fans hated it. This one, because there's a lot of stupid fans, people are split on. And then you hear people, oh, what do you what do you have a problem with it? It's fun or it was funny. Oh, or, well, and, and that is exactly why I despise most of these fucking DIY, do-it-yourself, untrained, outlaw, cosplay fucking wrestlers. Because they have through the fact that they have no ability to get over in this business as, as it existed because they're not good enough. They're just allowed to do whatever stupid whacked off shit they want to do. And that makes a lot of these fans who don't know any better in some cases and who are obviously intellectually challenged think that it's okay to laugh at everything and that it, it, this is all supposed to be fun. And the people that tell me, Oh, you just must hate fun. No, I hate stupid, disrespectful shit done by stupid, disrespectful people about a profession that I take seriously. There's a difference. Like fun, where you're supposed to have fun. And wrestling used to be fun when it wasn't phony and silly. I don't like that these guys make the fans think that this is okay to think that way about something that it's obviously not okay to present that way because nobody gives a shit past this little fucking collection of outlaw mud show fans that they have fostered. You see, you see the same thing now. <clears throat> this is the program that on my DVR guide says a new league introduced in 2019 that introduces real sports analytics and et cetera to the fucking yeah, real sports analytics. So next week, Matt Hardy is going to have a graphic Matt has only teleported four times in the last week. That's your real sports analytics. Take your real sports analytics, Tony, and shove them up your ass. I knew this was going to happen. I knew it. I knew it. You got a guy that's read newsletters for fucking 40 years and thinks he can do it. He gets involved with the wrong people, the fucking people like the Young Bucks and Olivier that have created some kind of mass hysteria from this small group of fucking mentally challenged people that wants wrestling to be a goddamn joke. And together, they will let the inmates run the asylum and present stupid, phony, silly wrestling. And all they had to do to change my mind was not present stupid, phony, silly wrestling. And what have they presented since day one? Stupid, phony, silly wrestling. It doesn't matter if you have a goddamn Shakespearean drama break out in a fucking dog fight out in the alley. Nobody's going to pay attention to the fucking Shakespearean actors because they're in the middle of watching all these fucking stray mangy dogs fucking around. If you don't have a serious program all the way through, you don't have a serious program. Why is the fucking comedy bullshit in the third match not indicative of what the rest of your program is like? If that's phony, then the main event's phony too. 
if you don't fucking take yourself seriously from first match to last match, from start to finish, from the first second of the program till the last second, and present wrestling legitimately, seriously, as it's supposed to be, then you're a fucking clown show. There is no reason to do the activity of professional wrestling unless you are presenting it as if it is real. Just like there is no reason to do a movie and spend a hundred million dollars on it and in the middle of it have the fucking two main stars that are fighting each other break into a little dance routine and giggle about the script. This so is, this is why you need one booker with a backbone and you yeah. can't just have guys saying, well, this is what I want to do. And then you're like, you know what? Be free creatively. Express yourself. No, this was, I'll tell you, you could take all the Dark Order shit and all the Orange Cassidy stuff and the Marco stunt and the awful jelly Nutella matches. You could take them all. This was the single most embarrassing thing I've seen on their show to me. And I've given them a lot more slack than you. And I couldn't believe Chris Jericho. I guess I should. I mean, he's done a lot of stupid shit in his life, but he's been so good on AEW and so good in his role. And now he's cutting promos on inanimate objects that fly and then dealing with a teleporting guy who blocks him with fire after seeing Abraham Lincoln in the crowd. And Cody, who gets a free pass from everybody, he's in the middle of this too. It's just, this was infuriating to me. And I can't believe that people will justify it and defend it more than anything else on that show. More than, you could take any Omega criticism you have this was the single most embarrassing thing I've ever seen associated with AEW. And imagine what territory that takes in. That takes in Marco Stunt and JoJo the Dog Face Boy. But that's a, so you know what? I'm, I'm tired of looking for bright linings in this thing because I knew it from the start and they've done nothing but back up my opinion. They None of them can be serious. And now they're taking established stars and fucking putting them in the goddamn clown kitty pool also. <sighs> so I turned it off before I had to fucking subject myself to that. But should we watch this fucking program anymore? Or is this just the end of it? I think we should. You know, like I said, the Dark Order episode from, I think, December was the worst episode they ever did. And the story is Tony Khan took the reins after well, that. No, but no, fucking Tony Khan taking the fucking reins. Tony I'm not Khan saying he's, the, I'm not saying he's the guy. No, I'm but here's the he's thing. creatively you, with Here's it. the thing. You said they needed a booker with backbone. Yes. Okay, number one, if this was 25 years ago, everybody in the locker room, Tony Khan would have been the guy that they turned upside down and shook for change after fucking school and stole his lunch money. A nerd with glasses that they went up and thumped his fucking nose and gave him a wedgie. And that's the way they would have treated him because he was a fucking mark that had enough money to get in the fucking business and didn't know who to get involved with. And that's why they've got a shit show now. Now, now that the guys aren't real men anymore and they don't give people wedgies and steal their fucking lunch money, etc., they're just conning the fucking guy because he's still got all that money. So they're making friends with him and buddying up to him and let, and he's letting them do whatever their fucking creative hearts desire. And the people who benefited off of this television show were all the people stuck in, at, a, at home that could not get there due to risk of deadly disease who didn't have to be on that thing. And like Tony Schiavone, embarrass himself as he's never embarrassed himself before. <sighs> so they killed their announcer, their debuting new star, and their fucking biggest star, Chris Jericho, all in one fucking segment. And their television program by just being stupid because it's a goddamn television show to them rather than a wrestling show. And that's the thing that I've been saying from the start and nothing has changed my mind. These fucking dipshits think they're back into fucking independence and everybody wants to giggle and they don't realize that it's a bigger world now and it's a bigger audience they're trying to get and they ain't going to get none of them like that. If anybody believes that a motherfucker teleported from the top of the arena to the fucking ring. If anybody believes that really happened, then they need to be put away. They're not going to be buying fucking tickets or watching TV shows. They're going to be locked up in a rubber room at the puzzle factory. 
And the only way that you get people to really invest time and money and passion and energy is to give them something they can believe in. And if you don't try to make people, even though the cause is lost now, but if you don't present wrestling as if it was real, then there's no goddamn reason to do it because then you're just doing a fucking fake fight scene in front of a bunch of fucking stupid people. Oh, fuck. I really wonder if Jim Ross was there, how he would have called that because he would have been on commentary. I bet you Jim Ross would have figured out a way to go to the bathroom. If Jim Ross ever calls a man teleporting from one place to another, I will lose, I will lose all my respect for everybody in the world. It'll just all evaporate. That'll be the last, the last fucking straw. Huh? Apparently I'm the only one who just has any standards or principles and just will, will just not be involved in just any goddamn stupid thing. Just cause somebody tells me to. They are trying now to say that Matt Hardy wasn't really teleporting, that Vanguard One, the drone, was projecting, what do they call them, a hologram or a holograph or a, a hologram. Tele telegram or a fucking candy gram, hologram, whatever the fuck it may be, land shark, um, <laughs> there, the, 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 yeah, I knew you'd get that one. <laughs> The drone was projecting the picture of Matt Hardy in various places, and he really didn't. That's the explanation. Do you see the major glaring loophole in that, Brian Last, or should I elucidate it? Oh, is there one? Well, yeah, and, and, and any number you want to fucking chime in on. That the drone was producing holograms of Matt Hardy throughout the arena? When was he finally at ringside? Exactly. How the fuck did he just appear there when there Jericho was looking in that direction and you didn't see him fucking on his hands and knees crawling behind the seats to fucking show up at the railing? It's it, they're, they're, They got so much shit for that because it was so fucking stupid that now they're trying to come up with a rational explanation that could happen in the real world allegedly, but it still couldn't because they didn't think of the explanation until after they had fucked up. And apparently, from what we are being led to believe by news reports... That was the second take. Second day. They, well, they, but it was the second. They did it again. Yeah. They had taped it first the previous day, and apparently Jericho just fucking despised it, loathed it even. And so they had to do it again the next day during the show because it's a, there's no roof on that building, I've come to find out. It's an outdoor amphitheater type building, so they couldn't do it. I didn't even realize that. They shoot it well. You can't see it. It's a fucking... You know, there's no roof, but so they couldn't do it during the day because it'd be daylight. So they had to wait until during the show, they put on a pre-taped match and then did that again and then hustled it up into the, which maybe explains the lackadaisical editing on that freeze frame when he was there and he was there, but then suddenly Jericho's head goes Dink, and then Dink, the other way. And apparently it was the Kip Sabian Darby match that was taped the night before. And when that was in the ring or when that was on the air, that's when they actually taped it on Wednesday. And then they <sighs> rush back and expertly edit that thing together. Expertly. Science fiction wrestling. It's fiction, all right, but there's not a lot of science in it. But anyway, that's the explanation for teleporting. As I've mentioned, and I stand by it, from this point forward, we're trying to give you as much entertainment as possible, folks. But if there becomes any invisible contestants any teleportation appearing disappearing psychic manipulation or whatever the fuck i'm turning the shit off I, that is I, that's i have to draw the line somewhere have they explained how matt hardy saw abraham lincoln and martin luther king or how he knew judas i think that was the acid okay that was the acid and somebody said, by the way, it's not purple acid, it's purple microdot. I'm like, oh, whatever the fuck, the purple haze, I don't all through my brain. You know, in Impact, there was kind of an explanation for why he became this guy. Like, I think like his career broke down and he reinvented himself as broken Matt Hardy, and it explained why he lost his mind. And then he went to the WWE and suddenly he had a mind again. <laughs> and now he's back here, there's no explanation. Now he's just crazy again, for no good reason. And as we all know, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. 
on purple acid. But on purple acid. But I, yeah, I like Matt and a, a crazy Matt Hardy, a legitimately crazy Matt Hardy would probably be fun. But appearing, disappearing, teleporting, flying about, flittering about the airwaves, not so much. What was that? It wasn't. A, and I like John Cena, and I've never said anything bad about John Cena. I assume John Cena is gone also from the WWE and will never come back. That's the only reason he participated in this, I would think, because he'd never be seen again by this audience. I wrote, how do I make notes on this? He came to the ring, then Bray's in the funhouse in the video, then Cena's in the funhouse. Then there, then he goes through the door because the puppet tells him to, and you know, and fucking Lewis Carroll has Alice down the rabbit hole. I wrote the following: This is the end of wrestling. Why am I wasting my time watching this? This isn't even a cool movie fight scene. This is just stupid and nonsensical. Even in the movie fight scene, they weren't obviously acting silly and doing shtick with each other. I've never met Bray Wyatt, but I'm disappointed in John Cena. Bray Wyatt was emoting to the silly background music. I, 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 I don't know what the fuck was going on. They, then they they changed characters. Cena was all of his old characters. But then Bray Wyatt was fucking Hulk Hogan or somebody was doing something. He disappeared. This makes no sense. Cena's Hogan on Nitro. I hate this. What does this shit even mean? This is the things I'm writing. Fiend appears and hits Cena with his finish. And the Mandible Claw and Bray Wyatt counted the pin in a different shot for his own self holding Cena. So I wrote, did he win? Thank fuck this is over. I assume John never wants to come back to this bullshit. What? <laughs> It didn't even make any sense as phony wrestling. It didn't make any sense as anything. It was making fun of the wrestling business, having them obviously work together to not just do what Taker and AJ did, which was have a reasonably realistic looking movie fight, but to have silliness and stupidity and act in it and be a part of it. And it didn't even it, so it accomplished nothing good because it it made the business look like fucking well I don't even it, I don't even know if this could make the wrestling business look bad because what the fuck besides the fact that these guys were portrayed as wrestlers beforehand there was no wrestling involved here it's just stupid but but it wasn't good at anything it wasn't a good movie it wasn't a good movie fight scene. It wasn't performed well because it didn't make any sense. You couldn't follow it to begin with. What the fuck was this? And then and then they even have Titus O'Neil. Apparently he's still there. I guess he Vince got mad at him, but then we'll never fire him. Um, just stay, say, I don't know what I just saw. Duh, you think? Understatement of the year. Who could have thought that this was something that you should do in front of people? I'm talking about, I'm not even talking about the fans that weren't there. I'm talking about do this type of shit and show it to the world. Why? Why? I can't explain why. I can't explain what. It. You were the guy many, many moons ago, Brian, last, when the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west many times ago. You were the one who said, watch the Firefly Funhouse. This guy's really weird and bent. Well, that's not exactly what I said. I said I think people would really like to hear your opinion of this when he first started doing his Firehouse, Firehouse, Firefly Firehouse, Funhouse yeah. promos. <laughs> and what did you think of the Vince puppet all of a sudden showing up? Oh, cry Van Vince and Jesse and the fucking the pub, the uh, uh, Muppet Show fucking thing. They're in the goddamn. I, Jesus Christ. Just. <sighs> Reportedly, the creative leads on this were Bray Wyatt and Bruce Pritchard. Woo, well, I, if, I can believe that Bruce was involved. Um, I don't know Bray Wyatt, as I've mentioned. I've never met the young man. 
I thought he could talk his ass off in a wrestling context, but I I don't know what the fuck this was. I I don't, you know. Now, if you were worried about, and I don't know if worried is the right word, how the rest of wrestling outside of WWE and even inside WWE will react going forward to something like the Boneyard match and how they'll try to copy it and come up with new versions. What do you think when you see something like this and the effects this will have on the future well, of wrestling? Okay, and I've stayed off of Twitter, and for the most part today, we've this has just taken place last night. We're recording this on Monday, and I've watched this this show and doing this with you. So I would assume, certainly to God, doesn't everybody? I can I can see feedback being mixed on AJ and Taker. Did anybody actually like this shit? Feedback is mixed on this, and that's what I was telling you you earlier. There are WWE fans that will be entertained by anything, and there are also fans who, at this point, are so jaded with wrestling that they saw something that was really weird, and they got a kick out of it. They're not looking for wrestling to make sense anymore. They're just looking for something they can get a kick out of. Like you said, was it a match? Did Cena actually lose? Is that the last time we'll ever see John Cena? Is this his send-off? until he goes into the Hall of Fame one day? Is this the send-off of The Undertaker, Cena, and Goldberg on the same (laughs) show? You sound like the guy that used to do the voiceover questions at the end of each episode of Batman. Tune in next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Is this the end of the Cape Crusader? I hope it's the end of everybody that was involved in this fucking thing. From start to finish, I hope the cameramen are are fired and never uh, cameramen are fired and never come back. If you did this on a wrestling program even ten years ago, it would put your company out of business. And I and now that's for everybody that was waiting for me to cut the big promos, saying, "Well, this has killed the business." It's too late. I acknowledge that it's it's, it's, it's over with anyway. We have that's what I said a few weeks ago. I said. It, it, Coincidentally, right after I announced my retirement from professional wrestling, they cancel all the shows across the world. Coincidence, I think not. But I I have no interest in being involved in this shit anymore because the cause is lost and the fight is over. And when we are actually in a position where not only fans but wrestlers are debating whether the Invisible Man should be booked on a card where anybody can participate no matter what their size or age or skill or whatever and be called a professional wrestler and where even the participants put up absolutely no pretense that they're not completely full of shit uh, and the fans think that there's nothing wrong with that. This is not a fucking industry that I want to be involved in anymore as it currently exists. The fight is over. So I can't really muster up a horrible scathing promo on how bad this was for the business at this point, because the fucking business is fucking done. Whatever this is, it ain't the wrestling business. And it appeals to an ever tightening circle of fucking people who want to see silly shit. But the more that they do of this, the more they run off all those people who over 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, would have watched wrestling till the day they fucking died. And now we're like, fuck it. I just, I can't take this anymore. That's where we're at. And, <sighs> and you know, this again goes to my point, And we talked about it on the bonus drive through that came out yesterday, I guess, as we're doing this or, or today as we're doing this, but yesterday as the show is released, That's what makes me so mad when I saw the Friday night SmackDown go home thing with Bray and the puppets and Cena. That's what gets me so mad about the Hardy Jericho stuff in AEW because this is WWE. This is the road they're going down. So many of the idiots on the independents will copy them in terms of, hey, we can do stupid wacky shit because that's what wrestling's supposed to be because that's the way it's been since we were born. (laughs) But AEW has a chance to go the other direction and present a different kind of product. And I don't think they would lose viewers or lose their fan base if they presented, you know, even if you take the guys like the Bucks and Omega. But wait, but here's the fly in that ointment, Mr. Last. The only person in a decision-making capacity, the only person 
in a power capacity, the only person in a capacity can tell people what to do and or pick talent that knows how to do that is Cody Rhodes. You give Cody because way that, too much credit. But wait, but he knows how to do it. Does he, he knows he signed he Marco kn- Stunt. Listen to me. Are we sure he did? But anyway, the point is he knows how to do it. He may not do it all the time, but I didn't say he was the best in the world at it. I said he's the only one who knows how to do it of that whole group. Because ultimately the burden will come or should fall on Tony Khan for choosing to listen to outlaw, goofy, indie fucking wrestlers that either thought they were a big deal in Japan or think they're a big deal because they sell T-shirts, even if their picture ain't on it, because the bullets are cool. And they, the great territories run by the great promoters who were ex-wrestlers, always educated their audiences to the style of wrestling that they were best at presenting, which was generally what they were best at doing in the ring, which is why in Chicago for so many years and Indianapolis for so many years, it was Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher and the fucking brawl and juice on Heenan. But in Florida, it was great scientific wrestling to give the fucking sport credibility and then the fight on top with the blood. Or the big fucking monsters and the ethnic heroes in the Northeast, or on and on, whatever the flavor was. It was always the way you educated your audience as what you were strongest at presenting. And with the exception of Cody Rhodes, none of them either know how to do that or have ever even tried to do that. At least Cody has studied what his father did. His father had experience and learned from masters. He uh, he has applied that to the matches that he's had, which is why they get over in the building or in that instant more than the other matches as far as shit that makes sense and, and the finish accomplishes something because he's the only one that knows how to do it at all. Whether he's the best in the world at doing that is subject to debate, but he's the only one that knows how to do that at all. Otherwise, they they have an outlaw indie mindset, and that's the product that they're going to fucking give. With a national TV slot and a billionaire's budget, they're going to give hokey shit. It's just not going to be hokey shit on the level of the hokey shit we just saw at WrestleMania. Well, again, my point is, and I'm not, I don't agree with you on Cody. I, I think that a lot of people give Cody a pass because of who his dad is. And I think he has a lot he still needs to prove in terms of his wrestling smarts. He, he figured out how to get over. He figured out how to latch on to things that are over. And he figured out how to get the fans to like him. But I think there's still a lot more that Cody needs to prove in terms of that. But you just made a point about it's all these outlaw indie guys there. And there's really no one, unless Tony Khan puts his foot down and becomes a wrestling genius, there's no one to really stop them and push them forward. That's not the issue. The issue is guys like Jericho and Hardy who are saying, we're now here, we have free reign to do all the goofy shit we ever wanted to do. Because that Hardy segment, apparently, Jericho was the guy who wanted to do it. That was Jericho. So it's one thing worrying about, and I agree with you, you worry about you know the Orange Cassidy kind of stuff and the Marco stunt and any of these goofs that were just cherry-picked off the indies because they had a small following somewhere, let's put them all together and make you know a fucking melting pot of bullshit. Make a big pot of burgoo of wrestlers. But this is the problem. If WWE is doing this kind of stuff, I want a wrestling product that goes the other direction. And I think a lot of other people do too. And AEW at times has presented that. And you could definitely point to some of the Cody matches and say, at times it has presented a fine alternative to the WWE style of wrestling, which now permeates the independent scene as well. But it's stuff like the Jericho Hardy thing, which is on that show, which belongs on an impact. Or belongs, I guess at this point, you could say it belongs in the WWE. Vince didn't want to do the Matt Hardy stuff, but he wanted to do this stuff. (laughs) But that's what gets me so mad about AEW is the fact that I want a wrestling product I can enjoy and lose myself in. And at times you can do And everybody's going to say, well, why don't you watch New Japan? Because we don't want a, a bunch of fucking interchangeable Japanese guys who we cannot understand what the fuck words are coming out of their mouth. Doing fucking wrestling. We want Americans that we understand what their passion and emotion and reasoning is and fucking promos. And we want to have a little fun in the context, fun in wrestling in the context of the presentation of a bunch of wild ass personalities having a fight. There's plenty of fun there. You don't see that in New Japan. 
That's drier than nuns, cunt. And I like Japanese wrestling. When it's a really good Japanese match, I really like it. I have a massive collection of Japanese videotapes still to this day. However, I want an American-style wrestling television show and promotion that doesn't insult my intelligence. I like the idea of sports-based wrestling. I'm a massive fan of Mid-South Wrestling. You can't go back to 1983 and 1984 and say, all right, we'll just take everything back and do that. But you can apply the basic principles of presentation and tone of the show to not insult the audience. And you insult the audience when you go from something treated realistic to teleportation and drones. And just like you insult your audience when you go from a Firefly Funhouse to Brock Lesnar. Jim, let me ask you about something that was sent to me by a Cult of Cornet member whose name I probably shouldn't use or attach to this. But they are a member of what is called the WWE Fan Council. Are you aware of the Fan Council? I've never heard of this thing. Apparently you sign up for this, they let you in, and then they survey you about various WWE ideas, events, and they sent out a survey after WrestleMania. So, so wait a minute. So basically it's a it's a focus group that they solicit, make them feel like they're on the inside of something and that they're privileged people and then hope that they will answer in a favorable manner the questions that they ask so that then they can use that biased and skewed information to make decisions or sell shit. Precisely. Okay. May I ask you some of the questions they sent out on this survey? Sure. You could answer strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. This is about WrestleMania. The event made the most of not having a live audience. (sighs) Well, I would strongly disagree with that, except that Charlotte and Rhea Ripley was so good. Uh, Mostly disagree. There's strongly disagree or disagree. There's no mostly disagree. So which one would it be? Oh, fuck it. I'll just disagree. Supernatural and fantastical touches made the event fun to watch. (laughs) Well, what do you think I'll answer on that one? I don't. Fantastical touches is a fantastical (laughs) touches. Uh, You shove your fantastical touches up your ass. There's my answer. I, I want you to strongly shove your fantastical touches up your ass. There were many unexpected moments throughout the event. Well, if I woke up tomorrow morning, I went out on my porch and there was a giant fucking pink elephant being sodomized by a fucking fisherman, I would be surprised, but it still wouldn't make any sense, so I'll strongly agree with that. Adding cinematic action and cinematic elements increased my engagement. We don't care whether you're engaged or whether you're just fucking around or whether you're friends with benefits. That's not an answer. Oh, fuck you. I strongly disagree. (laughs) Although technically it really did increase your engagement. Well, you went off for an hour on it. I was fucking engaged. I was, yeah. The event felt innovative and fresh. Fuck you. I will take that as strongly disagree. The match stipulations made the matches more exciting. What the fuck? What what stipulations did they have? There they was didn't... a ladder match. There was a last man standing match. I won't even get into the cinematic fantastical. Well, matches. that's it. You know, if, if the, the ladder match got in the way of the athletes involved. It could have had a semi competent match if the ladders hadn't gotten away. And all of the shit, you know, all the rest of the shit mostly sucked. Last Man Standing sucked as a match and a a stipulation. Uh, Yeah, I I, I strongly disagree. The use of off-site scenes and matches kept things more interesting. Why are they, they are just writing these questions to try to get people to blow them. Why don't they why don't they bring it up the other way? Why don't they did you think that the fucking offsite location sucked? Word it like that. And then you could strongly agree or strongly disagree, rather than giving all this flowery fucking pampered bullshit first. Your engagement. This is no way to speak about a company that is woven into the fabric of society. Well, I've been wondering what the fuck that stain was on society. The length of championship matches were just right. 
Well, wait a minute. Which the fucking long ones weren't uh, the short ones were the title matches. The world title matches for the universal title and the WWE title were relatively short. The women's world title matches were a little bit longer than that. Well, yeah, they were about that's actually that is right. They, Cause they needed to, although the quick Goldberg and dipshit, what's his name? Strowman match just took the shine off of the quick Brock drew McIntyre match. So they shouldn't have done that the first night, but otherwise they were about right. The matches felt unique and different from recent events. Oh, I strongly agree with that. It was different. All right. I like that the event used the entire. Re- <laughs> I, I liked that the event used the entire arena for matches. Oh, no, I, I disagree with that. They should have gone in the fucking turlet and fucking given each other a swirly because they, they missed that completely. Our final one from the survey. It's a little bit different for shows without an audience. Which of the below list would you like to see? I'll read you the list. Instead of uh, you checking it, just say, yes, I would like to see that. Championship defenses. No. Outrageous moments during matches. No. Matches with stipulations. No. Inclusion of cinematic action and elements in matches. Oh, hell no. The use of off-site scenes and matches. Fuck you. Seeing fan reactions during matches. I don't give a shit. Matches with theatrics. They've already got them. In-ring promos from superstars. On a wrestling program? Seeing superstars in the arena as fans. What the fuck? <laughs> well, 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 I get... The, the, <laughs> Now they're trying to say, should we do the same thing that all elites do? And it makes a better atmosphere where you put five or six of the guys out there and have them make some noise. I don't want to, I don't want to see fucking, you know, one of their top stars just sitting in the fucking bleachers and eating some popcorn if everything was normal. But yes, I'd like to see some of the people in the audience somehow, not the main event guys making some fucking noise. Having superstars as part of the match commentary. You mean like a color guy? Wow, I've never (laughs) thought of that before. Picture-in-picture commentary for others during matches. Fuck the whole picture-in-picture thing. Unless it's a split screen and they're both the same size, you can't see the fucking little thing to begin with. Inclusion of celebrities. Fuck celebrities. Matches that occur outside of the arena. Fuck matches that occur outside the arena. And finally... (laughs) supernatural fantastical touches during the show what is fantastical or wait a minute <laughs> hold on here. the american heritage dictionary third edition i'm going to the f's i understand Fant- scott munns told bill watts there were no fantastical there touches no- in new orleans <laughs> yeah we had a whole superdome show and didn't have any fantastical touches all right farm fandango uh, what, what did we say? Fantastical fan, fantastic son of a bitch. Fantastic. No, there's fantastically. Oh, also fantastical. Fantastic is, as also fantastical. Strange in conception or appearance, bizarre as in form or appearance, grotesque, <laughs> unreal or illusory. <laughs> Well, there you go. Bizarre or grotesque. Yes. There was plenty of fantasticalness in those fucking cinematic masterpieces. All right. Well, well what are they? T- not only you, you said it best. Most of their fucking heels look like bad guys on a children's show that no adult would be afraid of, like Baron Corbin. And now they talk to their fans like they're fucking 13. Well, what that- the fuck? No, on the re- here's what I want out of the wrestling match. I want the bell to ring, and I want two guys to simulate kicking the shit out of each other in such a, a fucking professional way that I can buy it as being halfway legitimate, and that the two individuals involved uh, come off like they're purported to be. That's what I fucking want. That's all I want. I don't need any more than that. It's not too much to ask. 
They got to spend six million dollars to teleport Nan Harriet in the middle of the ring in the finish. Well, on a similar wavelength here, one of our final two questions, or I don't even know if this is a question, really. This was an email sent in. Uh, before you continue, I'd like to ask that you not read my actual name as I'm directly related <laughs> to a WWE talent, and this could very easily be traced back to them. Oh, my God. All right. I don't know if you've seen this, but attached is the most recent version of WWE social media policy for all contracted talent. This was sent out to talent just before WrestleMania aired this past weekend as a reminder of social media etiquette. I thought you might get a laugh out of some of the things that the roster can and can't say on social media. Would you like to hear this, Jim? Well, I'd, I'd like to hear some of that because, after all, I try to have the proper social media etiquette. And I very, very rarely advocate for the nuclear bombing of anybody on social media. And I don't insult anybody on social media more often than once an hour. So I'd like to hear some of their rules. Okay, and just for the record, we have not confirmed that this is an actual thing, just to give us a little bit of a waiver here. General rules, social media guidelines. Do not comment or speculate on rumors or future storylines. Do not reply to fans in the comments. <laughs> be sensitive of the language used and how it may be interpreted by dirt sheets. They actually use the term dirt sheets. That's what makes me wonder if this is legitimate or not, but we'll, we'll keep going. Well, but, but actually, I can believe they would because they're the... Eh, go ahead. Always present WWE and talent in a positive light. Do not use messaging that enables or encourages fans to speak negatively about the product. Always use sports entertainment to describe WWE. Do not use professional wrestling or wrestling unless quoting a superstar or executive. You know, this sounds pretty legitimate. Talent should be referred to as superstars, not wrestlers. <laughs> Minimize the use of hashtags on Facebook. Only use them for very big initiatives. Only one show. Pay-per-view, feature, or marketing initiatives, specific hashtags per... I don't know what the hell this is trying to say here. Yeah. Do not use words... I just, I just make up hashtags, like hashtag fuck. You know, do not use words that trigger a spam label from its algorithm. For example, free. Wait, what? What? Do not use words that trigger a spam label from its algorithm. Is that English? What does that even mean? That means do not use a word that may trigger the platform to think that it's spam as opposed to an actual comment from an actual person. And apparently the words listed here that trigger spam are free, like, Share, comment, buy, purchase, click, watch, YouTube, and available now. Well, fuck, I've used a bunch of those. Do not use talent names and or social media handles that your brand does not have endorsed rights to. This includes signature moves, a.k.a. pedigree or spear, signature phrases, a.k.a. smell la la. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? What? I guess what The Rock used to say, can you smell or do you smell whatever he used to say? It says in quotes, smell la la. Or signature oh, looks. Smell la 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 la. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or signature looks, aka the people's eyebrow. Copy suggesting fans engage in, uh, oh, do not use, I guess they left out here. Do not use copy suggesting fans engage in physicality. And words to avoid on all platforms. Blood, choke, belt, strap, <sighs> diva, feud, headshot, trauma, kayfabe, mofos. <laughs> House show, DQ, the anti-diva. Spinal injuries, victim, violence, violent, wrestling or wrestlers, WWF, wife beater, curb stomp, need a push, to be over, baby face, heel, to job, jobber, card, strangle, kill, and murder. 
And this apparently, <laughs> allegedly, are WWE social media guidelines. Uh, well, I'm glad I don't work there. Because I probably wouldn't be following those. I'm glad they didn't have that shit when I did work there, because I probably wouldn't have been following those. All right. Well, one last question. If you smell a la 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 la, what corny is cooking? Smell la la. Someone's in the kitchen with corny. Someone's in the kitchen. I know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, Someone's in the kitchen question. with corny. Strumming on the old banjo. This was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from Mark in Dryden. Did Jim catch the Triple H 25th anniversary segment on SmackDown? <laughs> if so, your thoughts on the entire segment, or how about just when Vince showed up? You've been chomping at the bit, I know you have, just salivating, drooling even, to, because you made me watch it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. And then I said, do we really have to talk about it? He said, well, I mean, if we run short of questions. And then just right off the top, of, right off the tip. I don't want to, I, I don't mind knocking Triple H and Michaels for, for, I don't understand what they were doing unless they were just tickling themselves. That's what two guys sitting around say, oh, we ought to do this. Yeah, we ought to do that. Or riding in a car. Yeah, yeah, we can do that and that, but not really to actually do it. To even if, if I'm sure some people, oh, I love the self deprecating nature of the segment where Triple H, as played by Paul Levesque, actually made fun of his own character. Cause, you know, cause there's, there's that element out there in the wrestling community these days. But in what fucking world of a wrestling promoter's mind does it make sense even? To make one of your legendary fucking iconic wrestlers look like a fucking dipshit and have him and his friend out there doing funny, 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 haha with each other with nobody there to laugh. So it's even less funny than if a few fans were tickled by it because they were working with them. It, they made, whether you like him or not. It made Triple H, and then the people just said, well, fuck. Yeah, he did get the shit kicked out of him all the time. He didn't get beat all the time. It made he went as good as we thought he was. The whole segment was geared towards skewering him, and and he was going along with it. It just, it, I, it, it am I too old-fashioned, Brian? It is funny when they showed the montage of people beating him at WrestleMania. It did get me thinking. The two guys he did defeat at WrestleMania, of course, were the WCW guys, Sting and Booker T. <laughs> uh, so I, so I didn't understand that part. I don't think Michaels is nearly half as funny as he thinks he is. But then, when Vince came, I haven't seen Vince in a while. When was the last time Vince was on television? Well, at least on a television show that we reviewed or watched or have talked about here it's been a while right i don't know if he's been on any of the shows we've reviewed in the last six months I, I could be wrong but i don't remember the last thing i remember with him was the xfl announcement which is a while ago well and even the i i don't know maybe in one skin because that's where there was, it was a press conference there's people around whatever the case no the <sighs> I have never felt sorry for Vince McMahon before. But it, it's not like I think he's on the verge of death, right? <clears throat> I'm not saying that. I'm saying Vince looks old and human for the first time. And he looks like his dad, the old picture of his dad on the cover when his dad was gray-haired and facially. I mean, um, he didn't command the room. He didn't have the voice. He didn't, he, he is not six foot fucking three anymore. It doesn't look like he didn't slay it as a performer. He didn't, uh, uh, he made Joe Biden sound like the fucking federal express guy. You know, it, it, he didn't come to a point. Well, 
he didn't have those sly inflections. He seemed like he was out of breath doing the promo. I, that's the first time I've ever seen Vince where he looked like, in person or on television, where he looked like a normal human being that could age and get old and, and you know, he's, he's off his game. I actually heard from someone who's a former WWE employee, and I'll stress employee, not a wrestler, someone who worked in the office, and they had not seen Vince in a while, and I hadn't been watching. And then I went and sought out the clip after I heard from this person, and they said, is Vince sick? He can't stand up straight, and it looks like he's out of breath. And I said, oh, you know, that's surprising they would air that. And then I saw it, and I said, wow, that he... He does not look well. Well, I mean, the the part about Stan, is it, it, I mean, he had the quads torn. He's had, you know, issues. I would assume when he started taking bumps off top of cages when he was 60 or whatever, <clears throat> that probably didn't do him any good. Uh, so, uh, you know, but he just, it, it, he didn't have the energy. He didn't have, he wasn't Vince. And, and, Yes, Vince would exaggerate his mannerisms and his voice, and he he would exaggerate everything about him when he was on television, but it was all still shit that Vince did for real if you were around him for any length of time in person. And it, it, it he's one of those guys that you don't ever expect to get old or be different or or not, you know, or just be human. And, you know, I felt bad because, I mean, he's almost 80. How old is he now? 76? You're doing math with your fingers and your toes? I was actually looking up what his age Oh, is. cheating, eh? I don't remember what year he was born. Um, You know, he is... So, I mean, you know, when you think about it, he looks great for the, your normal fucking 75 or 80 year old fucking guy, but He's 74, Vince, 74. Okay. For your normal 75 year old guy, I think he looks pretty fucking good, but it didn't look like they left the hanger in his suit jacket. Like that's what I was used to say. It looks every time Vince walks out, it looks like they left the hanger in his fucking coat because his shoulders are just back and the whole thing. He's it was, I, I, I know if he's still breathing, he's still training, but he's lost some size, but obviously wouldn't you, but it just, no, man, he just, he looked he, and, and everything he said at one point when he, he started telling a story and it sounded like your uncle at Christmas when he wanders off in the middle of not wanders off verbally in the middle of, I remember one time and he's, you know, in Birmingham, Birmingham was one of my better towns. He just, it, it, it was, it was, Vince was, was human there. And that's shocking to see. You know, it's interesting when you take that Vince and you think about all the stories we've heard in recent months about guys wanting to get out of the WWE and Vince pitches them on ideas and says, you know, oh, it's such good shit or tries to convince them that an idea is good or at times maybe even dances to music that he wants them to take with a new gimmick to show them how good the music is. I mean, it's not 55-year-old Vince. It's this Vince. Yeah, well, you know, and 55-year-old Vince could get away with that because he could, as Christine Jarrett used to say, he could say the glass is off your own face. He could it, it, talk you into anything. And it, it, you had to kind of laugh when he was dancing with it. Remember I told you a story when, when he made two cold Scorpio flash funk and they sent him out on a dark match just to, you know, see what he, what he was doing and they didn't have music for him yet. So I had driven to that taping and I had my cassette tapes in the car. I said, I got Rick James. Okay. So he came out to love gun, but it just, so they started playing it. Vince was walking out and he does the fucking strut and the dance and the whole nine thing to love gun all the way to the ring. That's a, it exists somewhere in the, WWE library off a dark match of two cold Scorpio's first flash funk appearance. But this would no, I can understand why. I, Cause that's see, that's something also you, you never heard of guys actively trying as hard the last couple of years to get out of their deals as with some exceptions. I mean, you know, Brett or whatever the fuck that whole 
saga. Because Vince could always talk him into it. And, and that has been strange that the last couple of years he has not been able to talk people into some things. And this, this Vince, I can understand. <sighs> any other thoughts about the ending of the segment or any other thoughts about the Triple H 25th anniversary? What do you think about well, 25 the, the years of Triple H? Well, okay, well, first of all, the ending of the segment, when he walked off, did the exaggerated, you know, and, and but that was inside. They were doing inside stuff with each other. You know, inside family stuff and, you know, et cetera on, but on, they, they showed that on television, right? This was not just the, it was the lowest rated Fox Smackdown yet on Fox. They showed this. Yes. I was going to say it wasn't just for like NXT or the website or whatever They they showed that on Fox. Okay. Nobody, nobody got it. And nobody was, I don't think touched by it, except people that are already wanting to be touched by anything that's touching about triple H. Those people were touched. Most people were not touched. If they were touched, they were touched inappropriately by that segment. Um, well, Triple H, uh, he's had a longer run than almost anybody else in the WWE, but he has, of course, the familial advantage, as we've talked about. It's not like he's he's sucking or doing a bad job at anything, but he's not going to get fired anyway. Um. So I can understand why, you know, depending on how long he lives, he has another 30 years or more of the, until he looks like Vince of, of being with the WWE. So it's, it, I think a bigger accomplishment is probably Taker that he lasted this long without, you know, actually being married to the family, but, um, Congratulations. 25 happy years. Almost like the Mickey Mouse anniversary. 25 happy years with the mouse ears. Why did they, instead of doing something nice for him in a cool video and whatever, why did they go for just his friend roasting him and then Vince coming out and not really being very good? Some of the choices they've made. For they didn't do anything. This was not just like the rib you showed me. There, there was a there was not like a real ceremony where they put him over in a big video and all the accomplishments. And then Shawn Michaels said this was just it. No, that was it. That was what aired on TV. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, they came up with something on the sperm of the moment, didn't they? What do you think of Stephanie calling Shawn Michaels? What you say, cross eyed idiot? Oh no, you lazy eyed and he he hung up on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They that's two guys came up with that, like they would on a car ride. Yeah, we can do this, we can do that. She could say, but they really did it on national network television in front of people, and and unfortunately not in front of people, but in front of viewers at home. So even if they were laughing, you couldn't hear a comedy. By the way, Bill Maher, I think, has found out you can't do a fucking monologue with no audience. It falls flatter than a fucking plate full of piss. And that's exactly what they did. If Bill Maher can't do it, Triple H and Shawn Michaels can't do it. All right. Well, we have another Vince question here. This was sent in the corny drive through gmail.com from Christopher James Graham. I came across a series of That's a person who sounds way too snooty we'll see about that i came across a series of stories on twitter about vince i was wondering if we can get jim's thoughts on their veracity and if he's heard any of these before and i have a twitter thread here by a friend of the show alan blackstock on twitter at alan underscore cheap shot <laughs> let's hear if you know any of these stories if you can confirm or deny them all right vince hates sneezing when someone sneezes he yells at them and tells them to control themselves on the rare occasion Vince sneezes, he angrily mutters to himself and loses focus <laughs> for a few minutes. This was said by Paul Heyman on Chris Jericho's podcast. I can testify to part of that. I've ever never actually seen Vince sneeze, I don't believe. I It, it seems like that would stand out. Nobody Now it seems like everybody knows that Vince doesn't like sneezing. But nobody actually in 1996 told me specifically, don't ever sneeze around Vince. It, because I remember 
one specific time, I think it was, God, I can't remember, but it may have been in early 97. I remember I was real sick at WrestleMania that year with some kind of bronchial thing or whatever. But anyway, it's a writing day. We go to Vince's and I knew enough to know that you can't just call in sick with Vince, right? Uh, but at the same time, I'm fucking sick. So I'm there, but you know, I'm ready to do what I'm going to do, but I can't control that I'm coughing and wheezing and sneezing every once in a while and, and stopped up and just, I'm miserable, right? You know, my eyes are water, whatever. If I've got a bad cold or whatever. So I'm trying to do the old, I'll put up the brave face and I will basically demonstrate my suffering to where that any normal human being would have pity and would say, you know what? You're sick. Go home, get some rest. Right. So that I can't ask, but I can accept that offer. Right. I figure it's just a matter of time before anybody will make this offer. The offer wasn't coming. I'm fucking, and I'm really am fucking miserable. I'm not having to sell it too bad and I'm doing the best I, but I've just, <laughs> And Vince is, he's giving me all the faces and he's looking at me, you know, and finally he's, are you all right? I said, oh, I'll be okay, Vince. Cause you got to fucking, you know, you got to plead your case. You got to be a plaintiff. You got to say, no, I'll be okay. Cause that's part of the fucking, what making it look good. Right. Then he wouldn't come back with, are you sure? You know, he was, so then a few minutes later, I'll have to make some more noise. And he, Come here. Are you going to be all right there? I, well, yeah, yeah, Vince, I'll, I'll, I'll make it somehow. And you always, you know the rule of this, Brian. You always wait till the offer is made and you turn the offer down the first time and the offer maker insists, right? That's the way it works. <laughs> That's the fucking rule. So finally the offer comes. Well, Jim, do you think you need to go home? Oh, no, Vince, I'll, I'll be all right. <laughs> All right, then page six. I'm like, motherfucker. He did not. He did not insist. He broke the rule. And I had to sit there all day and I was fucking miserable. I'm sure I fucking had a fever. But no, he, you know, that's his. And then after the fact, you know, became that, you know, he not only doesn't put sickness over, but he doesn't like to see displays of it. Well, he should have told me to go home then. He wouldn't have to look at it. Vince once raced former WWE writer Court Bauer on an open highway. Vince boxed in Court so that Court was heading straight for road construction. Court had to slam on his brakes to avoid an accident. Vince sped off, having won the race by almost killing a guy. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really add anything to it. That's, that's true. Vince went bowling with an NBC executive. <laughs> the guy had done something Vince didn't like. Obviously, so. obviously, since they were bowling, they were wearing bowling shoes. Vince sneaked off, got the guy's real shoes from behind the counter, tossed the shoes in the garbage, and left. The guy had no idea where his shoes were and had to go home wearing the gross bowling shoes. Vince contacted him later and said, that's what you get, pal. The guy wrote a book and said that Vince was the biggest jerk he'd ever met in real life. No, but wait a minute. He didn't throw the guy's shoes away. Didn't he just take one shoe and take it with him? I believe so. And I believe the story yeah. was it was potentially a birthday party for Dick Ebersol and the person whose shoes were stolen by Vincent Pat Patterson, I believe. Yeah. Was Frank the Ford. That's right. Yes, it was. It was yes. It was a party for Ebersol, but DeFord, the sports writer, got his shoes stolen. Vince, but they, they didn't, he didn't throw them in the garbage. He actually took them with him so they wouldn't be there. Vince, as a prank, had real police arrest Jonathan Coachman for running a betting pool at work. Coach said that when the cop car finally turned around and brought him back to WWE headquarters, he openly wept in relief and rage. Well, yes. And I mean, that's uh, the classic have a guy arrested rib. They they arrested me in Spartanburg one night. I've told that story before. They had Arn Anderson in the back of a police car in Charlotte uh, at the Coliseum, allegedly on a statutory rape charge, and he was shitting himself until he looked out the, the back window and there was fucking Flair and Tully and whoever else leaning in laughing at him, and they let him out of the car. 
Uh, yeah, it's an old to have one of the boys arrested. It's just you got to get one of the guys that hasn't been around long, so they're not smart to it, and get the cops to go along with it. But in those days, you know, cops were regulars, so uh, yes, that is true also. Vince got wasted at a strip club and let the Hart Foundation hit their finisher on him, and they hit him really hard. I don't remember whether it was a strip club or just a hotel bar. Do you? I don't remember, but I believe it was the Hart Foundation after the Legion of Doom had hit the Doomsday device. Yeah, well, see, he he wanted this. This was back in the eighties, but by the time that I knew him in the nineties, no, this was could, this, this was ninety two, I believe. Okay, well, the the pre the pre trial era, um, and I guess maybe after he had that neck surgery, he didn't take too many of the guys' finishes anymore. But uh, yes, he would occasionally uh, go out and partake in adult beverages with the boys. And on this particular night, somehow or another, he decided he was going to take all the guys' finishes. And somewhere or another, the Road Warriors managed to do the doomsday device on him to where it didn't fucking kill him. But the Heart Foundation cinched up and were a little snug with him while they had the opportunity. Vince said something insulting to Kofi Kingston on a plane, and Kofi didn't do anything. As they were getting off the plane, Chris Jericho told Kofi that if he didn't confront and fight Vince immediately, Kofi's career was effectively over in Vince's mind. This was how Vince tested his talent. Uh, Well, that story is true. Jericho's told it. I wasn't there, obviously, at that point in time. But it it's almost like if Vince has, has gotten younger uh, mentally... <laughs> that because when i knew him he he it's not like he would have turned back down from a fight from anybody but he didn't actively want to fucking fight or fucking whatever with the boys but somehow in the the decade after that he's you're always hearing the stories about either somebody has to stand up to him wrestle him threaten to fight him or get on the plane and fucking face lock him or whatever but uh but that story is true Former 90210 writer Larry Molan joined Stephanie's creative team. They were in a meeting with Vince. Vince was talking. Larry was nodding. Stephanie pulled Larry out of the room. She told him, quote, you need to stop nodding. Vince <laughs> hates nodding. She explained that if there's one thing Vince hates, it's a yes man. This is extra hilarious because everyone always says that Vince is surrounded by yes men. Poor Larry lasted just a couple of weeks. <laughs> I, you know, once again, I never had him, never saw him yell at anybody for nodding or speak ill of anybody for nodding, but I'm not a big nodder. I don't nod a lot. I don't know that Bruce ever nodded a lot. I didn't see a lot of people around him nodding. Maybe I just caught him at the wrong time with a lot of non-nodders. So you think that's probably true? Well, I mean, it, if if they tell that story because it sounds like something that Stephanie would say. Vince and, I, I can't dispute it, is what I'm saying. Vince invited Mark Henry to a workout session. Bear in mind that Mark Henry's claim as the world's strongest man is based on the fact that he is the only man to have competed at top-level Olympic lifting, powerlifting, and strongman competitions. Vince tried to out-rep him on every exercise. Henry went along with it because he's competitive and even admitted that Vince tested him a little bit. Mark says that he actually quit before Vince did. Vince phoned Mark in great pain and admitted he had made a terrible mistake. Do you know anything about this story? I haven't heard it, but I can believe it. It's a, it sounds entirely believable. Vince was hesitant to hire Gail Kim due to her being Asian. Jim Ross convinced him not only because of her in-ring talent, but the fact that many men are attracted to Asian women yeah. and that there are even lots of Asian porn sites on the internet, this apparently shocked the hell out of Vince, who had no idea Asian porn sites existed. I have heard JR tell that story. So, yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, well, that's a. Well, you're talking about a guy that never even saw television. I don't know when he would have time to look at entertainment on the internet. So, I'm, you know, Vince may be like fucking Quagmire when they, they tipped him to the fact there was porn on the fucking internet. He didn't know it. And then he, you see him three days later, his right arm is three times as big around as his left one. I, you know, but, uh, but all I, the Vince McMahon's idea of a drop dead gorgeous woman is fucking sable. 
as we've mentioned before. And the only thing that I was ever able to glean of Vince's romantic preferences is that he and Shitstain were both all fired up over the idea of seeing Sable wearing white cotton panties. And I just fucking zoned out when they, when they would go into those discussions. The McMahons playing pool at their holiday home in Boca. Triple H and Stephanie against Vince and Linda. It was supposed to be a fun family game, and Vince turned it into a serious competition. Triple H and Stephanie kept getting lucky and were winning. Vince was getting mad at Linda because she was making their <laughs> side lose. Eventually, Stephanie ended up potting for the win, and he cracked up and stalked off. Later that night, she called him through the intercom and sang, You're tied to the whipping post, Dad, to piss him off. And from their bedroom, Steph and Triple H could hear him literally screaming in anger on the other side of the house. (laughs) Well, the only person that could have told that story would have been Stephanie. So I would have to believe that because she would have been there. Tiger Ali Singh complained to Vince about making him wear a turban and traditional Indian garb, (laughs) telling him it was offensive to his people and a desecration. Vince replied, quote, you and D-Lo are going to put those fucking turbans on. I don't care about desecration. Is there any truth to that? You would have been there, maybe. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know if I was specifically standing in front of him, but yeah, Tiger Ali Singh, I was there for that whole debacle. Tiger Ali Singh was the son of Tiger Jeet Singh. Tiger Jeet Singh was a huge wrestling personality in the Toronto market and the Ontario area in general, and also in Japan where he'd had a long run with the Noki's company. Like if, if the she- when the Sheik was, was Baba's crazy guy, Tiger Jeet Singh was Inoki's crazy guy. He came out with the, with a turban. Tiger Jeet Singh, the father did, came out with a turban and he, what is he? Pakistani or Hindu of some description. Um, and he had a a sword saber type of thing, and he would beat up the fans on the way to the ring. I didn't let you answer that question. Brian is, he is a Hindu of some description, correct? I believe so. Yes. Okay. I'm not certain. And then, well, I'm not trying to be racist here, but you know, that's why the name Tiger Jeet Singh, he is from some middle Eastern country or whatever. And there is a large population in Ontario, especially in Toronto of, His people, which is why that he was very over at one time in Toronto and had all kinds of, you know, sellouts with the Sheik and blah, 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 and and made a lot of money there. So anyway, Tiger Jeet Singh is retired at this time. It's 1996 or whatever, seven. But he's a rich guy. I think there's a school in Ontario named after him. Is there not? There is. I believe it's in Canada. It's him and is it Whipper Billy Watson? Him and Whipper Billy Watson. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, he's still a name in a community. He's a rich guy. He made money, put it into real estate, whatever. His son wants to get into wrestling. They should have named him George Singh. But anyway, his son is a big, tall, good-looking guy. We see the pictures, and they, as some way or another, the deal is going to be that not only is if, – if they take Tiger Ali Singh, the son – and the Ali was to honor Muhammad Ali because they're Muslim, whatever they're, the, the people, the, the lineage they are, whatever, they're Muslim. So the tiger Ali saying is to honor his father and Muhammad Ali. And not only if we take the son and use him, then Tiger Jeet Singh has some connections in the Middle East that is going to get these huge paid tours, right? And as we know, Vince has always been a, a big fucking fan of paid, huge paid tours to the Middle East, right? So this was 25 years ago. So, and also there was talk about, it, you know, he's so influential in Toronto, but we held, we were already doing fucking big business in Toronto. But they signed Tiger, Tiger Ali Singh. And he's one of those guys, not only is he, he's greener than a pepper tree, he his dad has worked with his dad was not a an accomplished worker as far as wrestling. He did his gimmick. He was like the Sheik. He did his gimmick, and if it was anybody else doing it, it was bleh, right? Would you attest to that? 
he was not very good in the ring. And he was and he was not even as over as the Sheik, but he just had those pockets of places and because of his ethnic heritage where he was very influential. Although he looked really cool in the Japanese magazines when you see photos. It was like, wow, this guy has a saber and he's out there yes. doing crazy stuff. But then you'd watch the matches and it was like, oh boy. Yeah, it was brutal. But anyway, so, but also Tiger Ali saying thinks that he should be a big star from the start because he's, you know, imagine if this, the Sheik telling his son, Captain Ed George, he should be a star times 20. Tiger Ali saying is deterred. He's supposed to be a big star. He's dry on promos. He just, he wasn't an outgoing personality. He got heat with the boys. It, he had, he had heat because he wasn't very good. And also because they'd signed him and were trying to give him somewhat of a push. And I think I can't remember whether the turban episode was bef- they tried him out and his father made some appearances and then come to find out, wouldn't you know who won the pony? <clears throat> those paid Middle Eastern appearances didn't actually pan out. Apparently the way if, if they panned out at all, I can't remember, but the, there wasn't a lot of money in the pan if they did pan out. And suddenly Tiger Jeet saying is not making any more appearances. And they've got Tiger Ali saying on this contract. And I can't remember whether the turban thing, as I said, was either before or after they finally gave up and sent him to Puerto Rico. Uh, any They had a relationship at the time with whichever what IWA was what Victor Quinones was with back at that time. Right. Yeah. Uh, so they, they sent Tiger Ali Singh to Puerto Rico. They sent Russ McCullough, my big seven foot fucking abortion from OVW. They sent him to Puerto Rico, whoever they wanted to run off of a developmental deal that they couldn't break any other way. Cause these were the early ones. <laughs> they sent them to Puerto Rico, figured they could run them off. And finally, I think they ended up in some kind of lawsuit, I, if I'm not mistaken, with Tiger Ali Singh by the time that they ended their contractual relationship. But so I can, but yes, you're going to put these fucking turbans on. At that point, if he wanted him to wear a fucking ballet tutu, they were doing everything they could do to, to first, they did everything they could with him, and then they did everything they could to get rid of him with old Tiger Ali Singh. A few years ago, the company had a snow cone party. Kind of weird, I know. This was in the back lot of the TV studio, not the actual large headquarter building that everyone always sees. Well, apparently Vince is a huge snow cone fanatic. <laughs> so much so that he had a lot of them. Like 10. At one point, he got up and announced in front of everyone in his Mr. McMahon, you're fired voice that he loves snow cones. It was awkward, and I had to fight to hold back my laughter. It was surreal. I'm not sure who said that, but it's in quotes. I can believe that also. I've never seen Vince eat a snow cone, but I can believe that that story might be true. Vince thinks throwing or pushing someone into a swimming pool while fully clothed (laughs) is the funniest thing on planet Earth. On planet Earth, excuse me. I could attest to that being true because I've been one of the people in the pool. Uh, And... uh, (laughs) It wasn't bad weather, thankfully. It was one of the days that we were writing out by the pool because it was good weather. But toward the end of the day, I can't remember how that I bit on the hook, but it was something to the effect of Bruce was saying, well, there was something. He he couldn't believe that Vince had that written on the bottom of the pool. I said, what? Yeah, Vince had whatever the fuck it was he's telling me written on the bottom of the pool. And I, he said, you can see it from right there. So I go over and as I'm looking, trying to see, it was just the 16, not 16 foot, but the six foot or whatever fucking depth. And I said, that's, and right then there's Vince's hands from behind, whoo, straight in the fucking pool. Oh God, he loved it. Everybody apparently that has been to say, never did it to Pat, I don't think, but everybody that's been to Vince's house for a work day has been in the pool apparently or at least at, as of that point they had and so then i've got no fucking clothes because my clothes are wet right i've got to go home so he said oh here pal and he got me a sweatshirt and a pair of sweatpants and and it was actually a jacket i remember i got a jacket to wear uh home so it must have been spring briskish as it got dark and it the jacket i said i'll bring this back to you he said oh don't worry pal keep it well it was the sleeves looked like a straight jacket because vince is a lot taller and bigger than me in the upper body 
Uh, so I had it in the closet for a long time. And then when I moved, I should have kept it, but it was like one of those jackets that probably was a designer jacket, probably not a suit jacket, but a coat probably paid $500 for it. And he didn't give a shit. Said, I oh, don't worry. Keep it. But yes, I've been in the pool. One time he got drunk and urinated on Ric Flair's hotel bed. <laughs> I have not heard that. I've heard that. Okay. Paul Heyman talked about. Vince's competitiveness. Vince supposedly has a world-class thick beard, but shaves constantly. <laughs> Heyman asked Vince why he doesn't just let the beard grow out and save himself the trouble, and Vince's answer was, I can't let it win. <laughs> well, we've told the shaving story here just recently, so we're not going to talk about it. But yeah, he shaves constantly with his electric razor that he keeps in his briefcase in the back of the limo. He's fucking grinding it on his face. So I can believe that even if it came from Heyman. Vince holds a meeting with all of the talent announcing the switch to PG programming. Michael Tarver stands up and asks a question. <laughs> Vince's response. Excellent question, Shelton. <laughs> I heard that a long time ago. I heard that a long time ago. See No Evil, the film that Kane did. Vince wants this scene in the movie where Kane's character pulls out his penis and he wants it to be three feet long. I thought there was a connection problem. I said, Greg, can you just back up and repeat that last line for me? He goes, yes, Vince wants Kane's penis to be three feet long. And none of the producers are saying anything about it. <laughs> uh, well, here's one of your stories. Jim Cornette was at Vince's house, and Vince had somebody from the cable company working on a TV yeah. because the sound <laughs> wouldn't work. The guy came up to Vince holding the remote control and explained to him what a mute button was, and that mute was on. Vince gave him a $100 tip. Is that accurate? That is, I've witnessed that with my own eyes. And it wasn't like he was working on the TV. So here's the thing. When we'd be there... Vince, Linda would be at the office. She still worked in the office on the other end of the fourth floor. Um, and she would go to the office every day. So the only people there in the house would be the couple. The, and gosh, I can't remember their names. But this man and this woman, they were a married couple. <clears throat> and they lived there and did the cooking and housework and cleaning and things. And they lived in some... I don't know. There was, a, there was an old building in the back that was like a three-car garage or whatever that... When Shane got married to Marissa, Vince had that renovated, spent like a couple of hundred grand renovating it and gave it to him for a wedding present. But I, so I think the, the, the live in couple lived in another wing of the actual house. But anyway, otherwise than that, there was nobody there. And if they would be off doing errands or going to shopping or whatever the fuck, it was just us. Well, uh, at one day, but you would see people on a regular basis. They'd be wandering around either on the grounds or in the house because there was always some work going on. Uh, uh, groundskeepers would be there or somebody would be coming in to do something. Well, on this particular day, we're sitting there in the dining room and and the doorbell. And I guess Vince goes up because the couple was gone. So Vince goes up and opens it. Oh, yeah, pal, come this way. And it's the guy from the cable, cable company. He says, right back there. And he points to the room, the little living room they had around the edge past the kitchen and the dining room it's where that big painting of vince is on the wall with that big opulent frame he's got the big arms and everything um but anyway he said back there pal uh there's no sound so we're sitting there and the guy comes back around the corner like a minute and a half later with the remote in his hand and he says uh, sir see this the mute button that's what the problem was Oh, thank you, Pat. He reaches in his pocket and hands the guy a hundred dollar bill. But uh, there would be so many people wandering around there. Sometimes Vince would look up and just see some guy that he had no idea who the fuck it was walking down his hallway, and he'd shake his head and say, "I don't know who these people are." But there, uh, uh, one time we're working out by the pool. It's me and Bruce and Vince, and Pat's supposed to come over, but he hadn't showed up yet. Well, Vince has to go in and take a private phone call in his study. So me and Bruce are sitting there by the pool. Pat shows up. Oh, Pat sits there. And we start now with <clears throat> with Pat where Vince is not the king of chit-chat. Vince, you know, has to, you have to be talking about something of substance. Pat just loves to chit-chat. And we sat there and we just bullshitting back and forth, enjoying the weather, whatever. But finally, Pat's like, fuck, is he ever going to come out here? 
He's got that accent. And, you know, it's like he knows. Sometimes you would literally sit there on some writing days. You would sit there for an hour and a half or two hours, just twiddle your dick to wait for Vince to come out of some telephonic conference. So we said, I don't know, he's been in there a while. So Pat, I don't know whether he saw a reflection through the window like he thought he was coming or he just said, well, just watch this. He went around, but he waited for a couple minutes around the where the pool is. It's landscaped and there's these bushes. And you can't really see past the barbecue area at the end of the pool. And there was already, there was the groundskeepers were doing their work, right? All around, you hear the lawnmower down the way and you hear this guy's raking and doing his thing. Well, Pat goes around the deal. Vince comes out. He doesn't know Pat's there. Pat has gone around to one of these fucking landscapers and got his leaf blower. And it's one of those fucking gasoline powered leaf blowers where you can really rev that thing up, right? And cause some turbulence in the air and so as vince sits down he starts talking again he says all right where were we pat starts revving that thing up behind the bushes and now vince all morning we've been talking about his his mexican ground grounds crew right the the what the fuck was it Uh, it, it, his mexican ground crew had a italian name because they're in connecticut so it's like the lambrini brothers but every single one of them is mexican so we were laughing about that so anyway Pat's got this fucking leaf blower. Vince doesn't know Pat's there. Pat starts revving that thing up right behind the bushes on the other side of the fucking railing from the pool area where we're sitting. And it's like he's doing the work, and Vince has seen him all morning. So he looks over, and he kind of disgusted, like, ah, this guy's right on top of us now. And he continues talking, and Pat revs it up louder. And Vince he looks over his shoulder again, and he's like, continues talking and then pat revs it up loud he blows through the bushes and now the wind's coming through the bushes and it's blowing vince's shit and vince looks over his shoulder hey amigo amigo por favor whatever he's trying to (laughs) and in response to this pat revs the shit up and just fucking floors the goddamn gasoline leaf brower it's the loudest thing and he's shooting the wind straight through the goddamn bushes and Vince's toupee is almost ready to come off. No, I'm kidding. It's, but he's fucking hair and everything, and the shit's flying all off the table. And Vince gets up and c- goes around like he's going to go on the other side of those bushes and cut a promo on this motherfucker. And he goes, hey, amigo! And just then Pat fucking l- leans around from the other side of the bushes. And he sees it. And now he's got to laugh because Pat got him. And he loves Pat. So he's fucking horse laughing. But that's the kind of shit that they would that we would occupy ourselves with. Well, that ends the Vince McMahon portion <laughs> of the drive through today. A lot of people have been fascinated by Vince's behavior the last few weeks, more than... Uh, what? The last few weeks? Well, we have never received people, the... People have been fascinated about Vince's behavior for 35 fucking years. The amount of questions that have been coming in have been extraordinary about Vince. Speaking of laughing at things, let's finish this up strong. The last match of the night, the street fight. And I thought this might be good. Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara, we've liked them. Obviously, uh, you know, we've been talking good about Guevara. Jericho's had good matches against Olivier. Well, you know, but and the debut of Matt Hardy. Okay, this is, you got some name value. You got some star power. It's main event match. I thought this was going to be good. I forgot that there's nobody in control here that ever the inmates are being left to their own devices. Yes, Olivier came to the ring making his insufferable twat faces and gesticulating wildly. But once they once they all got out there, they jump started it and off they went. And yes, Olivier's brawling looks like shit cuz he can't do it, but they were in and out of the fucking ring and it was fast-paced and it had picked up and boom 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 and the action was wild. And then suddenly uh, Matt and Jericho leave, but then Jericho comes back. They've gone through the entranceway. Jericho comes back, and Jericho and Guevara are double teaming the piss out of Olivier, and they're beating shit out of him, beating shit out of him. And finally, here comes Matt Hardy, and he jumps in and makes a comeback. And I thought at first, I was like, wait a minute, what the fuck? And I had to back the, the I had to rewind the show to see before he left. When he came back out, he had changed his clothes. He was dressed in a different outfit. He was dressed like 
I guess like the Hardys used to dress years ago or whatever. Is that what we were supposed to, to get out of that? Yes. He has gone from teleportation to outfit changes. So what now, right off the, in the start of this match, in the first segment, Matt Hardy's long-awaited wrestling debut on All Elite Wrestling partners with supposedly the world's greatest wrestling artist against the top heel group with Jake Hager in the corner. The heels are kicking the shit out of Olivier, and Matt Hardy took time to change his clothes before he came back to the ring to help out. So this is now immediately garbage. And by the way, apparently when he changes his clothes, his personality changes as well. Well, I don't care. It's fucking stupid and it's phony and now it's not real. And the, and Olivier is not in any kind of real trouble because his partner wouldn't come out and help him when he had the chance before he changed clothes for no reason. And then Matt makes a comeback and then Jericho... Chris, what the fuck has happened? Are you, is the COVID affected your brain? Chris Jericho gets a baseball bat and hits Kenny Olivier with it twice, gut shot and back shot, and Olivier immediately foils Sammy Guevara's off the top rope move and was back up on offense, the very next thing. And then... Both Olivier and Matt Hardy go out of the ring and go under the ring and start looking for weapons, tables, and ladders when they've left a loose baseball bat laying in the ring in plain sight. They've walked past the baseball bat that they could just pick up and just bash the fuck out of their fucking opponents with to go under the ring and find shit that they can set up, set their opponents onto, and then jump off of things through the, the, the oh, fucking hell. So they get a ladder and they get a table and they put Guevara on the table and Matt Hardy splashes off the ladder through the table and gets a two count because Jake Hager pulls the referee out. The baseball bat's still laying there. Nobody's caring about it anymore because it's not time for that spot yet. And they go to a break with picture in picture, which I don't ever watch because it's too small and I don't give a shit. But by the time they come back, they have fought out not only in the arena, but the outer arena, the concourses and the hallways, and <clears throat> they're headed next door to the football stadium. And a fight in the outer arena would be great if they hadn't done this at least three times so far this year. At least three that I remember. And besides that, if it was a fight that had gotten out of hand and went there, that'd be great, but we already know it's not a fight because they've already been stupid and phony in the first segment and ignored things like loose baseball bats laying around because they weren't supposed to use them and changed clothes in the middle of a fucking brawl. Then they put Matt Hardy in the fucking ice machine, which I admit, if I had seen an ice machine there and we were going to do a fight there, I would have wanted somebody to go in the ice machine. But I would have not have wanted them to come out of the ice machine later on, having changed clothes again. He changed back in the ice machine to what he was originally wearing. Did he not? He absolutely did. Am I hallucinating? It may seem like you were, but no, this is what actually happened. Sport-based wrestling. Sport-based wrestling right after Sammy Guevara ran Kenny Olivier into the ATM and then pulled money out of it. Um, so the heels are doing the comedy stuff here, not even the baby faces. Then Matt Hardy comes out of the ice machine dressed differently. And Matt gets a golf cart and clips Jericho with it very lightly. <laughs> and Jericho got a spun off because he's like, what the fuck? I'm not going to fucking cripple myself for this. But then... He ran over Sammy Guevara, and Guevara took a hell of a bump. Imagine if they'd have saved, if they'd actually had a real match that people thought they were serious about, and then saved that for when they, after the fucking finish, when they fought for 90 seconds out somewhere, and then they did the run over the guy with the fucking golf cart. Maybe it would have been cool. But that's the second guy that had just got hit with a golf cart in the previous minute and a half. Then Matt Hardy puts Jericho on a table 
and Olivier was going to the top of a scissors lift to come off onto it, but they fucking saved Jericho. So Kenny Olivier moonsaulted onto everybody and hit his own partner as well as his opponents. But here came Santana and Ortiz and they interfered and they power bombed Matt Hardy through the table. And then Jericho power bombed Olivier on top of the golf cart and then hit the Judas effect. And both Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara pinned Kenny Olivier out on the football field AstroTurf. This sounds like what I was reading from the Maryland State Athletic Commission earlier. Stupid. What the fuck? I couldn't delete this fast enough. And this is their main event guys that are obviously doing joke, phony, corny bullshit when they're supposed to be mad at each other. So they better like the existing fan base they have they have because that's all they're going to get. And once that that existing fan base gets tired of this thin talent roster and these contrived stunts, what are they going to do then? They've only been on television for six months. And to not even promote, not even shoot an angle for a pay-per-view match or not even to get a new guy over or whatever. They're just doing this shit on TV because they've got the ability to do this shit on TV. Where do they go from here? Next time, it's not a, it's not a a golf cart. It's a rider truck that runs over the guy. Or now they got to fight on the roof of the fucking stadium. Or they got to goddamn go out in the fucking parking lot and cross the street and go into somebody else's business. Or that whatever the fuck. It's they've only been on television for six months. They're not even trying to do this to increase business. They're just doing it to goddamn put shit out there because Tony Khan's a fucking mark. And the guys are convinced they're all stars and that anything they do, people are going to get a tickle out of. And they can't be saved for them from themselves from being stupid and silly to get their own selves over because there's no Bill Watts or Dusty Rhodes. Or fucking, or a Dutch Mantel, or goddamn any competent booker to say, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to do fucking this, and you're going to fucking like it, or you can go back and try to get your money from Vince again. There are different styles of wrestling. Everybody says, well, it's just a different style of wrestling. It's just a different, it's, there's all kinds of styles of wrestling. Yes, there are all kinds of styles of wrestling. But this shit ain't any of them. Yes, if you have a sports-based presentation, Mid-South Wrestling was good for fucking collegiate wrestlers that had turned pro and were real shooters, and it was also good for football players and beer drinkers and tough guys and brawls, and it was also good for high spot matches. But you wouldn't do a dick spot. You wouldn't have the Invisible Man because that wouldn't make any sense. You would have, if if you went to Florida, you'd have great wrestling on the card, a Jack Briscoe, an NCAA champion. You'd have a wild, bloody mayhem like Dusty Rhodes. You'd have the British world of sports style, Billy Robinson or Tony Charles underneath. But you wouldn't have a goddamn dick spot or an invisible man or a guy changing clothes in the ice machine because it wouldn't make any sense. And it doesn't fit at all. It's not a style of wrestling. It's a completely different other thing. And if that's what they're doing, then that's what they're doing. But the people they get are going to be the people that they get. And they've got the people they're going to get with this shit. If they can't, if even the main event guys can't be serious enough to pull you into something and get over based on we're going to have a fight and you're going to want to see it, then it's just a fucking vaudeville show. It's just a fucking clown show. And nobody's going to prosper. So that, and, and, and once again, six months, and they've been all over the arena, and people are being run down by golf carts and fucking moonsaulted off fucking scissors lifts. Where do they go from here? And who's going to go that far? But speaking of which, next coming up, Brandy seated at a desk. <laughs> doing a promo about Lance Archer and Jake Roberts. This might have been good. Actually, no, it wouldn't have. 
Um, it was plainly, obviously scripted and being recited by her. There was no natural delivery to it at all. But it also sounded like she was going to bow up at Jake Roberts. You're not going to slap me. Well, what are you going to do about it if he decides to? It, it 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 came off as heelish to me, almost her demeanor, but it's obviously a well-shot vignette with somebody reciting scripted verbiage. This did not come from the heart. Once again, this is not sport-based wrestling. This is an audition for a show on the CW. A villain on Supergirl or The Flash or whatever these shows are. That's what that was. She's very good at delivering lines. I should be good on a scripted show. But it came across as completely unbelievable. And Well, because was... also if it was a scripted show, there'd be somebody better script in the lines. That's right. Well, this was just the beginning of our uh, moment of brandy here. A shot well, of brandy. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about it's a jug of brandy and look at that jug, by the way. Anyway, um, so here comes QT Marshall with brandy against Lance Archer with Jake. So automatically you would think that brandy would have the advantage. <laughs> Once again, Jake Roberts, a dangerous, evil human being is out here with the murder hawk monster. And Cody's going to let his wife go to ringside with a, a, a underneath card guy the way that QT I like QT but that's the way he's been presented so here you've got a, a, a she didn't go to the ring with him she didn't go to the ring with Cody well that's what I'm saying what what if she's gonna be out there it it didn't make any sense she's telling people that probably Jake is gonna try to corner her intimidate her but it ain't gonna work well how's it not gonna fucking work what are you gonna do to Jake to begin with nothing and secondly, QT Marshall is not Cody's brother, Dustin. It's it's QT, and so Cody's letting his wife go out here with the Murder Hawk monster and Jake Snake Roberts. They must not be that dangerous. Uh, I, I love Jake with the mask. Um, this was a good match. Archer he gave QT offense when he he needed to, but stayed on him and never totally let QT take over. Archer, he worked his ass off to keep up the intensity more than he did last week. Maybe he's been listening. I love you, Lance. Um, in the in the Brody Lee versus Lance Archer sweepstakes, Lance Archer is is winning in a runaway with Absolutely. this, as far as being a new top guy. No contest. Um, I said they had to do a spot with Brandy and Britt Baker with the fucking shoe, and that really distracted from and got in the way of the business of the match. Because suddenly, why did Britt Baker hit QT Marshall with her shoe and then Brandy gets the glory of throwing it away? But they should have been concentrating on Lance Archer here. Um, I will say one thing. If Lance Archer did the head palm shoot off into the ropes on one of my shows, I would fine him $500. I hate that, and it looks so bad. But then it was a, a bit of a comeback, but Lance hit a, hit a big finish, boom, and then pinned him with the claw. I'm not sure about the claw. I thought the finish looked good. I, I'd like to see more impact maneuvers from these big guys. Boom, one, two, three, convincing, rather than these the tap outs and the you know stationary pin type of things. But that was a good match and got Lance Archer over more than most things they've done with him. But then, once again, Britt Baker, I know they've switched her heel, but what does she have to do with this issue? Is it is Britt joining Archer and Jake? She jumped Brandy and Dee Dee teed her and then <laughs> tossed her in the ring. But, but Britt tried to toss her the wrong direction, and Brandy ain't used to rolling, and she couldn't hardly get her in the ring. But then Jake brings the snake in, puts the snake on Brandy. And again, nobody helped. The fans would have cheered. They're like, oh, shit, they're going to get rid of Brandy. But why was Britt Baker involved? It sh it, it, why could I could tell Brandy you why. Well, well, hold on. It just real quick. If Brandy went to check on QT and had her back turned for a moment and Jake came up behind and fucking flipped that fucking snake over and jerked it back on top of her and she, oh, shit. It'd have been the same thing. But, you know, she was fucking... She was laid out by a DDT from a girl that had nothing to do with the angle. And then all Jake did was really just lay the snake on her already. They never fucking did any damage to Brandy for any retribution to be called for on behalf of Dustin. 
Well, first of all, you're leaving out that Jake dry hump brandy. Well, yes. Well, he did that too, but that was after he put the snake on. <laughs> Which was quite a moment there. No, um, Britt Baker, in a matter of a few months, has gotten over, I think, with the AEW fans and even people like me who we watch every every week. We want to like AEW, but there's so much that we don't like that it kind of makes it so that we can't say that we're AEW fans. But she's gotten over with everyone as this heel. She's been great in that role. Yes, yes. Just every time they show her in the crowd, she's just become dynamite, uh, for lack of a better term, <laughs> on this show. So naturally, Stephanie wants to get into a feud with her. So she Stephanie, can get some... you mean Brandy. <laughs> I can slip up there. <laughs> Actually, yeah. So Brandy, <laughs> now that I think about it, I guess. But naturally, Brandy wants to now be in a feud with her. So in the middle of all this, the top female heel, Nyla Rose, you know, aside, Brandy has to get involved with her. And then after that theatrical promo, she has to get in there and she's now in this thing with Jake. It's it's so ridiculous. If, if it had been up to me, I said, well, Brandy rolls in to check on old QT. Jake comes up from behind her and grabs her and gives her the fucking DDT. And she fucking, she's laying there and then fucking Lance comes up and dry humps her and fuck the snake. And then you think Cody wants to get even? That's something to get even over. Well, here's another thing. They did a good job on commentary. They explained that Cody, because he's, I guess, attached to the football stadium. The yeah, dress, he was too far away. Too but far away to get there. We never saw him come after the fact, did that, we? That's the point. We never got the fired up <laughs> promo. You motherfuckers, you went after my girl. You dry humped her. You DD teed her. I'm going to kick everyone's ass. You needed that. We shouldn't have to wait a week to see the fired up husband. Yeah, well, he if he's if he's that fired up a week later, he'd have had a heart attack. Yeah, that's the, the there's parts of things here, but and and I saw somebody said, well, they couldn't have a man touch a woman. Well, they could if they want to get some fucking heat. <laughs> Jake DDT dirty white girl while dirty white boy was handcuffed to the fucking ropes and watching, and that was some heat in the fucking building. Of course, Jake then fucking never showed up again. But anyway, <laughs> he DDT dark journey. In 86. DDT Dart, yeah, the point is, it's just all over the fucking place. Hey, can I ask you a question? Yeah. If all of that had happened the way it happened with a crowd there, where they had popped for Brandy getting DDT'd and then... Yes. Dry, yeah, they would have gone They would have cheered. Yeah, yeah. they would have they cheered. All right. we. It, it's time. I think there should be a special place reserved in hell, in a way... For whoever came up with the idea to have both these stinkers of, of matches at the same time, but then again, it did get it over twice as quick. So there's that to be thought of. But <laughs> I said it when we heard the concept, and it, it, I, this nothing here changed my mind. This is one of those things where some goofy Hollywood reality show dipshit in a writer's meeting, I've seen footage of their writer's meetings where they all have their little computers out in front of them and their phones, and they've got ties on sitting around a fucking conference table just all writing on their fucking computers because they're writers, and they have ties. And they have never had a goddamn one match between a bunch of them, except for Michael Hayes, who they probably have given a lobotomy by now. I think he's the only wrestling person still there on the writing team, isn't he? They get it, 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 he's either he's either gone over to the other side or, or or you would have heard of Michael Hayes murdering some of these fucking people. But anyway, they said, oh, this will be fucking hilarious. What a concept. They have to fight from the start of Titan, the bottom of Titan Tower all the way to the top and get the blah, blah, blah. And this is the kind of shit that makes Vince's eyes light up because they can fucking have a set and they can have special effects and a blah, blah, blah. So the, uh, this fucking stinky bullshit consisted of Lacey Evans, Nia Jax, Carmella, Shayna Baszler, Dana Brooke, who her entire face looks like it was remodeled after somebody set fire to it and put it out with an ax. Ooh. What the oh, fuck has happened? Did she do that on purpose or was she in a horrible accident? What the fuck? And Asuka, or the women's match, and AJ, and Otis, and Aleister Black, and Rey Mysterio Jr., and Daniel Bryan, 
and the Grand Marshal of the Possum Day Parade are the men. So you literally have two of the best wrestlers in the world, three if you count Mysterio, but definitely Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles, involved with a bunch of fucking underneath guys and a bunch of fucking preliminary women, except for Shayna Baszler, who... But I, I get her UFC training taught her well for fighting in the women's room at, at Titan Tower. <sighs> Why did all the girls stand there to catch Asuka on the start of it when she dove off the... They were all standing there looking at her for 10 minutes. And then she jumps and they catch her. I'd just walk away. That's the Miss Piggy bump from the Muppet movie. And, and then she gets in the elevator... And and all the girls go, oh, shit, we got to run up the stairs. No, they don't. There's three elevators. I've been there. There's three elevators side by side. Could have just got the next elevator. But you know what? Since that elevator moves so slowly, and since there's only four fucking floors to this building to begin with, the stairs would have been quicker. Here's a question. Why did everyone get off the elevator and or exit the stairway at every single fucking floor? If you know you're supposed to go to the roof, <laughs> why don't you just go to the fucking roof? That building has a four-story parking garage underneath it and then four floors, four levels of offices, one, two, three, and four, and then the roof. You can go top to bottom in the elevator or on the stairs in under a minute. I did write that this is not worth making notes about at the start, but then I made some because I just, uh, you know, it, it, not any critique of any work in this because they're, <laughs> to fuck. They played music underneath the alleged fighting. When, 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 when Possum, you know, one of these days he's got to get fired so he can go to AEW so they can make a tag team of Possum and Pockets. When Possum threw the weight in the gym and broke the mirror, did you hear the dramatic music? And he, and he stood there and looked at it, oh, oh my God, what have I done? You idiot. You fucking buffoon. The WWE has told you people that you have to do this, that you have to have this fight, that you have to start down in the fucking gym and end up on the roof. They know you're going to break shit. Otis put a barbell on AJ Styles and he acted like he couldn't get out from under it. So he even beats fucking uh, balding buck on that goddamn ho ho hokey injury angle. He did a while back so he could go home. Yeah, that was really bad. It was clear that AJ could have rolled that thing right off him at any point. Well, of course. <laughs> and then as we mentioned before, Ray Mysterio ran into brother love and the shitter. Bru poor Bruce, if he's going to do that, he needs to fucking dye the hair back because now that he's gray, it just doesn't look right. He it, 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 he looks he looks more like fucking uh, uh, Pat Robertson. Uh, the music changes on every cameo. That brother loves music. Then that doinks music. Then plastic face is somewhere on the second floor, I believe. And by the way, you couldn't really tell what was what. I know, I know they have painted and carpeted since I've been there, but they were just in various places in the building, but it, they weren't taking a linear path to the roof. They were just fighting in various places in the building. So it, I don't know what the fuck they were doing, but in some conference room, Plastic Face got a fake briefcase, and then Stephanie appears to tell her, hey, stupid, the real one's on the roof. I don't know who's faker, the guys or the girls. So then AJ Styles is looking for Rey Mysterio, but he sees the Undertaker poster on the wall and he gets scared enough of the Undertaker poster that he stands there and looks at it for 15 seconds while he's supposed to be in this fucking mad, 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 mad world race to the fucking big W to find the, the money that Jimmy Durante buried under the fucking palm tree. I feel like Stanley Kramer produced this goddamn pay-per-view. He stares at the fucking Taker poster for 15 seconds and then sees a room with blue light in a coffin, so he has a boneyard flashback. And AJ Styles never used to take drugs. 
But now the LSD is coming back on him. And then Alistair Black beats him up. And then Paul Heyman's at a buffet. And he's got terrible manners. And suddenly the guys and the girls run in. What do you mean he has terrible manners? Well, he picked something out of one plate and decided he didn't like it and put it back in. <laughs> but then he saw the fucking, and he, they didn't even have like something he'd really go bonkers over, like a big Philly cheesesteak. It was like a fucking catering sandwich. It just looked like a big bread roll. And he really likes that. He's, you know, he's, he's looking at it real nice. And then here come the guys, and the girls both come in from opposite sides. Otis, have I mentioned that I despise Otis and his mumbling and his goofy bullshit and the whole cartoon nature of his fiasco? You have not. Well, I do. But at this point, Otis throws the food on Heyman, which he just stands there with a look on his face and takes. He didn't do anything to ru to run off or to pitch a fit or to whatever. He just stood there. And then that was, I thought somehow somebody's going to, he's going to take a bump. If I had been there and been forced to be involved in that, although that would have been a stretch, I would have at least taken a bump or something. But anyway, he gets food thrown on him. They have a big food fight. And one of the girls gets power bombed through a table while they play marching music in the background. <clears throat> then Otis goes to the cafeteria. I used to, I can't remember the guy's name he used to cook there, but he made great double cheeseburgers. And, and he loved me coming in because I was the only one that would get a double cheeseburger with extra cheese. Or I'd say, if, if give me the, the chicken fingers, I want extra ranch. All these other fucking twits that used to eat there were coming in getting fucking sandwiches and salads and granola bars. So he didn't, he didn't ever have any fun cooking for anybody till I showed up. But anyway, he goes in the cafeteria. Being mumbling and goofy, as I mentioned, why is John Laurinaitis in a fucking hover round? Why did John Laurinaitis pull up to him in a, in a fucking motorized scooter that looks like he's a fucking 400 pound old woman at Walmart? If that was an inside joke, I didn't get it. I have no idea. Is Has he recently had a, because he took a bump off the, the fucking horrible bump off the pie off the scooter. But he took a bump off the scooter, so he can't have just had, like, leg surgery or something. But anyway, he hit John Laurinaitis to face with a pie. Then Asuka came through. There was a custodian mop mopping the floor, and Asuka spazzed out at him. That's what I wrote. There's only four floors in this fucking building. Where are they all going? Daniel Bryan gets hold of somebody and he's actually trying to make shit look good in the middle of this. I, you know, he's way too dedicated. <laughs> then, oh, it was him and Alistair Black. Uh, I think uh, that were, was, he was kicking the shit out of or something. But then somehow him and AJ show up in Vince's office. And they play Vince's music. And they bust into the office fighting. I didn't see Beth. I don't know where Beth Zaza was because she doesn't let anybody in Vince's office, whether they're fighting or not. But he's sitting at his computer in the back of the fucking office. They fight for a while and then he turns around and then they see him. If somebody burst into my dead quiet office having a big brawl, I'd probably, it wouldn't take me, but like, a, I would say 1.2 seconds to turn around and say, what the fuck are you doing? But anyway, we mentioned Vince looks a hundred and I just, I was like, wow. He couldn't even say, get out. He just get out. And did he stand up straight from the desk? I don't know that he stood up straight there. I'm not sure. He looked better there than he did on the Triple H 25th anniversary spectacle. I don't know. But anyway, I just, he, he looks old. And But anyway, so he kicks him out of the office after they straighten his chairs up. They go back outside. They start casually talking about, well, I will, you were scared. No, you were scared. And then they start fighting again. So now the only two talents in this fucking whole fiasco that's worth a shit. And they pretty much just buried them as being stupid, fake, phony. Oh, I wrote this. My next note is capital punishment legal in Connecticut. That was just something I thought I would research to see if we could somehow penalize whoever thought of this shit. So, by the way, Vince's office is 
30 feet and one flight of stairs from the roof garden. But the women got there first, even though AJ and, and fucking Daniel Bryan were approximately 40, 44 feet away. So Nia Jax picks up one of those girls and was pressed her over her head, but lost her and fucking dropped her and then tried to throw her out of the ring. But the girl wasn't ready. She just kind of, it looked like she was tossing a mark out in Tulsa. Um, and I wrote all these people taking all these chances of getting hurt bad for this fucking shit that will be laughed at for years to come and remembered as the worst thing ever in wrestling until next week, probably. Um, I've pontificated that I don't know whether I hate the music worse or Asuka's incessant screeching. And now, by the way, now that when they got in the ring, having no announcers was a, sounded especially stupid. Um, and then I started to fucking fast forward because I was going to skip the rest of the girl shit, but the possum king showed up. So I thought I'd watch this and he climbs a ladder and the Oscar knocks him off. <laughs> Oscar beat the possum king to win the women's money in the bank match. She knocked him off the ladder and got the fucking case. So if, 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 if anybody could be buried any deeper Possum King right now is looking up at the treasure at the bottom of the money pit. Because a woman just beat him for the woman's money in the bank briefcase. Then the announcers come in and celebrate Asuka's win of a, quote, world title opportunity. Because Vince doesn't like the word shot. Although somebody should be shot for this. Uh, then Otis showed up. And couldn't figure out how to climb the ladder. I believed this. The first time all night, I believed in anything that Otis or any of the rest of these idiots did. Was when he couldn't figure out how to climb a ladder. And then it was a nice touch when he tried to broke the steps. Except the problem is that everybody knows those goddamn aluminum ladders, the steps don't break even if you're 350 fucking pounds. So that was phony too. Then I wrote, I hate Otis again exclamation point just to make sure that everybody knew then the possum king threw ray mysterio and alistair black off the roof we've said somebody was going to take a bump off the roof i guess they're are they dead now i don't know aj styles returned from being buried just recently well but that was in a movie this, this was a match. This, this, this was, was a, a match for the for the <laughs> uh, for a wwe title opportunity so if they get thrown off the roof and die they, they may really be dead. Is there a window cleaner at Titan Towers? Is there a potential that one of them landed on that? A, a, a window cleaner? One of them landed on him, possibly? Yeah, I mean, you know what? <laughs> you know what? They ought to open fucking <laughs> Raw, or they should have opened. They ought to open, open Raw tonight with a fucking last night graphic and a fucking zoom from a, a shot of the street with there's goddamn... Uh, fucking AJ and Daniel Bryan both, or not uh, AJ and Daniel Bryan, but Rey Mysterio and Aleister Black both hanging off a goddamn window washer's fucking scaffolding. But one of them's it's around their neck, and the other one their foot's tied in it. Help, get us down. <laughs> See, I, if you're gonna do shit, then do shit. Because this stuff was supposed to be funny, and it wasn't. And it was supposed to be wrestling, and it wasn't. And it was supposed to be entertaining, and it wasn't. So at least do something. But anyway. As I mentioned, I felt bad for AJ and Daniel Bryan having to lower themselves to be involved in this. This is the kind of thing in the old days when there was someplace else to go that guys would have heard this and say, yeah, okay, I'm just going to go to the car and get my bag. I'll see you later. And you would never see him again. And then finally, AJ and Possum got the case. But Elias from nowhere, who wasn't in this match but was hiding <clears throat> apparently in Titan Tower all this time for just such such this opportunity. Jumped the ring and hit Possum with the guitar. But AJ fumbled the case, and guess who caught it? Why, you don't have to guess because you were there. I saw it. I was waiting. I didn't know if you wanted me to actually jump in, but your favorite wrestler in this match got it. Otis. Otis is the wouldn't you know who won the pony. Otis. My boy Otis won the pony. So now Otis has a world title opportunity at an important WWE championship. 
Hold on one second. I don't know if I can tear this many pages at the no, same time. No, no, don't rip it. No. Fuck these fucking people. This is what's going to, the, the pandemic isn't going to kill, it, 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 the, the thing it's going to kill is wrestling. It ain't going to kill 50 million people around the world. It's just going to finish off wrestling because they've been looking for excuses to do this fucking shit for a long time now. And they got guys that are veterans. Some of them are just with a ridiculous need to be on television or some, some of them just can't handle their money and just have to have a check and just are whores for a paycheck, have no principles and no standards. And you got guys that don't know any better because they've been fucking taught that this kind of shit is okay because they're all entertainers. They're not wrestlers and they're actors and television performers. And you have just enough fucking people that are scared to not be with the times and to be left behind because they don't learn and evolve. Just enough of those small-minded, gutless, wimpy in, 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 in individuals to sanction this kind of shit because they're afraid the cool kids won't like them that people think that this is okay now and that this is what wrestling should be or that whatever they're doing over on TNT is what wrestling is supposed to be and there's no problem with this and this is not insulting or offensive or stupid. This is what we get. This is what we get. And and by the time that there's fans allowed back in the arenas, after they've seen shit like this, we won't really be able to tell. <clears throat> oh, there'll be people there. There'll be people there going to look at stupid people doing stupid shit. There won't be any wrestling fans in the building anymore because there won't be more wrestling. There barely is now anyway. There are a bunch of these fucking goofs that watch Tosh.0 or Jackass or stupid videos and think that wrestling is supposed to be a bunch of stupid people doing stupid shit that you're not supposed to take seriously. So the pandemic will do what... <laughs> All these other assholes, the wrestling artists and the doll wrestlers and the dick boys and the fucking invisible men and the fucking Hollywood producers of the WWE and all the rest of them that want to be anything other than what they are or supposed to be, which is wrestling and wrestlers. They've started it. The pandemic's going to finish it. And by the time that this whole thing is over, they'll say, well, we can just do all this. It's more fun. And wrestling is done officially. Here, I need something else to fucking tear. Were you uh, were yeah. you happy that the Elias Baron Corbin feud apparently has continued since WrestleMania? Oh, I don't know what I could have done without a, a fucking knowledge that they're going to continue their epic rivalry to only outshone by Bobo Brazil and the Sheik in terms of longevity and violence and hatred. Elias and Possum. All right, that was Money in the Bank. <clears throat> yeah. Now, after Money in the Bank, there was a documentary about the Undertaker. And I I'm well, I'm looking forward. I not on the channel I watched, but I'm going to be watching that on the WWE Network, and we're going to talk about that on the Experience because I've heard it's quite good, and I love me some Undertaker. But no, I got the pay per view, so I could watch this on real television. Because as we, as you recall, the only place that I cannot get the WWE Network is in my TV room on my TV because it's supposedly too old. Fucking nine years old. Goddamn, I've had underwear longer than that. But anyway, so I didn't see The Undertaker. I will watch that by, by the experience. But no, as soon as this thing was over with, and not a moment too soon, it said, thank you for getting this pay-per-view event, and I deleted it immediately. All right, the final match of the evening. What'd they call it? The Stadium Stampede or whatever. What was the name of the match? I think that it's, was it. I think. It's it's the inner circle. It's Jericho and his minions, Ortiz, Santana, Sammy Guevara, Jake Hager against the executive vice presidents. Uh, the uh, Road Warrior Buck, Balding Buck, Kenny Olivier, Hangman Page, and whichever personality, Matt Hardy, is occupying at this point in time, right? And I want to say one thing at the beginning of this. You made me promise two things. 
You made me promise that I wouldn't fast forward the first match or the last match. And that, I think, is why I hate you the most today, right now, because I couldn't fast forward this thing because I'd be breaking my goddamn promise to a friend. So I sat and I didn't watch it closely. Uh, and when I took my new toe knife out and tried to dig some fucking crud out from under my toenails at one point, but I didn't fast forward it. But instead of stadium stampede, they should have called it football field fuckery. That's what happens when you get a 10 jack offs that just want to have a giggle with their friends and go out and find a football field and play with each other and fucking goof off and some idiot surreptitiously videotapes it and broadcasts it to the world. A, a football field fuckery, sort of like Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies. Saturday Night Live was getting ideas off of this. And you know what? Now that I've said that, these fucking twats are going to think that's a good thing. At least the fucking Olivier and the fucking young fucks, they're going to, oh, that, well, that's a compliment. It's not. I promise you it's not. You couldn't imagine Kenny Olivier and Road Warrior and Balding Buck, the complete disdain I, I hold for you, personally and professionally. All right, so they're on the field. They've got pyro. They've got cheerleaders. They've got the football introductions. Of the inner circle's even wearing football outfits. The babyface team had some kind of, instead of doing everybody's entrance, they just did, you know, the same music, and they played some kind of fucking douchebag entrance music. I don't know what it was, but it sounded like some kind of fucking 80s porn soundtrack. Um, and then they just started fighting. They just started fighting around the fucking football field. There was a ring set up. They were in it for... Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> that's in the middle of all this foolishness at the start, Jericho and Balding Buck were in the ring doing a drop-down leapfrog spot. And they pretty much, otherwise than that, nobody used the fucking ring. Adam Page comes out late. He didn't come out with the rest of the team. He comes out riding a horse and chasing Sammy Guevara out of the fucking stadium. If one thing on this show got over with me uh, in the course of the night, it was Sammy Guevara's cardio. Otherwise, the whole thing was fucking hot garbage. It stinks like a man eating from Munda cheese in a septic tank of a slaughterhouse. So... They did a bunch of indie spots like they do in the ring in their backyard briefly at the start of this thing, and then they just all left it. I, I noticed again, the world's greatest wrestling artist, Kenny Olivier, is so fucking awkward and herky-jerky when he's not doing his dance routines. When he's not doing his fucking made-up wrestling moves and his snapdragon suplexes and his fucking petunia fucking double stomps or whatever when he's trying to fight or he's just trying to move somebody from one place to the next because he's never been properly trained and he's not a natural worker to begin with he's fucking awkward and herky-jerky and shit like this brings that out then they had the segment where a bunch of people dove onto sh off of shit onto groups of people who were standing there specifically to catch them um uh, road warrior buck Matt, who hurt himself diving off the goddamn stands on TV the other night, then backflipped off the goalpost onto some people that were standing there waiting for no reason other than to catch him. And then they all went up in the stands. Adam Page now is in the bowels of the building, so now they're trying to do, they're trying to imitate the money in a bank match by having different fucking scenes in this, different locations in this thing. I almost wanted to apologize to Vince Russo for saying that he produced the worst wrestling that I've ever seen or heard of after seeing this fucking thing. Because the, and this was, it was the worst aspects of Money in the Bank without the WWE production talent or budget. Um, it, it, it Page is in the bowels of the building, still riding the horse, looking for fucking Sammy Guevara, but he's just trotting. He's not like running. He's just walking ambling or whatever and he sees the sign for the bar so he gets off the horse and tells the horse to stay and goes to the bar in the middle of this fight meanwhile back at the ranch 
Santana and Ortiz are beating up Olivier, and they powerbombed him through a barricade. And then Hardy saves him with Santana and Ortiz's slapjack, which must be have a tennis ball in it because they repeatedly use it and nobody ever fucking suffers any ill effects from it. Um, then suddenly they came upon a swimming pool. They have a swimming pool at a football field. Why is this? Well, a lot of stadiums now because they want to get people with some money to come in and have a good time. You know, in Arizona, the Diamondbacks, their stadium, they have a swimming pool in the outfield. It's just, you know, another thing. What? Yeah. Who's going to go to swimming at a fucking football game? There are some total douchebags who go to these sporting events and don't give a shit about the game. It's a social gathering for them. Well, these two particular douchebags try to drown Matt Hardy in a swimming pool. And besides, the fucking timing of attempting to drown a wrestler, which I am not even going to go into because other people can go into that and it won't sound like Cornette just hates everything. And they should be going into that. But... What I was more offended by is that every time they dunk Matt Hardy in a swimming pool, he comes up as a different person dressed differently. And I'm supposed to fucking buy that. And at this point, and the announcers are calling it. And here is what I wrote. I promised Brian last I would not fast forward this, so I didn't. However, I will never watch this fucking shit again. Fuck all you people. I'm ashamed of Matt Hardy. I'm ashamed of Tony Schiavone. I'm ashamed of Jim Ross for not walking out on this. I'm ashamed of everybody involved in it. And it's the last time I'll be watching this fucking horse shit. And Tony Khan can take his sports inter- their sports-based presentation and shove it up his fucking ass. David Schultz should be there to personally fucking slap the fucking teetotal shit out of every motherfucker that lowered himself to be involved in this. And it wasn't over. So then Matt Hardy uh, took Pampiro Furpo Jr. to the big fucking Liberty Bell. There's a bell there, I don't know why. And he rang the bell on the guy's head and the guy went into convulsions. So then he duct taped him into a wheelchair and then threw Santana into the ice machine. Did they ever explain how Santana got out of the ice machine? I never saw a shot of him getting out of the ice machine. I don't recall a explanation. So then meanwhile, Jake Hager, one of the other blue chip players that they could have made something out of until he, they made him a goofy, phony, fake fighter. And one of the boys that just stands around with a stupid look on his face all the time and forever gets goddamn embarrassed. Hager goes looking for Paige and sees the horse. And sees the sign for the bar. So he goes to the bar. They sit down. They have a fucking drink with each other. And then suddenly get in a big schmoz. And Paige does a backflip off of a bar and a crossbody off a pool table. And that's where I wrote, these guys are taking big chances of getting hurt just to make the wrestling business look stupid and phony and fucking give a fucking billionaire's little fucking spoiled kid a giggle. So then... Olivier shows up and he and Paige break five liquor bottles over Jake Hager's head and he never goes down and they were fake bottles. And then Olivier gives Jake Hager his little fucking sissy leaping fucking knee and he didn't go down. So then Olivier bends over and Paige does the fucking vault over him and gives Hager the buckshot lariat over the bar. Then, when the dangerous MMA fighter has been left behind the bar like a sack of shit, Paige and Olivier have a drink with each other. However, Paige has a shot and Olivier has a glass of milk to make sure that we know that Kenny Olivier is the biggest nerd fucking pussy on the face of the planet Earth in real life, as well as on his television program, where he's supposed to be a fucking superstar. Then they did a spot where Sammy Guevara and Road Warrior Buck did endless gymnastics on the fucking football field. 
And when they got to the end of it, the referee threw a flag on Road Warrior Buck for excessive celebration, and he super kicked the referee. Just to make sure we've gone three minutes or so, somebody might be trying to take this seriously again. Let's make sure they don't. Uh, Jericho's over yelling at Balding Buck on a megaphone, so Balding Buck pelted him with footballs. Jericho hit his finish, Judas Elbow, on the mascot of the football team. And then Chris Jericho, former WWE champion, biggest star in this company, used a baseball bat on Balding Buck and got a two count. So Chris Jericho can't beat a fucking guy that looks like a junior high school fucking gymnast with a baseball bat. But then he challenged the referee's call, and is this a thing they do in football now? He and the referee, Aubrey, who now has completely no credibility whatsoever and is just as meaningless as the rest of them, they went into a tent to talk about it? This is what they do in football now? I don't really watch football much. I, I don't tell you. Baseball is where it's at. Well, I don't want to watch anything related to anything that happens on a football field. If there's porn shot on a football field, I don't want to I don't want to see fucking on a football field anymore. I don't want to see anything that takes place on a football field after this fucking match. Uh so then Balding Buck went all the way to the top of the stadium and ran down the stairs for no reason, like he's getting up a big head of steam, but he's running down stadium stairs. He can't get out of control. He can't go full speed. And then when he gets to the bottom of the stairs, he stops and jumps up on the rail and then jumped off and splashed Jericho through a table. So the running was just for nothing because he's an idiot. And then as Jericho is laying there, Adam Page ran the line marker over him, straight up the middle of him from his crotch over his face. Chris, it's been nice knowing you, but fuck you too. What the fuck? Can you not exercise any goddamn control over these fucking idiots, or do you just not care? Are you just taking this fucking goof's money, and you want to be a rock star so you don't care about the wrestling business anymore? It's gone. There's no reason to fucking try anymore. Is that what it is? He wants to fit in with them. That's what it is. Well, I'm sick of everybody wanting to fit in because you know what you do when you fit in? You become one of the fucking crowd. Nobody gives a shit about you. But I'm so, I, I never want to see any of these people ever again, personally or professionally. I don't, this reminds me of when I fucking said good things about Mance Warner in MLW. Yeah, he could talk and he had a different kind of gimmick and he stood out. And then he, I see him on the internet having a match with the invisible man. And I went up to him at the Charlotte Fan Fest. I said, oh, the Invisible Man returns. I said, what the fuck are you doing? Well, I said, no, you have talent. You didn't need to do that. Now I cannot defend you. I cannot say anything good about you ever again. Not that you care, maybe. I don't care whether you care. But still, I told him he's a fucking moron for doing that. They're all fucking morons for doing this. I'm disappointed in all of them. I don't want to see him personally again because I'd have to tell him. I don't want to see him professionally again because I don't want to see anybody involved in this ever again. And then Guevara was laying on the sprinklers when they came on. So that woke him up. And they chase him in a golf cart into the stands. And finally, Kenny Olivier gave Sammy Guevara his one-winged fairy move off the stands, it's the one-winged Tinkerbell, folks. Off the stands, onto what appeared to me, unless I'm missing something again, Brian, what appeared to me to be an airbag crash pad that they didn't even try to disguise that they landed on, and the announcers had to go, oh my God, look at the height. Yeah, and they landed in fucking an airbag. Was that what I was looking at? Yes. They didn't try to hide it. And one, two, three. Fuck all of you. Fuck you if you've been my friend. Fuck you if you've been my enemy. There are some things that you have to take a stand on and that are more important than goddamn taking a paycheck. That anybody involved in this did not walk out I'm talking about the announcers, I'm talking about the referees, I'm talking about the participants, I'm talking about the camera crew. 
for fuck's sake, why didn't one of the fucking technical people in the truck say, we're not going to fucking shoot this for all of y'all's sake? This, if this is what wrestling is now, it needs to die. Leave it alone and let it go. If you can't bring it back and you're just going to fucking piss on the fucking rotting corpse, let it go. Find something else to do with your fucking lives, like I have, because I'm too embarrassed to be involved with these people or this industry because of shit like this. I just slapped my own self in the face. <laughs> and I did it again. You don't have to do that, Jim. I'm going to beat my own self up. <laughs> Fucking assholes. So, you can't... I'm not going to tear this. I'm going to set fire to it. Can you hear flames over the microphone? We can't. Just hold on to that. Maybe we can find something productive to do with your notes. No, I'm setting, I'm setting fire to this shit. I'm don't, set right here in the goddamn floor of the office. No, don't do it in your office. Okay, <laughs> where is a god? I need some. There's matches. so much stuff in there we can't have burned. Minute, don't on. do it there. I'm gonna burn it. Will you stop? I'm gonna. I'm rubbing two fucking sharpies together on this thing. Well, that's not gonna do it. I don't think that's yeah. gonna do it. All right. You know what you need, don't you? What do you have any final thoughts about the stadium extravaganza? Well, you uh, certainly captured a lot of thoughts in your review. I'll say that I thought it was one of the biggest pieces of garbage I've ever seen on a professional wrestling broadcast. Although, again, this is sports entertainment, not professional wrestling. This is not sports-based wrestling. This isn't sports entertainment because there would have to be sports and there would have to be entertainment. You know what? This is this is sports entertainment the same way Vince does it. I, I, these guys, It's another version of Vince McMahon's style of wrestling. And... I think you uh, didn't hit the commentators as hard as I would have hit them because they're just laughing. What, saying, saying fuck y'all, you should have walked out is not hitting them hard enough? The, the whole show, just they're chucking it up and having a great time laughing about things with each other. Jim Ross is completely yeah. checked out. He's Yeah, he well, why wouldn't you? And, you know, Tony, Tony was away from the business for 20 years. So I was figuring I was giving him a pass when he would let him go. Wow, this is great because I was thinking, well, he actually thinks this is great because he doesn't know what's changed or what's going on. And he thinks now this is acceptable because he was away for a while, but nobody could ever that was ever a wrestling fan or cared about the business could think any of this was acceptable. And he's still going, wow, it's great. So he's just taking the fucking check. And let's face it. You know, Jim Ross knows I haven't talked to him. After this, probably won't talk to him for a while after this. But he knows this is garbage. Well, he's not going to say anything until after he stops getting paid by Tony Khan. We know how well, this works. Well, you know what? And it, it, there's two ways to look at this. He signed to do a job, so he's going to do the fucking job, and he's not going to fucking come out and just bury the shit on the air. There's that. That's being professional. Or there's being professional enough to go, you know what? I'm not going to ruin my goddamn legacy and my standing as the greatest announcer of the modern era by being remembered for calling this fucking horse drivel and he should go home and fucking apply his many talents to doing his own thing instead of fucking letting these people drag him into the goddamn cesspool fuck you know it's so much of the reaction on social media that i saw was extremely positive people loving this match people saying that it was nice to be able to have some fun and just laugh. And I think there's the big divide is that there are a lot of fans who just want to get into the personalities of the wrestlers and then see them do wacky things in a match or in a well, yeah, spectacle that's, like this. That's what we've got left because that, well, all that, the, that, uh, the other ones are gone. They've run them off with all the wacky shit. You know, no one ever just turns away from wrestling. I, I, I truly believe. You know, so many of the listeners I have on 605, so many of the Cornet listeners are people who don't watch wrestling anymore, but they still want to hear wrestling talk. They still want to follow the business. They just don't want to watch the business. Well, and they watch YouTube and they watch the, and they buy the old DVDs and they watch the, the good stuff. And you know, yeah. Why couldn't they give them some more of the good stuff that they have to pay more money for that's brand new that they haven't seen? Because because they can't, because you have people like this 
that think that this is what people want to fucking see and are blinded by the fact there's a fucking audience for anything, as we've mentioned. People will watch tapes of people's balls being nailed to a step stool. But there were so many millions more when we were serious about this shit and everybody didn't know what the fuck was going on or know how or whatever, and we acted like we cared. Now nobody acts like they care. They just jack off, and it's become a goddamn comedy show to be watched like America's Funniest Videos or Tosh.0. Oh, Oh, look, they're going to do something else stupid. Fuck. Like I said earlier, AEW's numbers are not that much greater than where ours are right now. There's a big audience that doesn't want this. There's a big audience that wants something different. There are people who watch that show just to hear you tear it down. Are you trying? Well, that's why, and that's the only reason I'm doing this, believe me, and this will be the last time I do this fucking thing after this. I don't want to ever see any of these people again, but I only did it because everybody wants me to fucking do it because I speak for them and how insulted they are and how fucking offended they are as wrestling fans by this shit. But for fuck's sake, just uh, have some pride, people. Just turn around and walk away rather than being remembered like this. I'm not talking about the Bucks and Olivier and those fucks. That's this the only way they'll ever be known. I'm talking about the people who have actually had success in wrestling and are ruining their fucking legacies with this goddamn being a part of this. But let me correct you. The Bucks and Omega have had success in wrestling. A success with their style of entertainment like this. The problem is, guys like Jericho, want to do that because they want to fit in with a younger audience than what try the- to go the other way, which is let me teach you guys some of the things you're not doing. Again, these are the guys that reject any not- older voice that tells them anything. They think they're the only ones who know anything. They're going to reject any any principles the industry ever had and just do their own thing and lots of high spots and stand around and catch me and all this shit. The problem is you have a lot of people that are saying, hey, let's try to fit in with them and their crowd as opposed to Let's try to elevate things. Let's try to build a crowd that's bigger than this. And uh, I thought this whole event was embarrassing. I must but, uh, just your, real quick, by the way, it's not a question of, 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 of wanting to fit in with the younger people. It's wanting to fit in with the stupid people. Age has nothing to do. I talk to 20-something-year-old people or hear from 20-something-year-old people on Twitter, on emails all the time and say, this is fucking stupid. Why can't they be serious? Well, when I said younger people, I'm specifically saying someone, let's say, who's in their mid-40s, early 50s, who sees something happening with younger people in the business, like the Bucks and Omega, and think, you know what, I want to find a way to get with that. I think that's what's happening right now. Um, I thought this this was an embarrassment. I thought the whole event was bad. I heard people said it was one of the greatest pay-per-views of all time, and there's the divide. <laughs> there's the fucking divide. There are people who think this is okay. There are people who have this exact spectacle had been on a WWE show would have shit on it, but for lack of a better term, and excuse me, uh, pardon the pun, whatever you want to say here, there's a cult of personality around the Young Bucks and Omega and AEW so that they have a free pass for anything they do, but if the same thing was done by WWE or Vince McMahon, it would be shit on, rightfully rightfully so. You know, I killed Money in the Bank, I killed this, awful, I think Tony Khan, you know, one of the big problems at AEW is there's no leadership. You have a guy that wants to drink with the wrestlers and hang yeah. out with the wrestlers. He may not be as pathetic as Gordon Scazzari ended up being. He may not be completely clueless like Dixie Carter was, but it's the same. He, he may not end up with Coke and hookers like Herb Abrams did. <laughs> no. But it's the same and thing. And he has unlimited capital, but he doesn't know any better. He doesn't know any better. I, I don't want to hear any more that, oh, he loves Mid-South Wrestling or, oh, he used to collect Memphis wrestling tapes. Oh, for fuck's he sake. He doesn't know any better. So after this whole thing, you know what? I had such a throbbing, massive headache. I decided to take some of my Omax CryoFreeze CBD pain relief roll-on and rub it all over my fucking head. And it did make my head feel better. I still couldn't forget the anguished memories of this... Uh, horrible affliction that i just watched but my head did feel better our next question jim sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from christian my name is christian 
I'm from. Well, well, sounds like a good name for you there. Is it Staunton, Virginia? Do you know this town? Stanton, Stanton, Virginia. Stanton, Virginia. My dad and I are big fans of the drive through and I wanted to throw this your way. A friend of mine is a member of a Facebook group of people who discuss Marvin Ward <laughs> and the money he owes all of them. <laughs> Marvin Ward is the man that screwed The Undertaker and Kane out of money and wanted you to come to Waynesboro, Virginia last year. Oh, yes, yes. Only to not follow up with you. My friend sent me screenshots where Marvin is apparently coming back under a new alias, oh, Austin no. Douglas Ward. Oh, no. This, however, is not all because he sent another screenshot saying Marvin is trying to get the rights to Smoky Mountain Wrestling <laughs> and start running shows again. Your thoughts? And let me click on this. He <laughs> sent two links. Uh, this is from one of the pages. Just found out he legally changed his name to Austin Douglas Ward. Just found out from a reliable source that during the whole Kane Undertaker debacle that Marvin purchased him a new car and house. I don't know who him would be. No, himself. Oh, himself. I yes. was also told he was going to try and get the rights to Smoky Mountain Wrestling and start running shows again. So, Well, well good luck to him with that because he'll be dealing with Vince's legal department. But, um, no, Marvin Ward's this fucking con man. That, uh, I've known him for... 25 years we actually first ran across him he was supposed to promote smoky mountain wrestling events in waynesboro and maybe in stanton but two towns up there on a weekend he had been bugging us it's his hometown he wanted to run shows everything we booked him with two cards and then he had run a show the month before and he brought in abdullah the butcher and he lost too much money and his father wouldn't let him have any more money to run shows so he canceled on us and we had to pay the fucking guys because we had booked them and there was no way to redo it at the time. So anyway, that was in 1994. He was an idiot then. Then he came back for a while. He was running shows up there that, that would sell out these big 1500 seat, 2000 seat uh, high school gyms because basketball's big up there. And but he, you know, he had great local promotion because he was from there and he knew everybody and et cetera, et cetera. But then he'd always do something where he'd overreach himself, do something foolish, owe a bunch of people money and have to go away for long periods of time. And I can't recite it chapter and verse because it's been incessant. He'll 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 resurface somewhere. He'll run a couple of shows that fucking work out. Then he'll try to run a big one, take a bunch of fucking money or fuck up one, some at one point. People were looking for him because he had promised people they were going to China. And I either took China's money or somebody that was a middleman and disappeared. He's the one that did that fucking ridiculous pay-per-view from Waynesboro, Virginia, uh, AWE, Awesome Wrestling Entertainment, that Kevin Nash and Ricky Morton supposedly had a shoot fight on, supposedly. Uh, he, You know, it, it's just, it never ends with this fucking guy. And he had booked me, I told the story on the show here, but I'll tell it briefly. I was at a comic book convention here in Louisville about a year and a half ago, setting up my booth that I see Marvin and some of his guys, right? And somebody told me, yeah, Marvin's booked The Undertaker to come and do an appearance in Waynesboro. He's given him 50 grand. And I said, well, hell, tell him I'll come to Waynesboro for five grand as a joke, right? Here comes Marvin Ward. Will you, will you come? Will you come? I said, for five grand? Yeah, if you really, I'll come. So he books me on another show that he's going to have in Waynesboro for five grand with the Rock and Roll Express. I said, okay, I'll believe this when I see it. And sure enough, wouldn't you know who won the pony? He sold a bunch of tickets to see Undertaker and Kane, but not enough to cover the expense, allegedly. Uh, canceled that show. To called me and told me that he was still going to run the other show that I was on until he got a letter from the fire department there in Waynesboro saying that because of the renovations going on to the, to the gym, they couldn't have any wrestling shows until the fire department said, okay. And then nobody ever heard from him again. And people still try to get their money back off that undertaker and Kane thing, including Kane who he gave a bad check to. Uh, so yeah. And so if he's changed his name, he, the problem is he keeps forgetting to change the ward part because <laughs> the ward part is the part that's mud in that part of the country and in the wrestling business, because everybody now knows he's a goof and an idiot and a crook. But that, 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 I mean, he's always been an idiot all his life. He's a country bumpkin. He reminds me, he's like the Virginia version of fucking Ernest T. Bass down there in Knoxville. 
but he was wrestler. He was a wrestler for a while. Doug Gibson. Um, Doug Gibson. So that's what the name he was using when we had him book those shows in Smoky Mountain. And he came down to do promos for him. And we clued Robert Gibson in, and he comes out because Doug's a baby face and starts going, yeah, that's right. And he starts cutting his promo, Doug Gibson wrestling somebody in fucking Waynesboro. Roger and he, Anderson. Roger Anderson. There you go. And then, he, then you've seen this, you asshole. Then he walks off, and then Robert Gibson walks in and says, hey, who's that asshole calling himself Gibson? He ain't related to me. <laughs> ah, it was funny he had to be there. Anyway, yes, he needs to change the ward part. He you know, could keep Marvin or Doug <laughs> or Rastus or Festus or Cletus or Kefauver or whatever. He just needs to change the ward part. The last time we heard about him, I believe, was that AEW show that Steven sat in the front row. It turned out that Marvin Ward was like two seats over from him. <laughs> and people spotted him there in the front row. And probably started asking him for money on the spot. You know, when I was 14, the first time I went to Fan Week, the last night in Morristown, where Rob Moore booked that King of the, or gave you the idea for that King of the Mountain tournament, that was the night we did the training session where several of the fans got in the ring with Brian Hildebrand and Brian Logan. And Chris Jericho was like the referee slash instructor, although he was injured with his arm. He couldn't do much. And, you know, we learned a few basic moves and then had a little bit of a match. No fans there, by the way, for anyone listening. It was a right, closed-door yeah. thing for, you know, the smart fans from out of town that weren't coming back. All of a sudden, in the middle of the match, I get pulled off the apron and thrown into the post. <laughs> and I go with it. You know, I'm having fun. I'm a kid doing this. It was Doug Gibson who was there. Oh, I guess it was, it was his ring, I think, maybe. And <laughs> he did that. And then after it was over, Dave Lane and Tim Knoll, who were fans from Virginia, Great guys. Dave Lane's still out there. I know he listens to the show. Really great guy. Pull me aside that like, you know, that guy's a piece of crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> like they were already hip to like what a con man he was in 94 before anyone was. They knew it right away. That was the first memory I have of him. <laughs> oh, God. As a matter of fact, years after that, because when he canceled those shows, I fucking called up and he talked to his dad on the phone. He wouldn't get on the phone. He said, well, he's just lost too much money. I said, you tell him if your jack-off son doesn't quit playing around in the wrestling business, he's going to lose more than money because we do this for a living and we take it seriously. And he's lost all this talent a fucking weekend of work and he's lost me a goddamn weekend of fucking revenue. And if we ever see him again, he's going to end up in a fucking hospital. I just want you to know that because your son's a fucking goofy. He got hot at me. So I'm not going to let anybody talk to me that way. I said, you just did. Because what are you going to do about it? You come down here and I'll say it to your fucking face, you fat country fuck. So <laughs> that was 1994. <laughs> In 2000, I think it was, when did the Marine come out with John Cena? Oh, geez. 2007, 2008? Yeah, in that range, yeah. The idiot had come back and was running those shows again that were drawing pretty good. And Dennis Condry called me and said, Marvin Ward wants to bring you to Virginia. I said, what? He said, he really is running these shows and he's doing good business, but he wants to bring you in here. So Marvin Ward paid me $1,500 to come to his show, plus another $1,500 to come in a day before and tell him how to run his fucking wrestling promotion. <laughs> And then he took us all to the Marine that night afterwards and took us all to the movies. <laughs> so I got $3,000 for to walk to the ring with the Midnight Express on his show and to tell him that everything he was doing was wrong. And here's how you really do it. And he didn't do anything. And he they were looking for him moments later. And he was underground again. Was $3,000 enough money to make you sit through the Marine? Well, Stace was with me and, you know, she wanted to see it. And I was like, all right. And we were, you know, we went to the movies with the Midnight Express. And Is it weird? And sat down the fucking way. Is it weird for you seeing like Cena, someone who you knew you had an OVW when he first got started to see him on the big screen in a movie theater? Is it at all weird? Uh, yeah, it kind of was back then. I mean, you know, it, it was... <laughs> I don't want to knock John when I say this, but it was even weirder seeing rock in actual movies that really fucking drew <laughs> and it's a big budget of shit. I mean, you know, cause that was the, one of the WWE studios movies. And, and that's what it was the joke at the time we watched the movie. I said, my God, 
the same people wrote this fucking show, wrote this movie as write their TV show. Whenever they can't figure something out, they just blow something up. It was the same thing, but I, it was a big shock seeing rock in actual Hollywood motion pictures that grossed hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes, that was kind of cool. And I don't want to, I don't even make mention of like, you know, hurting anybody's feelings or anything on a positive show, but I, I get I, in a cheerful way and in a non aggressive way, we, we do have to acknowledge that apparently we did. Now we've hurt Chris Jericho's feelings. When we critiqued the, the football field fuckery, I mean the, the stadium stampede event. And I've known Chris for a long time and I didn't know actually his feelings were that sensitive, but but apparently, and I don't know much about this is a late breaking story. I don't know much about this because I've been I've been positively serving the fine Cornets Collectibles customers over the last 24 hours or so. And I am I was only on Twitter briefly. I just saw the initial clip where it was it, it, but he said anybody that didn't like the stadium stampede match had no soul. Just no soul. Is that is that what he said? That was part of what he said. He said, I, I really I, didn't hear anymore. I have some quotes here. Let me read this. Oh, you, oh you, ha- you are prepared here for this. Oh, I figured this may come up. Yes. Well, yeah, we were going to be positive. And I don't think there's any reason not to be positive about this. We positively did not like that match. But let's get uh, these quotes here. I'll tell you this right now. There's some people that are burying this match. Jim Cornette hated it. If you don't like this match, then you don't have a soul. Because this was one of the most entertaining things that you can see. And if you're talking about a Jim Cornette, he booked a segment where I put his face in cake in 1994. This is the 2020 version of sticking someone's face in a cake. This is the style of wrestling that I love. We have everything in there. If you didn't like it, excuse me, if you didn't like that, then you don't like wrestling. Because this is what the essence of wrestling is which is entertainment, but all sides of the coin. And I was very proud of it. And like I said, one of my favorite things I've ever done. When your, when your old friends suddenly lose their rabbit ass minds, what do you do, Brian? It, 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 (laughs) searching for a way to positively respond to the positively ridiculous idea that anything about that was the essence of wrestling. The people that I have heard from in a positive fashion to, to go to the people that I've felt positively about people are fucking saying, what the fuck? The same thing I said, I don't ever want to see wrestling anymore. If this is what they've turned it into. The late night television, you know, Benny Hill sketch, um, the fucking Friday. It's not even Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live did several wrestling sketches, and with with stars in them, at least you had star power. Uh, more like Fridays when they did a wrestling sketch on ABC late nights. Look it up, folks. Google it. It didn't last long, but late night comedy show sketches about wrestling are what we've been reduced to, and. The people that I hear from who apparently have no souls are offended because they actually have loved wrestling for a long time until it quit being fucking wrestling. So between Twitter and email and the, uh, the, the folks that we have heard from on all forms of social media that have uh, the comments on YouTube that have said, what the fuck, just what the fuck? If, if it was South Park, they'd be. I mean, I mean, come on. This is not remotely anything to do with professional wrestling. They've completely lost the plot, and everybody thinks they're a fucking comedian now and an entertainer. That's the problem. If wrestling was always entertainment in the same way that football or boxing or UFC or fucking whatever the fuck, any sport is entertainment, but it doesn't have to be silly, stupid, and hokey. It doesn't have to be fake and contrived and phony and amateurish and juvenile. You don't have to make mockery of it and piss on it when people that, for all these years, that did it right fucking blazed a trail for you to come in and fucking vomit in its fucking face. 
So positively, I hate that we hurt Chris's feelings, but on the negative side, there are literally millions of soulless people out there. The zombie apocalypse has happened, and we didn't know it. Apparently, they just they, your skin doesn't rot, but your soul is left because all the people we've heard have said, this is why we can't watch this fucking shit now. We watch wrestling all our life. It's fucking offensive. It's a joke. It's just not even worth our fucking time because it's all just fucking silly. That's what they say, positively. But who are we? We have no souls. Well, you know, the funny thing, too, is everyone always says, well, Jim Cornette, if you don't like what he likes and what he thinks wrestling should be, then he castrates you. Then he goes after you. Meanwhile, Jericho's saying, if you didn't like it, you don't like wrestling. If you didn't like it, you don't have a soul. If I don't like your brand of comedy, I don't have a soul? Come on. Most of and, and and the problem is once again the people that like wrestling are the people that didn't like that. It's only the the only people that liked that were the people that like what they have turned wrestling into. If you never bothered to look up the tapes or weren't old enough to see it done properly or just don't give a shit. But if, for people who have liked wrestling, this is the exact thing that has driven them away from liking fucking wrestling, because there ain't no wrestling anymore. It's a bunch of fucking jack-offs, fucking goddamn goof suits, t- playing slap-ass and tickle taint with their fucking friends, and it's there's no reason to watch it. It's an al- but anyway... It's an alternate version of Vince McMahon's style of wrestling, and I didn't like that, and I don't like that, typically, and I don't like this. However, I love professional wrestling. Sorry, Chris, that doesn't fit your agenda. Sorry that you always have to latch on to anything that's happening and try to make it so that it's acceptable or try to make it acceptable. This guy failed at comedy. Now he's telling me that I don't like his comedy match. I have no soul and I don't like wrestling. Maybe you don't like wrestling, Chris. Maybe the problem is you've tried to branch out from wrestling and it's never worked and now you're still doing wrestling and you don't like wrestling for what it actually is. Maybe that's the problem. Brian, we're not being positive. I'm very positive. I'm very, very positive. You're you're absolutely positive that you mean exactly what you just said. I have not dropped the F word or anything else, but Chris Jericho stuck in an endless midlife crisis. And because of that, everyone who doesn't like the comedy show he just did. And and I think that was, what was that uh, in the back of the car? The comedy bus. Is this like a comedy bus? The comedy bus. Your comedy bus sucks. I don't like it. I like professional wrestling. If you don't like this, you don't like wrestling. Get get out of here. You don't like wrestling. You tried to make it in Hollywood. That didn't work. You tried to make it in comedy. That didn't work. Your band's a joke. You're back doing wrestling. And you just wish you could be an entertainer. I really like Judas. After I heard that song, I really fucking like it. I think it's a good tune except for his vocals. And I'm not even saying that (laughs) to Chris Jericho. He just, he can't sing. He sounds like Chris Jericho singing, and it's just, it's a parody of hairband music. It's not good. It's not good. There's a reason why rock and roll's in the toilet, like wrestling's in the toilet. Um, But don't you remember, don't you remember that hot angle that drew that fucking mega fucking gate at the stadium at WrestleMania and on pay-per-view when they laid Stone Cold Steve Austin down and took a line marker on a football field and p- drew a line on him from his fucking balls to his fucking nose. Don't you remember that? No, of course not. Of course not. And look, Chris Jericho, in his best moments, is an exceptional professional wrestler. He may not be able to cut in any more physically in the ring, but he's an older guy. He's not physically where he was 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Well, none of us but are. Gets, no, but, but I'm saying he gets... In his best moments, he gets how to present himself on TV, how to come across, but he also is just filled with stupid ideas and has obviously stupid defenses to justify him. This is the same guy that just got into a fight with a drone. So, I mean, give me a I'm, break. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find a comeback because I've always liked Chris, but I, he did take, he got in a fight and got mad at, personally, mad at a drone and... He got the line drone on him and and everything. And I, I this is what I, yeah, you have liquid ever, soul. I have soul. You have liquid soul. There's a big no, difference. But does everybody wonder why I'm so disappointed in the whole wrestling business when it would people I've known this long and always enjoyed their their work and them as people suddenly are out there fucking pulling their pants down and fucking 
you know, uh, fucking squirting the goddamn ketchup out their ass on French fries. It's goddamn ludicrous. And that's why I'm so disappointed. That's why I apparently I won't get my fucking fifth decade because right now I don't ever intend being on a fucking professional wrestling show again. It's goddamn embarrassing. You never know what to do. Two or three years ago, I was asking people, well, you're not going to book the invisible man. Everybody's serious, right? No dance routines. Well, if it, just those two questions right now would eliminate half the fucking companies on the planet. So it, it just it's it's disheartening. But I'm trying to be positive, Brian. That's right. Technically, it is sports based wrestling. If it's on a football field, I guess, right? Technically, sports based. <sighs> Now, let me just say here at the top that one of the reasons why this episode was delayed a day is that we've had very busy weeks. You know, we hate yes. to deprive the listeners of the shows, but we've had very busy weeks. And with that busyness, I know you haven't paid very close attention to social media and a lot of the things happening. So over the past couple of days, I have not. I tweet generally when I'm printing orders out very early in the morning and then I might come back at night to check things, but I've been uh, uh, incommunicado for a few days for most things. I guess I'll ask you about this. Have you heard about Ryback, the former Ryback? I don't know if he's still Ryback making comments about you. I have not now. Let me ask uh, one of these questions. This is and, and Ryback, wasn't Ryback the guy that when he left the WWF, he was pissed because he said everybody on the card should get paid the same from the first match to the main event because the we're all contributing to the show. Or was that him? You know what? Now that you say that, that does sound right. I haven't thought about that in a while. Yeah, that may that, have that, been him because I don't know this fucking guy. So and I haven't actually I I haven't seen him wrestle, but I heard CM Punk wasn't fond of it, of his work. That's all I really know. This question was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from William Cahill in Glasgow, Scotland. I caught a segment on Ryback's podcast. Well, boy, does everyone have a podcast now? I'm pretty sure. Well, you know, once it it's successful for somebody like us, everybody's got to jump on the band. I don't mind people riding on the bandwagon. I wish they'd quit dragging their feet. I can't get everybody over at once. I watched a segment of Ryback's show where he and his co-host basically berate you for 13 minutes. Over your comments on Becky Lynch, basically Ryback is telling us that you make these comments and cause controversy for attention and to make money. He goes on to say that your fan base basically thrive on this, in parentheses it says, so insulting me indirectly, speaks about you being misogynistic, about how Brian and yourself are a gimmick to get views and attention and speak about how you're immature. He also mentions that Santino. <laughs> so he, so he's a, he's a, he's a friend of a lot of my my favorite people. Let me rephrase that. He also mentions Santino and how someone is going to eventually beat the fuck out of you, <clears throat> and how you keep your head down around other talent. And then it says in parentheses, even though he does mention that you confronted Santino, so that's conflicting. I, they also bring up shit stain momentarily for someone who doesn't care less about you, and that's a quote. He certainly does seem to know an awful lot about you and clearly doesn't mind speaking about you on the air. What are your thoughts on this complete idiot, Jim? <laughs> have you ever had any extended interaction with him? And then I have another quote here from uh, these comments that I thought was funny, where he says, there's a direct quote, people listen to what Jim's going to insult this week. And he's done it with me on things that weren't even true. And then it says one of the examples, he's just a big steroid idiot. <laughs> what oh oh i said that about him i guess you said oh, okay. about him at some point. That, that sounds kind of bland for me doesn't it uh, I, I i bet it was probably more complicated than that but he just couldn't retain it so I, he just that's the he culled that out of it as a summation i wish him nothing but love and happiness i hope he could find peace in his life because he just comes off like the most miserable human being on the existence of the planet uh, and I would hate to personally go the road of just talking shit about everyone to get people to listen to me. I think that is just lowbrow. It's not needed. So he basically says that we're just doing a show here. We're just making up yeah. and not really saying what we think here on the program. We're just making this up. These people are not really doing these things that we're talking about. We're just making it all up. I, I first of all, I, <sighs> I'm trying to think even at a fan fest or a convention or whatever, 
I've never met this guy. I don't think I've, as I said, I don't think I've ever seen him wrestle because he was not, was he part of any of our WWE viewing experiments? No, he already been, he's been gone since then, right? He's been gone for a while from there. I've heard he was the guy that CM Punk said he almost killed him and he was a reckless twat. I've heard he was the guy that we mentioned this on the show, which is probably where I did the fucking promo that got him pissed at me, where he said that he thought everybody on the card from first match to last because you'd get paid the same thing because they're all contributing to the show. And we immediately shot that down because besides the fact that it's ridiculous in wrestling, you don't pay the fucking stunt man that doubles in fucking scene two the same thing as goddamn Bruce Willis in Die Hard. So he's just a fucking idiot. He's, and maybe the steroids rattled his fucking brain. Um, but I can't really rebut him as a person because I know nothing about him to criticize and knock and insult in a creative way. He is right that people listen to the show to hear me take the piss out of shit. But the problem is, like a lot of these people, either to make them feel better about themselves or their friends that I knock or whatever, they put the cart before the horse. They think that I say these things to get people to listen. Unfortunately, it's the other way around, Fatback. That should be his name from now on, Fatback. I want some Fatback. Lamont, give me some Fatback and Ripple. Or give me some champagne and ripple. They call it sham pipple. Or eggnog and ripple. They call it egg nipple. I used to love Sanford and Son. But anyway, fat back. <laughs> I say these things because it's my opinion and people listen to them because I'm the only one that's not full of shit. And I'm sorry if you think that I'm so misogynistic because you probably are friends of Becky. I guess they work together. So maybe he's one of these people. Oh, he shouldn't have said that. I don't give a fuck. And I don't know who, uh, don't know anything about right back. Or, or how to respond to him in a creative fashion. But they just can't get over the fact that people think these things about them and their fucking efforts in this business and that somebody actually expresses an honest opinion. So they always oh, just saying that shit so people will listen to him. No, people listen to me because I say this shit because that's the way I really feel. I could give a fuck whether any of y'all like me or not. I could give a fuck whether y'all drop over, turn blue, and burst into flames. Does not matter to me. I'm done trying to make excuses for people, as I said last week on the program. I put one guy over. I say, oh, this guy's got some talent. I turn on the fucking internet the next week. He's working with the Invisible Man. So I'm not going to say anything good about anybody else from now on, actually, because it makes me look bad when they do something stupid. But no, fat back. I don't make shit up. I see it and I respond to it. If you don't like what I have to say, I hate that because I'm trying to be positive. But of all the people that ain't going to beat the fuck out of me, you're one of them. Or if you want to, then what's that phrase I've heard? I'm going to see how much money you got, motherfucker. <laughs> Good God. Eddie, I keep my head down around. The- He's never been around me. I've said. <laughs> I mean, I think people have told stories about some of the things I've said to people. I don't go just in trying to pick fucking fights with people. But if I see somebody that I've been meaning to say something to for a while, chances are I'm going to say it to them. That has happened many times in the past. But I try to get along and be positive. If I go somewhere just because there's some asswipe that is a piece of shit on the fucking second match, I'm not going to disrupt the whole goddamn show to tell him but I don't shy away from controversy. All right. Well, there's the attention you were seeking right back. Let's get another question it's, here. It's fat back, fat back, it's fat back, bareback. No, I think it's just fat back. All right. Well, our next question was sent in the corny drive through. Cause Gmail. you know, them steroids, them steroids, they give you a problem sometimes with going bareback. Shouldn't it be pimple back? If we're talking that, steroids. What? There you go. That's another one. That's right. another one. But, you know, we should get a, a, a sponsor that manufactures skincare products so we can send fat back some for them steroid bumps he's got. Speaking of getting in the way, should we talk about the Raw Tag Team Championship between the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders? This is the bone of contention that everybody wanted me to see and talk about. Have I gone far enough into this now that you could put this on YouTube and I can start using cuss words? Well, we will find out. 
Ten nine eight seven six five four three two one. Fuck this whole fucking thing. I don't know what to say. I don't know what I was watching. I don't know why this happened. I don't know why it was aired. I have no words to describe it. I don't know why that everybody involved in it didn't immediately tender their resignation and walk the fuck out. You know what? Because the street profit, and I used to like the Viking Raiders, not the fucking gimmick, but the goddamn guys, fuck them too. If I ever see them again, I'll tell them in person, fuck you for being involved in this. I have never needed a goddamn job. I've never needed money so bad. I've never had so lack of self-respect or respect for my profession that I would have not walked. I've walked out on a lot less than this. And I think they ought to be ashamed of themselves. I think whoever pitched this idea should not only be fired, but potentially beaten up in an alleyway somewhere by fucking street thugs that are hired at a later date. If anybody had suggested that this was a good idea for me to do in a promotion that I ran, I would not only have fired them, I would physically attack them. Uh, I, I don't know I w- if, if it was my company and I had a choice of airing this or airing nothing, I would air Mighty Mouse reruns. I, it, we, it, it's got to the point now where, when, when they can make AEW look like the more fucking reputable organization with all of the WWE's resources and the talent that they have on the roster and the talent that they have in the production studio and the talent that, that, that they have, or just the, the high price talent that they have, that they would allow something like this on their program shows that nobody that knows what the fuck they're doing is either in charge or can stand up to Vince or has the backbone or the balls or the guts or the scruples to fucking walk out over goddamn principles. And I hate everybody involved in this, and I never want to see any of them again personally or professionally. Why would you even do so? It wasn't even funny fake. It wasn't even entertaining fake. It was silly fake and stupid fake. And they all ought to be ashamed of themselves. And it, it, as a matter of fact, if I'd have been Randy Orton and Edge, I would have gone up to all these guys, and including the agents, including the creative team, and I'd have slapped them all in the fucking face because they pissed all over Randy Orton and Edge. After I watched the, most of this match, after I started fast-forwarding to see when it would end, And finally, when I did fucking fast forward to the one point, they were in a dumpster and that was so fucking fitting. I said, if that ain't the finish, it ought to be. Y'all ought to put garbage in a dumpster and close the fucking lid. I got out of it there. I had to stop watching the show. I wanted to see Randy Orton and Edge. I wanted to see how they lived up to their billing and or just as I've always liked Edge. Orton's a fucking premier worker. That was something I was looking forward to watching. And after this fucking thing, I turned the goddamn thing off and I had to go away from it and walked around for about an hour and did other things. And the only reason I came back to it and watched Orton and Edge was because, well, two reasons. Number one, I didn't want to waste that much time on the rest of this fucking stinker just to not see the only good thing on it. And secondly, I knew people were going to be waiting for it and I wanted to be able to at least say something positive about somebody. But if I, if it hadn't been my profession, And what I'm supposed to be doing for the program, I would have never come back to this fucking show or watched any of the rest of it again after this fucking horse shit. Fuck you, Street Profits, whoever the fuck you are. I've never met you. Fuck you, Viking Raiders. I know you took the shitty gimmick because you got a job. But doing this, fuck you. Drive a fucking truck, motherfuckers. If Bruce Pritchard had anything to do with this, I hope Paul Bosch reanimates from the grave and sodomizes him, just fucks him until his soul leaves his fucking body. Fuck you, Bruce. Anybody else? Can you think of anybody else that we can directly implicate in this before I talk anything about the details? Vince McMahon. Well, Vince McMahon is obviously, we now have proof that he's insane, has lost his mind and is senile and is babbling and fucking spilling his goddamn oatmeal all over his fucking lap. 
the Vince McMahon I knew would have never let a bunch of uh, all the things that he even did in the 80s and 90s. <clears throat> something as amateurish and stupid and silly as this. They start out fighting in a parking lot, but then because they break Braun Strowman's windshield, they all four run off scared. The tag team champions and their challengers, all four of them are scared of one guy. So already I knew the guys were jabronis in the thing to begin with. Then they've, then they're fighting in the back of the arena with marching music. Then they have a face-off with golf clubs and axes and a bowling ball. I'm not kidding. But then they decide they shouldn't use those things. So they talk it over, put them all down, and then start fighting again. Here's how stupid they all are. They were laying shit in, trying to make their work look good while they were being obviously phony on purpose. I guarantee you, I've never, compl well, I've complained a few times to my boys, but never to the opposite side, really. But I I never complained about guys laying shit in to make shit look good if they weren't reckless. But I would complain a long and loud of a motherfucker laying something in to make it look good while we were doing something that was so obviously phony we could never make anybody believe it was real to begin with. Then, I don't care whether your work looks like the shits. Don't fucking hit me hard trying to convince people when we're doing something they, they can't be convinced over. That's fucking stupid. Then they were eating turkey legs. Then they got knocked through a glass door. A, a Viking flashed back to a, a, bowling, a, a game of bowling, and we could see the fucking flashbacks in the guy's mind. And then he threw the bowling ball into the street prophet's nuts. Here's what I wrote verbatim. I hate all four of these guys. I hate whoever told them to do this. I hate the idea of this. I'm not sure if it was a flashback or a dream sequence. Whatever it was. They should have sent out the fucking LSD so that we'd all be on the same page. Then we might not have minded it. Ninjas on motorcycles showed up. What was the meaning of the ninjas on the motorcycles? Has this has something been done with a team of ninjas on a motorcycles that this is referring to, or they just they just showed up and interrupted the fucking fight? I believe this may have been the debut of the ninjas on motorcycles. I don't know anything about it. And I wrote, well, the WWE is now the biggest garbage wrestling promotion in the world. It's made for football field fuckery look like Fez versus Rogers. So then the Vikings and the Prophets join up to fight the motorcycle ninjas, and they go through a quick series of clips of goofy spots, so I started fast-forwarding to see what it would fucking end. I stopped. They were fighting again. When I left, they were to joined up, teamed, fighting the motorcycle ninjas, but then they were fighting each other again, and then I fast forwarded some more and then they knocked each other off a goddamn fucking uh, uh, semi trailer truck. And I fast forward a little bit more and they were all laying in the dumpster. And that's where I just turned the show off and walked away from it. And it, the virus, as I said before, and you can go back what a month or so ago, I said, the virus is going to be what kills wrestling because now that they've been forced to try to be creative, they're doing this shit and they're getting a tickle out of it and they like it, so they're going to do more of it. And it's going to get worse and worse. I don't know how it can be worse than this. I could actually smell my computer monitor from watching this on the network. But it, it, this the virus has killed wrestling. They're either going to computer generate the shit or they're going to do more movies or cinematic approaches. I'd like to give you a cinematic approach of a fucking John Holmes movie and splooge right in your fucking eye, Kevin Dunn and all the rest of you. And this is what they're going to be doing. And it's it. And by the a, a year of this and nobody will ever want to watch anything that's called wrestling ever again. I'd, I'd like to say a positive comment. Uh, like you, I hated the stadium stampede match with AEW. I thought it was an embarrassment. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was bad comedy put together that was acceptable by the dwindling wrestling audience. But by and large, 
people who like professional wrestling or comedy would realize how stupid it was. But if I could say a positive about that match, at least Bruce Pritchard and Vince McMahon weren't involved in it. <laughs> because now you're seeing, you know, I've said how AEW is those guys, their version of WWE wrestling. It's not sports-based wrestling. It's not a modern take on Mid-South wrestling. It's not a modern take on Nitro. At this point, it is their version of WWE wrestling. And this was WWE's version of the AEW cinematic match. Oh, this by the way, was there's the- a way to do it. I mean, that's the thing. The next match on the show was a cinematic match. It was a match with various elements from, from crowd noise to Howard Finkel being reanimated to cuts in the match, like you know, elements of the match that were put together in post-production that's a way you could do it where at least it's not insulting. But this shit, I don't know what this was. I mean, you missed another dream sequence. You missed so much. Yeah, I would have missed I would have missed wrestling for the rest of my life if I'd have seen any more of this. I was disgusted but, but by know, the I whole mean, I was repulsed by it. I understand being really mad at the production team and whoever was the agent and whoever came up with it and the head of creative and Vince McMahon. These four guys in the match are four guys with their first real chance to make some money. I don't give a fuck them. Fuck them. Have some fucking balls, some fucking principles. Go out and make a goddamn idiot out of yourself on national TV and shit all over the wrestling business. Fuck them. I've walked out for less. And, And adjusting my fucking WCW contract for inflation, probably on around the same amount of money. I don't give a fuck. Fuck everybody had anything to do with this. Fuck anybody that liked it. I'll slap you. How about that? <laughs> Fucking tell me, man, woman, or child, 8 to 80, blind, crippled, or crazy, if you can't walk, I'll drag you. You tell me you like this, I want to slap the fuck out of you. This was bad. This was pretty bad. And I was so upset that when I finally sat down and then watched the worthwhile match on this fiasco. I was more insulted and offended and upset for Randy Orton and Edge. And now we find out Edge tore his fucking tricep. He's going to be out for a while. They go out there and fucking put on a clinic, have the closest thing you can have to a masterpiece in this day and age in wrestling. Um, Fucking work their asses off. And Edge gets hurt and is going to have to have surgery and it was all for naught because nobody could take a goddamn bit of it seriously because they had just seen the whole business mocked and have it and made a joke of by a bunch of fucking underneath twats that shouldn't be in a fucking ring. And they weren't in a ring. All petite wrestling, or what do we call it these days? All friends wrestling. Well, it's not all friends now. They've actually got some talent in the company besides MJF. We're going to be speaking to him later on FTR here on the program. So I can't say it's all friends now because FTR made it clear. They're not particularly friends with anybody over there. Yeah. Plus it's, it's only all friends until one of the EVP sends out an email and then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some feelings get hurt every now and then. <laughs> it's only all friends till the feelings get hurt folks. But somebody else has has been has been excommunicated from AEW outside the circle of trust, no longer welcome on the premises. A person that's been literally synonymous with all elite wrestling since the their formation. They have banned Linda Hogan from from coming to any all elite wrestling events, which is like me banning Donald Trump from dinner at the castle. Yeah, what a interesting little attempt at uh getting some points on social media that was by Tony Khan. You are banned no, but- like your husband is from All Elite Wrestling. Yeah. Congratulations. Like ah. she's ever heard of All Elite Wrestling. <laughs> like she has any idea what the hell that is. I have several thoughts on this. One, a lot of people said, fuck, they would fucking roll out the red carpet if Hulk Hogan would deem it uh, appropriate to make an appearance in AEW. And unfortunately, those people are wrong. No, I legitimately believe, because for one... Tony Khan's father is a billionaire, as we've mentioned many times, and they don't need the money. And these other guys are getting paid guarantees regardless whether they draw anything or not. 
So the guys wouldn't want Hogan because then they could say, we turned Hulk Hogan down because we're big shit because it wouldn't make any difference in their bottom line, the increased gate that would result from Hogan being on any one of their events would not add any money to their pockets like in the old days when the guys had been clamoring to have a name like that on a show. The billionaire promoter is, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately the smell of his farts has fucking swayed his mind to where that he says, I'll just tell Hulk Hogan he can't come to my wrestling event. And since his dad's a billionaire, he doesn't need the money. But a lot of people have said, Cornette, if, if in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, if you could have got Hulk Hogan, would you have booked Hulk Hogan? Are you out of your fucking mind? I don't, it, it, yeah. If Hulk Hogan would have come to one of my events for a price that I could afford and conceivably make a profit on, and he would have been motivated to do so rather than just been showing up for the money to stink up whatever he might have done, if he actually wanted to come and wanted to come for what I could pay him, I would have booked him in a heartbeat because he's the biggest star in the fucking business. And you do something, you get something out of it. So, but, but Hulk Hogan is barred from all elite wrestling because, because he would never come anyway. And now Linda's barred from all elite wrestling. It's so stupid. I she, mean, cause she would never come anyway. And they would never want her because I, I, I believe I've mentioned to you that I, without mentioning any names, a person that I know and value their opinion and, and to trust them as far as their word and what they would say and or exaggerate spent a bit of time, quite a bit of time around the Hogan environment and said that she is batshit fucking nuts, batshit fucking nuts. And of course it was a bullshit tweet. And, and you would think even though they broke up and, and, and I don't know which one, if he, either one of them came out the baby face, you would think after what happened to him, she wouldn't go on and on about the Afro Americans rioting. It did were they, they were Afro-Americans when Clarence Williams III was still starring as Link on the Mod Squad. Um, yeah, the last time I remember hearing that term, I think, was at the end of Malcolm X, the movie. <laughs> like that, I have not heard that used. Like Since then, I have not heard anyone say that except for Linda Hogan, who, by the way, isn't even a Hogan anymore. Well, she was never a Hogan, but she was only an honorary Hogan while they were married. But she, had, how about this clueless middle-aged fucking uh, plastic surgery, fucking addled privileged white woman who married her way to fucking millions of dollars. How about that? Sounds Shut accurate. the fuck up, Linda. But she's banned from AEW. So that'll show her. Well, it's, but again, that's where it gets stupid. That's where it's Tony Khan trying to get some points on social media. I know AEW. Had a couple of rough days with fans jumping on Jericho and pointing out Cody's old burner account and some of the things he liked and focusing on some of the Young Bucks' alleged political well, views. Well, 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 hold on. I, and, and, and I didn't know anything about it. Cody having – and the burner account is the one where you adopt an assumed name so nobody knows it's you, right? Right, although but, his – it was like Prince CGR. I mean, it was, it was like basically his initials <laughs> with the word Prince, which only the son of Dusty Rhodes would anoint himself that. <laughs> well, mine, mine is going to be no, Notorious JC then. Um, but now I've heard – do we have confirmation? Because obviously the, the Road Warrior Buck and his brother Balding Buck have blocked me on their, on their Twitter machine – but I keep having fans say or people say, boy, how can the people excuse these fucking right wing tweets from the young bucks? Uh, they were birther fucking nuts and they're, you know, right wing lunatics. And, and, and I have not seen this stuff. How do we do we know this is a fact so that we can condemn them for it? Well, first of all, I don't believe they're on Twitter anymore unless they have burner accounts because they had a big hissy fit. I think after the notorious dark order episode at the end of 2019 and they got off twitter because <laughs> they couldn't handle the criticism for that dog shit that aired um what i've seen is old tweets i think one of them actually was one that one of the young bucks liked that was a tweet by chris jericho years ago where he said i just saw a guy in the airport that looks like barack obama i wanted to punch him <laughs> uh, i may be paraphrasing a bit and i'm thinking 
What does that mean? A guy who looked like Barack Obama, a, a black man in a suit? Like what? What the fuck does that even mean? Maybe but, uh, he saw The Rock because The Rock is the closest looking one to Barack Obama that I've I've always thought he should play him in a movie. And you know, Chris Jericho got some heat apparently this past week again. Not that you would want to bring up Chris Jericho getting any heat or anything. Well, I didn't. Well, this has been something people have talked about. I haven't seen it because I'm blocked by Chris Jericho. I have been for quite some time, a few years now. But apparently, on one of his social media accounts. He responded to a Black Lives Matter comment by saying all lives matter. And that just that's just fucking ignorance. Just shut up. If that's really if you if you respond to Black Lives Matter with all lives matter, please, sincerely, go fuck yourself. <laughs> go fuck. Well, you always respond to a tagline that is meant to bring awareness to a, a developing ongoing problem with a basically simple fucking statement like yes of course all lives matter you dipshit but since the ones in jeopardy that are being fucking taken currently are the black lives don't fuck with their fucking tagline because we're not talking about you right now you're fine i don't think that and and maybe maybe canadian lives matter he's from fucking winnipeg even though he's got the dual citizenship maybe he's having a problem i, I don't want to know. announce that chris jericho is hereby banned from my backyard. <laughs> He's not allowed near the pool or the swing set or anything. Chris Jericho, banned from my backyard. Hey. Congratulations. It, no, but here's the thing. You need to ban Matt Hardy from your pool because he will jump in there and come at a completely different person. I hereby ban Matt Hardy from the premises of Last Manor. In perpetuity. He can never, ever come. Ever. You're banned, Matt. Sorry. <clears throat> Congratulations. Who else can I ban that was never going to come anyway? Linda Hogan, by the way, you're banned. There's, Just there's, throw that out there. <laughs> there's, there's a joke there about people that are never going to come anyway. Some other old stories. I talked to Dennis Condry a couple days ago, and uh, he's doing well. He's like me, staying away from everybody because he had the treatments for his cancer several years ago, and, and so he's staying away from everybody mowing the yard and being peaceful at home. But one of the, we, every time we talk, we talk about old stories, right? And you remember when this happened, you remember when that happened, we did this and somehow I can't even remember what story led us to it, but the goddamn, I was laughing till my face was hurt because he reminded me. And then I told him back the story of, did I ever tell you when Bobby Eaton in 1983 agreed to dog sit for Bill Dundee? No, you did not. Okay. Well, it helps everybody to know that Bobby Eaton, as many people have said, is the nicest guy in the history of the wrestling business. And if you, we've told stories how we'd go to the store to get some beer after a match and he'd see a homeless bum and he'd end up buying the guy groceries and beer and patting him on the back and shaking his hand in new clothing, whatever. Whenever you ask Bobby Eaton to do anything for you, his first reaction is immediately, yes. And how can I do this? And how quick can I do this? Let's go do it right now. Whether it's to help you out something or jump your car or fix a flat or borrow something. We've talked about, he had those big bags where, you know, he'd hand out a dozen towels every night to guys. <clears throat> well, in this case, it was the Thanksgiving time of 1983. We had just gone down, done our first Mid-South television taping in Shreveport for Watts. And all of us were living in Nashville because we were all going down as part of the talent trade. Uh, me, Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson, Terry Taylor, Buddy Landell, and Bill Dundee was going to be the booker. So we go down to our first TV, which was the day before thanks, the Wednesday night, Thanksgiving Eve night, right? The day before Thanksgiving. We did two tapes and then Thanksgiving, we flew back home to Nashville and Dundee invited us over to his house to have dinner. And we did. That was very nice of him. And then it helps you also to know that Bobby had just become Dundee's son-in-law. That's when he and Donna, Dundee's daughter, had just been married, what, a year, year and a half or whatever at that point. So now the following week, we're off. We're, we're still working the Tennessee territory. We're, you know, we're, we're not going back to Louisiana, but Dundee has to go back to Louisiana. Actually, I think he was going to Oklahoma to work with Watts for a week. He was going to be the new booker. He's coming in. They're going to get all their stuff set, right? So he's going to Oklahoma to meet with Watts for a week, and he's taking Bev. He's taking Beverly, his wife, 
Uh, cause she's probably going to go down to Louisiana, look around for some places to fucking live, et cetera. This big move that's going on. And that's going to leave since we're all still in town. But Dundee's going to be gone for a week and nobody at the house except for Dundee's huge, giant fucking pit bull. This goddamn dog had a head the size of a fucking toilet seat and these big paws. And if it's reared up on its hind legs, it was as tall as you were, right? A big, a mean sounding pit bull. And it helps for this story also to know that Bobby Eaton is scared of big, mean dogs. Right? He's not scared of dogs in general, but big mean dogs like Arnold Steiner, the Steiner brothers pit bull that used to chase him around the fucking locker room and out in the building. And Arnold could work. So imagine a big fucking big ass pit bull that can't work. So Bobby is, is sitting in the locker room one night and Dundee goes up to him and he says, will you, will you take care of my dog? I can't remember what the dog's name was, but take care of my dog, Butte. You got to take care of my dog, feed my dog, water my dog, come over, make sure he's, he's okay. Okay, Bill, I'll do it. I'll do it. Well, then over the course of building this up over a couple of days, every time that Dundee would see Bobby, he'd talk about how many times he need to come over and what he need to feed him, how much water he need to give him, whether he need to let him out. And he said, now remember, you can't let him out because if I'm home, I let him out. I can get him back. He'll come back if I want. But if you let him out, you can't let him out. He'll just goddamn run off. He'll be gone. Okay, Bill. So he's got all over all these details. And finally, it's almost time for Dundee to leave. And that's when he hit him with the, the, the big news. He said, now, Butte, and I can't do the accent, but he said, Butte, here's the thing. You're going to feed him. You're going to water him. But you can't let him out. So I'm going to be gone for a week. And the thing is, when I'm home and I let him out, he goes out around the neighborhood and he does his fucking business. He finds some girl dog and he fucks the girl dog and then he comes back. But you can't let him out. So you're going to feed him and you're going to water him. But if he doesn't come for a whole week that I'm gone, he's going to get fucking mean. <laughs> and he's going to fucking bite your ass and attack you. So at least twice during the time I'm gone, Bobby. You're going to have to jack this dog off. Oh, no. <laughs> Come on. And now and Bobby's buying it. And Bobby's with it. He's like, what? What? what did, no, Butte, I'm telling you. The dog's going to get mean. He's going to bite your ass. He's going to attack you. He's going to fucking, he's going to get vicious. He's going to come at least, you're going to have to, at least twice, Butte, every couple or three days, you're going to have to just jack him off. And he'll be all right. <laughs> and Bobby's like, oh, God damn. What if he bites me while I'm trying to jack him off? He won't do that. He likes it. <laughs> so Bill Dundee had convinced Bobby that this dog was going to attack and potentially dismember him over the course of this week, unless that Bobby jacked him off at least twice. And Bobby had, had gone so far as to say, okay to it just to get Dundee to shut up with no intention of jacking a dog off. But now he's shitting himself that the fourth day is going to come and he don't give this dog a hand job and the dog is going to fucking attack him and fucking eat him. So finally, if it hadn't been for Dundee cracking up finally the day before he was about to leave and fucking admitting that he did, Bobby didn't have to jack the dog off. Bobby was, was he was feeling badly because he was not going to be able to honor the re request of giving his dog two hand jobs in the course of a week. I guess you had to be there. I don't wow. what a, <laughs> There's what a, a nice guy. I, <laughs> why is there always a story about jacking a dog off in a, in a wrestling locker room? Well, usually the Memphis territory. Well, Terry, what Terry Funk was in Amarillo when he saw. No, Bobby Ray Thornton or what's his but name? He claims Bobby, it was Billy Bobby, Bob Thornton. I don't believe it really Billy was. Bob Thornton. It couldn't have been. Well, that's what that's what Terry said. I don't we haven't heard from Billy Bob Thornton on whether he was indeed a dog jacker or not, but there's anyway. no there's no way to deny that without sounding like you did it. <laughs> I just want to say, despite the rumors, I did not jack off a dog. Yeah. I have never oh. jacked off a dog. <laughs> I don't know who this guy was going around the country saying that he saw me jacking off a dog because ah. This one was sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Roberto DeMarco. 
whose idea was WWF greetings on call? This was a service provided by WWF that allowed people to send greeting calls to others for their birthdays. In 1994, during an episode of Superstars, as Yokozuna went one-on-one with a jobber, Jerry Lawler sent a greeting to someone, and it was The Undertaker and Paul Bearer singing Happy Birthday. Do you remember this? I have no knowledge of possibly I was in a coma. I don't remember any of this. Well, I have some audio here. Please help me. This is actually your managing Yokozuna here, you and Fuji. This is from 1994 WWF Superstars. Let's hear this. Have you heard of the WWF greetings on call? Of course I have. What? Of course. What does that have to do with you? Well, I'll tell you what. I called up and I, I had my choice of WWF superstars to leave a little message for Helen Hart. I could have had Lex Luger. I could have had Bret Hart. Who would want him? I could have had Razor Ramon or the Macho Man. But I chose the man that this man, Yokozuna, demolished at the Royal Rumble. I chose The Undertaker. And before his final demise, he left a few choice comments for Miss Helen Hart. And the, the phone should be ringing any minute with this message. Oh, no, good Lord. Lord. What, what are you up to, Jerry? Listen to this. Listen to this. Listen. <laughs> One second, Paul Bearer. I've got to find out something. Please let us know that you have a touchtone phone by pressing the one button now. If you what the fuck? Hello, Helen. Hello, birthday girl. This is Paul Bearer. My undertaker asked me to call you and give you a special message because he dug up the news that it's your birthday. Here he comes now from the depths of the darkness to try and shed some light. Stop it there. Uh, so there, it. so one of the Yokozuna's <laughs> matches was going on in the background. They were totally ignoring while they were playing that fucking fiasco. Yes, you're at ringside. Fuji's at ringside. Yokozuna squashing someone. And the Undertaker and Paul Bearer leaving a message for Helen. And, and apparently they had them record like, it's like one of these automated prompts. They had them record like Billy or Joe or Helen or Betty or whatever. And they just plug it in. That's right. Good fucking God. No, I I don't. Re- I think that probably was the only time that was done, wasn't it, on television? Because if it had been done more than once, it seems like I'd remember that. I don't remember any other times it was done, but I can't. And I have it. a feeling I know why it wasn't ever done on TV again. Good fucking God. I have no knowledge of what was going on there, but it, the, one of the things that they were trying to do back then to to uh, get with the modern program. Oh, look at all the technology we can do these things. If fucking hell. Well, you have nothing else to add to that. So let's get I another question. <laughs> this well, one. Well, it can't all be diamonds. Did you notice any of this stuff with Chris Jericho and Sebastian Bach of Skid Row? I I did not. Well, apparently there's a little bit of a feud that's broken out between Chris Jericho and and Sebastian Bach of Skid Row. Are they going to bring him in for a match now? I don't think this is a work uh, because he hit Jericho where it really hurts. Uh, Let me, I have a article here from blabbermouth.net, whatever that is. Yeah, please please tell us what blabbermouth.net had to say. Uh, Sebastian Bach has engaged in a Twitter feud with Chris Jericho over allegations that the Fozzie frontman uses pre-recorded vocal tracks during live performances. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are unaware, famously a Millie Vanilli kind of move, but let's go back to the article here. The exchange began on Wednesday, July 15th, when one fan commented on social media that Jericho is starting to look like the Skid Row singer. With Sebastian Bach weighing in, 
Every single day for the past two or three years, somebody tells me this. Ha! Huh. After another person told Sebastian, you partied too much, Jericho has you beat, Bach came back with, he definitely does, considering that he mimes to a tape. A third <laughs> fan told Sebastian, you know Chris Torres with his band, right? I've seen him live a couple of times. He's not lip syncing. To which Bach replied, cool. Let's see a clip of that because every single clip I have seen is Millie Vanilli. <laughs> referring to the duo that infamously had to return their Grammy Awards more than 30 years ago after it was revealed that they did not sing on their album. Oh, for heaven's sake, like somebody needs to explain Millie Vanilli. A short time later, Jericho, who made his name as a wrestler before starting Fozzie, wrote in a tweet, I've seen the derogatory comments towards me from somebody I considered to be a friend. So with that in mind, I'll be happy to have a sing-off with Sebastian Bach. No effects, no tuning, no bullshit. Boss, I guess that's his nickname, is a great singer, but I'm better. You've got my number, dude. Call me. <laughs> Bach then shot back. Where's the derogatory comment? All I asked is to see one single clip of you singing live. God damn. <laughs> Every clip on the internet is you miming to a tape. I will sing in your, uh, I guess he was going to say fucking face, but it's F star, 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 star face. <laughs> Wrestling is not rock and roll. I will show you fucking rock and roll. Chris responded, I've never mimed anything ever. And I don't use star, star, star in a tweet ever. I will fucking sing in your face anytime, <laughs> any place, dude. I've been a fan and defender hey, dude. of you. Hey, I've, been a, <laughs> I've, been, I've been a fan and a defender of you since day one. But don't you ever question my rock abilities. <laughs> and I leave wrestling out of this. This I can has got to be a work. It's got to be an angle. Grown men don't talk like this. They say, hey, motherfucker, I'll fuck you the fuck up. Meet me out the goddamn parking lot. No guns, no knives I can buy. But don't question my rock abilities. Bach then wrote, you're full of shit, bro. Check your text. Set up the sing off. I'm ready when you are. Your text. Another Jericho fan took the Fozzie vocalist side, writing, Take it as a compliment. Champion, I guess Le Champion or whatever he calls himself. Your singing is so spot on, it sounds like the record Red Heart. I don't know what that means. Prompting Bach to respond, That's because the record is fake and the live show is fake. What do you mean? <laughs> Another person wrote, don't ever question the Ayatollah of Rock and Rolla, which was met by Bach with, the Ayatollah of Rock and Rolla doesn't know anything about Rock and Rolla. Sebastian, who has been outspoken about rock bands using pre-recorded backing tracks during live shows, then added, I'm not trying to beat anybody at anything. I'm actually trying to say, hey, Chris, maybe you're right. Maybe I'll stop singing live and prance around while the tape is playing, just like you do, Chris. I'm tired of trying so hard. It's like beating my head against the wall. Fozzie guitarist Rich Ward also weighed in on the <laughs> well, 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 I was waiting to see what he was going to have to say about this. Anytime I have witnessed Sebastian's name come up in a group setting, the room enthusiastically lines up to say the worst things about him. He's universally disliked. Never witnessed a more unifying topic. I am Jericho, that's his Twitter handle, has always come to the guy's defense and shuts it down. Jericho is loyal and was always quick to defend the guy that he considered a friend. Seeing Sebastian publicly go after the only guy that I have ever witnessed utter a nice word about him is sad. When a Twitter user pointed out that Sebastian Bach is trending, Bach wrote, I don't know why I'm trending. I'm just drunk sitting alone in my bed. <laughs> Jericho has been suspected of relying on backing tapes during Fozzie's live performances. When the band played in Canada in November 2018, several concert goers accused Jericho of singing along to pre recorded tracks. So uh, this is kind of it. Uh, let me see if there's anything else here at the end. It looks like that may be. Uh, oh, no, it looks like there's some other stuff. Wow, my oh, band is heavens. more popular than Sebastian Bach, Chris Jericho wrote. Isn't that, isn't that really like being the nicest guy in prison, though? Because that's 
Sebastian, We're not talking about fucking Robert Plant here, for fuck's sake. Sebastian Bach wrote back, that's great. Is there a clip of you actually singing live? Because God, all I've seen are clips God, of you God. miming to a tape. Congrats on the radio hits. God, and your God. hair is certainly looking good these days. <laughs> and yeah, and it went back and forth more. So Chris Jericho, you know, like a comedian being accused of stealing has, jokes. Has there ever been a tape uh, of, of uh, produced of him singing live? I don't know. I've always said that Chris Jericho is a pretty shitty singer, that he sounds like Chris Jericho when he sings. And, uh, you know, his band is not, as, I'm sorry, you can't consider Fozzie a serious band. It's a vanity project. I like Judas. It's great until he starts singing. The vocals are what kills that song. It's a good instrumental track with really bad vocals. Who wrote it? I don't know. I couldn't tell you that. It's good. It's good lyrics. Maybe somebody else just needs to sing it. You think he was making a comment about his place in wrestling, being with AEW, Judas? <laughs> I'm become, I'm become, I'm becoming. So whose side are you taking here? Sebastian Box or Chris Jericho's? Well, I, I, I got to be honest. I can't really follow that up with a lot of commentary because I think Sebastian Box said it all of, of you know, of tape up or, or, or shut up. Um, I can't believe these are actually grown men in their 50s. At least at least when I cuss Russo, I, I vow mayhem instead of these backhanded compliments. Well, here's some more. Um, uh, someone tweeted. More? Someone tweeted at Sebastian Bach. Chris Jericho, le champion, will definitely beat your ass. I'm a massive Sebastian Bach fan, but Jericho is no Patrick Swayze. This won't end in a stolen model. This is a reference to the show Trailer Park Boys, one of the best shows ever. Uh, but to the idea that he would beat Sebastian Bach's ass, Sebastian Bach replied, "Well, he better reach up then, because Sebastian Bach obviously <laughs> would tower over Chris Jericho." Uh, yeah, this is pretty funny stuff. Oh, uh, so, <laughs> so Jericho not only is taken to the distance by a fucking guy with his hands in his pockets, but he's putting over middle-aged alcoholic rock stars on Twitter. From New Jersey. From New Jersey. I got no finish for that bit. <laughs> Maybe we ought to just go back to the program. You know, after, uh, the angle where they poured the beer on Omega's head, it was a lot of beer. All I'm thinking is it's going to really suck to work in that ring <laughs> after that much liquid gets on the mat. Little did I know what was coming next. All right. Chris Jericho gets in the ring with Sammy Hagar and sent or Jake Hager. He wishes it was. Sammy yeah. He was Santana and Ortiz. <laughs> if I don't, what, which one Hager wishes he was Sammy, Sammy Hagar. No, or Jericho, Jericho wishes he was in a ring with Sammy Hagar. Jericho Either wishes one. He was in the ring with Sammy Hagar. Absolutely. I wrote, they need Guevara back bad. That slappable face of his, he was a lot of the, the life in this thing. And here's where we, we got to, Chris Jericho, I know he's almost 50. And I've liked Chris. And I'm just so disappointed in what Chris has done to himself and become. I know he's almost 50. He can't work a full schedule. But he can still go seriously with talent once in a while. A, a, so he didn't want to stay with Vince and work an occasional match with top stars. He wanted to take more money to come over here and destroy his fucking reputation and legacy. Is the is it the money the thing? Or is it, he just... he is? He's obviously done with wrestling. Does he want to be the host of America's Got Talent? Does he want somebody to cast him in a sketch comedy show? He doesn't care about his reputation or what he's done in the wrestling business now. He, he's fully embraced this. For what fucking purpose? What can his motivation be? To inst it, it, At first, I could see where, before we saw what has happened, I could see where he wants to be the guy to make a difference and elevate young guys into stardom and be the flagship guy on a brand new wrestling program. But now that it's, we're seeing what he's doing that he hasn't elevated them. They have plunged him down to their level. He has submerged past the outlaw guys in terms of silliness and hokiness and eye winking at people. So it, it did he first have the thought I'll be a, a guy that makes a difference. I'll be the flagship guy on the show. I'll elevate people and then see that that was not going to happen and just decide to to go for the job as a the host of a sketch comedy show? Or what is he fucking thinking? You know, the last few months have really, you know, because he was great 
the first few months, the Cody feud, and then into the Moxley stuff, there were some moments that were, I, I hate to say it now, but typical Chris Jericho, bad comedy, stupid skits that you would see on WWE TV, like the party with his dad there and various other things. But it wasn't every week and it no, wasn't in the match. That's the thing. And then the next week it would be something really great with him. However, this year, in the last several months, he's had a feud with Matt Hardy and Matt Hardy's drone. And he went from that into a feud with Orange Cassidy. And I think it's, look, Chris Jericho has been blessed with bad sensibilities for a long time. And he always wants to latch on to whatever he thinks the hot thing in the business is. And you could say he wants to elevate it. I actually think a lot of the times it's the opposite. He wants to just get the attention from it. Remember, I killed him when he had that match with AJ Styles at WrestleMania years ago. AJ had just come in. He was the hottest thing in the, in the WWE. And then he lost to Chris Jericho, who looked shot at WrestleMania. He sees the reaction Orange Cassidy gets. Despite whatever you think and whatever I think and whatever all the other soulless fans think, Orange Cassidy with their fan base is popular. Orange Cassidy sells a lot of merchandise to their fan base. Jer- but, but see, I'm not buying that because Chris Jericho is smart enough to know that just their fan base of people who like the gaga and the joke is not going to be what they need over the long run. He was there specifically to get real wrestling fans, uh, uh, longtime oh. wrestling fans. He has a name from a real wrestling program. That That's, was supposed to be his job. That should have been his job. Of, Instead of cuddling up to the joke guy that the only people that like him are the people that are already watching to begin with. Look, eventually, Tony Bennett got to a point where no one was going to pay attention to his new material. So he had to do his duet stuff with any contemporary artist he could find (laughs) that he could latch on to. All of whom were happy to work with him because they respected his tenure and talent. And that's Chris Jericho right now in AEW. He well, sees that go. Orange Cassidy is happening with that fan base. He wants to be a part of it. Trust and Jer- me, if Sonny and, and, Kiss, and, and, Kiss, somehow, if that Sonny Kiss segment does an amazing rating, and they bring him back next week, and it does an amazing rating, and he sells a bunch of merch in the next few weeks, he'll be working with Chris Jericho in a month. <laughs> I guarantee it. Damn it. Oh, fuck. All right. Well, anyway, in this interview with Jericho and his men, he actually cut a promo talking about winning the fucking demographic last week without saying NXT's name. He talked about him and old pockets there, which, by the way, I thought they were uh, fucking they 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 did their match itself. Was that the high point of the rating or the demographic or whatever? Yeah, I don't. Well, whatever the fuck. I'm fairly certain it wasn't the high point of the rating. It may have won the demo versus NXT. Yeah, the the point is we have to get this minute with it. NXT had more people watching, so he's out there doing bragging about winning the demographic like Tony Khan was bragging about winning the demographic, which is a nice way of saying We've shot 900,000 fucking people that were watching this goddamn program at the start of it, and NXT has now started kicking our ass, but we still won a demographic of such and such people between the age of such and such living in a town with an R in it. It was fucking embarrassing. And said no rematch for Pockets. And then Pockets came out to interrupt, but he didn't interrupt because he can't speak because he's fucking mute. And then this went forever with Jericho telling Pockets off. And finally, Pockets gave a thumbs down and orange juice fell from the ceiling uh, onto the heels. And while Jericho pitched a fit about his jacket, I used to call Ortiz of LAX Pampiro Furpo Jr. because I like keeping Pampiro Furpo's name out there, but he's an embarrassment to Pampiro Furpo. And I don't think I can call him that anymore because he just, it was okay. A heel can take a bump in the liquid, right? And then he purposely couldn't stand up for a full minute, taking bumps and rolling around and dog paddling in it to make sure everybody knew that it was fucking Gaga. It was stupid. Stupid. This guy needs to be beat with a fucking stick. 
And I'm sorry when people are saying, well, uh, Santana and Ortiz, they're a top quality to w- in what fucking universe in what wrestling school is this goddamn clown and his partner a fucking great team when all he does is fucking make everything goofy. And Santana did one interview that one time I said, this guy could be a fucking star and they've buried him ever since. I've never heard him speak again. Yeah. I think he's all right. I think Santana isn't the problem. And by the way, major respect for representing Hector Laveau on your shirt there, but Ortiz, he isn't good in the ring. He's over. I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather represent Marie Laveau. Well, he isn't, he, he's overly goofy in his best of moments. I mean, remember a lot of those early promos where he kept sticking his tongue out. Yeah. And he just, he's ridiculous. And then this, like you said, someone, even if all that whole group, all four of them took a bump in that liquid one time, that works. But the idea they're all standing there and he's flopping around like a, like a baby deer. Well, he and he was trying to was- stand up. He was trying to get his partner to, he was reaching for his partner, trying to get his partner to grab him so he could pull him down. And Santana's like, get the fuck away from me. You know, (laughs) just so fucking stupidity, stupidity, stupidity. But, and and let me say this, Orange Cassidy, he's probably the smartest guy in the entire business. You know, you have to actually say that. I do. Do you, you, and, and I agree now that he is for a, generic bland looking pale white guy wearing t-shirt blue jeans and sneakers with no discernible talent can't cut a promo his whole gimmick is that he does nothing and he somehow suckered these people into giving him a job and paying him he's better he's smarter than kevin nash you know i think it may have been lou reed and i may be wrong but if it wasn't lou reed it was one of the other warhol people who said you know everyone thought we were so cool because we sat in the back of the room with our sunglasses on. They didn't realize they always think the people are cool who do nothing, who just sit there and do nothing. They have nothing going on. <laughs> they <laughs> seem the coolest because they have nothing going on. But in actuality, they want something to be going on. Orange Cassie, smartest guy in the business. And uh, I was worried about people working in that ring after the beer. Obviously, oh, they now tape, the orange juice. Obviously, they taped this on another night or something. I don't. They could have fucking rolled the goddamn canvas off during a commercial break. That was a lot. That was a lot of liquid. That I was, don't fucking. And by the way, major props to Orange Cassidy for being in cahoots with whoever is running the uh, whoever the, the special the effects. Yeah. yeah. Who is that guy? Why doesn't Jericho go beat up that guy? I don't know. Well, I'm sure, you know, and by the way, when did they give uh shit stain a job? Cause they just, they actually just stole a fucking Russo angle from 20 years ago, except instead of blood from the brood, it's orange juice from fucking my little dog pockets. Now, let me ask you something. Cause I've made this complaint many times that this is WWE. This is their version of WWE. I will make that again. Do you think it's a fair statement? This is, a bunch of guys who want to do their own version of WWE doing it here. This isn't someone on Twitter said this and it was yeah. brilliant. They said, I wanted an alternative to WWE, not alternative WWE. <laughs> and that's well, th- what this is. This is an alternative WWE. This is low budget outlaw indie mud show bullshit from guys who have been somehow convinced that they can take over the wrestling world from the WWE. And this is what they do. And uh, there's a few smart guys in the middle that are milking a billionaire for a lot of money for a job that they have to do very little at. And to your earlier question about Jericho, another reason why he's happy to be here is he doesn't have Vince McMahon saying, no, we're not going to do any of your stupid (laughs) ideas, Chris. (laughs) I like you. I want to push you. If these were any of the ideas, I can see where where that was happening. All right. You can get mad at me a little bit on this one. I'm going to tell you when I left it, when they lost me. The swamp fight match closed this sad chapter in American wrestling history. Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman and Corey Graves' pitch to this match I think summed up the whole thing. He actually said, and I quote, the question on everyone's mind, 
What sort of unforeseen terror is lurking beneath the surface of the brackish waters? <laughs> that was on everyone's mind. And, you know, if this was a Universal International picture from 1957, um, or a possibly a William Castle production from the 60s, maybe, we, you know, maybe they could have even had, had a, like a fucking tingler thing on our seats, wired to our seats, where every time that the fucking, you know, you saw a snake in the swamp, you felt something bite you or whatever. That'd be a William Castle fucking gimmick. Because there wasn't anything to do with wrestling in this. It's all movies. They all... They're frustrated fucking movie actors, movie writers, movie producers. And now we know why they're frustrated, because they're not any fucking good at it. So it opens with Bray Wyatt and a rocker rocking in the middle of the swamp when Braun Strowman pulls up in his SUV. And I hope it's not a rental, because it voids your insurance if you're driving in the swamp. At least it hurts. Braun Strowman says, I'm home, and then the lights go out. The lights go out in a swamp. That happens to me all the time whenever I go down to the swamp. The lights went out, and when the lights came back on, Bray Wyatt had disappeared. And right then, I was going to invoke the teleportation rule. But the, I thought, okay, I'm not going to, because first off, we're not supposed to take this seriously. This is wrestling, supposed to be silly and fun. And secondly, he didn't actually teleport. The lights were out. He could have gotten up and walked off. We'll just discuss the loophole of how the lights got turned off in a swamp at a later date. So then they start the spooky music and the movie fight. And during them fighting... It cut to a clip of Bray Wyatt in the funhouse cheering Braun Strowman on while Bray Wyatt was fighting Braun Strowman in the swamp. And then Braun Strowman, I'm not making this up, ladies and gentlemen. Once he, am I lying about any of this? No, uh, you're telling the truth about exactly okay. what sort of garbage we saw. Okay, on Braun Strowman gets hit from behind by a shovel. And goes down and looks up and he sees who hit him. Brian, you don't have to guess because you saw it. But just for the sake of me saying this for the people that may not have seen this fucking four finger stinker, this goddamn back alley abortion of a wrestling program. Who hit Braun Strowman? Guess who hit Braun Strowman, folks? I'll tell you who hit Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman hit Braun Strowman. He looks up and sees Braun Strowman with the shovel because of. He's a mental goddamn case. I don't know why, because. And right then, I couldn't find the remote. And I got to see that Braun Strowman woke up after being knocked out with the shovel, chained to a chair in a cabin. Or as New Jack once said, chained in the bowels of a slave ship. Braun Strowman was chained to a chair in a log cabin. And that's when I said, I'm done. Fuck these guys. Fuck these alleged writers. Fuck this whole company. This would have made me ashamed to ever be a part of wrestling, but this isn't wrestling. So I'm not ashamed to have ever been a part of wrestling. I would have been ashamed to ever be a part of whatever the fuck these people just did. And they should be ashamed to call themselves wrestlers. But it didn't make me ashamed of wrestling because there was no aspect of wrestling involved in this. If Vince likes it, he needs to take that cognitive test that old fucking president pig shit has taken where he can identify the elephant from the donkey. Or if Bruce was in favor of this, I think he's been to rehab before. Somebody needs to fucking check and see if Bruce is falling off the wagon or potentially it may be that, that, you know, he he's had, bad health maybe he's on some kind of heart medicine that's that's causing him to have psychotic episodes maybe he's on that hydrochloroquine braun Strowman, i'm pretty sure we've established is a fucking idiot and would have never made it 15 minutes in the real wrestling business because he'd understand how it worked or how it's supposed to work bray wyatt i think i'm the most disappointed in 
of all of them, because as I mentioned before, Blackjack Mulligan, I only met him a few times, but from what Ric Flair and other people have told me about him, he would be spinning in his grave right now at the thought of his business being portrayed in this way. So what else happened after he was chained in the cabin and I said, fuck this, I'm done. Was there anything else of note? Of note, that's uh, it's hard to say. At some point, a guy came out and attacked Braun Strowman after he got out of the chair. Don't know who the guy is, but then he was lit on fire and he ran off on in flames. Wait a minute, Braun Strowman or the guy <laughs> no, that... No, no, the, the stuntman that they hired to be a generic Bray Wyatt disciple. <sighs> and ran then, off in flames. I gotta be honest, I didn't turn it off like you did, but I just stopped caring and yeah, stopped paying close yeah. attention, so every now and then I would look up. The end of the pay-per-view <laughs> had Braun Strowman, I don't know if it was a raft or a little boat, but he's on the water, and the little credits come up, you know, copyright, World Wrestling Entertainment, or whatever. They didn't do the goddamn Friday the 13th body out of the fucking water. Oh, that's into the exactly canoe. what they, that's exactly what they oh, did. fucking hell. And then Bray Wyatt jumped out of the water, pulling him into the water, and then the water all went red. <sighs> and so did their ink. And so did their ink. As soon as they aired this and people started canceling their network subscriptions. Fuck. So that was that. An eye for an eye. I, I think we've put to bed now or put to rest any accusations that have been cast our way that we favor the WWF over AEW when in actuality, they need, neither one of them worth a fucking shit. Neither one of them are worth a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. I will tell you this. I find AEW, and again, I killed them this past week. I hated that show on Wednesday night last week. They are much less offensive than WWE to a wrestling fan. Well, okay. I, the way you phrase that, I will agree with that. Because AEW is still more offensive to me as a wrestling professional because of the I can't say the word talent because the individuals that they put on national television that are so woefully not ready and look so outlaw and do such goofy shit, it offends me more as a wrestling professional, but I can see where to a, just an average fan, it might be easier to watch just because you can, you can laugh at it more instead of just shaking your head. I shook my head more. I didn't laugh at anything on this show. It was all just stupid, and what was supposed to be funny wasn't funny. And it was offensive with the eye thing and the whole nine yards, just just cheating people, promising them something you didn't deliver. But nothing's silly or just completely, obviously, that the, they do obviously phony shit, but they act like they mean it. I don't know which is worse. The guys that are doing obviously phony, stupid shit and acting like trying to act like they mean it or the guys on the other channel doing the obviously phony shit and laughing while they're doing it because nobody takes it seriously to begin with. I, I pick it. I don't fucking know. This, I think this is worse. This is much worse. The eye for the eye, the swamp fight. Bailey deciding she's the referee and the title seemingly, or at least her friend wins. I don't even remember if there was a title on the line in that match. The other match had a title on. Oh no, there was a title on the line in every match. There was a title on the line in the MVP match. Guy didn't show up, so MVP just walked off with the belt. <laughs> this whole show was a train wreck, and it is another piece of evidence that Vince McMahon is shot, and that Bruce Pritchard is there just to enable this shot old man to continue to stay on top of this company where everyone in the company or out of the company knows the best thing for the WWE right now would be new management because the ratings are down. There's nothing they could point to as a metric that says, you know what? Vince is doing a good job. There's nothing. And in terms of, you know, you can't base wrestling on critical acclaim because People who are smart fans sometimes like things that work. Sometimes they dislike things that work. 
But this is just that's that's why whenever you see a smart fan that suddenly gets his own company and gets to book, that's why you get some of the things you get. That's right. But this is garbage. This is complete and utter garbage. And I don't know how anyone could like it. I don't know how, any, how anyone could support it. If it wasn't a business expense for me, I wouldn't have the WWE <laughs> Network and I wouldn't watch any of this crap. You know what? I don't even write it off because I'm so ashamed to let anybody know I actually have it. It's awful. Just awful. <laughs> awful. What a brain, well, what, a, were, what a brain trust they have up there. I thought you were going to try to make me feel better. You're making me feel worse. The fact that AEW can be a better professional wrestling program than anything ought to right there tell you we might as well just fold our fucking tent. Might as well just pack it up and go home. Nobody's even trying anymore. But it, <laughs> More shareholders need to get upset at the way WWE is being run. More shareholders need to speak out and tank that stock for the message to get through. Shameful. Just awful, awful television. By the way, their ratings are in the toilet. There's a reason for that. It's not just COVID-19. It's some of the worst television anyone has ever produced. Not just for wrestling, but for television. (laughs) (laughs) And even if you want to do some weird, cinematic, David Lynch-style wrestling match... If this is the best you can come up with. Because you know what? The Undertaker-AJ match, not my thing. But that was done well for what it, it was. It it worked for what it was and because of who was involved. And this swamp thing was the second Tupelo concession stand brawl a, a year later that yielded very little in the way of results. It was the second worst swamp thing I've ever seen. <laughs> God damn that. The first one wasn't too fucking good. That swamp thing. Anyway, <laughs> that's exactly right. Awful. Just awful. I apologize to AEW for killing them so hard last week. The show still sucked, but this, this was a whole new level of suck. The likes of which hopefully we never see again, but we will because it's Vince McMahon and his toady, Bruce Pritchard running a creative team that produces shit like this because this is what they think Vince wants. Awful. Garbage. But now, but now will AEW take the challenge? Will it, will it take the handoff of the baton and say, no, just like Vince said last week. Oh, oh, no, no, no way, pal. I can top this. Will they find a way to top this and be even stinkier and rottener? We'll have to find out. We'll have to find out. We'll see if Chris Jericho has any more creative input. That may uh, steer that one direction or another. Another hot button issue lately that we talked briefly about this past week on The Experience is Chris Jericho and Sebastian Bach. This has continued. It got worse, didn't it? It got worse. Now, some people think it may be a work. We will find out if it is or isn't if Sebastian Bach ends up on the COVID cruise when Chris Jericho does it next year. The COVID cruise. But in the meantime, Chris Jericho on Saturday. You know, I bet you there are going to be a bunch of dumb, stupid fuckers that get on a cruise ship and and slobber all over each other for that deal. I bet you they will. They announced Ted DiBiase is going to be on that cruise, but I think he may just be trying to flee. I'm not sure. Oh, pff, pff. Woo. This past week, Chris Jericho put out a video on Saturday of him singing a Skid Row song. I saw that. Unfortunately, I think it reinforced the opinion that Chris Jericho can't sing and that he's doing a parody of 80s hair metal. That's what I was going to... Okay, I'm not a graduate of the Juilliard School of Music, but it occurred to me that Chris Jericho put that video up responding to people saying he couldn't sing by giving them ample evidence that he couldn't sing. Was that good (laughs) singing? It was I, I mean, it's not for me to say, but was that good singing? Garbage. It was horrible. It was a parody. I mean, it, it seemed like a parody. Someone spoofing hair metal, but it wasn't a spoof. But was he doing that? Was he parodying Sebastian Bach? This is the way you sound because you can't sing. No. Nope. Or was he? Listen, no matter what side anyone's on here, no one is disputing the fact that Sebastian Bach can sing. He can sing. He is legit. 
That's probably why he's so offended by Chris Jericho. So Jericho <laughs> was legitimately doing this like, look, I'm comparable here with what what I heard. I guarantee you every stray dog in a neighborhood had a brain aneurysm at the same time. So Jericho did that to defend himself. Meanwhile, Sebastian Bach is up the ante. Sebastian Bach tweeted out, what does someone have to do to get a response out of the most amazing singer of all time, Chris Jericho? I've been trying to get a response from this vocalist who is so much better than I am. Just ask him. He will tell you. Hey, Chris Jericho, I'm here right now. <laughs> Teach me how to sing. You're so much of a better singer than I am. I'm ready to learn. At this point, a fan named Martu replied, Hey, Sebastian, morning here. Look, it's okay if you want to do this. You have all the right. But here, all people love you. This isn't proper English. Here, all people love you for your amazing voice, career, and cause you are a good man. I just maybe want you to read all the good vibe comments for you. Always with you. Take care. <laughs> Sebastian replied, Thank you. I'm actually bored. I've never lost a fight. Chris Jericho thinks he's so tough and such a great singer. Come and fight me. I'm six foot four. Have at oh, it. Oh, shit. <sighs> Sebastian then tweeted out private messages that he sent to Chris Jericho. Hey, man, do you ever suck? <laughs> well, I gotta stop right there. <laughs> oh, God. <damn>. <laughs> oh. <sighs> nice video online. What a complete joke. You are a complete talentless fuck. Get your own shit. Uh, yeah, that's what it says. Get your own shit and quit copying me, buddy. Your singing sucks. You should stop singing for the benefit of all mankind. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Is this still your number, pussy? I accept your challenge to a singing match. If you accept my challenge to whooping your ass. Excuse me. To your fucking ass match. Whooping your fucking ass match. I was about to say, I don't know if he's challenging him to an ass match. Believe me, it won't be much of a match unless you bring a phone book to stand on or, so oh. <laughs> or something, you fucking pussy. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, he's walking the dog on Chris Jericho, Jim. What do you think of this? What is there? Has, has Chris come back with anything or is he just taking his drubbing? I think. Chris has just taken this drubbing. I have not seen any response other than his attempt at singing <laughs> that he released on Saturday. Well, there you go. Now, right now, I'm more interested in Sebastian Bach versus Chris Jericho than anything on AEW or the WWE. I th that could be a, a standalone pay-per-view. Have Don King promote it if they didn't want to get in the wrestling business. <laughs> just... <laughs> If he can cut a promo anywhere near as good as he could type a promo, yeah, he is money. Yeah, you could, you could, you could see, you could draw some money with that. What do you do uh, if you're a wrestler and you're public? I mean, this you never had this happen in the territory days where there was social media and someone could just call out a wrestler. But what is the proper response here? He is just calling out Chris Jericho. Well, th there was newspapers. Sometimes, you know, people would call out wrestlers uh, if they got a bug in their bonnet on a regional basis. Some guy, some athlete in some sport who had a bug in his bonnet about wrestling. There, there was things would be said. The the protocol was depending on who was in the verbal beef, either ignore it try to get the guy to work with you or uh, just try to get sucker the guy into letting the wrestler beat the fuck out of him. Uh, but, you know, I don't see really how they're going to have a resolution to this unless it is a work because I don't think Sebastian, Sebastian Bach wants to work with Chris Jericho. It doesn't sound like I think he just wants to fight him. And that could be interesting. We'll see they're, what they're both 50, right? Give or take. Yeah. They're just a little younger than me. Um, that could be interesting. There's even physical similarities from what I've seen in the side by side pictures separated at birth. Well, then it's one of Sebastian's complaints is that Jericho is trying to copy him. <laughs> you are such a joke. I can't wait to kick the shit out of you just for fun. Hey, shrimp. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> Holy <laughs> Jesus Christ. Hey, shrimp. Why don't you text me back? You fucking asshole. A pussy. 
I'm sick and tired of your copycat bullshit. So there it is right there. Wow. Someone give him a mic. I want to hear him talk now. Hey, Skid Row Deathmatch. I'm telling you. That's something we need to see. I'll 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 buy that. Now, last week on AEW, Jericho mentioned the demos and how AEW, even when they lose by a lot sometimes, the overall number of viewers, they win that demo. A lot of people thought it was kind of silly to mention that on TV. It kind of showed that this has gotten to Chris Jericho. We saw that it got to Tony Khan. He tweeted out and about also, it. And also, it's gotten, this, it's gotten down to this, that you have to brag about having more people in a certain age group than the other program that just beats you in total number of viewers. And, and there's a lot of people, well, Cornet doesn't understand how television works. It's all about the demo. And yeah, I don't understand how TV works. You dumb fucks. I'm not talking about whether the network is happy with their advertising. I'm talking about when you've got a show available in a hundred million homes and you can't get but six or seven hundred thousand people to watch it, you got a pretty shitty fucking show. That's just I'm sorry. Remember when Ole Anderson got the seven thirty AM Saturday morning time slot? On TBS from Ted Turner. On Saturdays. When, yeah. On Saturday when Ted felt bad about Vince getting the fucking uh, uh, regular time slot, he gave Ole an hour on Saturday morning at 7.30. Ole's hour on Saturday morning at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific, was drawing more viewers than AEW is now. Just for comparison's sake. This is why I'm not impressed with any of these fucking made up or fucking fumbled numbers. Well, considering Jericho's reaction to the ratings talk, do you think he's going to be singing this week on dynamite? <laughs> do you think he's going to come out there and say, well, you, you know, people say I can't sing. Watch this. You know, actually he should do a concert and have somebody break the fucking guitar over his head or he break the guitar over somebody else's head. But if, if, if he was that, that's another reason I feel bad for Drew McIntyre because of the pandemic. The best thing that Chris had going, the fucking sing along with all the people of Judas was cool, even though he's a heel and everybody's out there, you know, blowing him and fondling his testicles. He's supposed to be a heel, but still it was a cool thing that they started doing and the people, you know, picked up on and, and kept going with. And now they can't even do that. I bet he's like, motherfucker. Right? That was a fucking cool deal. So I, I don't know, you know, maybe he and Sebastian Bach should join forces and, and maybe they if they could dig Greg Allman up, they could do a trio and go out and, you know, the fucking uh, bleach blonde look like we've been floating in the river for three days crew. All right. I didn't expect you to bring Greg Allman into the mix here. Well, I'm just, you know, he, he's probably, he's probably sprier now than either one of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say that a popular topic that has been sent in by many people. We will do a combination and just ask them all is one right here. Have you been following AJ Styles recent comments about Dixie Carter? No, I have not. Please enlighten me as to what these comments were. I'm going to read you a quote and then feel free to say whatever you think. Here's a quote from AJ Styles. This was, I'm trying to see where this was from. Twitch. He did a live stream on Twitch. <laughs> he, 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 he twitched. He twitched. He, you know, that would have been, Gene Anderson would have been the perfect spokesperson for <laughs> Twitch. <laughs> oh, come on. That's awful. I'll go to hell for that. I love Gene. Gene was a great guy. Anyway, go ahead. Vince Russo, as a person, I love the guy. And we butted heads as far as him writing, even in TNA. But I realized when we butted heads, it was because he was getting things from Dixie the whole time. It must have been very difficult to work with this woman who has no idea how wrestling works and <clears throat> wanted everything to be done. Excuse me. I wanted everything to be done to it. And it didn't make any sense. We butted heads with him as a writer. But due to Dixie Carter getting involved a lot with creative. Do I believe Dixie <laughs> ruined impact? Well, it was TNA back then. And 100%. Impact, there was a time when it was really gaining ground. The problem was, Dixie wanted it to be WWE light, and that's not oh what boy. people wanted. Oh they boy. wanted to see something else. 
All she had to do was let us do what we do. It was really that simple. Had she left it to the writers, I think TNA would still be around and be bigger than what they are, but not knowing what's best for business, she hurt (laughs) TNA. Now, what are your (laughs) thoughts on his views about the inner workings of TNA, Dixie Carter, and that it wasn't Vince Russo's writing, it was that Dixie was telling him what to write? Oh, boy. Um... AJ has some, as we've spoken about here recently, has some controversial viewpoints, such as he said there's questions yet to be asked on whether the earth is flat or round. Wasn't that one of them? <laughs> that the deed was one and of them. <laughs> look, here's the thing. He's right in certain respects, but for the wrong reasons. He's right. Ultimately, the responsibility for the shit show that was TNA wrestling was Dixie Carter's. Um, And much of that was because of the person that she hired to be in charge of the creative, Vince Shitstain. Um, And one of Vince Shitstain's talents, he does have some, none of them are related to wrestling, but one of his talents is the ability to be able to talk to somebody. And also because I think he in his, in his warped, demented mind legitimately believes this. So he's very believable when he tells guys, this is that, well, I'd love to do this. And then the other thing, or we could do this and that, but they won't let me or Dixie wants me to do this or Vince wants me to do that or whatever the first standards and practices or whatever the fuck. Basically Vince Russo sat down with AJ styles and realized that he could convince AJ that he's a great guy, which he obviously did. And that, you know, the writing, unfortunately, it, it, Dixie wants this. Dixie didn't know what the fuck she wanted. Dixie was like some, some fucking body who'd never goddamn seen food cooked before to going into a fucking five-star restaurant and trying to tell him what she wanted prepared. What the fuck? Dixie had talent she liked. She thought... And I'm not saying that in a, in a, in a inappropriate way, but she thought that Hernandez, which she was correct in this, should be a, a Latino Mexican superstar uh, at one point. And, and, you know, I fully agreed with that. And unfortunately for Hernandez, she had picked an idiot to write her show who didn't know how to get that guy over. And when I left, that was the end of that because he didn't understand it. Um, so yeah, Dixie was responsible for creative in terms of who she hired to be in charge of it. And Jeff Jarrett, to his credit, while he was there, was able to balance most of the bullshit out, uh, with uh, actual shit that made sense or wouldn't harm talent when you presented him with a better way to do it. The whole time that I was there until Jeff was got sideways with Dixie and was sent home. Dixie may have sat in on a few production meetings, not that many. Sometimes she wasn't there at television. Another time she would get there right before taping started flying in from somewhere. She'd get just in time to get her makeup done to go out in front of the fans and take posed pictures, holding the TNA title belt. Uh, But if you had a creative question or if I did, I went to Jeff Jarrett. And if the talent did, because Vince Russo was head of creative, obviously, and I was not going to go to Vince Russo to try to help him make sense of shit that he obviously hadn't made sense of. So we would get the shit and I would go to Jeff Jarrett and I'd say, Jeff, what about if we do this? We get in the same place, but it won't make so-and-so look like a fucking idiot or be so phony. And he'd say, yeah, you're right. Let's do that. There was never any consultation on to Dixie Carter on fucking creative. Uh, and, and I, AJ was there before I got there and, and he was there after I was gone and he was there after Jeff Jarrett was gone during the time that Jeff Jarrett was there. There was never any consultation by any, by, and I was the head producer by anybody on creative or uh, with creative with Dixie Carter on the day of the TV show. Now I'm sure since Russo also made it a habit to talk to her as much as possible so he could poison her mind and, and take advantage of her because of the fact that she didn't know anything about wrestling. And he does have that talent to convince people who don't know anything about fucking wrestling that he knows something about it. So I'm sure they talked all the time, 
but to say that it, he could have done a bunch of other stuff for AJ and and it was doing shit that AJ didn't want because of Dixie is fucking ridiculous. And it's just that AJ, I hate to say this, I like him. He's great talent. Apparently, he's easily led to believe things by people. We know he's religious. He believes that the earth, there's questions to be asked on fucking flatness or roundness or the shape of the earth. And he believes Vince Russo when Vince Russo tells him he could do other shit, but it's somebody else's fault. I talked to a couple of talents after a long, after I'd been gone and they'd been gone from TNA, but were there in that time period who were convinced somehow that it was Jeff that didn't like them instead of fucking Russo. I said, you'd have been a per- you'd have been someone that Jeff Jarrett would have really enjoyed <laughs> if he was writing the show by himself, but no Russo was writing a show. And Jeff was trying to run talent relations and fucking creative and everything else important in the company because all Dixie could do was hire her school friends to office positions and have her pictures taken for magazine stories where she looked like she was auditioning, which was actually true. She was. She wanted to be a real housewife of Nashville on television because the deuce bags are fucking egotistical. So that was the relationship. And, and bless AJ. I guess maybe they bonded over the invisible man in the sky, him and shit stain, because people who believe in that kind of thing will overlook any egregious fault in another person because they bond over that fucking level of insanity they have about what they believe is true and supernatural and et cetera. Do you think there's any way TNA could have succeeded under Dixie Carter, even if Vince Russo wasn't there? Was she that big of Uh, a problem at the top that it couldn't have succeeded no matter what? I mean, it's just, you know, amateur hour bullshit. It, they could have succeeded at a certain level, but at the level they were trying to be at, that was too, it was over her head. She was a, a fucking fence post turtle. You got fence post turtles up in New Jersey, don't you? I've never even heard that expression before. No, I don't think we do. Every so often when you're riding down the road out in the country or on your fucking walk or whatever, you will come across a turtle sitting on top of a fence post. And the fucking first thought you have is this is not that turtle's natural environment. He didn't get there by himself. He doesn't know what to do now that he's there and he's going to need some help to get out of it. Dixie Carter was a fence post turtle. And look here before we, you mentioned this earlier, before we get on these TV reviews, AEW and they, it's a play on words because the heels are meant that the heels are being worn by all their female wrestling fans. Is this correct? And it's a site gear, geared toward the female fans. I think this so. Is what I've heard? I believe so. Although I think AEW pumps would have worked better. Well, for what, what difference does it make? There are no female wrestling fans, especially for this fucking horse shit, neck beard fucking lover show. Uh, but there's no female wrestling fans left anywhere, are there? All the all the female wrestlers, all their fans are men that act like teenage girls when you knock their favorite female wrestler and they goddamn write letters to you in crayon threatening to kill you. But are there are there female wrestling fans left with what it's become? And also, then, once again, would any of them be wearing heels? There are some, I mean, the bigger question is, you know, I I believe the goal was, it was announced a little while ago, like we're going to create this community for female wrestling fans to feel welcome and talk. And now it's, we're going to create this community for female wrestling fans to feel welcomed and talk for $50 a month. (laughs) Well, that means they're going to gross $150 a month (laughs) if all of them sign up. Well, they're not going to be able to check if it's women. It's going to be a bunch of guys like, yes, this is Marcy. Yeah. I want to talk to Brandy. The mouth breathers that, you know what? That's when, when, when Sinclair Broadcasting first bought Ring of Honor, um, they, they set about trying to, you know, 
we we all set about trying to enlarge the company and and you know make things bigger. We thought they were going to do the same. They did. They wanted to just not not spend any money to do it. But one of the things was Joe Coff asked the question: Why are we selling other wrestling promotions DVDs? And because Ring of Honor had always made money selling you know wrestling DVDs, not only theirs but they would get the PWG stuff in bulk and sell that. Uh, and, and the, I can't remember what the name of the women's promotion was, but, uh, they would sell the women's and shimmer. I said, shimmer. Okay. And, and Dave Prezak like, promotion, yeah. Dave Prezak, nice guy. I'm not even knocking them now. Uh, but I'm just, the, the, just mentioning them that they were selling the DVDs. And my thought was why the fuck a would we, if we're going to start a national wrestling promotion on television, why would we be selling other promotions DVDs? That's like WCW selling WWF DVDs or whatever the fuck. Secondly, the last thing we'd want to sell is PWG because it, it was even then it was the fucking inmates running the asylum and a Mark spot fest of a bunch of guys doing everything they ever learned how to do over and over for hours at a time. And of course, Ross, the merchandise weasel said, well, that that's besides our shows, that's our most popular product. I said, and then he told me how many they were selling. I said, so for fucking 2,500 bucks a month or whatever, we're coming out ahead. You're going to fucking foist this shit off on the wrestling fans and show them our guys in some cases working out there and doing fucking this crazy bullshit. No, cut, shut that shit down now. And so what about the shimmer videos? I said, does anybody who buys them? Who, because there's, we weren't seeing any women fans at our matches or anybody else's even back then. And I'm sorry, I, I, as you can tell, I came from a generation where you had to literally tie most of the guys in their fucking seats to make them watch girl wrestling. And I said, who's buying them? And it's, well, generally, this is where I was going with this. Generally, <laughs> people call up and ask like, Hey, hey, do you have any matches with uh, 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 Sally, the farmer's daughter in them from uh, uh, at least last year or what? You know, like mouth breathing guys were buying the fucking girl wrestling videos. And I'm like, why would you do that? Because you can get this shit on the Internet for free and they're naked and using toys. So why would you watch girl wrestling for sexual gratification? It the whole thing didn't make sense to me. Uh, Where were we? But anyway, so now they've <laughs> run off all the women fans, and the guy fans are the ones who are the fans of most of the women wrestlers because of their fucking psyches somehow. So now the promotion that probably has fewer women fans than any other promotion because it's just a bunch of stupid jack off guys doing silly shit to each other is going to charge the few women fans they have $50 a month to be in their heel group. And I, I'm pretty sure that if most of the women that liked AEW, if they put heels on, they wouldn't be able to take more than two steps because they'd be stuck so deep in the fucking ground. So, what the fuck? I just went looking for some quotes about this. I figured, let me go to SI because they always have puff pieces, so there'll definitely be some quotes here. Here's a Article from SI, Sports Illustrated, about this. Here's some quotes from Brandy Rhodes. Oh, boy. I still don't feel comfortable in wrestling, and I'm the chief brand officer of a major organization. Wrestling has a really long way to go with women. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, on the surface of the moon as a NASA astronaut either, because I'd be way out of my fucking element. The yeah. idea came from me watching people interact on social media. I saw women getting bashed for having an opinion just because they were a woman having an opinion. That inspired me to create a place where female fans can voice their opinions. Don't let someone take your opinion away from you. Don't let that ever shut you down. Talk about what you love. This platform is a place Nobody where Nobody women... ever shuts her opinions down. That's the problem. This platform Every, is a... Everything she fucking dreams up somehow gets done. This platform is a place where women can be themselves as wrestling fans, create friendships, and learn. We can create a movement, it says here in the article. To do what? Rhodes, 
is the 37-year-old Brandy Runnels, and she brings a wealth of experience to her position as chief brand officer. She also carries a degree from the prestigious University of Michigan, as well as a master's degree from the University of Miami, though questions about her education are not often included when critics opine about her ascent in the wrestling business. And then we got another quote here. What the fuck? Well, wait a minute. First of all, what the fuck does an education have anything to do with an ascent in the wrestling business to begin with? Albert Einstein would have been a rotten wrestler. I'm reminded, uh, <laughs> I'm reminded of that every time I'm told I only have my position because I slept my way into it, said Rhodes, whose husband is AEW I, Executive Vice President Cody Rhodes. I never said that. She married her way into it. Not everybody that Cody's fucked actually got a position. In wrestling, the man is Adam and the woman is Eve. Adam belongs and Eve does not. Oh, for fuck. That's a perception. That needs to change. Well, good luck, because it ain't gonna. And then I see there's more quotes here about her. You know, at this point, Brandy's trying to justify why she's there. And the fact of the matter is, I'm sure she's a very nice person. And I've never seen anyone prettier with go-home heat in my entire life. But no one wants to see Brandy on their TV. And no one is interested in any of this stuff that she's doing. AEWheels.com for the women fans. Only $50 a month. Only $50 a month to learn from the wisdom of Brandy. To learn what? About what? You're still watching the same wrestling show. What is it? What is that? Why, why do women have to join this $50 a month thing to feel safe on social media? And by the way, you do only have your position because of Cody. If Cody wasn't there, you wouldn't be there. If well, of Cody, course not. If Cody quit tomorrow, you would not be retained much longer. I mean, give well, me a break. Well, I mean, wh why is that in dispute? And if that's not even a knock on her. No. she's She's got a better education than Cody does. She could go out and I'm pretty sure probably get a real job somewhere quicker than Cody could. Doesn't have anything to fucking do with what we're talking about here, which is the wrestling business. And people want to be on television, despite the fact that there's not a, a real big clamor for them to be there. And what about this women's tag team tournament? When does that thing start that we've got to sit no, through? No, it started. Gonna... It's, it started already. I did. I watched the show. I didn't see a goddamn thing. This apparently they made it a standalone show. I thought from the packages they had on TV that it was going to be on Dynamite. They created a separate show. Just for YouTube, I believe. You're kidding. No, and every review I heard said it was all. So we, do, so we don't have to fucking watch it. We don't it have to watch it. It will not be on Dynamite. Oh, I am. I'm kind of interested Woo, to see Wait it, a minute. Though, hold on. Wait a minute. Hold on here. Let me see. Ah, hold on. I'll find it. There it is. <laughs> Thank God. I, uh, I'm i kind oh, of interested to shit. see it, though, because from what I heard, it was just really bad. It was really, really, really bad. Well, I and, mean, Brand and Brandy's a, behind it. A dog it. barks and a cat meows, so yes, but we've already got bad on the major network to watch. Hey, let me ask you something. You have a women's division, right? Let's just say in the fantasy world, you have a women's division for you. Yes, yes. Who do you feel more comfortable as the creative behind it? Kenny Omega or Brandy Rhodes? <laughs> because those are, the two, those are the two creative forces oh, of the AEW women's division. I, you know... Uh, if I have to pick, it's like electric chair or the gas chamber. I'll go, I think, a more feminine touch to be in charge of the women, so I'll go with Kenny Olivier. I actually think Kenny Omega has a better grasp on who can work, and you have a better chance of getting... I didn't say that. I just think I, that, I'm the, saying that. The, the, the girl talk will be more interesting between, <laughs> between Twinkle Toes and, and the, the other girls. You know, but I don't think either one of them have a grip on anything related to wrestling. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. Like I said, I, I think Brandy's just trying to justify her position. But this, she's not done one thing in AEW that people have wanted to see her here. Not one yes, thing. Yes, she did. She she starred in Travis Eckel's artwork when he was, <laughs> he was making all those that week or two that we talked about it where every fucking piece of art had Brandy leaning in from behind, th peeking through a window or leaning in and waving. <laughs> and Brandy! <laughs> she became a meme there for a couple weeks. They made an action figure of Brandy. 
Uh, it writes itself. I don't know what you want from me here. I don't know. I I mean, there was that there was that famous Francis Crockett action figure back in '87. Uh, I don't I don't know what you want. I had the John Ringley plane playset, <laughs> stewardess, and everything. <laughs> All right, we've popped ourselves. You've re- we're 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 reaching way back into the exotic reference category this week. Speaking of help, Shane McMahon. <laughs> I, I've said this many times. I like Shane. Shane is my favorite McMahon. Shane's a heck of a guy. Balls of steel. What an athlete. Nice guy conversational you know he 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 really he comes off as very nice he got a nice family nice i met his kids a few years ago i was down there for wrestlemania the hall of fame thing but goddamn he 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 wanted to buy the ufc 20 years ago before dana white put the fertita brothers together to do it i've told you this right because he's I always actually heard this from Bob Myrowitz, so I heard it yeah. from the other side. Yeah, he 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 always liked the idea of the shoot fighting, and that's why he people blister him because of his punches, and they are rotten. But he's trying to do the boxing fighting thing, right? It just it looks, you know. But he's he, he's always had the idea that this real shit will sell, but he just needs help in in executing it, and. I don't know why. As a matter of fact, I wrote the the notes that I wrote on this thing. I will try to explain at the top what I think of what is it, the Underground Club or Raw Underground or the Fight Club or Raw Underground. Who was in this movie? (laughs) Yeah, who was it? It's been so long ago. I can't remember who was in the movie. There were several people in there that I did not recognize, and then of course there were some recognizable names. No, no, I mean in the movie, the Fight Club. This is what they stole from, right? It well, fucking movie's 20 years old. Brad Pitt, Ed Norton, Brad Meatloaf. Pitt, yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking of Brad Pitt, you know, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, that's what it's based on, right? Because I don't even remember seeing the movie. It's been 20 fucking years. But I, I get the the vibe, and I've seen it in the past. I get the vibe that that's the thing. They go to the underground fight club. That's what they're they're trying to do here, right? I think it's, it's that. With, with dancing girls. I think it's part that, and I think... Clearly, it's been influenced a bit by. There were some indie shows run. I think it was called Josh Barnett's Blood Sport. I saw some clips of a while back where it was shoot ish matches in a ring with no ropes, which is the exact look of this. Okay, but well, and I guarantee you, if Josh Barnett did it, it probably looked a whole lot fucking more real, to it be looked, honest. It looked a lot better than this, yes. Um, but it, it this was like. <laughs> And I guarantee you, Vince chimed in. Well, we gotta have dancing girls, pal. That's good shit, because he was the the the, the most important thing to him on Shotgun Saturday Night, twenty fucking what was it three years ago, with the the dancing girls in the cages at the goddamn, uh, what was that nightclub up there in New York? They did the first Webster Hall. Why do I know that? We had to go down there and do a site survey. Me and Bruce and Vince and everything, and and I'm like, how the fuck are we going to have wrestling in this dark, fucking small, and the catacombs and the catwalks and everything? I'm like, what the fuck's a wrestling show going to look like in here? And I found out. But, and 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 of course, Shitstain loves the whole dancing girl thing. Didn't he have dancing girls in cages in fucking the early days of TNA? I, I didn't watch the early days of TNA, but it sounds right. Yeah, well, I'm. I was hearing written descriptions of it, uh, along with midgets beating off in trash cans or whatever. That was what he was known for: was dancing girls in the cages. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. In the early days of TNA, Shitstain did that. The point is, all people named Vince apparently love the dancing girls in the cages. But in this case, they cut the fucking dancing. They're in. The, they're in a warehouse with regular lighting. And, you know, just a bunch of junk everywhere and people beating on the ring with no ropes. And then all of a sudden there's a shot of the dancing girls in what looks like a club under purple lights for two seconds for no apparent. And they're dancing, even though there's no music playing, they're just gyrating and writhing. They look sort of like fucking Kenny Olivier on his way to the fucking ring. 
gesticulating and finger pointing. Is that they looked a little better than Olivier? I must honestly admit. So I saw the, the, the highlights of this. I didn't watch it as it happened. I saw, but the Shane was all jacked up at the start of the thing. And I was hoping he'd calm down instead of trying to do running commentary over the whole thing, which he did, uh, toward the end of it. He, or toward the, as it went on, he calmed down a little bit and then the other guys were talking, but I've just, they couldn't do this for Dan Severn or Ken Shamrock, or Kurt Angle, or Steve Blackman, but they do it for Daba Kato? <laughs> the f- fuck was it? And then, that's what I was... <laughs> that name has been what? stuck in my head ever Daba since Daba Kato. <laughs> and he looked, he looked like, you know, the fucking red-headed stepchild of the Samoan family, where he kind of looked like a Samoan, but he didn't. Why did they go out of their way this is my con- the, my thought on this concept, raw underground, where anything can happen and there's no rules and it's so dangerous. <laughs> Did you see how the matches end? Well, yes, but as soon as somebody gets knocked down, oh shit, stop it! There's no rules and this is dangerous, but goddamn, we don't want anybody to get hurt. Yeah, Shane just gets in there and goes, "That's enough. That's it. That's yeah, it. that's enough. He's had enough." I <laughs> see guys fucking fly off the goddamn Titan Tron through tables head first on Raw. And they get up and continue the match, but this guy takes a knee to the head and fucking he's down for a second. And Shane says, no, that's enough. But that's the thing. They, the WWE as a company, why do they go out of their way to tell us it's all fake and it's all entertainment and it's all scripted and they're playing characters and all the other things they say. And then every time they try to juice things up or get interest or sell tickets or uh, plug a big pay-per-view back in the day, or now it's just get the ratings up for the rights fees or whatever. They try to do something that's purportedly real because everybody knows that will sell more tickets. And then they don't know how to make it look real when there are ways that you can make this shit look real. So that is why the logic of this whole, not only the whole industry now, but the WWE in specific drives me completely bat shit bonkers out of my fucking mind. They go out of their way to tell us it's fake, except when they need to draw money. And then they, along with everybody else, acknowledge and recognize that the things that draw money are the things that people believe are real. So they try to do worked real shit and don't make it look real. Am I missing something? No, I don't think you are. Uh, So... We now know what real MMA looks like. And they have guys, as we will see in a second, that have competed in real MMA. I'm not going to shit on this whole thing because there's a positive to this I'll get to in a second. But the, the, they came back from one break and, and Shane welcomed, welcomed us back and the girls were mad at each other. The dancing girls who are dancing even though there's no music. Just a, a, a little pulse in the background. Boom, 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 boom. Sort of like the telltale heart. Maybe the fucking guy's buried under the warehouse. And then fucking Shane says, maybe the girls can fight next week. And I guarantee you that'll never be referred to again. And then Erica, the Viking Raiders beats somebody up. But then here comes MVP and the hurt business. Okay. MVP did a good promo job here. I like the hurt business. That's kind of a cool name for his little stable. They come in and take over the show that's been on the air for 10 fucking minutes. Did you notice this? And then Shane says, okay, we're going to come in and and fucking radically take over this show that has never been seen before 10 minutes ago, but now we're going to take it over. Okay. But then Bobby Lashley beats the shit out of a guy, which is good because Lashley's the real deal. And I've said he's, I can't believe it's been 15 years since he was in OVW. And he was not, he had already uh, had an MMA career and been in the service by then. So I'm thinking he's now he's in early to mid forties and looks like a million dollars. Uh, so How old you, is Shelton? I'm going to get to that. Then MVP takes his jacket off and then more girls. Every time someone have, I guess they want to cover cuts. They just do a, a cutaway, a B-roll, more girls. 
Uh, they jerked the littlest guy in, and MVP beats him up. That was pretty good. And then he introduced Shelton Benjamin. I will now spend five minutes or so raving about Shelton Benjamin and how that they've taken this long to figure out how to do something with this fucking guy or why to do something or just to do something. Shelton was in OVW with Brock. He came in in 2001 and he had already graduated college and been assistant wrestling coach at Minnesota, which is, he was one of Brock's coaches. And so I, I can't remember how old Shelton is, but he's ever bit of 45 and he looks as good as he ever did. And it's not bullshit when other people have said, Jim Ross has said, other people have said Shelton pretty much any time he's ever been in the WWE locker room, he was the best athlete there. The best all around pure athlete by the definition of the word athlete. He's a better athlete than Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar is a physical fucking freak, and he used that size and the way that he could move it. But his wrestling technique was not as good as Shelton's, and his car, nobody's cardio is good as Shelton's, <clears throat> and his Shelton's balance. Plus, Shelton was a wrestling fan from South Carolina, Orangeburg, and grew up watching the biggest stars in the business as a fan, and he knew what the shit was supposed to look like, and he was brilliant instantly which is why I teamed him and Brock up. Not only could we tell the story about them being teammates and et cetera at Minnesota, but also because somebody had to have the rest of the match so that Brock could get a tag and come in and make a comeback because he was drizzling fucking boring shits when he first got started. But Shelton had something he could also sell believably. Um, He never worked out. He, he came to every wrestling practice. You couldn't blow him up. But he ate McDonald's and junk and, you know, didn't do any type of workout workout and was ripped naturally and in that shape. And I, th I remember, God, I it's been less than 10 years or ago, less than 10 years ago that I, I as a matter of fact, when he was in uh, Ring of Honor, which was like eight years ago, he came to me, he said, yeah, he said, I'm getting old. Started having to work out once in a while. It is it just he's a fucking freak, but his work has always been tremendous and what a great guy. The only flaw in his game was his promos, which to be honest, now viewing with today's eyes, when everybody just recites monotone bullshit that they've rehearsed, Sheldon's Mr. Personality. His promos automatically look five times better 15 years later because everybody else is so much worse. Um, but anyway, uh, he goozled a big guy and then they all beat up everybody in the gym and the, the camera work did make me ill because they're doing all the fucking herky jerky stuff. But, and Shane did an awkward close more girls. And then MVP said the last line, we're the hurt business and business is good. Okay. I'll to anything that gets Shelton Benjamin a fucking top spot in a wrestling promotion. I'll, I'll, I'll fucking go along with it, but I, there's so many easier ways, especially with some of the talent involved, including Lashley and Shelton that are, are legitimate. Uh, they're, they're just, you need a better host than Shane. Shane's not a TV host. I love the guy the guys, a great guy. He's very intelligent. It's just some things some people can't do. And Shane is not a TV host. He's not smooth. He's not natural. And it comes off as hokey because some of the ways that he phrases that, well, there's no rules. Anything could happen. We can do this or that or whatever. It just, it's, it's, it was local TV. And they did too much gaga at start before they brought the shooters in. The shooter shit looked better, but still they could, they don't have to cut so quick with these guys. You know, I've I've watched Dan Severn, I've watched Ken Shamrock, I've watched a number of guys work shoots that you you could shoot with one camera, and you couldn't see through it. And for the purposes, of, and it doesn't need to be twenty minutes long; that would be boring. But for the purpose of this exercise, to have these guys who could really do it go in and stretch somebody and sugar them in a, a fucking minute, 
and just concentrate on what they're doing instead of the fucking artsy fartsy camera bullshit would make it look more legitimate. And you could have the strippers or the dancers or whatever. They were PG rated. I've never seen strippers so fucking covered up. So I don't know what they were, but they didn't need to be there and it distracted. And why did they have purple light, but everybody else was just standing in a warehouse. It's the TV end. The TV studio up there gets a hold of things, tries to dress it up with their fucking ideas that are sometimes better left unsaid. I, it, one person, Dusty Rhodes, Eddie Graham, Bill Watts, fucking it, somebody could have walked in there and told me and told everybody this is exactly the way we're going to do this, exactly the way we're going to shoot this. You're not going to be able to see any holes in it, and these guys are going to get over but when you let the TV studio do their thing and fucking somebody else chimes in and there'll be dancing girls who gives a fuck. If they're not naked doing a goddamn Tijuana donkey dildo show, I don't give a fuck. Cause I can see that for free on the internet. Don't get in the way of my fucking wrestling. Anyway, that's so I hope to fuck that they will use this to just get the hurt business in the ring somewhere and start hurting people that we know who the fuck they are instead of this off brand fight club fucking blood sport rip off whatever the fuck it is what do you think about the fact that this apparently is a response to less people watching raw than ever before that they're losing viewers each and every week they saw this as a response to get attention what do you think of that that shows how fucking lost they are this was not going to get attention unless it was completely different and believable and legitimate. And they haven't they been doing the one of the McMahon offspring comes in and tries to take over the company for the past 25 years now? And 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 I'm not knocking Shane, but do you believe that he's suddenly being a subversive and gonna fucking do all that? And 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 it's it was still obviously not real. This was not done like a sport. It was done like a movie. They keep trying to do things that are supposedly real to get attention, but they don't do them where people would believe them. People ain't going to, It's if you just start, if you just interrupt raw with, oh, and here's a movie. Nobody's going to give a shit either because they don't watch raw to watch a movie. It doesn't make sense. And they, and, and are, it, it wouldn't be that hard to do something legitimate. The fucking snake pit. There's the goddamn gimmick. The snake pit match that they did with Riddle and fucking who's what's he on NXT. We said Thatcher. that was a Thatcher. Thank you. That was an updated gimmick. That's perfect for guys with MMA backgrounds. It's like an updated hell in a cell thing. It's not so stupid like the elimination chamber with the plexiglass panes and the multiple people and is it a hat on a hat. It, it, it's two fucking badasses can go in this thing and use the contraption. They can't get in or out, but they can use it in a variety of ways. We said that was cool. Why is that not raw underground instead of a ripoff of, I guarantee you, nobody name McMahon watched anything that Josh Barnett did or any other pro wrestling event from anywhere. Maybe some of the fucking comedy writers saw it and being that they're not athletes themselves, nor do they have any idea how to fucking do anything related to a shoot. They didn't grasp all of it and just took away certain aspects of it, but nobody named McMahon watched anything of any kind pro wrestling related Josh Barnett or otherwise to do this, they're, they're doing a movie and that ain't it. You can't look at either, either buck and not look at those faces and th that Sammy Guevara has a slappable face that translates to the wrestling business. These two little middle, middle schoolers are just slappable and it just, anyway, uh Oh, you know what that means? It's a toll-free call. Hold on. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> ah, well, we're on a program right now, so why are you people always calling me? Who is that? This is Babar from National Pin. 
What's national? I've, what's National Pen? The National Pen Company. As a, here's here's something else: the Cornets collectibles extras. I'm always trying to get keychains or pins or or the pocket knives. Those were good ones. From a company called National Pin, that's where I would and I would send free things to people who spent a lot of money or ordered a number of things, or I was late with their stuff or whatever. I'd throw free shit in, and they would send me these mailers, and I would then fill out what I wanted and send it in, and they would send me the stuff, and I'd send them a check. Well, then they started calling me on the phone and wanting to talk to me on the phone. I don't talk to anybody on the phone. I don't have time, much less to order fucking free pins. I'm going to give out. So I didn't call them back. Well, then I started sending in my orders off the cards they send me, and they wouldn't send me my shit. They apparently were going to hold me up for a fucking phone call. That's why nobody's been getting free shit lately, because I can't get any either. I pay for it and give it away for free, and I still can't get any. The last three orders I've sent in, they didn't send me my flashlight keychains. They didn't send me my pins. They didn't send me my shit. Because I won't call them on the phone and I won't talk to them on the phone. That's why you people out there are not getting your free stuff that I'm trying to pay for to give to you for free. Because the National Pen Company insists on calling me on the phone now instead of sending me my shit that I order through the mail. And I don't have time for this shit. And by the way, for anyone wondering, they're on Twitter at National Pen. Yeah, tell him just send Cornette his shit because he ain't going to talk to you on a fucking phone. <laughs> I've ordered thousands of dollars of stuff from them, have never stiffed them one time, always paid them, and turn around and give the shit away for free. Now they want me to hold me up for a fucking phone call with my schedule instead of just sending me my shit in the mail? Fuck them. Anyway. All right. So the next match. <laughs> well, they shouldn't have got me in the middle of watching this thing. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. that Before the next match, Stone Cold Moxley was on the stairs somewhere. A couple questions about this that's come in. Let me read both of these questions, or at least let me read two of these questions. This one was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through. It is from Southpaw Radio. Excuse me, Southpaw's Radio. What are your thoughts about Booker T's recent comments about Dixie Carter having parties with the boys and, quote, living her MILF dream? <laughs> Does this give credibility to similar comments Scott Hall made a few years ago on shoot interviews? And then another question sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Jason from Toledo. I'm a longtime listener and cult member. I was listening to the Booker T podcast. Booker stated that Dixie Carter was a MILF and she was dipping her pen in the company ink. <laughs> I was wondering if Jim knew anything wait, about this. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, wouldn't Dixie be the ink well instead of the pen? I was wondering if Jim knew anything about this. Was Dixie known to sleep with talent? Was she a party girl? I'm curious if these accusations are true. Oh, good Lord. I I don't know what Scott Hall said. And Scott Hall would have uh, the double edged sword about Scott Hall is he'd have more insight into this than most folks because he, of his friendship with Kevin Nash and other people who, who had been at the top of the TNA organization on top of the TNA organization or on top of whatever in TNA, the company Inc, uh, the company Inc. Uh, but also, you know, it, it goes back to, can you always believe everything? The, the words that are coming out of God all's mouth. I, myself as Dennis Condry, I will paraphrase what he once said. I never saw a penis and vagina merge together. However, what I've talked about is that Dixie was just so impressed about being an executive and about having this wrestling company and about having this, this talent. And you would invariably see when you came back to the double tree across from universal studios, where we taped the, the, fiascos you'd you'd come back to the double tree as you're walking to the elevators go to your room or whatever in the bar restaurant in the lobby you would invariably see dixie surrounded by a number of the people that love to sit there and pour her another glass of wine and tell her how great she was and nash was there plenty and there was it was a whole and 
The only that was the only time Russo wasn't sucking up because Russo's such a fucking puss. He won't even go in a bar, and probably he's probably one of those like the fucking idiot vice president we got that doesn't go anywhere where there's females around unless his wife accompanies him. But that was then that was time for the boys to take over, and they're all sitting around her, telling her how great she is, and pouring her another glass of wine, and putting her over. And you could tell she appreciated all of that attention. So I'm not saying that there there was or wasn't anything inappropriate sexually going on, but it was definitely who the fuck is going to, and a lot of it showed in who was then featured in this company or things that were done. Who was going to go and put this douchebag over as something special when she was in over her head, as, as we mentioned, the fence post turtle, and had... No idea what's going, and that's why she listened to so she loved to listen to charming people that she thought knew what the fuck they were talking about. Whether it was Kevin Nash pouring wine in the you know a bar of the DoubleTree or Russo fawning over her and acting like he's a wrestling genius, and she had no ability to di- to ascertain which was which or who knew what because she didn't know what the fuck was going on with the wrestling business. So, you know, there you have it. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying she was a who, as Frank Reynolds might say. Uh, but at the same time, you know, what the fuck? You, I have a quote. It, it, no, go ahead. I have a quote from Booker T. I don't know what Dixie was doing half the time. I know she was hanging out in the bar, hanging out with the boys. <laughs> When you're hanging out with the boys, the water might get hot. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know what Dixie was doing, but she seemed like she was living out her MILF dream. Serious, man. Dixie was getting busy. I'm not going to say what she was doing, but Dixie was definitely... How do you say it back in the day? Hot to trot? <laughs> I don't know. She had the makeup and everything on. I don't know how much writing she was doing for the show. And it goes on from there. Wait a minute. She wasn't doing any writing for the show. Well, according to AJ, it was her behind everything and not, oh, not Russo. Oh, uh, Well, but, but coming was she, back. Was she to- sleeping with AJ? Yes or no? Oh, for God's sake, no. Are you out completely out of your mind? If you said that in front of AJ Styles, he would turn, his face would turn red and he would get pissed because he'd be embarrassed because he's a Christian. I wouldn't care. But, uh, I guarantee no, you brought I, up people I, I getting pushed I, on no, TV. No, I guarantee goddamn to you. There are a few things in life that I can guarantee you. But AJ Styles messed around on his wife, much less with Dixie Carter, would probably be one of those I can pretty fucking much dismiss. What about America's Most Wanted? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well no, wait a minute. I was trying to remember. <laughs> No, God damn it. Stop it. Now you've gone completely off the rails here. I was trying to remember what the storm's partner's name was. Poor God. Poor goddamn Chris Harris. It took me a second. That's what I was trying to remember. Um, I, I mean, I, I I don't think so. I can, I can, I can, I can't speak for Chris Harris. James Storm never brought it up to me and, it, you know, and, and I never saw anything. He wasn't one of the, he was not one of the people sucking up at that time. He was one of the guys doing all the fucking work, the storms and Harris's and fucking Rudes and Bobby Rude. That is not Rick Rude. And, and Samoa Joe and AJ and Daniels, those guys were doing all the work. And the other guys that were the WWE fucking over the hill gang were doing all the sucking up because they were getting all the money. So, I, I no, I do. I don't think America's most wanted. No, but the point with Booker T, you're getting hot to trot here. Dixie Carter just loved attention, and she obviously thought herself quite beautiful. I've told the story. She was flying in from Texas for one of the TV tapings. This was before she was ever an on-air performer or character or whatever she just came to most of the tapings not all but most at this time but uh, i remember they they had a makeup room in one of the soundstage um 
But the, the buildings, if you've ever been at Universal Studios, and I'm now at two inside baseball, but there's offices and you go outside and then there's production rooms and you go outside and there's a sound stage and they got the blah, blah, blah. They always set a makeup room for the knockouts, the girls in the same area. And one day I'm standing there because it's the hallway. You go into it as the hallway where the production meeting is had. And one of the stooges, office stooges, I can't remember who, I, just somebody that worked in the office is running in with a fucking headset and going, I got to clear the makeup room. It's, what do you mean? Dixie Carter had phoned from the either the plane or the airport saying her plane was late. When she landed, she was going to come straight from the airport, and she wanted to make sure that she could get into the makeup chair immediately with no waiting because the show was going to start momentarily after that, and she had to have her makeup and hair done so that she could go out with the fans and take her pictures holding the title belt with the fans that she did before most of the tapings at Universal Studios. So they kicked the girls that were actually on the show out of the fucking makeup chair and put Dixie in so she could get prepped for that to go out and take pictures with the fans. Carrie Silken used to do the same thing. Oh, come on now. Let me ask you a couple more things and, on and this. And also, and also, you remember, she actually was trying to pitch... And it was Spike. They're lucky they got this fucking show on Spike because Spike wanted a wrestling show, and that's barely what they got. And I've told you how that it was so embarrassing when the Spike representative would be sitting there in the production meeting and have to listen to this fucking falderall be read by Mike Tanay that shit stain had written and the words were misspelled and they didn't know how to answer any questions. And then the Spike rep would go and play golf all afternoon and come back and watch the taping, make sure nobody said fuck on the air. She was trying to pitch the Real Housewives of Nashville, starring guess who, Dixie Carter, and her husband, Serge. Serge would have been, been the Brandy Rhodes of Real Housewives of Nashville. <laughs> so, that, so I don't know if Dixie was actually, you know, uh, bumping uglies, stuffing the muffin, however you want to fucking phrase it. But she just wanted attention. Let me ask you two more things on this topic. Because Scott Hall really started this whole thing years ago saying that he found out Dixie was fucking the boys. But which boy? Kevin Nash (laughs) was seen many times in the hotel drinking wine with Dixie. Did you ever hear anything when you were there about Kevin Nash and Dixie? No. But that doesn't mean... I mean... (laughs) Here's the thing is if Kevin Nash is married and lived 90 miles down the road. Uh, so I'm sure if it happened, he wouldn't want that getting out. And you know, is Dixie going to fucking come in the next day and, and, and fucking divine herself and stooge herself off and go, yeah, by the way, Kevin, great job last night. So, I mean, things can happen, but no, there was no guy. It was no raging goddamn rumor. Just the, the obvious talk that I heard was everybody sees Kevin Nash sitting there next to Dixie pouring wine in the fucking glass and telling her how great she is. That was the, the scuttlebutt. Nothing between Jeff Jarrett and Dixie. Not that I'm aware of. No. Okay. I think we've tackled this topic. People always, especially when she's, you know, the fucking modern day and Gunkle, except without the product knowledge, people are naturally going to assume in the wrestling business. That's the same reason why they think that Tommy rich had to do shit for Jim Barnett to get the belt. Cause they're going to say that because that's what you say. But, and, and sometimes it happens, but without legitimate, um, if I Jerry Jarrett used to swear to me that shit stain was fucking her. Jerry Jarrett would swear to me, believed it with all his heart because you know, he hadn't, He hadn't been around. He was not around Russo in a one-on-one situation like I was before it became completely untenable about six months into our relationship. And he just didn't pay enough attention to the fucking human being behind the idiot to know that I said it's not that I would think that Dixie wouldn't do it. It's that Russo wouldn't be brave enough to do it. He would would not uh, know in under no uncertain terms he told me one time in 1999 or whatever, he'd never been with a, a woman but his wife. And that we were both nearly 40 at the time. They were high school sweethearts. I found that 
to be the most incomprehensible thing that another adult male human being had ever said to me and immediately determined that this man was born on the planet Pluto. However, um, no, he charmed her the same way that he charmed other people by impressing an idiot with no product knowledge that he had knowledge of the product. But he did not bed uh, the MILF of Nashville, did shit stain. But Jerry Jarrett believed, because he, he said, how else can you explain this? I said, because he's good when he's talking to people that don't know what he's talking about, and she's gullible. And there you have it. It's the same thing with Brett and Sean. That was the explanation you heard from people. How can you explain this? How can you explain Vince letting Brett, uh, it's not Brett, uh, Vince letting Sean get away with all this? I mean, it's the same, I'm not saying it's true, but it's the same. When people get exhausted, I'm just thinking, why does this keep happening? Why is this allowed? That's where their mind goes. Straight to the gutter. Straight to the gutter. I do love, I haven't heard the phrase hot to trot in quite a while. I don't know why. I, I think that was that. that was a song by the Ohio Players in the 1970s, for fuck's sake. I'll tell you, you know what? This question that I've just answered, Brian Last, it makes me realize that there is a lot of people involved in professional wrestling that could do with some experienced professional counseling. Would you agree? Certainly. Especially well, people who work for TNA, yes. Anyway, then here comes the best friends. We got MJF on this program for 90 seconds, but we have to look at fuck Taylor's face every goddamn week for 20 minutes. Taylor, by the way, got every single one of the muffin tops in the bakery to go along. It's it's a special, a special, (laughs) a six pack of muffin tops and a mud show face. And the the best friends faced Santana and Ortiz. Same as always. I don't need much time for this. Trent is talented. Ortiz is goofy. Santana's got potential. And fuck Taylor is shaped like a fucking suppository. Um, The only thing that made this match look in in any way good was watching Taylor try to make a comeback after the ice-cold tag that they gave him. Nobody can do a hot tag either. That's impossible in this company. Taylor tries to make a comeback. That made the rest of the match look good. Um, apart from that, after the babyface comeback, you know that that's never the end of the match anymore. For a fucking hundred years, babyface made the comeback, you're going home. No, now it's just middle of the match. Babyface makes a comeback, but then they got to do fucking extra shit. They did some kind of contrived superplex on Ortiz with one baby face on the other one's shoulders. Then the heels took back over after the baby face come back. Then the heels did better baby face stuff than the baby faces did. And then it continued on forever. And then finally Trent bit beat Ortiz, the guy that I always say, I want to see win, and they always beat him gets the win. Cause he's the only worthwhile talent in that fucking side of the, of the, ring but they when they do all this time they could have had trent beat somebody they could have had trent beat somebody when they finally do they beat the top heel faction the t the tag team in the top heel faction inner circles top heel faction santana and ortiz are the tag team in it and they beat the top heel faction with preliminary guys that nobody gives a shit about because the way they've been booked and because Chuck Taylor is the in, in the epitome of rotten outlaw talent. So they're using preliminary guys that have done jobs for everybody. And now they beat the top heel tag. I do not understand. I, I, you forgot it, to mention that they showed up in his mother's minivan. Well, I was going to get to that later because I, I found out also you can save a bunch of time if you zip through the entrances. So I did that. But with the minivan, we'll get to here in a minute. But as far as the match, did you see anything that I, any reason that I should have looked at this closer? No, I, I've said it many times. I think Santana has something. Ortiz has showed me nothing besides goofy facials goofy faces not a fan of best friends not a fan of their gimmick not a friend of their not a fan of their act you're not a friend of their fans either i'm not a friend if you're if you're their best friend i'm not a friend of yours 
Uh, I will also say... And if you're a fan of their friends, I'm no friend of your fans. This will be the moment I say it for this week, although it goes for every week. But specifically, I guess it was the introduction of Santana and Ortiz that made me think it. Justin Roberts is the worst ring announcer in wrestling. (laughs) Get him off my TV. You have Dasha working there. She showed you in those weeks when he was not there that she's better than he is on commentary. uh, Not commentary. As the ring announcer. Have you noticed how less satisfied he looks with himself when he finishes letting out one of those fucking names? When he introduces Moxley, he almost gives himself a hernia. And then he goes immediately into a smiling and satisfied look on his face. Like he he just he just shit the giant biggest turd ever fucking measured by the by the fucking uh, uh what was that the the inter interplanetary fecal philia s- syndrome thing in Stockholm on South Park. Uh, that would have been funnier if I could have remembered the name of the organization that that weighed turds. But nevertheless, WWE has better ring announcers than him. NXT has better ring announcers than him. AEW has better ring announcers than Justin Roberts. I get it. He's a friend. He got a job. He's so bad as a ring announcer. And like you said, they keep doing close-ups of his face. And just like he's so pleased with himself. Happy. He's a he happy say, person championship or whatever the fuck he says and then they show him and he's like what what's he fucking pleased about it looks what's like he- somebody shoved feathers in his jockey shorts he's so fucking tickled he is awful he is the he may be the single worst ring announcer in professional wrestling history no no wait a minute no no I, yes i'm i'm no a, worse than i'll Tony tell Chittle. you i'll tell you who was i'll tell you who was he was the fucking volunteer fire department guy in paintsville kentucky that filled in one night that introduced the gangsters as from south central louisiana because <laughs> he didn't know la was an appreciation for los angeles well no we were actually even better than that they had jack reynolds do the clash of the champions once and he's reading it off a card and he goes here are from Kilos, Russia, at a combined weight of 128 pounds, the Russian assassins. <laughs> but no, but those were one-off instances. Consistently, on a regular basis, he is the worst in the history of professional wrestling. And they have a better person there in Dasha. Much, much better. You know, she doesn't have the right friends at this moment, but we'll see what happens well, in the future. But also, uh, Justin Roberts should follow the rule set for referees a a great referee is someone who helps the fucking match and you don't really notice him getting in the way and uh, all i see is justin roberts screaming and he's a giant he's got to be six foot six next to all these children anyway he sucks the next thank thank you i believe we got the point there's plenty of other suckage to go around here i don't even know if anybody had taken matt hardy's pulse yet or not before they cut away from Matt Hardy of wrestling legend bleeding to death to cover the destruction in the parking lot of the baby fa- the mid card or preliminary baby faces mother's minivan. And by the way, you brought up earlier the camera with Sammy. Is that more ridiculous than the camera inside the minivan while they're destroying the minivan? Oh, I well, no, actually, you're you're correct. They did have a camera so you could see the cool shot of the fucking fake fucking slapjack that they use breaking the window out. Of course, it was a real one in this case, I imagine. I don't know. Maybe they got fake car glass. Who knows? But (laughs) the heels decide to demolish Trent's mother's minivan. I can't even say that with a straight face. To get even for getting beat in a wrestling match, and this is totally impromptu and unscheduled, so they've got a camera in the back of the minivan waiting for somebody to break the windows out. And they they beat up the minivan and this is what we have this is what we've come to is you're going to get heat on the baby faces by trashing their mother's minivan. When the reason why that one of the many reasons why nobody gives two shits about your baby face either is because two weeks ago they just got driven to the fucking match in their mother's minivan. Is that they're just not trying to appeal to anybody other than the zit ridden, poorly groomed, unshaven, greasy, computer living, video game playing fuckwits we used to know one looked something like that he was a real bitch 
that watch this program and live in their mother's basement and eat their Hot Pockets as like a rib on South Park, right? That's all they're going for here. And they don't realize that every grown adult man that's ever had some pussy or got a blowjob in the back of a dumpster behind the Greenville Memorial Auditorium by five women at the same time. What? <laughs> every single one of them wearing fur coats in warm weather and nothing on underneath. What? Those people, those grown adult men, look at these fucking little pricks with their in their mother's minivan and go, fuck you, you fucking children. What the fuck is this? If Stone Cold Steve Austin ain't going to be on this program, I'm going to go watch somebody else fight instead of a bunch of grade school kids fighting over their mother's minivan. <sighs> you know, two, maybe three women, I understand. And after that, it's a bit excessive, I think. They were all friends. But after a while, you know. And, only- they, and they, made the, they made the conscious decision to come to the matches wearing fur coats, high heels, and not a stitch of clothes on underneath any of them. I understand, but to use this example, for instance, if someone were behind the dumpster. Yes. And this was happening. One girl could do one thing. Another girl could do another thing. Maybe, like I said, at best, a third person could get involved. The other two are in the back waiting for a turn or just hanging out and talking. It was a rotating type of thing, but there was a lot of conversation going on from the people who didn't weren't busy with something else, but it was a rotating kind of thing. Just see if we could get away with it. If I'd been the main <laughs> event that night. Just, well, we, that we, was the reasoning behind Well, yeah, if, if I'd have been the main <laughs> event that night, I would have hopped them all in a car and we'd have gone somewhere, but I didn't have that much time, so we could only get to the fucking dumpster down at the end of the building. Anyway, then here came... The best friends again, standing in front of the van, crying over the uh, junkyard dog, was blinded and couldn't see his daughter. Right? Fucking Jerry Lawler had his leg broken and his crown stolen and his kingship of Memphis taken by his former manager and best friend. Other people have been turned on by their tag team partner over the world championship or Hundreds of thousands of dollars. These two legitimate nitwits are upset because of their mother's minivan. And here are actual quotes. Fuck Taylor said, not only did you destroy my friend's mom's van... But you heard a do I told do not touch my mom's van is what Trent said. Trent said you're going to personally apologize to my mom on speakerphone. So now it's just we're just we're just jacking off. We've got our dicks in our hands and we're just spraying sperm all over the camera lens to come in a giant bukkake all over the viewers' faces, because if they're watching this stupid shit, it's what they deserve. So they are jizzing all over their fans' faces because they're stupid enough to watch this shit. Does any legitimate wrestling fan ever want to see any, either one of these two idiots again after this After this promo about it, it nearly in tears over their mom's minivan? There are some hardcore AEW fans that enjoy... Well, I said legitimate wrestling fans. I don't know. Honestly, these two guys... Have go home heat with me as well. I uh, don't want to see them on my TV anymore. Uh, yeah, funny enough, since Orange Cassidy's been with them a little less, I care about them a little less. But no, this is awful, and this is bad. And I'm assuming the Young Bucks are booking this tag team division, which is just so stupid. And I don't care about this. I don't like this. I don't know why anyone would like this. And uh, if only they- children. Children, I wrote, as a matter of fact, here's my, my quote. Only children should wa- could watch and like this, but these guys are supposedly grown men. Once again, the Raw test with this type of stupidity have been on Raw in the last generation. And if the answer is yes, it sucks. And the answer is yes, and it sucks. I guess it's time we should talk about the the sentence that was laid upon me this past week, the ruling came down from the International 
fecal statistics and weight matters in Zurich, Switzerland, I was banned by the demo god himself, Chris Jericho, from watching any more AEW wrestling or AEW dark. This was on Twitter, so you know it's official. He tweeted specifically that I was banned from watching either program. And and I'm I I tweeted back honestly I, I I tweeted back I wanted him to know that I appreciated that he was concerned for my mental health and my sanity but I felt like I had to do it for the people for the people who deserve it and need it in these in these cosplay times that we're living in but I did remind him don't worry I never watched dark the hashtags were of uh, concern to some people. I hashtagged our, as we were talking last week, little bit of the virus also hashtag COVID God, which that tickled a number of people right up between the uprights, right in the taintal area. It tick tickled some people, but I was banned and I know people are thinking, well, how, how are we going to do our programming? And I want you to know now, shh, shh, don't tell anybody. This is just between us. Brian knows this. And the only other people that are going to find out about this are the people that are listening to the show right now. If you don't tell anybody, they won't know. But I snuck downstairs. I peeked out the curtains to make sure nobody was around. I closed them. I turned all the lights off in the room. I turned the TV on, but I even turned the brightness down so it wasn't too bright. And Brian, you know what I did? I watched the show. I don't know what Chris Jericho will say about that. Well, he's not going to find out because nobody's going to tell him. I've just prefaced everybody to not say anything. You know, I actually saw people responding to his tweet. A lot of people responded to our both of our tweets. I saw people responding. It's about time. It's about that'll show him. It's about time. I was sick of him having watching that show and having all those things to say. Well, that, thank goodness we don't have to. Like it was something that was enforceable. They took it seriously, which I guess, actually, when you think about it, people of a mental age who will watch this programming would take something like that seriously. However, we won't ban you from listening to the show, Chris, but throughout the day, maybe someone should cut you off. Well, his wife already did that. No, that's a Rodney Dangerfield line. <laughs> I tell you, my wife cut me down to twice a week. That's okay. I know some guys she cut out entirely. Um, but no, in, in all seriousness, there are two schools of thought on this because obviously Chris knows that he does not have the power to officially ban me from watching the cable broadcasts that are beamed into my own home. Uh, but there's two schools of thought. And the first one, Brian, was one that, that you subscribe to this. You have preferred, not P-R-E-F-E-R, -E prefer as in like, but proffered, P-R-O-F-F-E-R, -E as in promoted or brought forth with the theory that he was deflecting from his current controversy, which I brought the people back to when I mentioned a little bit of the virus, COVID God. Because we talked about it last week, he played the kind. Now, have you seen the footage? Have you seen some of the videotape of the concert and the goings on in Sturgis, South Dakota? Sturgis, that sounds like a promo I did for the WWF in Utica one time. I said, Utica, New York. Utica. Sounds like a noise you make right before you throw up. So does Sturgis. Stur Stur Sturgis. They were all over each other, slobbering, drooling bikers and biker periphery people, slobbering around all over each other, drinking, carrying on like proper heathens. And somebody did make mention on Twitter somewhere, I wish he wouldn't knock, Jim wouldn't knock the, the, the motorcycle folks. I wouldn't knock the motorcycle folks either, except every single news report, every single piece, every single photograph, every single piece of written material, every television report that you see on these things. What are the bikers like? The bikers like motorcycles, guns, and Trump, and America, and flags, and patriotism, and all that stuff. 
And that's the last thing we need. I am in favor of all of them getting together and spreading germs around amongst each other that could Darwinize the situation here. However, Jericho, who's got to be on national television in, 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 in the, just a few days afterwards, decides to go out and cavort amongst all these people. And I've been getting, I've been getting little chit chat that, that Jericho, I know he had a picture taken with old, uh, which was it? Was it, uh, Douchebag Von Fuckface or Thurston Shitbag the Third, one of President Pig Shit's kids. He had a picture with him not long ago. I can't remember which one it was, but the point is, it's Jericho. See, he's sounding a little right-wing Trump-like for my, for my taste here these days. But anyway, you thought, Brian, and other people thought that he was using the Chewbacca defense. He was using the Chewbacca defense by deflecting Fading the heat, as we used to say in the wrestling business, fading the heat over to me, saying, oh, I know I did a horrible thing exposing myself and everyone I come in contact with to a bunch of these biker COVID germs in Sturgis, South Dakota, but Jim Cornette's a rotten person. Look at him over here. And then he used the Chewbacca defense. Now, if Chewbacca is a Wookiee from Endor, well, it does not make sense. Look at the pretty monkey. And he shined a flashlight on the wall, and some people went to me instead of him. That's your theory, is it not, Great Brian Last? Oh, yeah. My theory is Jericho, rightly so, was getting killed by everyone for the irresponsible decision to have his band play several shows, including the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, where despite them saying we played only half capacity and despite there being masks given out at the door, you could see the footage, you could see the photos. It was an incredibly irresponsible decision by Chris Jericho. If I was Tony Khan, I wouldn't have let him show up this past week. I would have told him to sit at home for a couple weeks because of that. But he was getting killed everywhere. That's why all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it became... Out of nowhere? It became... Send, send Jim Cornette is banned! Get out of here. Irresponsibility. Irresponsibility. From the Ayatollah of Rock and Rona. I'm become, I'm become, I'm become in, infected with, infected with COVID in my bloodstream. I'm become, I'm become, I'm become in. But see, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> Judas right. in his lungs. Judas in his lungs. <laughs> <sighs> that's one way to look at it. However, I have another thought. I have another thought, which I will float out now for the listeners. He's going for the ratings. He, in a shameless bid, in a shameless, he knows where I've got a big match coming up. This is what Chris, Chris Jericho was thinking to himself. I got a big match coming up with this fucking idiot that puts his hands in his pockets. And for some reason, the two dogs fucking on the side of the road principle is not worn thin yet. And they tune in to see what the fuck stupid shit this guy's going to do. Because we've established now, I think over the last few weeks, we know it, you know it, I know it, everybody knows it. Even the people at AEW know it. People are watching the, their TV show to laugh at the fuck-ups and the stupid. We've established that. So Chris Jericho knew, where can I go to get a large group of people that will tune in to see how stupid this thing is going to be? If I rattle Jim Cornette's followers, if I rattle that cage, they'll start, they'll watch it. Not only will Cornette watch it, but they'll watch it just to get even with me, just to stick it back in my face. That's what Jericho was there. So he was trying to promote his match with little dog pockets. And I, I see it very clearly. He's, he may be the demo God, but he was going to the ratings God, Jim Cornette, because I don't just stick to a demographic. No, my appeal is far and wide. My appeal is broad. My appeal covers the globe like a shroud, like a actually more like a comforting blanket. My voice and the reach of my voice and the power of my thoughts covers the globe like a comforting blanket. And Chris Jericho wanted to slide underneath a corner of that blanket and get some of my warmth onto his TV ratings this past week. I know exactly what he wanted to do. And I don't blame him because after all, like I said, I have a wide appeal to every demographic, men, women, children, old, young. The only 
qualifier to be a part of my audience, Brian, as you know this very well, is to actually be smart, intelligent. It helps. That way you understand all the words we use. So he knows the smart people, the intelligent people, the wrestling fans that listen to us are only going to watch this show for the fuck-ups and the goofs. But he doesn't care because he wants the numbers. The demo god had to bow to the ratings god to go get the big numbers. It's like when I used to get on the radio, if I had a big match with Ronnie Garvin in Charlotte or something, I'd shamelessly go around and plug it on every radio station that I could. I'd get in the newspaper. This is the same thing he was doing. He was coming to the biggest broadcaster that he knows how to come to to get a leg up on what at least what he hoped get a leg up on on these numbers on his his big match with his little puppy. And that that made me think a lot of people have been speculating. We've talked about it over the last month. When I was talking about the television program on a regular basis, the ratings, they were staying somewhat all right. Then we quit, and they lost 200,000 viewers. Then we started talking about them again, and they got those 200,000 viewers back. And we naturally and rightfully assumed that it's the 200,000 people that listen to us that also want to see they can't see good wrestling. They want to see a fucking shit show. They want to see a hoot. They want to, what's the outlaw show going to do on national TV this week? That's the way they're, they're, they're watching. What do the kids call it? They're watching it ironically, right? It's not meant to be taken seriously. They, it's like an Ed Wood movie. They want to see how bad it's going to be. So I thought what we'd do is we'd get the numbers together, Brian, and you helped me on this research, and I appreciate that. But I thought we would just compare before we do the – the programs this week, we would compare and see who has the reach, who's the most influential, who's got an audience, what's going on here, right? So I got some numbers. Help me if I do not describe these in the proper fashion. <clears throat> Let's see here. What we did was we took for the month of July, we took the total viewers of AEW on TNT, we took the total viewers of NXT on USA. Boy, there's a lot of initials here. And we took the total listeners of the Jim Cornette podcasts for the month of July. Now, right off, some of the naysayers and the shit disturbers out there are going to say, wait a minute. They only do one TV show a week, but Cornette does two podcasts a week. And my answer to that, the short answer is, blow me. But the long answer is, yeah, motherfucker, you're right. But also, I'm sitting here in my own home with a pair of headphones on, talking into a microphone on Skype to Brian Last. These other two fucking entities are national television productions with a production crew and a cast of wrestlers numbering in the hundreds. So fuck you, I get the handicap of having two shows per week because the fucking production budget is markedly different. Would you not agree, Brian Last? I guess I will agree to that. The production okay. budget is certainly, certainly, certainly different. Yes, Certainly there's a disparity. Our so production I get, budget is zero. So I get the head, don't tell them that. We don't want to look really <laughs> off key here. But uh, so I get the handicap on that. So we, the total viewers, NXT, AEW, and the total listeners, Jim Cornette podcast, month of July. Now, a lot of people are going to say, wait a minute. You got the YouTube. You got YouTube going for you, for everybody. Well, that's true, but we're getting into some apples and oranges here because I did some research and the entire television program the entire two-hour program in one fucking fell swoop from either one of these companies is not on YouTube. They chop it up and do clips. We, on our YouTube channel, chop it up and do clips, but we also do the complete show. So there's little apples and oranges there. So what we have done is we have eliminated my chopped up clips and their chopped up clips, but we have counted the YouTube listens that these two podcasts that I do get on YouTube in their entirety. 
Is that clear enough for everybody? The complete episode as it is on YouTube. Yes. Complete episode as it is on YouTube, minus sometimes some of the off-color political things I say. So therefore, we're doing complete shows, complete shows. That's the comparison. <clears throat> Are you ready for a drum roll as I announce the three places in this three-horse race? Drum roll? I don't have a drum roll. I didn't you don't have a drum What the fuck? You should have your head up and say, find some drum roll. What? You're a goddamn it. You're on fucking radio. You don't have a goddamn drum roll? Here, my 300-pound right. desk and play. All right. How's that sound? Thought, you, thought you'd be more prepared to give you a heads up for a drum Is it too loud? Tell me. Give me some No, it's, it's fine drums. now. You've rolled enough drums. I need a cymbal. I need a <laughs> 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 Number three, within the month of July, 3,504,000 viewers NXT. Number two, with 3,532,317, Jim Cornette. Number one, I guess there's no fucking suspense now, 3,869,000 All Friends Wrestling. They beat us by 337,000 people. We beat NXT by 28,000. However, in all fairness, besides the fact that we are growing exponentially year by year, uh, they've been flat and fluctuated, whereas we've had a, what, 30%, 40% increase in some of these programs over the course of the last 12 months, or actually even six months, more over the last 12 months. So how long is it going to be before we catch them? But anyway, that's what Mr. Jericho was trying to latch on to was viewers for his little exhibition he was going to have with his little puppy pockets. You know what? Hold on. Hold on here one second. <laughs> Hold on here just one second. Let me find some. Where is it? Oh, that's the wrong one. Yeah. That's wrong. Oh, there it is. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> oh, that's a little much. It is. Good heavens. <laughs> I'm just I'm just looking at their drum sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, at least we're in the proper mood to re review these programs. And and Tony Khan is right now the primary employer in the wrestling industry of wrestlers that are followed for the same reason that they like people who eat dog poop. This is just a freak show and a, and, a, and a goof on everything. You know, as a matter of fact, <laughs> was that your question, Brian? I guess is that so. the answer to your question? I get, do you think there'll be any other releases anytime soon? Well, if he smartens up and realizes it, that, you know, here's another thing. Oh, my God. I just read this. Remember, we kept talking about why the fuck is that Michael knock and knock and knock it the fuck off and get off my television with his baby oil routine, uh, actually wrestling for a, the, the supposed number two national wrestling company when he's a fucking joke wrestler from an outlaw fucking company in Japan. Oh, I knew the answer. It's because well, he's well, Omega's the, buddy. He's Omega's but No, no, he's not. He's Omega's assistant. He what? is actually, they don't, no, they're not just booking him as a wrestler. That's his side light. That's his, that's his, what did they call it? A side hustle? They act since an executive vice president needs an assistant, they hired to be the assistant of an executive vice president of the number two wrestling promotion in the United States of America. They hired a fucking, outlaw fuck from an indie group in Japan just because he's friends with that same executive vice president and also found out guess how old he is he is well preserved for his age 
45 fucking years old. A 45-year-old outlaw wrestler from Japan with no other pro wrestling experience whatsoever is the assistant to the executive vice president of the second largest company in the United States who has no previous pro wrestling experience either. Um, got to give yeah. them credit. They all got their friends' jobs. To quote Jim Hurd, I haven't seen this sort of loyalty since Korea. Since Korea! Yes, Michael Naka 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 to fuck off is the assistant to the executive <laughs> vice president, Kenny Olivier. In a, and he just, so because there was an article saying, well, he knows in 10 years he won't be wrestling, which Olivier did give us hope also. Kenny Olivier was quoted saying, in 10 years, I certainly won't be wrestling. I've, even though I will be just south of 70 at that point, and it'll be the best 10 years of my golden years, I'd give them up tomorrow if he was out of the fucking business. But anyway, I did get a an email from one of the Cult of Cornette members. What, what the hell? Hello, Kenny Omega's office. <laughs> <laughs> His assistant. I'm sorry, I had to do it. Had to do it. <laughs> oh, Rio, hold on. I'll get Rio, Rio. <laughs> <What? laughs> Kenny, it's Rio. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. I needed that. No, we said we were going to be silly today, and we and we are. Uh, because the, I have this email though that's pertinent to the subject matter that we were just discussing. Hello, Jim. Hope all is well. I, like a lot of folk, am an avid listener of the experience in the drive-thru and like how you tell it like it is. One thing I have to respectfully disagree with you on is the comparison of AEW to backyard wrestling. I guess you could say I'm an expert on backyard wrestling as I ran my own deal for years. When we did it, we worked old school style, except you really had to win. <laughs> We didn't go predetermined until later. When I finally did get the chance to train for real, it was a real culture shock. I realized that none of us had any real clue of what was going on and more so the amount of work it took to really know what you were doing. That's when I understood why a legitimate pro wrestler looks down on backyard wrestling. These guys coming in from bullshit renegade indie mud shows are no different to me than what I was. Untrained, reckless, playing around, no clue why this works and that doesn't. Except the only difference is I wanted away from the playing and into the real deal, whereas they want to bring in the playing because they can't handle the real deal. AEW is backyard wrestling with a budget because everything they do, we did 25 years ago and probably did some of it more safely. Sorry for my long-winded rant. Just thought I would give you a different perspective. Well, there you have it. It seems like that you would think that these guys, instead of continuing to play in their garage, would want to get signed by a record label and put out quality music. But instead, they still want to fucking play in the backyard, and they just want to bring the backyard to... Well, I guess they never left the backyard. Didn't, didn't the... The the Bucks, uh, Road Warrior Buck and his brother Balding actually have a match with each other in their backyard like this fucking spring. I heard put it on it. YouTube. Yeah, I heard about it. I can't. I don't know how anyone watches that garbage they call a YouTube show. I tried once and I'm not into bad humor, let alone bad wrestling humor. So I didn't I didn't see it. Well, you got what now it. there. Yeah, well, there's something for everybody there. You got bad wrestling, bad humor and bad wrestling humor. Yeah. On their YouTube program. And it went. You know, Chris the Jericho Bucks is the Jack Benny of bad wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it, it, it seems like, I don't know, at some point, when, when do the young, young bucks become the older bucks, the aging bucks, the middle-aged bucks, the senior bucks, the, the over the hill bucks? What, because... I mean, Father Time is catching up, and neither one of them are Ricky Morton. I mean, you've already got Balding Buck. We've mentioned this. His hair in the back, it looks like Shawn Michaels. In the front, it looks like Steve Austin, his hair. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I'm just wondering when they have to quit playing in the backyard. The Firefly Funhouse came up, and I just cannot watch this at all. 
I just can't watch it. So I fast forwarded to the end. Braun Strowman comes in and gloms Bray Wyatt and knocks him out of camera range. You know, the cameras just locked down on their little puppet show set. And Braun Strowman does the, sh- I don't, why do guys do this? It, when they're obviously, especially the worst workers they are, the more they do this. But every time they throw a punch in like an empty arena or a backstage brawl or whatever, who, 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 like, does anybody do that when you're actually hitting somebody? Are you going, ooh, who, who, does that, a, is that a thing? I don't do that typically when I'm punching people. Well, I, it just sounds phony as fuck. But anyway, so they go to the break after he drags him off the set. And they come back from the break. They're fighting in the garage and near the loading dock. And one of the, I believe it was Corey Graves, might have said this. One of the announcers did. I quote, destruction is going to be otherworldly between these two. And then, seconds later, Braun Strowman got Bray Wyatt like for a choke slam, but he didn't really pick him way up in the air. He just kind of fucking pushed him backwards off the fucking loading dock. Right. And then it's one of those reaction deals where you see everybody else's face, but in the, in the, when he pitched him off the loading dock, you didn't see him land, but you saw his foot stop still in the camera shot. You go back and watch it now, folks. Now that I've spoiled it for you, you see Bray Wyatt's left foot stop when he's obviously at ground level and then you get the shot of them looking from the loading dock and down and he's on concrete and he's way down there. Right. So they couldn't even reshoot this fucking, I don't know what they're fucking doing, but anyway, the ambulance comes in within seconds. Did you, did you get back for the ambulance part? Yeah, this was the end of the show that I actually did see. Yes. Okay. The ambulance is there within seconds, and they did not only stagey referee acting, but bad fake EMT medical treatment. They got a a double there. Poor Adam Pierce was selling like an auctioneer. He was working his ass off trying to make this goddamn unbelievable horse shit look real. And even he banged on the ambulance, according to Twitter, and fucking, I think, broke his thumb. But the referees are just, yes. The referees are just yelling it's shit you wouldn't yell. The EMTs look bullshit. There's no, it's, it's too fast. They're, it's not going to happen. Then they put him in the ambulance. They close Bray Wyatt. They close the fucking doors. The ambulance pulls down a ways and then stops. And they're screaming, go, go, go. Then the ambulance backs up. And then you see everyone's face, all the referees and the agents and the people that have been out there with a look of horror. And then you pan back over to the fucking ambulance and there's the fiend standing there in the, with the back doors of the ambulance open. He wasn't the fiend when he went in there. This is the teleportation rule, but luckily this was the end of the program, but fuck this sucks is what I wrote. This fucking sucks. If you were going to do this fucking horse shit, you couldn't even have had him throw somebody out the back doors of the ambulance and bust it open like Christopher Lee in the fucking episode of the Avengers where he's a goddamn automaton and he keeps coming back to life and the fucking guy busts out the back doors of the ambulance. No, they just went to a reaction shot. Fuck this sucks. I, I have come to Bray Wyatt has come to mean everything I dislike about wrestling now teleportation, invulnerability, fucking these goddamn Firefly Funhouse. I'd like all take all those puppets and just ball them all up and shove them straight up his fucking ass. So that put me in a real good mood to watch AEW. But uh, what, what was your final SmackDown thoughts, great Brian Last? Well, again, just watching the beginning and the end and now hearing you recap the middle. <clears throat> That's basically how I felt. You could do that sound over and over and over again. It's not fun to watch this show. It doesn't entertain me. It just sucks. It's so bad that it's just so fucking bad. (laughs) I hate this fucking company and this stupid fucking shows. I turned it off at the beginning because Bray Wyatt teleported away and then this gang of mystery men came in there while Michael Cole screamed at me. 
And then I came back at the end to see Adam Pierce and a bunch of guys standing there like it's close encounters of the third kind and Bray <laughs> Wyatt standing in the ambulance. I'm <sighs> not entertained by this at all. I don't find this good in any way. In fact, I hate it. <laughs> And you know what? Now I'm pissed off because now I know that because I haven't watched SummerSlam yet because we're not going to talk about it until the experience this week. And there is a number of, as a matter of fact, I've, I noticed this. There's a number of things that I do when I know I have to watch the wrestling shows. I try to get all the rest of my things that I need to do first crossed off my list before I go. It's a last resort to watch the shows. I, I take my, my anal suppository. <laughs> I do my self-service dental work <laughs> i i in, engage in all manner of activity and and then i end up watching these shows and every time i watch one i know why but now i haven't watched SummerSlam yet but now i can't even look forward to it because i thought i was going to at least get to see one of the girls get their head shaved and now i know that's not going to happen and you know what i gotta be honest with you it's easier now than ever before brian to shave your head whether you're a man or a woman. <laughs> I didn't see that coming this time. Because of Manscaped. <laughs> Our friends at Manscaped, whether you're a man, a woman, a child, or even a cute little puppy dog, the folks at Manscaped have got something that will make you slicker than cum on a gold tooth, folks. It, it, you know, it, a lot of people, the, the question on their mind, the uppermost question on their mind is, when's the last time you shaved your balls, right? Everybody wants to know. I don't, huh? I don't know if that's the question on everybody's mind. Well, I'm always, I, you know, I write it down so I don't forget because I want to do it on a regular basis. But the Manscaped Lawnmower 3.0 is now the greatest piece of personal grooming equipment that has ever been invented in the history of personal grooming since we were cavemen slogging up the hill from the swamp. This is the greatest thing because you can... You can trim all your hair without trimming any of your skin, whether it's your head, your chest, your underarms, your crotchal area, you know, the back, the front, the sides, wherever you've got hair, the lawnmower 3.0 will take it off, will not nick you, will not cut you. You will not look like you've been run through a razor blade factory, folks. It even, it's a slight little massage that it gives you. It also has an LED light. So you can see all the little critters, especially down in the nether regions. It's waterproof. You can do this in the shower if it floats your boat. Uh, they also just released the Shears 2.0 nail kit, which is the perfect add-on. Uh, tipped tweezers or twipped teasers. You know, the, the tweezers certainly teased me. Round point scissors, fingernail clippers, a nail file. You can pluck your eyebrows, trim your nails. You can all, they've got the crop preserver, the crop reviver, like a cologne for your balls. You can tame the summer swamp ass with natural hydrators and antioxidants. And everybody knows if you listen to this show and you're a member of the cult of Cornette, who has the cleanest crotches in all of cultdom, go to manscaped.com and use the code DRIVE. To get 20% off and free shipping, 20% off and free shipping with the code drive at manscaped.com. Take the bull by the tail and face the situation. They also have very nice cologne. They do. Yeah. Suzanne likes it. And see, Sonia DeVille's hair would have fell off. Holy shit. It would have abandoned ship just as easy as pie with a, with a lawnmower. Don't know why they didn't do that. <laughs> All right. Did you see Keith Lee? Oh, boy. You know, we just put up the drive through where we reviewed NXT TakeOver. And it's been brought up to me several times since that wonderful Tuesday afternoon the show went up. That I said on there, just watch how they'll screw him up on Raw. <laughs> I had no idea it would already have happened by the time the show came out they did it in record time this time uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay we we have mostly praised keith lee for almost everything physical right most of his matches the the match with him and carrying cross 
last week didn't come together is probably my least favorite of Keith Lee's matches that I've seen. Part of that may have had to do with uh, Cross hurting his shoulder and it being, you know, a problem in the last minutes of the thing. By the way, apparently, I'm a goddamn savant. That was as plain as to me as the goddamn wart on the Wicked Witch of the West Nose's face that he hurt his shoulder and you could see that not a mile away and everybody on Twitter was like, oh, Cornette saw it. Cornette called it. How could we have known? How could you not fucking know? He's he's not using it. He's holding it in. There's a giant knot on it. What the fuck? Anyway. Hey, real quick on that, though, and we're going to review NXT on the drive through this week with AEW, as well as some questions, I presume. But he vacated the NXT championship. How long does someone typically have to be out when they separate their shoulder? Well, I, you know, it depends. Is it a... If it's a bad enough separation, it it needs surgery. Um, Orton's gone through that in the past. If it's just a regular old separated shoulder, some of these fucking freaks of nature, and I'm sure this guy's driven, he might be back in four to six weeks. It just, it, but the, you know, it, I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on television, so it can be all over the page. Uh, but boy, they can't keep a motherfucker as champion, can they? It's like as that belt is cursed. Keith Lee forfeits it. They go to all this trouble to name the new champion. The new champion gets hurt in the goddamn match where he's going to be crowned and then has to immediately turn it over as soon as he wins it. And now what they're going to have... Well, no, he are, beat Keith are, Lee for the title. You're thinking of the North American title. Oh, he, wait. Oh, he vacated God, the North American all title. All right, okay, shit, I'm sorry, you're right. Yes, he vacated the North American title. They go through all that and fill that, and one of those guys got hurt before it was over with. Then the fucking title that Keith Lee kept, he then loses to Karrion Cross, who gets hurt in the fucking... You know what this means, don't you? There's too many fucking champions. And now they're going to have some kind of goddamn clusterfuck, multi-man scaffold match, bungee jump over the Colorado Ritter, River, Snake River Canyon fucking stipulation deal to fill this title now, right? It's a four-man, the four men being Gargano, Ciampa, Adam Cole, and Finn Bauer, a four-man, 60-minute Iron Man match. Okay, wait, why is Gar? I guess Gargano's in there because he he he's got good cardio and he can take everybody else's moves. And he's but, a former champion. Man. They're all former NXT champions. Johnny, same face. Where's Champa been? Why have they not been featuring Champa? We've been watching NXT for weeks, and where's Champa been? Well, he returned on this week's show, which you'll see before we review it. On okay, he returned. That does not answer the question of where he's been. That indicates that he's back, but it doesn't tell me where he's been. I have no idea where he's been. If he was available to them, they're putting goddamn some of the talent they've been putting on that show and they're not using Tommaso Ciampa? Or I, I, all right. Anyway, the point is, and we see this on SummerSlam, and, and I don't want to preview the review, but every goddamn match practically was not only for a title, but it was for another version of someone else's title. Well, this guy's the champion. Huh, the Raw champion? No, the Universal champion. Well, these are the tag team champions. Which ones? Oh, the Raw tag team champions, not the tag team champions on Smack. It, it, it can't even be world title, North American title, intercontinental title, whatever. It's got to be just different versions of everybody's the world fucking champion. And it's and you can't keep track of it. And now with NXT, it's even worse. And all these titles being dropped and vacated and whatever. Getting back to Keith Lee. What in the flying fuck? What in the wide, wide world of sports? They thought, I, as I said, we've been putting Keith Lee over for his matches and his moves and his athleticism and the way he can move that fucking weight. And he's in his mid thirties. He's a physical freak. I said, I hate the fucking promos. He sounds like Dr. Frazier Crane. Sounds like a goddamn clinical psychologist he doesn't he looks intimidating as all hell and and sounds almost pleasant and friendly and sing song and then what was it week before last somebody pissed him off and he cut a fucking promo that i said sounded like it ought to have been on mid-south wrestling in the 80s had some based his voice got mad we're gonna do that's the fucking keith lee i want to see i'm thinking okay that's what they're bringing to the main roster 
this fucking badass that can do all this shit, huge, can work, and fucking, as Ernie Ladd would say, talks like he covers the ground he walks on. What we got on Raw, he actually said greetings and salutations. We got a fucking giant 375 pound man wearing a hoodie and a fucking skirt that that makes Paul Lind sound like a badass. <laughs> Come on. Look up Uncle Arthur on Bewitched, young young people. He this was the goddamn most physically and verbally unintimidating promo since the last time that Richard Simmons got mad at his mailman. He was going the other way to be a a very articulate and pleasant person. It was like somebody kicked him in the balls. His voice is three octaves higher. And did I mention he's wearing what appears to be a skirt? What? Yeah, he was dressed like a divorcee playing tennis. Yes. <laughs> he was dressed That's like a, it. it was a tennis skirt. Yeah. A tennis skirt and a fucking hoodie. And then he took the hoodie off, but he still got a shirt. On. What? They've changed his music. They changed his fucking dress. He shaved. And I, I don't even mean his his manner of dress, but they literally put him in a dress. <laughs> they had him shave. And, new look. That's right. That that I didn't even notice that. I thought he looked cleaner somehow, or b- b- even more baby face. He shaved too. And then, okay, let's uh, appearances are subject to you know people's personal interpretation. Let's look at the facts this new talent that went literally as far as anyone could go in NXT simultaneously holding both championships. NXT is no longer doing spot shows in Florida. Only they are on national television. People have seen this fucking guy. Am I right? Am I speaking facts? You are right. He's been on national television for months now. The way he dresses, the way he talks, the way he works, the things he's done. He comes to a television program on another cable network. This program currently doing charitably two and a half times the viewership of the program he's left. So it's not like a goddamn difference between local television in Cleveland and NBC. They not only change his look, not only change his dress, not only change his music, But also when he challenges a top star, Randy Orton, the most physically dominant guy from this other promotion, challenges Randy Orton, wrestles for a few minutes with Randy Orton, then Drew McIntyre interferes and fucking pulls Randy Orton out of the fucking deal and goddammit, they get into it. Where'd Keith Lee go? He disappeared like Tommaso Ciampa in NXT. <laughs> it's hard to make a 375-pound man disappear into thin air, but they did it. So the 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 guy who viewers can be excused for thinking is the biggest star and the most accomplished man in the history of NXT gets a match on Raw with Randy Orton. It's competitive for three or four minutes. And then somebody else interferes, and this guy's never seen or heard of again. He doesn't win his debut on this television show. If he can't beat Randy Orton, put him against somebody else he can beat. If he can't beat anybody, don't put him in a match. It's a work. You can do whatever you want. Have him come out and challenge people, and they don't want to fucking get in the ring with him because he's such a big fucking badass. Or, more importantly, Just do what you're supposed to do. Have him challenge a star. Have him wrestle the star. Have him beat the fucking star. That's how he becomes a star. That's how he gets over. Just exposing him on this television program for a few minutes, like, oh, well, we gave him an interview and he had a match with Randy and he went four minutes without getting beat. 
before he disappeared because he's such a dickless pussy that somebody interferes in his big raw television debut and he doesn't immediately go after that motherfucker. He just tucks his head and tail between his legs and wanders off like Dr. Frazier Crane, not the Incredible Hulk. It's a work. You can do anything you want. So therefore, if you ain't going to fucking debut the guy and give him a big win and put him over, don't do it at all. What the? F- I, that is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. If it was, if it was some little guy, bring him in, let him be competitive with Randy. Sure, and then and then he sells and gets sympathy, and then Randy fucks him, and then Drew McIntyre comes to his rescue. But fucking hell, what? Uh, there is. Show me one time in the history of professional wrestling, and I will say this, and then I'll be done with it. One instance in the history of professional wrestling where a guy became a star by debuting against a star that he then not only didn't beat, but just disappeared when the the actual stars got to fight. Fuck. Jesus Christ. Am I, am I misrepresenting this to the people? No. To the people out there? You're very, very correct. And... It's not just any Raw, it's the Raw after a major pay-per-view. There's always a bump for that. So it's a bigger audience than Raw's been getting for a while. People have seen Keith Lee. He was in the Royal Rumble, and they bring him in, and he runs right into that wall known as Vince McMahon. Well, I mean, well, I mean after, the, after the interview, you know, nobody wanted to see him anyway, because it was so goddamn... I didn't... It was like a Disney movie. The, it, it, he does, he looks like that and cuts a promo like he should be the fucking big brother bear in a Disney movie. Like he's blue. Oh, it's some honey. I don't, w- Are we scared now to have any intimidating badasses on television for fear someone might have nightmares? I don't know. Anyway. Point is, if anybody hadn't seen Keith Lee before, they never wanted to see him again after that. After the fucking promo he did, it 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 was sounded to me like a lot of people would probably hope Randy Orton just kicks him in the fucking mouth and shuts him up because that was a goddamn disgraceful fucking promo. Not for a college classroom, but for a challenge to a fight. That was the most unintimidating interview I've ever heard. And, you know, it's it's hard to... It's hard to dismiss the physical capabilities of a giant 375-pound man except when they're wearing a tennis skirt. So why didn't they just fucking throw him in the fucking pond out back and and just kill him quick instead of embarrassing him first? I don't know. I was going to split this thing up because I knew it would be lengthy. And so I decided Sunday afternoon I would watch the first half, and that way I might be more receptive to the second half on Monday morning before we recorded this. I watched the first segment and turned the whole thing off and spent all night trying to decide whether I should watch the rest of it or or whether I should just disappoint people and take care of my own mental health. What are people saying about this thing? I have, as I said, I've earlier in the program, I've been out this weekend with the pole saw, been doing some some things in the yard and trying to get some things done. I haven't lived on the internet. Is somebody making excuses for any of this, or specifically the tooth and nail match? I don't know if anyone's making excuses for the tooth and nail match. Other things happened on the show that distracted everyone from the garbage that was the tooth and nail match. From the horribleness and awfulness of is anybody making excuses for this program in general for why that people were charged money to watch this and why that nobody got their shit straight? There are certain excuses being made by certain people. However, unlike the previous COVID era pay per view that AEW did, this one is one where even AEW fans are saying this pay per view wasn't that great. Some are saying, well, I like the matches, but dot, dot, dot. And the fact that there's a but there tells you everything. It's hard to, it's hard to 
Yeah, it's hard to watch. It's hard to watch. I think it's hard for AEW fans. hard to watch a dream die. I I think it's hard for AEW fans to see this pay-per-view and pretend like all is rosy in AEW land. This was an embarrassing pay-per-view event. Well. If I may say so. Well, you may say so, and we will talk about this. I am i don't know whether I'm embarrassed to have been involved in professional wrestling. I don't know whether I'm embarrassed for the people that were involved in whatever this was. I don't know whether I'm embarrassed for the people who bought the pay-per-view and can't write it off as a business expense. I don't know who I'm embarrassed for. I, I got plenty of blame to go around. They made a big deal of announcing a couple of days before this show, hey, the tooth and nail fucking match was going to be on the pre-show, but we want to give people the best wrestling show we can. So we're putting it on the pay-per-view. Is Tony Khan a drug addict? Is Tony Khan on hallucinogenic drugs? Not that I'm aware of. and I don't. Had know. they seen this beforehand and then made that decision? Because obviously it didn't happen live. So did they tape this fiasco commit this thing and believe me commit is probably the best word commit this thing to video and then decide to put it on the pay-per-view i believe from what i've been told tony khan as well as jerry lynn were at the location when they filmed this well god there was a lot of people there when kennedy got shot that doesn't mean they had anything to do with it poor jerry lynn don't slander him tony khan i can believe I would imagine if Jerry Lynn was there, he was probably, you know, parking the cars when all this went on. I would have figured out some excuse to get away from it. But so there was a there was a pre-show, which I did not watch. Because I could tell it was a pre-show and I knew this fucking main show was going to be long enough anyway. Before we get to this fiasco, was there anything else on the pre-show we should be aware of? There was a truly atrocious Jelly Nutella match. <laughs> where once again he showed that he just is not very good as a professional wrestler. The guy he was wrestling, who apparently is someone who's been featured on Dark, I'm not <laughs> familiar with Serpentico or whatever his name was. He was equally as bad. It was a real amateur hour match. That's what everybody gets for free to try to make you decide to buy the thing, right? That was one of the puzzling things. You would think you'd put something hot on the pre-show to get people into buying the pay-per-view <laughs> event. This match was so bad, and just saying indie isn't correct. It was just amateur hour. It was really, really bad. But, you know, we've talked about it. Jelly Nutella is one of the few people in AEW that AEW fans and haters are united over the fact that he doesn't belong there, that he's not good. He's really, really not what good. What was it? What was it that they they had the feed going to fight TV? I read this that uh, they went to a break when Jelly was, I think he was, that's when he was uh, impersonating his cousin Pippi, Pippi Longstocking. And the, uh, Jr. said to Tony Schiavone while they thought they were in break, but they were live on fight TV. Why do they keep booking this kid as a fucking baby face? I said, I'm looking at a heel because what, what, look at the state of this guy. When you look <laughs> at him, he's disreputable in every way and has no endearing features. So why would you book him as a baby face? Just because they booked him as a baby face on some fucking shows in closets in front of other people that look even worse than he does. So naturally, he would look good by comparison. But anyway, so basically nothing on the pre-show of any consequence that anybody gives a shit about. No, there was that match, which was horrible, and then there was a private party match, which was a private party match. And then they bring out Jim Ross for like the last minute of the pre-show. And I I would actually think it would be important to have Jim Ross there for as much of the pre-show as possible because you want people to see him who aren't familiar with AEW and go, oh my God, Jim Ross. What's well, he doing there? I'll tell you uh, from, from from not I don't have any inside knowledge that Jr. has said this, but from my perspective as being someone in his age category and not close to his fame level, but certainly a bigger fame level than anybody else involved in this proceeding. If I was Jr., I'd say bring me out right at the end of the show so you can tease me coming out because I've got to sit out there for four hours and figure out something to talk about with this shit un- unfolding in front of me. So. If, if, if it might better use Jr. sell the goddamn show on the pre-show and then let Jr. leave so he's not embarrassed by what he has to call on what you got to pay for. I don't fucking know. I want to talk about this thing. The tooth and nail match between Dr. Britt Baker with her uh, assistant Reba and Big Swole. 
which was cinematic in nature. And to use that, well, they said this was going to be a cinematic match. Brian, I have shot better shit. I'm not even talking about content. I'm just talking about better lit, better edited shit with a camcorder and Smoky Mountain Wrestling myself for free. This was an embarrassment not only by from content, but to be aired. They were trying to imitate the WWE cinematic, dramatic acting. Now we know Big Swole can't work or act. The TV crew can't light, can't shoot, or edit. This was a cable access level, like a parody of if you found some women who had never really seen wrestling before, but you told them have a movie fight in this office and use some wrestling moves in it is the only way I can, whether this was faker than silly or sillier than fake, it was still large amounts of both. Horrible overacting or just bad acting to, to begin with sloppy play wrestling work, if you can call it that, in a dentist's office. Hitting each other with the goddamn framed pictures in they were breaking, even though the fucking the, they're not even I don't want them I, they're women. I don't want them to hit each other with shit that they can fucking put each other's eyes out with and bust each other open with. But if you're going to goddamn have a fight, hit each other with the shit for real and have it gimmicked or something. It was both fake and fake at the same time. It was fake on the surface of it. And it looked fake. It was, it was insulting to anybody wrestling fan or no, even if it was on a free show, the announcers made fun of it because what could they do? Or they just laid out entirely because what could they do? Well, let me, can I stop you there? I, and, and this may be a topic later in the show, but the announcers make fun of, to, just sit back and laugh at so many things throughout the show. And I get it. We're doing something here on this show. We're critiquing and reviewing this pay-per-view event. We could shit on it. We can make jokes about it. We could laugh about it. The announcers shouldn't be doing that. I don't care what it is. No, no. Well, th th here's the thing. I agree with that, but I can't agree in this instance because it, 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 last year when I did commentary for MLW, there was some great, exciting stuff. And there was also uh, either some of the young folks who wanted to go a hundred miles an hour or the Lucha stuff that you'd, it, 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 you, you yeah, sometimes couldn't figure out what to say, but I didn't openly mock or laugh at you you could find something because i remember i said on the program at least they're really trying and they're not assing off on purpose and so i did not have a, ultimately a problem with my voice and face being on that show because even if all of it was not executed you know, 100% according to the Eddie Graham playbook, they were not just being stupid and phony for the sake of it. And therefore, you work with them in however, whatever way you can. You cover up the misses or you try to give some insight into the the mindset of, of why somebody would do something that on the surface of it looks basically like something that you would be crazy to do. But, well, he, he thought this. You try to do all the little announcer tricks and help them. But with this... There's nothing to fucking help. It's a goddamn travesty. It's an insult. And at that point, if it was me, I mean, you know, at this point, JR knows what he's in for. I understand that JR doesn't want to sacrifice his entire career by calling this like it should be serious. But uh, that give the, the, the fucking best announcer in the goddamn business something serious to call so he's not embarrassed to talk about it. Yes, I believe the announcers should be, while they're on the show, should be everything a professional that they can be. But when you're looking at something like this, then it, it's like, I don't want to get any on me. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have credibility to actually sell something another day when they try to get their shit together. That's what maybe the mindset is. The only one that's excited about any of this shit is excrement because he's excited to be there again. Anyway. The finish of this thing, 
Britt Baker goes for the fucking after she's tried to put a power drill and have done all the other things, whatever the fuck. Britt Baker goes to get swole with the hypodermic of Novocaine, but accidentally gets it jumped or stabbed into her leg and her leg goes numb. And Reba was screaming over and over, oh my God, you've stabbed her while she's standing there with a banana peel on her fucking head. Not even just actually splayed out like a a little cap that she didn't have time to fucking knock off. And then Swole doesn't just hit Reba with the goddamn diploma, but hands Reba the, the diploma so she can hold it in front of her own face so that Swole can hit that. And then puts Britt Baker out with the nitrous. And the real question is, is Tony Khan on the nitrous? How dare you, sir? (laughs) How dare you (laughs) ask people to pay for this? How dare you, sir, ask people to watch this under the guise of watching a professional wrestling program? How dare you, sir? perpetrate this on all the people that have given their blood sweat and tears to keep this industry going for the past 125 years so that you can shit on the airwaves how dare you sir (sighs) unprofessionalism so we are instituting the tooth and nail rule which is this. Remember how I've said, okay, Britt Baker has grown on me with the heel thing and the promos, and I got I get a kick out of her and Reba. Eh. I will never watch anything again involving Dr. Britt Baker, Reba, or Big Fucking Swole. Never, ever. I don't care if they bring Britt Baker to the fucking WWE and she fucking knocks out Brock Lesnar with six F5s in a row. That they did this should have revoked their membership in the goddamn wrestling fraternity, which they're not really in anymore anyway, because there is no such thing as a goddamn wrestling fraternity, the brotherhood of people inside the business that protected it and respected it. There's just a bunch of goddamn clowns playing in it. But if it was possible to revoke a wrestling license over a single performance, every single motherfucker involved in this, and Mike Posey, the referee, don't ever let me see you in person again just for fucking being there. Did you want him to quit his job? Yes. How's he going to support his family? Oh, for God's sake. He picked up a goddamn referee spot in a goddamn nail salon or a dentist office in suburban fucking Atlanta somewhere. I think you'll fucking be fine. I will say, I know you hate the term performer, but I'm going to use it here in this case. Out of all the women's wrestlers in all of wrestling, Big Swole is the worst performer in the entirety of professional wrestling. She's garbage in the ring. Her promos, her attacking wrestlers when she's sitting at ringside, her performance here, this whole Britt Baker, Big Swole feud. This is awful. This was the worst way you could have started this pay-per-view event. If this, if this had been done right, it would have still sucked, but it was done low budget, outlaw, rotten, stagey, and awkward. And in a simple-minded fashion, talk, for once, they needed writers. Imagine, I Jim Cornette just said they needed some fucking writers. Tooth and nail rule. Nobody writes my TV but me. <laughs> well, <laughs> nobody makes my rules but me, and Britt Baker, Reba, and Big Swole are disqualified for their participation in this for my life ever. All right, next up, it was an interview-heavy show, and that didn't do him any favors either because most of these people can't talk, but Tony Schiavone, this was an interminable segment. Tony Schiavone in the ring with Kip Sabian and Penelope Ford, and the premise of this uh, improv skit was that Kip Sabian is going to announce who his best man is for his wedding because he and Penelope Ford are going to get married. And he's going to announce his best man. And once again, 
why would anybody give a fuck? I, I, I had questions besides who's his best man. I had, I had questions. Why does Kip Sabian wear women's pants? That was a question I had. Did you notice that? He's wearing like the women's <laughs> I not, fucking. I did not notice his pants. Women's so. yoga tights or something. <laughs> what? <laughs> I have another question. What is the age of consent? Is Kip Sabian old enough to get married? He um, looks older than 18. You have to give him that. Well, now that he's got some facial hair, I'm not sure. That may be drawn on with a Sharpie. <laughs> um, but you know, anyway, so they're going to get a, a job guy's going to get married to a job girl. Uh, we saw Penelope Ford fucking show her ass figuratively, not literally, with that she can't fucking work a goddamn lick here in this match. What was it a week or two ago? Uh, that was the sloppiest bunch of shit I've ever seen. Anyway, so we've got a job guy wedding coming up. Who's the best man? Well, then suddenly, a false start, some fat guy comes out. That's not the best man. So now, see, they got the low-budget comedy in this segment. Then, Brian Pillman Jr. comes out. And because Sabian has sent him a text, you're the best, comma, man. So, actually, Pillman comes out, his arms, he's jacked up, he's wearing a tight fucking shirt, he's tanned, he's got that hair, he looks like a goddamn celebrity, like a star, like an athlete, and Kip Sabian blows him off. And he fucking and sends him back, because he's not the best man. You're right, he looks like a star. And the other thing is, he says, no, I texted you, you're the best, comma, man. But then he says, I, I don't even like you. Yeah, well, so why yeah, are I, you texting him, you're the best, man? Yeah. Because that was a way to blow him off, because none of this material has to be goddamn consistent. It's fucking made up. It's, this, especially this segment, was like it was made up as they went along. So I have to think this is Tony Khan's booking. Because none of these people have the goddamn standing to say no to anybody so this had to be completely tony khan because this was the most i wrote this was cable access level at this point this was the most amateur segment on the show i think anyway then the real best man is revealed as do 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 Miro slash rusev slash the fucking russian bulgarian guy from the WWF that everybody's made a big deal out of and, and wanted to wish that uh, Dave Meltzer would burn in hell last week. And we were commenting on, and this valuable acquisition, apparently he does have a lot of following. He has fans. People have been follow him on whatever the fuck he's been doing. I don't obviously, cause I don't give a shit. But this valuable acquisition, another semi-mainstream name, I to this day, I don't think I've seen any of his matches, so I don't know whether he can work, but he comes out. He's good. He is good. Okay, well, then boy, then he needs a goddamn manager. And I'm not even talking about somebody to talk for him. I'm If he's got any talent, he needs somebody to save him from himself. Because he came out, not, did he used to have blonde hair? No. Okay, he's it comes out in a bleach blonde crew cut, a pink Gucci women's Mickey Mouse t-shirt with that has been put in the bedazzler, sweatpants and brown shoes. He looked like some schlub that would be walking down the street on the way to Joe's Crab Shack. He looks like he buys his clothes from the Kenny Omega collection. Well, I, I, as a matter of fact, I wonder if Omega handed him some stuff down. Of course, well, no, Omega's clothes aren't actually in men's sizes. But anyway, here's the problem I had with this. Besides the fact that this guy looked like a complete idiot instead of a star, and he was the furthest thing from physically intimidating, big body, big voice with the accent, and he's wearing a fucking pink Mickey and Minnie Mouse bedazzled t-shirt. But... What sense does this make? Why is this guy here? He His first words, of course, are about the brass rings and the glass ceilings and all 500 smart fans in the fucking place cheered wildly. He was introduced by a heel to come out and be the heel's best man. But because he's a surprise and a known person from elsewhere, people cheer him. 
But when he gets in the ring, he's smiling. He's happy. He's happy to be there where now he gets a better chance at the brass ring and the glass ceiling. So is this guy baby face or a fucking heel? He's there at the behest of the heel to be his best man, but he's smiling and happy, loves the company and the people are cheering him. You would be think you would think that uh, this guy prob- probably comes at some expense and is an ex-WWE guy that has a following, so he should be planned to be a main event guy. But the first taste that we get of him is being the best man of a preliminary heel in a bogus comedy wedding. So am I just to assume that everybody in this company is a complete amateur idiot that has no idea how to get anybody over, or is this part of a deeper longer plan (laughs) what the fuck this was not good i think he's a really talented guy although when i started to enjoy his work he was a russian or bulgarian brute he wasn't dressed like that he didn't have the blonde hair oh he he's a real brute all right he wasn't doing these promos plugging his twitch page and that he plays video games oh yeah oh yeah well, i forgot about that after well and i know that uh um uh simpleton uh what's his name uh, Sabian. 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 thank you yes uh i knew he was plugging the twitch thing i actually to be quite honest with you i know that twitch is something that they do on their phones with a video but I knew he was plugging his Twitch thing because they just had the controversy whether the WWE was going to ban it or not. However, to have this goddamn giant fucking jacked up bodybuilding Bulgarian brute come in is, oh, and I love to play video games too. What the fuck? The fuck? God damn it. God damn it. I don't know what would... Imagine Ivan Koloff coming out and saying... Dusty Rhodes, I'm going to get you in the Russian chain match, and then I'm going to go play video games. Twitch. I'm going to get a Twitch from these programs. And they put it, they bring this guy in who has main event capabilities, despite the way he looked and everything else here in this initial appearance. He's a main event caliber wrestler, and he has a name, even though no one knows him as Miro, except if you're on Twitch, coming off WWE TV. They have him out there. Penelope's at least been pushed someone in the women's division. Kip Sabian has been used as a complete jobber. And now they're aligning, I was about to say Rusev, Miro with him, which doesn't make sense. And the last thing he did in the WWE was the bullshit where his actual wife was marrying Bobby Lashley. So he's going from one bullshit, awful wrestling. He now say, what now? Wait a minute. Rusev's wife? Was oh the Lana thing? Lana, but that's not yeah. his actual wife. Yes, is that it is. Act- in real life, it is. Yes. Oh, good lord! But nobody believed that she was really marrying Lashley. They anyway. bonded over being fake Russians in the WWE, and they got married. Fucking so God. he's going from one bad wrestling wedding angle to another one in another company. So, uh, well, that's uh, I didn't even realize that, but now that's even worse. Now you're just rehashing bad angles a guy's done in the past in a, in a bigger, better company. <sighs> and it went on forever before we got to that point, and it was raw quality. It passed or failed, depending on how you want to see it, the raw test. <laughs> this, this was a Monday Night Raw segment. Well, we'll come back next week, and hopefully it'll be more well done. (laughs) Anyway. All right, well, let's stay on the topic of clothing, because several people sent this I thought you were going to say straight jackets. Or tennis skirts. But let's stay on this topic. Several people have sent this in. I'll read this question sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Ron Eastman in Austin, Texas. I assume Austin, Texas. It says Austin. I wanted to see what you guys thought of this. A lot of women on social media were ragging on the guys who didn't understand how expensive Rusev's clothes were on Dynamite. Maybe we are the ones out of touch if this is mainstream, and I have a little diagram. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You, 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 now, so read this to me again. What now? Who was saying what about where? I wanted to see what you guys thought of this. A lot of women on social media were ragging on the guys who didn't understand how expensive Rusev's clothes on Dynamite were. 
So they are saying that those clothes apparently were expensive is what I'm hearing. I have a picture here. I guess it's his first official AEW photo. I can't believe he's wearing this and smiling. And this was the Russian Bulgarian brute Rusev. The Disney t-shirt appears to be pink. The Mickey on- and Minnie Mouse pink t-shirt that he was wearing. Well, it was a pink um, print on what appears to be an off yellow, off white shirt. There was pink involved. Pink involved. It's says- more pink than you would expect a Bulgarian brute to be debuting in. That is a Gucci Disney shirt valued at six hundred and fifty dollars. What? The pants he wore. Wait, 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 wait. wait. That Mickey Ma- literally Mickey Mouse T-shirt. I'm not. I'm not knocking the shirt. I'm saying it literally was a Mickey Mouse T-shirt. Pink. Was worth six hundred and fifty dollars. Was priced at six hundred fifty dollars. I'm looking at it. It may be a version of red, not pink. I'm not exactly sure, but six hundred. I don't care if it's fucking magenta with a hint of taint. You can go to Walmart and get the same goddamn looking thing, but it won't say Gucci. Well, Gucci, Gucci, goo. Who gives a shit? You'd have you'd have six hundred and. Because you could get that for six fifty at Walmart, so that means you would have from six hundred fifty, you'd have six hundred forty eight dollars fifty fifty cents left over. So your math but, is a bit off, but the the point is taken. six hundred forty eight from six fifty. Yeah, that's right. You'd have six hundred forty eight dollars, or six hundred forty. No, see, you see, that's, that's what I'm exactly saying. what I said. You'd have six hundred and forty three dollars. That's right. And 50 cents left. That's right. And you wouldn't have Gucci. Well, so a $650 shirt. Let's go with the cheapest thing he's wearing in this photo. His shoes, Adidas Yeezy Boost 350 V2 Earth. What? Wait, 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 what? What did you just say? These are the Kanye West branded sneakers. They are called Ye. Apparently, I'm not uh, familiar with these. I'm not a, I wear flip flops. Yeezy Boost. 350 V2 Earth valued at $220. Those brown fucking clod hoppers that looked like in, in the old, if he, if he came along in the 50s, they'd have had one of those metal bars run in between those two fucking shoes he was wearing to correct the goddamn posture from his <laughs> polio or spina bifida. They were fucking therapeutic orthodontic or orthopedic or whatever shoes for $250. $220. $220, whatever. Okay. And then the main event, his pajama pants, Gucci Disney X Gucci jogging pants, $1,450. Wait a minute. Wait, he had on fucking brown sweatpants. You're telling me the brown sweatpants cost $1,450. Does he have a, a... Certainly, he is not claiming that he went out and spent this money. Did somebody provide him these clothes? Is that why he was wearing them for free? Because he's he's promoting something or a store? I have he's to not he- admitting in public that he paid well over $2,000 for that explosion and a Salvation Army drop box that he was wearing on national television. He looked like a goddamn idiot. I haven't seen any denials. I haven't seen any thing where he said that it was supplied to him. I have to believe these are his clothes. And uh, it's an important lesson for all of you out there. Money is a fantastic thing to have. Live under your means. Don't spend $2,000 on pajama pants and a t-shirt. I... that yes, uh, what kind of fucking sucker is it? Do they do they teach them nothing in the WWF now or WWE? Because he was there for a while. That's the first thing I used to tell the guys in OVW. Well, they, and they got a, a. That's the problem is now they go to NXT instead of OVW instead of being on the fucking ring crew and working the goddamn Vaughn Reno Starks Community Center in E Town. They're on national television, but somebody had told, especially this fucking sap sucker idiot you apparently aren't real bright and you're probably not going to fucking be a big star in this business very long and if you're lucky enough that somehow you're making some fucking money for a little while don't buy fifteen hundred dollar pajamas you fucking remember the time flair got me the fucking sansa belts from michaels of kansas city i told you that story i don't remember 
Ric Flair loved to get, every time he would go into the Central States Territory, he would get a new wardrobe because Michael's of Kansas City was his favorite men's clothing store. And that's where he got all the suits that he wore on TV and all the Sansa Belt slacks and all the leisure suits and all the shirts and all the co- everything, the shoes, the whole nine yards. And I happened to mention in a locker room one day because I was always trying to find all the wild colors. And the reason I got the Sansa Belts the slacks that they had back in the old days there is because they were made out of polyester. J.R., you say the Prince of Polyester, right? Well, polyester, unlike a lot of suits and the material that suits were made from, polyester stretches. You could take bumps in polyester. The belt, if you had a, a, a slacks or a, or a, a pair of pants that goes to a suit that needed a belt and belt loops, then you've got something that not only can snag, but it can be ripped. Marks can snag them. Uh, The belt doesn't allow your waistband to expand, but you bust the seat out of these pants. I'm telling you, running around the ring, jerked in the ring, taking bumps and being a manager, Sansa belt slacks were fucking great, right? But I was bemoaning to Rick one day, well, I can't find all the, you know, the crazy colors here in Charlotte. I went home one year and, and, you know, they had colors out for the Derby, blah, blah, blah. He said, They've got a bunch of them at Michael's. I said, really? What's your size? And I told him whatever size I was wearing at that point. I used to have like the small, medium, and large selection. I said, I gave him the size. He said, I'll call Michael's and have them send you. He said, give me your address. I gave him the address. He said, they'll just send you the bill. I said, okay. I'm thinking, well, he's going to get me fixed up with like, you know, a dozen pair of pants. This will be great, right? The box fucking arrived. Michaels of Kansas City carried 38 different fucking kinds and shades of Sands Belt slacks, and they sent me one of it. Cost me <laughs> almost three thousand dollars back in the eighties. I had a hemorrhage. I I <laughs> I think to that point, never spent that much money collectively in total. This was 1986. I'd been in the business four years. I hadn't spent that much money on my clothes total at that point in time. And it took me forever to wear through them. I finally, I finally did, but but uh, never let Ric Flair do your clothes shopping for you. Did you say anything to Flair? Thank you. <laughs> what am I going to say? Then I, if I'd have said, Rick, they sent me 30, what are you, a cheapskate? Because we're making fucking $200,000 working for fucking Crockett. I'm going to get mad at a fucking $3,000 bill for pants. And he, then he'd said, write it off. <laughs> But he would have said, write another thing in. It's a write-off. Thing is, I was actually paying my taxes at that point. Can you imagine taking financial advice from Ric Flair? Uh, well, there you can see I, I, the, the, the sartorial advice I took, but I just didn't bother to clarify the financial parameters of same. Is it true Vince McMahon bought his suits from the Spike Jones estate? <laughs> Do you mean Spike Jones and his city slickers or is Spike Jones the modern movie director? No, no, Spike Jones and his city slickers. <laughs> oh, I wish I had the cowbell. So we could we could move that right along with the cowbell sign. It's like 30 or 40 listeners who understand who I'm talking about. Ah, uh, you have way overestimated that. You have way overestimated. There's about 15 and 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 some of them are on a fucking ventilator because they're of aged description. You know what? What? Well, I'll tell you what. Thank you for for answering that. If you understood Brian Last reference, you need some fucking help. But if you have other problems, serious problems, or problems with issues that you need to talk to somebody about, then you don't need to talk to either one of us. That's obvious. Neither me nor Brian. You need to talk to the folks at BetterHelp. We've been talking about our friends there for some time now, and we've read the the statements and the emails from some of our listeners where this has helped them in a major way, whether they've experienced a loss or they're being isolated because of the pandemic or just, you know, even beforehand, they, they lived in a rural area or didn't have a therapist easily accessible that they could talk to in person. And now you don't want to go anywhere in person. Uh, the folks at better help assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist and it's it's basically you can start communicating either by phone or by video calls in under 48 hours. They've got 
folks with a broad range of expertise available, which may not, as we said, be locally available in many areas or especially in yours. It's worldwide because this is the Internet. And you can log into your account anytime, send a message to your counselor. Uh, So basically, you can go to BetterHelp.com and read some of the testimonials and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional by going to BetterHelp.com. And as a special offer for our listeners, get 10% off your first month's services at betterhelp.com slash drive. Just remember to slash and drive at betterhelp.com. And I kid about it, but we've we've had a number of, of people write in, and we've read some of them on the air, that, you know, especially this year, with all the other shit going on, the world's in flames, the West Coast's in flames, the East Coast is often underwater. We know who's in the White House, and there's a global plague. So if I didn't have Brian Last to talk to, I don't know what I'd do. And this is going going so well. well, I was about to say, talking to you is probably (laughs) why I'm doing some of the things I'm doing. Anyway, (laughs) folks, go to betterhelp.com slash drive, 10% off your first month. That's the way to do it. The drive through you're the host of the show. I'm the star, of course. But you're the host of the show, and 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 you pick the questions from the cult of Cornette, and you direct the tone of the that you welcome people and tell them that that they're our friends, and and you you're the major domo around here on a drive-through side of things, and all day now you delayed our recording time because you just didn't just didn't feel too good, and then we get on the telephone, and and you're say well I. Trying to find some good questions. You said you've got some things, right, Jim? You're trying to get me to do your business for you today here. Well, no, for the record. And for once, I was in a cheerful and, and compassionate mood, and it was like, yeah, I'll just I'll just go with the flow here, let Brian run this whole thing. He'll, he's such a professional. He's always good. He's got the knowledge. He'll run this whole thing. It'll be a breeze. I'll sit back on cruise control today and do what I do. It'll be an easy day. And when I'm being expected to carry a load, to shoulder a burden, and and I expected you to 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 like them that burgum. Did I ever tell you that story? You did. I, that was uh okay. What was it, Nick Goulas? No, Coco Ware. Coco Ware. That's but, right. That's right. Buddy Landell, I'm gonna like them your burgum. See, go back in the YouTube clips if you want to know what we're talking about. But anyway, what do you have to say in response to what I've just said? Well, there are elements of the truth in what you just said. (laughs) However, they be just elements. You said, I was in a good mood for once. For the record, this would have been twice. You were in a good mood this past week on The Experience. The name of the show was Jim is in a good mood. Well, that's true. Because you watched NXT and it was a good show. We'll see if they could have two in a row, which would be remarkable. No, I... Called you earlier to say, hey, can we push back a little bit? I'm a little beat down today, a little tired. And you said, oh, that's fine. I've got things for the show. Now it's become, I said, now, Jim, do you have things for the show? Can you please help me with the show? <laughs> Elements of the truth. Please, can you please help me? I mentioned that I was just going to chime in. With a few things today, if I could, if I could get permission, because it's your program. Would you like me to do some chiming here at the top of the show? This could put everybody else in a, in a, back in a good mood after they've listened to us bicker. And instead, they'll all be giggling like schoolgirls with shiny new vibrators over this. I, I don't know where you're going to go. However, permission granted. <clears throat> all right. Well, we asked here on the experience this past week when we reviewed all polite wrestling and whatever... <sighs> Chris Jericho, chapter 17 of his midlife crisis, was he and his badass backup Bellator MMA fighter had a a match with a meth head from a trailer park and his partner, the, the Swayback Sonny Kiss. And we mentioned in the process of talking about how rotten and awful it was that were that it was a, a shame that that jelly jelly nutella and sunny kiss do not have a tag team name 
because that would complete the overall package and make them indeed replace the ding dongs on the at the pinnacle of the worst tag team ever in history. And we solicited members of the cult of Cornet to come up with some team names for Jelly and Sonny. Would you like to hear some of the team names that the cult of Cornet members, Brian, have submitted to help this, this great gimmick achieve its proper place on the, on the top of the list of the all-time most rotten tag teams ever? I'm not sure if I do. I want to remind you in advance that this is a family program. So please be careful with what you say, and I will what say... Are the, what, are the Adams family? The listeners have gone a bit haywire with this, because I was inundated on Twitter, and especially in the emails, with various submissions for... I, I, don't, see any, I don't see any submissions or emissions or any of the transmissions that, are, that it contain any profanity. Uh, there's no profane language here. The cult of Coronet members are all high-class individuals, fine people that use their left and right turn indicators in their car. Uh, but they do. They did submit some some uh, some names, and I just thought we'd run down a few. And folks, if you like any of these, feel free to share them or uh, you know do whatever you do with them. We I don't know if we've got an official uh poll going or anything a vote it's just some of the options if anything catches on i'm sure we can pass it on to these boys so that they can complete their ensemble anyway the first submission peanut butt her and jelly oh come on this is <laughs> so stupid what is, what is this the next tag team name pretty shitty that's Pretty bad. shitty. That's not bad. How about this? Too cold sodomy. No, that's awful. That's, that's not even, terrible. That's, that's not even that's good. Like, what the fuck? That's not I even funny. Know. I don't know. It seemed. That's it not seemed. even funny. <laughs> How about this? Ladies and gentlemen, the team Nut Butter and Jelly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there was a trend, Brian, <laughs> back in the 80s after the success of the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express, there were uh, many expresses, Lightning Express, and the, the basically all the express teams you've ever heard of. Here, updated just for Jelly and Sonny, the Cornhole Express. Oh, well, you, you know, real quick, not that I approve of any of this. However, I'm, I'm looking through the drive through emails right now looking for questions, and I ran into some submissions from someone named Vigo B. And on that last one, he had the sit-down to piss express. <laughs> <laughs> the shark <sighs> the shark foundation. <laughs> the, the shark. <laughs> okay. wait, wait a minute. Hold on here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, they, how about this one, ladies and gentlemen? Smucker up and kiss. That's not bad. That's, that's actually not bad. That's pretty good. Um, Gives you a chance he, to go to Smuckers to try to get a sponsorship deal. I think that's a good yeah. One. He could have the the jar on his on the ass of his tights. There's plenty of room if he we wanted to have a case. Um, how about this, folks? The unwatchables. That's good. That you know that gets to the root of things. <laughs> That's pretty good. But is it is it flamboyant enough, or do we want to go with the more flamboyant team name, Technicolor Yawn? <laughs> That's actually fantastic. That is uh, fantastic. <laughs> or we could we could go back down to more of a, a Disney uh, Disney team name type. The the Forgotten Dwarves, Greasy and Cheesy. Eh. Eh. How about this? We're going back to the flamboyant side, but with a nod to Jelly's home life. Meth and makeup. Meth and makeup. I like that. I don't That's know. pretty good. That's pretty good. I did see someone said it one. <laughs> the name of it was like Sonny and Meth Head Share. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Oh, wait a minute. If they sign with impact, if they sign with impact, bound for glory holes. Oh. Boo. Oh. Tasteless. I don't know. You know, you get some kind of taste in your mouth in a place like that. Um, how about this one, folks? Maybe they could be a brother team. The Talent Twins, Slim and Nun. Okay, that's a... Uh, sounds like Bobby Heenan came up with that one. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, here they are. Cirque du Soleil and some guy. <laughs> that's good that's good but that doesn't really give both equal billing so how about the team of nuts and ass and, uh, you know well he's he, he does so have the stupid. he stupid. does have the t as well a more a more subdued uh, uh entry the team of that time of the month. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what they were driving at there. <laughs> that was that was all right. Uh, bring it back to to both of them equal billing, folks. Here they are, fancy and flabby. Okay, I think that's if they were in the WWE. I think that may be what they. What, yeah, that probably wouldn't. Uh, but fi- no, this is actually their WWE. Attitude Era name, folks. Finally, if they were a team in the WWF Attitude Era, the How Do These Guys Have a Job Squad? <laughs> From, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, folks. I'm telling you. Right there. From the cult of Cornet members that were sent to the home office in Lincoln, Nebraska. The team names for Jelly Nutella and Sunny Kiss. Thank you, folks, for your contribution to the program this weekend. I mean, some of, I'm looking at some of the ones that were sent in here. They're all ridiculous. Like, <laughs> like some of them just are not funny. It's just random curses. Put well, <laughs> it's actually you, when you think about it, it's it's kind of fits too because the the team is not funny and just random. Some of these are just completely inappropriate. <laughs> Yeah. Just, well, like what? Like what? I'm not, I'm not saying a few of these. I'm definitely not saying some of these. I thought I was I was quite unprofane there. I didn't utter any vulgarities or epithets. The Exotico and <laughs> Express. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say that on uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Probably I think it's not. a no no except in England. But uh and but and I see what they did there. They thought you were going with the one and then they went the other. You know, because actually well, you know, when you think about it, Sonny is more manly than Jelly because at least he goes to the gym. Sonny, that is. <laughs> All right, this is your program. You know, I mean the thing is though, I said it to you the other day and I saw Suzanne's reaction. Sunny Kiss at least has the ability to make people stop and say, what is this? What's going on? And Sunny Kiss at least is somewhat athletic. So, do, so does your fucking elderly neighbor down the street when he's standing out in the front yard masturbating and screaming at the fucking raccoons. He, he gets you to you know look at him. But is it is it an experience you really want to go through again? My point is, it's Jelly. That's the person in the tag team. That has absolutely no business being on a national broadcast. That well, everyone, that's a gift. everyone sees that guy, and it's like, why is this guy on TV? He sucks. AEW fans say this guy sucks, and a lot of people love you. What did you say on the show when he was in there with Jericho? That it was like looking at. <laughs> I said it was like a before and after ad for the effects of alcoholism and a sedentary lifestyle on meth heads. <laughs> It just, it's it was a, a, a I don't know whether it was a sobering I don't know which one it was should have been sobering for whether it was a sobering thought for Jelly to see that he might end up like that or a sobering thought for Jericho to see he's ended up like that but never looked like Jelly he was quite a striking young athlete in his prime I don't know what's going <laughs> he on. does look like meth head Jericho that is funny 
<laughs> well, now don't just laugh just because you can't. Don't just laugh because I'm saying this. You I'm laughing because it's funny. It's no, funny. you're being you're being a sycophant. What? A sick of a sycophant? Are you are you sick of a are you sick of what are what are you sick of? How do you pronounce that? You're being sycophantic. If that's how you feel, I take it back. That's what the fans it doesn't say. Doesn't look like Meth Head Jericho. I didn't say that. So now you're being a sycophant. I I agree with you. Whatever I need to sycophant. whatever I need to say to agree with you. No, they get mad when we agree with each other. Because intelligent people are not supposed to agree with each other. We don't agree with each other on women's wrestling. So any of you think we only agree with each other, go listen to those segments. And pizza. Anyway, let's get to the one people want to hear, apparently. I've heard... I, I stayed away from looking at anything. I stayed away from watching anything about this parking lot fight until I actually watched it so I could form somewhat of my own opinion, except that I it was unable to be avoided that Uncle Dave bestowed on this I can't say match on this segment the first five star rating he's given since the pandemic so that's a, a big fucking day apparently he didn't give it to Adam Cole and fucking Finn Balor apparently he didn't give it to Rhea Ripley and Mercedes Martinez. Apparently he didn't give it to any of the number of the matches that we praise to the heavens. Apparently he didn't give it to, apparently he didn't give it to fucking flair and sting ever. Somebody had a list of all the matches that Daniel Bryan has apparently not had a five-star match. Uh, over the last 30 years, all the people that didn't get five stars, they listed, but this got five stars. <sighs> I watched it as a spectacle without making notes until afterwards so that I wouldn't be distracted. And there were some things. God damn, how to explain this? It's like you fuck something up so bad that nobody wants to see it fixed. A relationship, a goddamn television show, fucking something's gone off the rails. And then. When they've reached the point of no return and nobody gives a shit, they actually do something halfway good. I guess is because here's the conceptual problems that I have. This whole angle was started as a comedy thing and presented in a way that nobody could ever believe it, that it was all a hoot and it's revenge over Trent's mom's minivan. You're doing this with mid-card guys, the butt buddies, the best friends or whatever. Middle card to be generous. You're not doing this with main event performers. You're doing this on free television, not pay-per-view. You're doing this in an empty arena era where there's no way to sell tickets to this or to rematches. This, is, this was a long angle. Remember, we've talked about the location fight rule. When the match gets out of hand and then goes out in the parking lot or out in the arena or out in the concourse or out in the concession stand or whatever, when it gets out of hand like that, that's shooting an angle to want to see a rematch that could get out of hand in your, in your mind even worse. And the longer you stay in that cool location for the fight, the more people have seen it and don't want to see any more of it. So your clock is ticking there too. You've got the inherent dangers of real glass and steel because these were real fucking cars. So they're doing it on free television in the empty arena era where there's no tickets to be sold from any rematches or for this. A long angle instead of a blow off with middle card talent especially and even if you want to uh, elevate Santana and Ortiz because they're members of the inner circle, nobody says that fuck Taylor and Trent, one name only, are fucking main event guys. Nobody with any sense. Nobody with any experience. It, but then after all of that, then they go out there and we're serious for the first time and stiff. And no outright silly shit. And nobody running over their crotch with the fucking football field marker. And they legitimately hurt each other. This is the most ass-backward shit I've ever seen in my life. 
if they were going to do anything, why weren't they serious and legitimate and really mad and violent at the start to hook the people to want to see anything, any other developments in the program? And then maybe they could have got a little silly on the blow off. But instead, they make everything a goddamn clown show until they get to the fucking blow-off match, and then they almost kill each other. Taylor still looks and moves like a goof. That fucking does not change. But everybody else in here did a great job. I did get a fucking tickle on the giant wall mural saying it's nicer here while they're having a goddamn rumble in the parking lot. But they did the the fucking and it's it was a great movie scene. It was counterproductive to anything you would ever want to do with professional wrestling. But it was a great movie fight scene. But here's the thing: why? How will this make any money in the long run? How will this make any money for anybody in the long run? How can you top this? Do more? Break more cars? Get bigger, harder cars with more glass? How does an in-ring finish mean anything now when anybody does it, when they've been whacking each other over the heads with fucking boards and fucking pile drivers on cars, etc.? How does a foreign object uh, cheating in a wrestling match mean anything? Cheating, just cheating of any kind in a wrestling match mean anything else after they've had a street brawl for 15 minutes in the parking lot? Like I said, every part of this was set up to be phony, funny, or silly. And when they had made sure that everybody knew that and talked about Trent's mom, then they get violent. Then the announcers sell it like a blood feud. They double powerbomb Trent through a real windshield and almost break his neck in the process, by the way, and it's not the finish. But then he comes out bleeding from the back profusely. It was like garbage deathmatch wrestling with a fucking budget once you saw that. And then, just when I was ready to say, all right, they hoped this whole goddamn thing up, but at least on the blow-off, they worked as hard as they could. They were serious. They did the closest thing they could come to, I guess, in this environment, to an actual fight in a parking lot and stayed away from silly bullshit. Then my little dog Pockets comes out of a fucking trunk of a car at just the right time and knocks out Santana with one fucking shot with a gimmick after he'd just been hit by 18 things over and over, hands him off to fuck Taylor and the butt buddies double pile drive the heels on cars next to each other and double pin them. So they even at the end had to spoil what they had accomplished after nearly killing themselves to do it by bringing out the goof and making the finish funny and gaga and bullshit. He didn't need to be there. They could have done this on their own. They were getting some respect and getting taken seriously. And then out pops the goof. And then just to make sure that even for the fans of my little dog pockets that liked seeing him, But otherwise, they could say, wow, what a fight. Hey, boy, bow, Jesus Christ. Here comes Trent's mom in a minivan, pulls up, and they all get in the minivan, and and she drives them off. In what universe was this good or entertaining or productive or conducive to future business or good for ratings or to sell the non-existent tickets they can't sell or anything Otherwise, than nearly to kill these four fucking guys and still make a joke out of it when they're all still bleeding and it's hardly even over with. Just fu- And this is what Uncle Dave now thinks is a five-star wrestling match is contrived, dangerous bullshit with preliminary talent that... S- somehow manages to stay serious all the way through the thing until at the end when they ruin it on purpose to make a joke out of the fucking finish and the fucking drive off into the sunset with Trent's mom's minivan. Fuck all of you. I, I was sorry. I was feeling sorry for them that they were taking those bumps and hitting each other with shit and obviously fucking beating the piss out of each other. And they'd been the victims of such rotten booking up till now that nobody was still going to give a shit or believe it. And then they all cooperate with that. Fuck all y'all. 
And Dave Meltzer, you can suck my big fat white cock. If you think this was five star anything, you are goddamn demented, son. You have completely, you haven't lost your mind because you know better. What you've lost is your principles and your integrity. Because it's more important to you that the cool kids like you than to tell people when you're seeing fucking shit. This was ridiculous. It, it, every compliment I could possibly give these people was taken away by shit that was preventable, by just they couldn't be serious about anything, even in this instance, when they really were about to fucking paralyze each other. That's what I, 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 I don't understand this whole goddamn thing. I don't know why anybody would do this. I don't know why a promoter would allow this to be done. I don't know what the point of it is, what the end result is supposed to be, how they're going to make some money off of it. Or how, how have they just not killed their goddamn company for anybody to do anything else to each other? What else can you sell? A cannonball? Pull me out of this. Well, let me start by saying it certainly wasn't five stars to me. Like I said last week, you could take a star and a half, or even, I guess, a star and a quarter, depending on what it is, off Dave's ratings to adjust them for inflation. So I would say maybe three and a half to three and three quarter stars as a brawl, as a spectacle. It was good as a brawl. Like you said, you have to forget the fact that it's been a silly feud with a silly premise behind it. And it was so good, I was actually able to forget that until the finish, when it got silly again. Santana continues to impress me. Yeah. Chuck Taylor didn't do anything (laughs) terrible in this. I mean, they were all really good here, until Orange Cassidy popped out of the trunk, and then the whole thing with his mom, and then the camera stays on them, because obviously she's going to give them the finger out of the minivan. Well, thank God my DVR cut off. I didn't see the finger from mom. Yeah, she gave a middle finger to, uh, well, I guess to us, the audience. (laughs) uh, On behalf of of myself and the group, here's what they think of all of us. If you were stupid enough to sit here for two hours and watch that shit, here you go. You can't tell me they couldn't have done a feud with these two teams and made it somewhat serious building to this as the end of the feud. Very easily they could have. Of In- course. Instead, it's been this silly feud with stolen gear and a minivan of the guy's mom destroyed, and he's going to apologize to his mom. With that said, it was good for what it was. I liked it until Orange Cassidy popped up, and I remember that this is all a joke. This is a joke feud. And that was AEW this week. Wrestling for kids by kids. But calling this right. calling this five stars just I oh that's just I ludicrous. Don't. And and then even if if you get into the fact that there is an art form to professional wrestling and leading the people on the emotional roller coaster and putting in an athletic performance, and then also there's garbage death match wrestling where you just whack each other with a bunch of shit for no fucking reason till somebody loses. And this was performed well for that. Most of the fucking deathmatch garbage wrestlers can't do anything. These guys, they did it fairly well, but they ended up shit in the bed and meant nothing. And to say that it's five stars of a performance in relation to professional wrestling, like I said, it may be a five-star movie scene, I bet you there's not any stuntmen in Hollywood that could have done all that in one take. I guarantee you there's not. And I think that's where these guys ought to fucking go and find suitable employment because their wrestling fucking sucks. Five stars for a, for a wrestling measurement. Yeah. I, I, he compared the, it to DiBiase and Duggan in Houston. Oh, good Lord. Oh, for fuck's sake. He's lost his fucking mind, and it's sad. And he's embarrassing himself now, and more people are picking up on it. There was no art to this. It was just (laughs) go out and potato each other for a while, and then double pile drivers. There was no art. There was no talent. What it was was done better than the average garbage wrestler out on the independents, but it just gives them more 
fucking ideas that, that somehow this has something to do with wrestling. And this is what wrestling's about. And that's why I'm down on the complete modern generation because they, they, every time they do shit like this, they tell the fans, this is what it's supposed to be like. And it's only because in most cases, one of two cases with AEW, they either the talent is not able to do it right or elsewise, the booking will not allow them to. If, if, if you're working for somebody and you don't have that much experience to begin with, and they tell you, well, we want you to go out and do this. Okay. You're going to go out and do it. Cause you've seen all these other outlaw goofy wrestling shows. And you think that's what you're supposed to do. And there's nobody here to fucking yank this back and say, what the fuck? No. So uh, a very popular topic, Jim. And I mean very, very popular. We've received a number of emails about this. Have you heard about the comments made about Tony Khan in England from various soccer commentators and apparently even the coach of his own soccer team? I must admit that I have been sent a variety of these clips on Twitter by folks wanting my comments, and I have honestly not listened as of yet because... To be honest, I just hadn't had time to listen to commentators of a sport that I know very little about telling me why that they don't like Tony Khan in, in their terminology, and I won't probably get it because I, I'm i offended when people try to say what's wrong with the wrestling business and they don't know what they're talking about. So I'm, I don't want to not know what I'm talking about when the soccer comment, and I shouldn't say soccer. I don't want to insult the worldwide cult of Cornette audience, the football fans out there everywhere else but America. It's football. but So I haven't heard what they've been saying, but I know by what I have heard that they're not happy with Tony Khan and feel that he is not exactly a football expert. Have I grasped the, the gist of this? You have, and we do have some audio, but let me read one of these emails. Sent to Courtney Drive through at gmail.com. From Matt Healy, the subject line of the email is Tony Khan, the soccer clown. I'm from London and a big football fan, and it says soccer in parentheses there. My team is Tottenham Hotspur, but there's been some controversy over here regarding Tony Khan. You know, wait a minute. Now, you you just, you got to love a place where a team is called Tottenham Hotspur. But there has been some controversy over here regarding Tony Khan and his role of director of football at Fulham FC. I've included a video from Sky Sports that will be better at explaining why this is the case than I could. My question is, how can Tony Khan be a booker for a wrestling company, a director of a Premier League football club, which is a very important role and full-time for all teams, and I believe still have a role in the Jaguars' American football team. Surely all roles would suffer, and it seems to me this is the case. I'm sure most Fulham fans are totally unaware that their director of football also runs a professional wrestling company. Now, wait a minute. That's interesting. Do you think that that, that is the case, that most of the people over there that are fans of this football team don't know that that its owner is... Uh, owner, operator, manipulator, and head booker and bottle washer of a uh, national pro wrestling company over here? Well, again, he's not the owner. He's the son of the owner, which is why he's got these positions. Well, you know what I mean. I don't know. I would gather the majority of those fans aren't wrestling fans, so who knows what awareness they have of what's happening in the world of wrestling or how full-time the role of a wrestling booker and a promotion I was going to say a promotion owner, but he doesn't own the promotion. His dad does. Someone who runs a promotion would be. I mean, it's a full-time job. Yeah, you think? Uh, back to his email. I'm sure most Fulham fans are totally unaware that their director of football also runs a professional wrestling company. If they became aware, this would have repercussions on the con's ownership of the club. In case you are unaware, Tony's father is the owner of Fulham a role held previously by the much-hated Mohammed Al-Fayed, the father of Dodi Al-Fayed, you may remember, Jim. Wait a minute. He was the uh, 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 consort 
of Princess Diana, was he not? Uh, very briefly at the end of her life. I mean, they died together in that car accident in France. And his father was the previous owner of this football team that is now owned by Tony Khan's father. His father is a fantastically rich man. I think he owns Harrods. Holy shit. But let's, uh, let's hear some of this audio. The uh, name, and again, I'm not familiar. Is this going to be too technical if we if we don't know all the rules of of soccer slash football, or is this just, is this, can anybody play here? I can't speak towards the technicalities of what these men will be saying, but these are a couple of their analysts in studio, Carragher and Keen. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I have no idea who these people are. The name of the video is Carragher and Keen's Brutal Reaction to Fulham Director of Football's Tweet. This is from the Sky Sports Football YouTube page. Let's play this. Let's talk about the negatives then, um, before we get on to the full and positives that um, Scott Parker was referring to. This is, this is Tony Khan, who's the director of football and son of the owner, tweeting after the game, I apologise to Fulham supporters for our performance tonight. I remember you guys were both talking about the defensive um, susceptibility of, of Fulham throughout that game. We've looked to add centre-backs since Wembley, since the playoff final, which was just five weeks before the start of this season. He says, I'm sorry we haven't yet, as two got COVID, uh, we lost a free we thought was close and had another issue with the fourth centre-back. I promised players and better efforts from this squad. He was then challenged about um, whether that meant he was now looking for his fifth choice centre-back by an, a, another fan on, on Twitter, I presume. And his response, Tony Khan, was to say, either we go for the fifth choice or we wait for the one, uh, one of the others to recover from COVID. What do you make of that? Clown. I mean, getting involved in that. I mean, that that, that was a, a really poor performance. I mean, it, it was that bad. We were actually laughing at some of the defenders. I mean, Fulham are, Fulham are going down. I've never been more certain about anything in my life. And they need to buy at least two, maybe three, four defenders before. Is, it, is he the owner or the CEO? That's say? that's the director of football, who's the son of the owner. I mean, he's just he trying to be he's trying with to so engage good. with fans. Isn't yes. It? It, so what's what's wrong with that? that? It, no, it never works. It always ends up in in tears. What does Scott Parker think about that? What do those lads are playing at the back think about that? Who've maybe got to play midweek, got to play at the weekend? Just keep your mouth shut. I mean, was he involved a couple of years ago when yes. they bought all these players? Exactly. So he was the one who was buying players a couple of years ago when they were like, mess of that. Just shut your mouth, get on with it, keep your head down. It's difficult for them at the moment. They're going to have a tough season. As I've just said before, I, I don't think I, I'm more certain of Fulham going down than Liverpool winning the league. You're but ready that, to write Fulham off after oh, three games? What we saw there defensively was unbelievable. Fulham were actually fortunate that was another game after them that we didn't properly analyse the goals. I mean, what we saw from Dennis Adoy was, I mean, it's, it was unbelievable, really, what we saw in terms of, of the goals. But, but that doesn't help. That does not help at all. And they were a mess last time they came up. What they don't want to be this year is a mess. They're going to go down, but almost go down together be a club be stick together I know people may say you talk about clubs. engaging with supporters but that's, you shouldn't be discussing clubs business or your transfer targets that's nobody's he's business. trying to offer crumbs of comfort isn't he no, but fans. not after no well you got beaten three nil at home just, just you know take your medicine and, and, and look at things over the next few days but um no, bizarre did you see the positives that, that Scott Parker was referring to no I, he must have been watching a different game to me well there it is Jim <laughs> I love the way the British speak. <laughs> Crumbs of comfort. It always ends in tears. <laughs> ah, well, I guess the the learned uh, soccer football folks are not any happier with his football team as we are with his wrestling promotion. Maybe he ought to do one thing right instead of several things at the same time. Do you think from what you've seen, he tries too hard to make himself a baby face on Twitter? Well, yes, because here's the thing. The, the reason why you don't see Vince McMahon constantly explaining himself on Twitter is because of that very reason. And, and, you know, I know he means well, but Tony Khan is coming off like one of a fan talking to a fan or worse, a Mark talking to the Marks, uh, whether it's in football or wrestling. And, you know, if he's got to explain stuff like that to these people in, in a, 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 a sport like football, then imagine it, 
why does he wonder why the people who actually like wrestling and who have been longtime wrestling fans are just offended by the shit that they see on his wrestling program when some of the soccer soccer purists don't even like the stuff they see from his soccer team and that's a shoot and they're really trying to win and not doing any hokey shit it's it it, it, it he comes off sometimes like Richie Rich yeah, I was going to say, you know, the Mets have just been sold. It hasn't gone all the way through yet. Major League Baseball has to have 23 owners approve it. But they're going from the Wilpon family and the Katz family to a guy named Steve Cohn, who'd instantly be the richest owner in Major League Baseball. Us Met fans have been driven crazy by the Wilpons for numerous things. And a lot of it includes micromanaging, getting involved with things that an owner shouldn't be involved with. You hire a general manager for a reason, not so you can pretend you're the general manager and tell them what to do. And Fred Wilpon, the main owner who bought in in 1980, his son, Jeff Wilpon, he put in charge of most things with the team. And every single story, and I started hearing about it. Now, what was the, what was that young man's background in baseball? He played it at one point in his life when he was younger, <laughs> and his father owned the Mets. That was his background in baseball. He, his family comes from real estate, construction. He has no baseball background. He's never so that he can it. he can he can build a baseball diamond. He just shouldn't be yeah. allowed to, to coach on one. That's actually a perfect thing to say. City Field, which he oversaw the building of the Mets Stadium after Shea Stadium, is. A beautiful ballpark, a wonderful place to spend an afternoon watching a ball game. The team that he put on the field, that he micromanaged, that he told players if they were injured, they had to play. They traded guys for other guys because they thought they knew better and it didn't work out. Stories started coming out. I started hearing about him a long time ago from some of my friends in sports radio that, oh yeah, the other teams, they all laugh at what a horribly mismanaged operation that is because of Jeff Wilpon. And then eventually he started seeing these stories come out in the press, in the media, people talk about them. Now they're gone, but I see a lot of similarities between Tony Khan well, and, and, and Jeff also, Wilpon. That was, uh, Wilpon, was that the same Wilpon? I know he was one of the Wilpons that was connected with the Mets that was going to start the big wrestling promotion back three or four years ago. Remember, he was the last guy that was going to be Tony Khan. Yeah, I believe. A billionaire, start a wrestling promotion, give people... Uh, insurance and benefits and retirement and profit sharing and the same general list of suspects in the wrestling business that want to believe every other who shot John story, believe that one. And that, that never got off the ground. Well, you know what it is? It's very easy to promise people lots of things when it's not your money. And that will pond from what I remember, he was maybe a cousin of Jeff Wilpon's. I was a black sheep will pond, but the entire Wilpon family was affected by the Bernie Madoff scandal because all the things they had been doing for years, from buying out their partner, Nelson Doubleday, to financing their cable network, to financing their stadium, to deferring contracts like Bobby Bonilla's, that was all with Bernie Madoff money. That was all with made-up money they didn't really have. So after Madoff went kaput, they couldn't properly finance a New York baseball team a baseball team in a major market and we've played this game now for over 10 years and now they're finally gone but i believe when the madoff scandal happened is when that other wilpon in florida all of a sudden was like well i don't think i'm going to be able to do this wrestling project now. yeah hey, by, by the way why was everybody surprised that a guy named bernie madoff made off with the money they shouldn't have been surprised because anything you hear about he was promising returns that are ridiculous. Ridiculous. But as I was saying, I see a lot of similarities between Tony Khan and Jeff Wilpon. How many, how many multimillionaires or billionaires have we heard of in the last 25 years even, much less in all of history, that we're going to start the world's greatest wrestling promotion? There's been a few, I guess. <laughs> I bet if, if we sat down and thought, I bet we could come up with a list of at least 20. 
And, and, and everybody wonders, uh, you know, why everybody rolls their eyes when they hear these things. And then one of them actually does. And it's worse than anybody. This is probably a worse product, AEW, than any of these other multimillionaires and billionaires would have put, fielded, put out in front of people if they actually had gone through with the who shot John they were telling people they were going to do. Because at least they, at, at all those points, would have not hired these mud show fucks. They would have actually gone out and overpaid for legitimate top talent and thrown the whole salary structure in the business out of whack. But they would have got actual legitimate talent. This is the first time where a promotion has been built specifically around the wrestlers that a couple of the guys want to just fucking hang out and play with. So there's that. Well, there it is. The question about Tony Khan, the soccer clown, the Jeff Wilpon of soccer, football, and professional wrestling. Let's get another question. It always ends in tears. (laughs) That was another good line there. Are you ready for some questions here on the show? Well, first, I, w- I want to send a special happy birthday to fantastic Bobby Fulton, who celebrated his 60th birthday this past weekend. Uh, he went to a, a park with a few close friends and family and observed social distancing. And he said he feels better than he has in nine months since all this ordeal started. And... His next project is to start eating solid food again, which I'm sure, as you can imagine, he's looking forward to. But I want to say happy birthday to Bobby. Did I did I tell you the story? I tried to do this a couple weeks on the show, uh, or a couple weeks ago on the show. I was going to tell the story about Bobby Fulton and the pussy hitting the ring in the sportatorium. Did I did I tell that story? I don't remember that story what's the well, story? It, 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 see everybody knows there was a lot of rats in a sportatorium right of all kinds not only the rats that we wanted but the rats we didn't the four-legged kind in the dallas sportatorium i i know the um you know the tv show made it look so good because it was filled with people right but we've we've talked about this before when it was not filled with people it was the sportatorium it was a it was a dump. It was a big tin building. Originally, it had been built in the 30s, and it seated, God, like eight or 9,000 people. And then in, what, 1953, I believe, the opposition promoters, they believe, set fire to it. It was a case of arson. I don't know if they ever proved that it was the opposition that did it, but it burned half the sportatorium, which is why when they rebuilt it, Later that year and opened it up again, they called it the Million Dollar Sportatorium because they'd done all those renovations. They just put a wall down one side of it. So it was like it was like a hexagonal building on one side, the arena, and the other side just had this corrugated tin wall down it. That was the part that that burned that they never built back. And if you're watching on the world class wrestling show from the hard camera. To the left, you would see that corrugated iron wall, right? To the left of the ring. And that's where the heels would go out after a hot match. The security, instead of taking us back up the hill, up the way we came to the locker rooms, would take us just out that 20 feet from the ring. There you were out in the parking lot, out that side door. We'd go out the side door so we didn't have to fight the people on the way uphill. And then they'd take us back up through the parking lot and go in the office entrance. That would keep the fans from being able to jump us. Of course, in fucking February, after you'd been sweating in that building under those TV lights, and then you go out there at about 30 degree temperature, it also frees icicles on your fucking dick, too. But nevertheless. So anyway, the building was so old, and renovations were not done on a regular basis. And because of the part of it, it was just in a big empty field at that point with that gravel parking lot all around it just minutes from downtown Dallas, it got rats. And I don't know where they lived. There were so many bowels in that building and so many places and the, the, the offices that were like Fritz's main office and where he worked was up on a second floor. And there was a crow's nest where you could go up back stairs and you could watch the matches without the people seeing you up from this cage apparatus that they had up there. They called the crow's nest. And anyway, 
Every once in a while, the rats would come out and make themselves known, especially when the people weren't there, when the TV lights were on and the crowd was in the building and everybody was making noise. They stayed wherever they they lived. But when the building was empty, they would come out and run around. And Ken Mantell's office, he was the booker, and Bronco Lubitsch's desk was was right in the corner where you came in from the parking lot. And there were holes in the paneling, the wood paneling in those offices in the back, where every once in a while you'd look up and you'd see a face peeking out at you. And I've told the story of when one of the rats jumped out of the ceiling fan and landed on my shoulder in the locker room. Holy shit. And then later on, I tell one of the radio DJs, Doyle King from Q102, he's a friend of mine. I told him, I said, yeah, a rat just jumped on me. He said, I saw it. It was as big as a house cat. I said, no, this was just a little rat. He said, no, the one I saw crawling across the top of the heating ducts was as big as a house cat. <clears throat> and what David Manning, the referee, and I don't know if Bronco Lubitsch ever got in on this. Ken Mantell did. They would sometimes bring 22 pistols. Because, see, the, the offices were there. The, somebody was working there most every day of the week uh, that related to the office, even if nobody was in the actual sportatorium arena itself. So they'd go out in the arena, and they'd take those 22s, and they would be at the light switch, and they'd flip the light switch on. And when the lights hit, the rats would start running. They'd see if they could pick them off. And I've told the story that Paul Bearer told Percy Pringle when he worked there, that's when the health department came in and investigated the concession stand and actually had them drain the deep fryer, which had not been done at that point, apparently in several years. And and Percy always loved the French fries at Sportatorium. I've had a few of them myself. They drained that deep fryer and they found all kinds of rat skeletons in the bottom where the rats were tra- walking across the piping at the top of the, uh, you know, the uh, over the concession stand and they'd slip and fall off into the deep fryer. So at one point... Oh. They decided what they do is they, because what is the mortal enemy of rats? I'm talking about the four-legged kind. The mortal enemy of four-legged rats is cats, right? So they figured they'd get a cat and the cat would get the rats. So they fucking turned a couple of cats loose in the fucking sportatorium and figured that would take care of the, of the goddamn rat problem. The unwanted rat problem. So one night Bobby Fulton is in the ring. He's got a single match going. I don't, I don't think it was on TV. Every two weeks they taped TV and every two weeks it was just a house show. He grabs Brian Adidas in a headlock and he takes him over and he's cranking up on the headlock and the people start popping and he looked up and one of those cats had jumped in the ring, had hit the ring and just walked across. The fucking <laughs> ring. Pussies hit the ring. And it just walked across the ring and jumped out the other side and they continued the match. They couldn't do any spots until the cat left. They didn't want to hurt the cat. But anyway, it was, it was Bobby Fulton is the only one that I only person in wrestling that I've ever known of that had a match that was so stirring that he actually got the pussy to hit the ring. Well, let's get some questions here on this show. Happy birthday, Bobby, by the way. It's gonna be it's gonna be a good day on the program. We got a lot of positive energy here. We got a lot of cheerfulness. We're gonna be happy. We're not gonna be grumpy. We're not gonna be grumpy like people are. Like there's a lot of grumpy people on Twitter lately. Possibly grumpy people that have heard one of our programs and not liked the content of same. Possibly grumpy. They may have been up late at night having a little bit of the bubbly. And Brian, let me ask you a question: When you delete a tweet does that generally indicate that the response to aforesaid tweet was not of the vein that you were hoping it would be well i don't know if it necessarily would reflect the response but it certainly reflects that you may regret that you tweeted it out well the only reason you'd regret you tweeted it out is when a bunch of people hopped in and say you know what he's right and 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 things and such of that nature and and going against your 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 statement or your your meaning or your attempt at at somehow gaining some ground back or just you're venting your frustration because someone told the truth one of those things should we tell the people what we're referring to 
I think so. I think a lot of people may have figured it out. A lot of people may have noticed this before it was deleted. Well, I did retweet a screenshot that one of the Cult of Cornet members was good enough to send me. So it, it's it's out there if you want to find it. But basically what has happened is on the experience this past week, the highly popular, wildly successful Jim Cornette experience. We reviewed, as we usually do, some of the recent television offerings from some of these so-called wrestling promotions uh, these days. And one of them was the fact that, as, as, as a member of Twitter did comment on, Chris Jericho's 30th anniversary television celebration match was against a fat, pale, 50-plus-year-old man that hadn't wrestled to anybody's knowledge in 20 or 25 years, but they're friends. And we reviewed the match, and hours after, apparently it was, it, it must have been late that night, because I was off of Twitter, because I, I go downstairs after a nice hard day's work here in the Cornets Collectibles Mines, and I've shut off the outside world. So late that night, Hours after the experience aired, and we gave these comments and opinions, Chris Jericho tweeted, Well, Cornette's knocking my matches again, but it's okay because AEW is wildly popular and I'm entertaining the masses, but if Jim would just get his head out of his ass, we'd probably offer him a consultant's job. That, that was basically the gist of the tweet, wasn't it? It was, yeah, it was basically that he is extremely proud of his shitty work over the year so far, over 2020. And if you would just pipe down for a little while, you'd probably get paid for it. Said the, here's the, 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 the bribery, attempted bribery now is added to the shenanigans of, of they are, that is, is that not basically saying if you just stop telling the truth, we'll pay you for one thing. Just I know he was, he was pissed because I criticized a match he had with his friend and it's wonderful. They're friends. I mentioned that I have plenty of friends that I wouldn't book in wrestling matches. John fell in Baltimore came to mind. Um, so he's mad because I criticized his match, but that is in effect proving my point. They, if I will shut up telling the truth, they will pay me. <laughs> Apparently, that's the line of when you, you know, when you got the billionaire backer, I guess that's what you do. And that uh, might account for some other people that we'll talk about shortly that join the conversation. But what's a boy to do, Brian? They, they cannot either. It's always oh, just doing this as a gimmick. Uh, cause he wants views and hits and listens. We, we, then we did the math and we did the shows and we proved that I'm bringing a couple hundred thousand people to their program just to see if it's really as rotten as we say it is. And then they report back that indeed we were telling the truth. And if we were just doing things just for hits and listens and downloads, we would be doing raw every week. Period. Yes. Because there's no comparison with how popular those segments are to AEW. No but, you know, problem. here's the problem with that. Besides the fact that's another rotten wrestling show that I don't want to watch because Raw is rotten. No doubt about that. For all the people who say, well, he takes up for the WWE. I'd like to know when. Uh, except for their production crew. Uh, but besides the fact that Raw is rotten, Raw didn't come out a couple of years ago and make all these big announcements about how they were going to have this great revolutionary new sports-based wrestling show, bringing statistics and analytics into the presentation with a sports-based fucking outlook on things. And it was going to be just the greatest thing since fucking grandma got those fucking false teeth so she could eat corn again. They didn't do that, so we're not fucking holding that against them. We are watching the program that said they were going to be revolutionary and the greatest thing since grandma's fucking teeth. And she, you know what? She's still gumming the hell out of that corn. They either have to say it's a gimmick. He's just doing this. He doesn't really believe this because it makes them not only it makes them feel better, but also it does some damage control spin control. I think the the politicians uh, call it. Because it makes the fan, the fans that buy the rest of their shit will buy that. And yeah, that's what Cornette really doesn't believe this because they're great. 
He just says that. That's their damage control. Or they have to, well, he's just, he's bitter, he's angling for a job, or he's bitter they wouldn't give him a job. That horse left the barn a long time ago. Once again, I've never, I have to tread somewhat lightly because we know, Brian, from late night phone calls to and from Stephen P. knew that they're touchy about that non-disclosure agreement that I signed with them. Lo, about how long they how long they've been on TNT now? A year about two years ago is when that was signed because they've been on television for a year. They're very sensitive about that. They're they're very sensitive. I don't know that. what they're afraid of you revealing. I mean, that's the other. Well, no, thing. there ain't nothing else to really to reveal. What I is Tony Khan afraid that you'll say that he told you? I think the listeners would love to know. I wish they would release you from the non disclosure well, agreement. There's not because then there's nothing. There's nothing else to reveal because then I'd have to remember all the other shit that he was blathering at me that I was like. Ah. Here's the thing. I've never said they were not going to do this. It was entirely plausible that a family that owns a professional football team and professional sports leagues in other countries and stadiums and arenas and things like that would be, as the story I believe has been told by Mr. Khan himself at a party with uh, Kevin Riley and, and the Turner Networks and Boom, and it was it was a it was a surprise. Uh, I think has has been told also to the new Turner executives that they actually had Vince McMahon's competition twenty years before that. Nobody there really knew that because uh, wrestling wasn't on their mind at the time. But anyway, they I don't believe- even know who Ted Turner is. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it was like it was a Turner. What was it? Anyway, I never said he couldn't get the show on the air. And I never said that he didn't have the money to back the thing, blah, blah, blah. So where I differed in his presentation was when I believe, as I've said, and I'm not revealing anything here, when he told me who he was going to be in business with. And that's when I knew that this was not something that I was going to be involved with because I knew what it was going to look like. And I'm pissed that they proved me right. That's why I'm pissed about AEW, as I've said this before, but maybe it bears repeating, and I haven't said it for about a year now, so we've got a bigger audience. It pissed me off that instead of taking the ability to talk to a fucking guy at Turner Networks and just get a network cable show, and the financing that nobody else has to sign seemingly one would think any avail- any professional wrestler in the world that's that's not signed to the WWE might be available to somebody with that bankroll if they knew how to do things. And all of those assets were going to be used in a shit show because of who was involved and who their friends were going to be that they were going to hire and the style of presentation that it was going to be done as it proved me wrong, right? That's why I'm pissed, because they haven't. You could have taken that, as I said, all those assets, and you could have got wrestlers, and you could have presented a product such as Ring of Honor has presented, or, or, or certainly something more respectable to professional wrestling than what we have gotten with the All Friends Wrestling Alliance. And that's why I'm pissed. It's a wasted opportunity. In this generation, in many of our lifetimes, nobody's ever going to just be able to talk to a guy at Turner Network and get a show on the air again and have the money to do all these things, especially through a pandemic, and do a worse job at it. <laughs> no, nobody's ever going to have this opportunity again, and they're fumbling the fucking ball because they hired the friends, relatives, acquaintances, and paramours of the central goof patrol that he's got as his brain trust. And so that's, that's why I'm pissed at them. It's not that I want, I didn't want, that's about my first comment to Tony Khan. The first time I ever spoke to him on the phone was Tony. I'm the only one that'll tell you the truth. Cause I don't want a job. Two years ago, I was 57. Now I'm 59. That's almost 60. I was not going to be definitely getting on airplanes and flying around or driving around to a wrestling promotion events that were being held all over the country, regardless of who it was fucking for. Not interested in that. 
Am I going to stay home and write my thoughts down via email or uh, or phone them in and and take a check for it? Well, if it was a goddamn real pro- promotion, Pinocchio, absolutely. If there was a way I could help, but how the fuck? You couldn't do anything with this show that they're doing if you were on the fucking ground there. Unless the the unless the first thing was fire half the fucking roster and start over. So sending thoughts in on a show like this when those people are are on the scene, it's like telling somebody over the phone how to cook a cheeseburger. You don't get to stand there and watch, you don't get to smell it, you don't get to take a bite of it when it's done, and they're probably not going to do it right to begin with. So they're just sending you money to send them shit that they're going to ball up and fucking toss away. And I don't want money like that. Because then I feel like I'm wasting my time. So there was never going to be any goddamn arrangement here. Especially, as I've mentioned, after I saw their first fucking program. But if you had wanted it, it would have been there. That's another key point. Well, yeah, I'm not saying that, but the, 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 the point is everybody thinks... They have their own reasons. They can't imagine somebody just out here just telling the truth because I don't give a fuck and I'm tired of people wiping their fucking feet on the wrestling business. And I praise the people who respect it and who approach their profession in a serious way and who have talent and who are doing their best to get over. And I shit on the people who are goddamn jokes and imbeciles and wink, wink, nudge, nudge wrestlers and cosplayers and have matches with inanimate objects and the invisible man because that's the way I really fucking feel. And the problem with everybody's fucking trying to figure out why is Cornette doing this is they cannot accept, they can't start with the fact that, yes, we do suck. And yes, this does suck. And whether a 100,000 people watch it or a million people watch it or 10 million people watch it, That's not even what he's talking about. He's just telling us we suck. And that can't be true. So he's got to have an ulterior motive. I got news for you, simpletons. Start thinking simpler. And I'm sorry, Chris, that I didn't like your match with your friend. I would have I would have booked it in Smoky Mountain Wrestling because it meant something to you. I would have put it on OVW TV because that's local television and a wrestling school. But to put that fucking guy on national cable on a new promotion that's supposed to be in competition with the WWE just because he's your fucking friend, that's irresponsible. Fiduciarily irresponsible. Fiscally irresponsible. Physically irresponsible. He got so blown up, he could have fucking killed poor. Did you see him try to do... The the Dick Mur- the old Dick Murdoch thing where he comes off the top with a knee and a guy's back and rides him down. He was he was beside Chris because he knew he'd fucking kill him if he fell on him because he was so blowed up and sucking wind so bad. So he just came down next to him and Chris had to kind of face smash his own self. But the point is, I do apologize if I hurt Chris's feelings. But everybody that thinks that I want a fucking check or a job to shut up. That ain't going to happen for everybody that thinks I don't really think this and I'm working a gimmick. You really do suck that bad. And let's say what's the foots for all the rest of those people. Basically just fucking deal with it. Goddamn. A lot of people have said bad shit about shit that I've done on fucking television. In their case, they were wrong. However, (laughs) you know, it's, it's, uh, it's their opinion. But mine is mine. It was a little revealing, too, in that tweet that Chris has since deleted. That it was basically, if you just put your head down and shut up, we'll pay you. If you just sell out everything you believe in for a little while, like some other people may have done, we'll pay you. Which I think says a lot about Chris's attitude with AEW. Because for years it was, I'll never work against Vince. I'll never work for anyone but Vince. Wait, how much will you pay me? How much? Oh, shit. Vince who? Who's Vince? I hate Vince. Give me that money. Give me that bubbly. Well, but don't put it all on Chris, because there's a number of people that are taking that money. Does anybody... Goddamn. 
somebody, uh, one time somebody said to me, well, I get bored sitting at home. <laughs> How? I've been sitting at home for six months. I'm almost ready to have a nervous fucking breakdown because I got all kinds of shit to do. And if I didn't have all kinds of this shit to do, I'd have plenty more shit to do that I'm not doing right now. I don't, I know everybody has been waiting for me to talk about what occurred next on this program. And I honestly don't know what to say. I do not have words. I do not know what to think about the people involved in this from start to finish. I don't know why anybody thought that. Well, I do. The people that thought this was a good idea were the people that are masturbating themselves on television every week. Whether it be the the mental masturbation of the alleged amateur armchair booker that's running this fiasco, or the masturbation from the past his expiration date oversized canned ham that has taken over this program and turned it into the Carol Burnett show when Jim Neighbors would guest. I don't know what to say about this thing. I do know one thing. I will I will make the apology that I've already made on Twitter. I apologize for complimenting anyone ever. I apologize for saying anything good about anyone ever because in and I will not do it as freely anymore because I'm tired of getting burnt. Whenever I do say good things about modern wrestlers, invariably they make me look like an idiot. Remember when I like I went to MLW and I liked old Mance Warner? And then I found out he was on every independent show all every weekend doing staple gun matches and wrestling the invisible man. And I had to quit putting him over. MJF had it. The one guy, the one guy in this company, the one guy on their entire roster that not only had it, but was still young enough to use it. The one heel who looked and talked and worked like who he was supposed to be. And he's blown the image. Name another heel that looks good enough to be a a star wrestler, looks like enough of an athlete with enough size, can cut a promo as a top guy and work psychologically like he's a top guy, like he's real and like he's who he's supposed to be. Name another heel on this roster besides MJF. I can't. Name another face that a baby face that that fits that description besides Cody that looks good like an athlete that can cut a fucking promo that sounds like he would say these things and can fucking work like that guy should be able to work if he's real. Bes- another baby face besides Cody. Off the top of my head, I can't. So they had two and now they've got one. The MJF had. He rode back with me from one of the MLW tapings in Black Beauty to the hotel in Chicago, which was like 30, 40 minutes away. So it was, we, the MLW tapings in Chicago were in Cicero and it is a horrible looking neighborhood filled with vacant lots and industrial parks and a lot of fucking barbed wire and people sitting around on the corners of the streets that you probably wouldn't want to go up and engage in casual conversation with. Not a, not a sharp neighborhood. We're leaving, going back to the truck in the parking lot. And of course, since this was just last year, it's long after the days when there actually were uniformed policemen to escort the talent out because nobody needs that anymore. MJF is being MJF to the people then to the point. I mean, he's not like he's getting in everybody's face and screaming and cussing them, but as he's walking to the, to the truck, Through the parking lot, people are saying shit to him, and he's blowing them off, insulting him, and keeping moving as he goes. He's being a rude dick to the point where I was like, you know what, fuck. We're out here in fucking Cicero in this neighborhood. Maybe you ought to lighten up and be a little nicer to these people. I almost said that. That's how fucking committed he was. And now I don't know which one he is, whether he's Steve Lawrence or Edie Gourmet. But it's overtaken him, too. They've not only decided to fucking take the rest of their program 
and flush it down the porcelain throne, but they are now infecting the few people they had that could do this right. The people, we haven't actually said what we're talking about, have we? You have not. Jericho and MJF were scheduled to have a steak dinner and talk things over. And they did. They sat down at this alleged steakhouse and they did scripted, unfunny comedy about how they were ordering their steak from their waitress, Velma or Thelma. It was like a, you know, it was like Harvey Corman and Lyle Wagner doing a skit on the Carol Burnett show. And you can kind of even hear the audience tittering. And then suddenly, they broke into song. Music started playing. <laughs> Music started playing. They started singing. Jericho started trying to sing. MJF wasn't very good, but he was better than Jericho. The curtains behind their restaurant table opened up to reveal a dance floor, a ballroom. They had, what, five or six dancing girls. And they proceeded to do a duet mixed with ballroom dancing. And that's why I said Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet. I'm pretty sure this is their fucking song. I'm pretty sure when I was a kid, I saw them do this song on television. They were singing and dancing and doing customized verbiage for AEW. This was... It wasn't the most offensive thing ever on television, in wrestling TV. It wasn't as repugnantly offensive as the tooth and nail match, which beat football fuckery for the worst thing ever on a wrestling show, but that was for one reason, because it... The tooth and nail match was not only insulting to anybody who's ever been in the wrestling business, but it was poorly performed and shot worse. It looked like it was fucking recorded on somebody's phone and the participants were so mud. So other than that, that's the reason why the tooth and nail thing was still more obnoxious and repugnant. This was actually shot better, but it was similar, very similar. And to me, watching this, it looked like two local news anchors that were doing a fucking song and dance routine on a local charity telethon backed up by the cheerleading squad from Tits McGee Middle School. What the fuck? It, it, the, they, they finished this thing. Even the dancing girls were rotten. Did you notice they couldn't even figure out what they were doing? Keep it stay. Should have had Sonny back there. See, there's a, he's, he's a talent for something in wrestling. They even did a false finish on the song, and Jericho was blown up. And then I really mean, and they go back into it again. Is this now supposed to be a sports-based musical variety program? Is that what it is? Is, is? That's why I'm saying one segment, Eddie Kingston is cussing like a whore with crotch rot, swearing to kill people. And after the break, the two top heels in the company break into a song and dance and the fucking stage and the dancing villagers appear like an episode of the 1967 Jackie Gleason show when the honeymooners went to Europe. And they won't even, these fucking people, they're like Trumpers. They're so fucking far up the ass and they're so delusional and they just can't admit that they were wrong and they've been hornswoggled and taken for suckers and taken for a ride all along. There's people trying to say, well, it was entertaining. No, not in any way, shape, or form. It was insulting to wrestling. It diminished your capacity to do future business by not only making Jericho look even more stupid than he's already made himself look over the past several months, but now you've got MJF with shit all over his face, too. If you found entertainment in this, you might be one of those people that likes to have their fucking balls nailed to a step stool. And I, I don't know what to think about anybody anymore, but I will be less free and easy as I have been with my endorsements and accolades or allocades from this point forward. 
What the f- just because Jericho, I'm sure Jericho thought of this. Just because he thought, well, oh, it would be funny. Just take your dick out, Chris, and just jack off on Tony Khan's face while he's there. Because you've just raped him and ripped him off of all this other money he spent on this fucking company that started out looking like you were going to carry it and now is looking like you're going to sink it. He likes this just as much as these idiots like doing it. That's what I'm saying. While he's while he's at this, take his dick out of his pants, jack off on Tony Khan's face and splooge in his eye. You're showing him, even if he's too stupid and immature and, and inexperienced and lost in the weeds as a goddamn wrestling observer mark instead of a fan of wrestling that he can't see, that he can't book, and he's wasting his father's money and that this is all a goddamn variety of horseshit that's going to lead to nothing but wrestling never getting on national cable again for the next 20 years. Just because he can't realize that doesn't mean that Chris Jericho, who knows better, has to fucking splooge in his face, waste his money, and fucking make fun of his own fucking product at the same time while he's doing it. I feel sorry for Tony Khan when shit like this comes up on his television program. I don't feel sorry for him at all. He's running his wrestling company the same way he runs his dad's football team and soccer team. It's just that wrestling fans, the super niche audience, are more forgiving because they like some of this stupid stuff. This is all Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho has some of the stupidest instincts in terms of entertainment of anyone in the history of the wrestling business. And his 2020 has been an embarrassment. And remember, has- remember when I said last year that this is the Jericho show and he's the star here and he will carry this and get it over if it's going to be got over? I apologize. You know, you brought up Stephen Eady and Carol Burnett. Funny little fact. Stephen Eady and Carol Burnett lived on my family's block in Lido Beach. What? Yeah. I still have like a whole bunch of Stephen Eady autograph photos I used to give out. <laughs> but but uh, you were the one that would take them? What a neighborhood I had. Stephen Eady and Carol Burnett, a few blocks over, the Rubens, Rick Rubens family, a few blocks over, Gambino. It was a great neighborhood to live in. If it, if if Edie ever got with Gambino, she could have been Edie, Edie Gambino instead of Edie Gourmet. All right. Uh, well, you know, look. That's a fun fact about Carol Burnett. I have been a big fan of MJF. Unfortunately, I've been seeing that things are going in this direction for a few months now. Ever since that really awful campaign shit. Yeah. When they should have made him a serious heel going after Moxley. Look, I saw this ever since they threw him into the pool. Which told me everything I needed to know about the way they're going to treat a guy who has the possibility to be an actual heel in a company with lots of smart fans who can get heat. That told me everything I need to know about the way they see this kid who has a world of potential. The only thing that MJF needs to be the modern 21st century Roddy Piper is experience and learning how to take care of himself. And unfortunately he's getting a crash course in how he shouldn't take care of him. This is what not to do. So maybe if, if there is a wrestling business in five years and MJF does stick with it, he's learning now what not to do. Hopefully he'll get a second chance to be viewed and say, well, he's going to get a second chance to be seen by people because just, I assume that all the AEW fans hate the WWE and they don't watch most of it. So if he's only being ruined in front of AEW fans who are not going to watch any real wrestling programs, then when he moves on to actually make money and become a star on a highly rated program, if it still exists by then, the WWE fans won't know that he's been goddamn one half of the fucking uh, Rat Pack or whatever. Chris Jericho is a major problem for professional wrestling right now in terms of wanting things to be serious and not just really stupid. And I know you've always been a defender of his, and I know you not can't, anymore. And I know you can't deny it anymore. You can't deny that it's can't. a fact. He's proven it over and over again. You know, there's always been talented people in wrestling. I'm not, by the way, I'm not including Chris Jericho in that list. But there's always been really talented people in professional wrestling. Guys who could sing or play guitar. Guys who were funny in the back. Wrestling was never a talent show where whatever you could do, let's make sure we do a, a song and dance number. MJF is obviously a very talented guy, 
This was embarrassing. I was embarrassed watching it. And I know a lot of the younger fans will say, oh, but wrestling's supposed to be fun and silly. And hey, if that's what you like in wrestling. Yeah. We covered that at the top of the program. Then why, don't get mad when we laugh at you and tell you how stupid and silly you act. This does nothing to get people who don't like this into the door. And, you know, it, it bothers me to critique someone like MJF, who I think is a world of talent. He's a fellow Jew from Long Island. But he is from Suffolk County, so maybe I feel well, all right I'm, about I'm, I'm reaching across the aisle. I'm not even Jewish, but I liked him. I don't even know why I'm supposed to be mad at Jewish people. I have no, the only reason I'm mad at him now is because, God damn it. And I know it's the first big contract he's had, and I know they're paying him a lot of money. God damn, sit down and say, no, for the sake of my career going forward, don't make me stupid like the rest of these people. I may be able to fucking help you one day. You know what would help AEW right now? Fozzie going on tour. That would help AEW. Hey, Jim, real quick, let me read you a few comments that I got a kick out of. Because I'm trying to not take this too seriously. Because why should I? They don't take it seriously. And I'm trying to laugh at the stupidity of this. So a few comments from the Mothership group that I got a kick out of. Lou Kippelman, superstar producer. Kippelman! On the network. It reminded me less of Frank and Sammy and more of the New Yorker staff Zoom call with Jeffrey Tubin. <laughs> it was the first time I said to myself, you know what this segment needs? Brandy. <laughs> Jericho revived that game show gimmick he had on ABC. He put MJF's promising career on a conveyor belt, taking a slow ride off the side of a tall building. How does self-consciously ironic shitty singing and dancing come across? Shitty. And really unfunny. And there's a few other. Can't wait for the eventual movie length Rat Pack tribute, Cody and the Seven Marks, featuring songs by Sammy Khan. <laughs> oh, good old Sammy Khan. Scott Quarters said, I could see the headlines in a Simpson meme right now. Old man yells at production number, doesn't understand the wrestling has involved. <laughs> and finally, one more from Scott Cornish. The main problem with AEW wrestling, it's too choreographed. <laughs> Again, trying to find some light in the awfulness and the Ugh. horribleness that was this segment on AEW. Well, I guess we've got as, as much to the bottom of that as we can get. It, 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 Believe me, it was at the bottom. I've you got to laugh. You can't. I mean, the, the horse has left the barn and the wrestling business is gone. And as I've said, I'm going to make it a point just because I can. And I despise all these people. I'm going to point out every time they suck and everything they do bad and everything they do, it's embarrassing. And every time they show that they're poorly trained and untalented and lacking in fucking determination uh, because they don't give a shit. So why should I? But so we will laugh at them and tell them that they're silly because that's what they're going for you always do the i told you so thing when it comes to chris jericho i told he you told so. me so i told, told you me so. so he can't help himself he truly believes he has good ideas he can't help himself help me he's not just drunk off the bubbly he's drunk off his own ego which needs to be put into check quickly. This next question, Jim, is one that several people have sent in this morning. I'm going to read this one from Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from the Jewish maestro. What do you think of this alleged leaked payroll document from AEW? <laughs> now, this is something that made the rounds, if it wasn't a year ago, it was several months back. I think it was before the pandemic. And... You can comment on it, Jim. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. I know, I know. Um, and, and, and why did it? Because I'm like you. I saw it on Twitter and knew that it was a gimmick uh, months ago. Why is it back in the news? It's the same. It's the same exact picture of the same exact fake document. Fake document. Yeah, yeah. fake document. I've never seen an invoice like this in so, my entire life. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> but, 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 but what's what stirred it up again? Oh, that they're just now finding it. There's a certain goof who's desperate for people to check out his videos. So either he was too stupid to know that this wasn't legitimate, or he was just hoping people would talk about it and he would get some desperate views. But he presented it as if it was legitimate. 
from what I don't watch his stuff because I care about my brain cells. Uh, but but anyway, what so I people understand, are taking it. Yeah. people are taking it seriously. Yeah. Okay, we will explain. As a matter of fact, can you pull that document up? I have it right here. Okay, because I want you to, I'm going to explain the, the flavor here, and then you can read it, and we can read the itemization. But basically, this is supposedly an internal financial document from AEW on bills or accounts that they have to pay. Confidential. Confidential. It says <laughs> to make sure you know it's secret. They got confidential. It's confidential to our entire accounting department uh, that these are the bills that we're paying. And honestly, I give them credit for the idea, whoever mocked us up. And if they'd have just had any clue about any kind of business and or what you would pay people, they could have done this where it, it was half ass legitimate looking, but instead they've made these amounts so ludicrous that it, it's obvious that it's bullshit and everybody who knows anything about what you would pay anybody knows that this would be ridiculous. Correct. If I basically phrase all that. Yeah. I don't understand why anyone would think this is legitimate. I mean, I think part of it is, you know, I'm not someone who believes that Dave Meltzer is on AEW's payroll. No, we established last week on the experience. He's paying them to well, mention his name so much. That's ridiculous, too. But I'm not a believer that he's on their payroll. You know, you've seen it. There are people that believe it. So something like this emerges. And although it's ridiculous on its face, there are people who will take this and hold it in the air and say, you see, evidence, <laughs> evidence, this April confidential accounts payable invoice says it. All right, well, read, read, read uh, the items on this confidential paperwork. Now, once again, I'm assuming this, because it says April, that this fake invoice is supposed to be just for the month of April. Yes. Payment processing, automated retail systems, $803.98. Coke solutions, <laughs> 5 20 23 I said, wait a minute, is that the, the, the soft drink or the drug that they're helping you find solutions to? Maybe backstage party favors, who knows? Anthony Rezco, whoever that may be, $693.43. He sounds like a teamster. <laughs> Talk to Rezco, he'll get it taken care of. And then payments today, that's what it says, payments today. Well, every accounting <laughs> internal inner office thing has a payments today column, doesn't it? $489.70. Now we get to the section for public relations and advertising. Brian Alvarez, $89,000. <laughs> Once again, for the month of April. Total Divas Entertainment, $42,300. Is there actually a company named Total Divas Entertainment? I don't know. I mean, I'm guessing maybe because it's under public relations and advertising and thinking there's maybe a tad of integrity with whoever concocted this. Maybe it's like a Twitter account or a website of some sort. All right. The Voices of Wrestling, $109,000. Monterey Peninsula Talent, $203,000. Westwood One, $333,400. Westwood with the folks that do podcasts. Westwood One. Well, it started, of course, as a radio syndication network. Big competitors of Bob Meyerowitz's DIR. But they're spending three hundred grand a month with these folks. $333,400, to be exact. Yenta Bixen Span, $10,000. That's where I knew it was bullshit, because if Styles Bitchley, that little fucking crumb grubbing fucking rug rat, ever, anybody ever paid him $10,000, he'd be fucking screaming about it from the rooftops. Yeah, plus he would drool all over you for just $500. $10,000. But anyway, just leave your car window open. Face. You'll get a fucking lap full of drool. You know, he's denying that happened. I remember you telling me about it years ago. Hey, I guess he didn't count for the fact that, and I didn't know about this either, that my ex-girlfriend had a contemporaneous journal entry where she wrote all about it. Maybe we'll have to post that. But anyway, moving on. Facebook, 
80,000. Yeah, that's why she's your ex-girlfriend. Cause you know about that journal, but that's another story well, for no, a she, different time. She's the one who told me actually, when I asked her if she remembered any of this, <laughs> $80,600. To who? Facebook. Facebook. Something awful. LLC. $12,000. I don't know what that is. All right. Dave Meltzer, excuse me, David Meltzer, $207,100. Wade Keller, (laughs) $75,000. Like anybody outside of (laughs) Bellevue would give Wade Keller $750. No, $75. No, I'm saying seven dollars and fifty cents. Oh, 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 oh! Like anybody outside of fucking Bellevue, outside of a mental institution, what, what would these payments? They don't have that many subscribers, for fuck's sake! For a dollar, a dollar a subscriber. Here you go. All right, keep going. Instagram, thirty thousand dollars. Twitter. Three hundred and twenty thousand nine hundred dollars. How would you spend three hundred and twenty thousand dollars <laughs> on Twitter? I don't know, because even if you wanted to sponsor your tweets, there's no way it would cost anywhere near well, that. But yeah, if they were if they were spending three hundred and something thousand dollars on Twitter, wouldn't you look at their Twitter and they'd have eighty nine million fucking followers? Yes, you would think. You would think. But Russian bots aren't. The same price they used to be, Jim. The whole bot market's gone to hell. Lawrence Sinclair. I don't know who that is. $24,000 a month. And finally, from the public relations and advertising section, TikTok, $111,200. And then, of course, finishing up this bullshit invoice, (laughs) refreshments. Refreshments. Now, important to note, Coke Solutions wasn't under refreshments. It was under payment processing. But anyway. Okay, well, maybe in that case, it was the B- Bolivian kind. American Bolivian. Water? Maybe you should ask Bill Ponderosa. <clears throat> American Water, $3,404.09. That's a lot of water. Healthy You Vending. $16,603.90. And finally, Poland Springs, what it means to be from Maine, $798.45. Now, wait a minute. Polish water is from Maine? What do they have over in Poland? No, it's, Lobsters? Po- it's Poland Springs, not Polish water. Well, I thought Poland wa- Springs was in Poland. Poland Springs is in Maine. Why don't they call it Banger Springs? <laughs> Why don't they call it Molen Springs? Why don't they call it Nantucket Springs? You know, I once knew a woman from Nantucket. I once heard Lanny Poffo tell that story. So what was the grand total on these expenditures? <laughs> there is no grand total, and I have not added these up with my calculator. But it seems like they're spending a lot of money. They certainly seem to be spending a lot of money. Maybe that's why they're cutting costs on talent. Can you imagine people believe this is legitimate? <sighs> I got to, to to paraphrase. It wasn't about this subject, but it was definitely the same words. If you gave Dave Meltzer two hundred and something thousand dollars a month to quote Dennis Condry about a uh, a young lady one time, he'd be dropping down, sucking everything in sight for half of that. All right. Well, I guess with that, we'll move on to the next topic here. Would you like to move on? You know, listen here. If you'd like to just shut me out, if you don't want to listen to the comments that I make and the things that I have to say, well, I got a way that you can shut the whole world out. It's what, as a matter of fact, I've even, I've come along in technology to be able to shut the world out because I wasn't going deaf quite quick enough. So I've got to have noise canceling earbuds and folks. The wireless earbuds from Raycon, the everyday E25 earbuds are the best ones yet. Six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass. You always need more seafood in your diet. A more compact design and a noise isolating fit. You can be wearing these, people be screaming at you. You don't know anything about it. 
You could be wearing these. Don't walk across the street wearing these everyday E25 earbuds from Raycon. You will get your ass run down because you will not hear that train, that car, or even that motorcycle. Folks, they're stylish and discreet. No wires, no stems. These things, they stick right in your ear. You can't lose them, but they stick right in your ear and they sound like a million dollars. They sound better than the premium stuff that's twice the price of these fine earbuds. And they've got a 45-day free return policy, so you can make sure they're the pair of wireless earbuds for you. If you do try them out and you don't want them, then you can send them back 45 days, free return, wipe the earwax off first, if you would, please. And folks, for a limited time, get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com. That's B-U-Y. Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N, buyraycon.com slash J-C-E, buyraycon.com slash J-C-E, 15% off the wireless earbuds. Do it now while this deal's still running. They can't do this all month. It could end at any time. You never know with these people. Take advantage of them while they're willing to be taken advantage of and screw them out of a set of these fine earbuds as soon as you possibly can. Actually, there's another listing here I forgot on this invoice. $600,000 Raycon, so they don't have to listen to Jim Cornette. Well, there you go. The whole company now is outfitted with noise-canceling earbuds so they don't have to listen to me tell the truth about them. And you, folks, whether you don't want to listen to your wife, your kids, your husband, whoever you don't want to listen to, block them out with the Raycon earbuds. Okay, I'm going to depart from our format here for a second. I'm going to read an email that I should have read, but I didn't see it. Kippelman sent it to me, but I didn't see it until just yesterday when I was going through some stuff, and then it was too late to read it before this match. But it would have it would have been a spoiler on the next event that was on this show, Matt Hardy and Sammy Guevara. I think you were furnished a copy of this email, too. You may have seen it. But somebody wrote to us at the drive-thru. Hello, Jim. Love the show. I live in Pinehurst, North Carolina. This week, the AEW crew came down to film at Matt and Jeff Hardy's house. I think it's Matt's house. I think <laughs> I don't think he and Jeff live together. But anyway, in nearby Cameron, North Carolina. Uh, the brothers are neighbors that bought all the land down one road outside of Cameron for themselves and their father, who is whom is known locally as legend. Anyway, someone I know was hired to set up and work the lighting for the Matt and Sammy match, which they filmed Wednesday and Thursday night last week. This is apparently for the upcoming pay-per-view. My friend that doesn't watch the product noted to me that it was the stupidest thing she'd ever been a part of. She noted that they had over 300 people working the production. 300. I th that's got to be an exaggeration. And asked me if this was normal. I just shook my head in embarrassment. She said the cost for such a production was beyond anything she had ever seen and also related that she had never heard of AEW nor knew it was on mainstream television. And, of course, we're talking about uh, the the people who set up and work lighting and pull cable and stuff, they always, they don't just bring in everybody for that. They have local people that do these things in these various areas. Uh, apparently, the rule number one was for nobody to speak to Rebby Hardy unless she spoke to them and don't park any production trucks, vehicles, or put any equipment by her car, which was pink. Rebby filmed a scene in the warehouse by Matt's home where she played piano Yet everyone was made to wait outside the building when she was filmed, save the camera operators. Apparently, it took a long time, and everybody was just standing around waiting. From there, they brought Matt and Sammy in to start filming, whom my friend thought was 16 years old. Sammy, I believe, not Matt Hardy. Regardless, she said Sammy was probably the nicest guy on the set. But she wondered again how any of this was wrestling, even though there was a ring on set. She just kept remarking on how much money was being spent or blown. Beyond the over 300 people there, whom all were booked into Pinehurst Resort hotels. Oddly, they all got double queen-bedded rooms per person, even people that lived around the area. Mind-boggling. They brought in a monster truck and had it run over a golf cart, or try to as it only knocked it over. They brought in other wrestlers, two guys that they had to reshoot over and over doing flips because they couldn't get them right 
whom based on the description sounded like private party. All this stuff is coming to pass when I watch this show. They filmed a sequence where Matt and Sammy fired bazookas at each other that shot fireworks. They had to keep filming in the water by Jeff's house and a heavy sequence at a fountain when Matt couldn't get his dialogue right. The whole thing took all night, and during the time she said this guy was standing around acting giddy in a hoodie, whom after I showed her a picture confirmed it was your guy Tony Khan. She had no idea he was fronting the bill for all this. In fact, the entire time, everyone in production was remarking how much money was being wasted with an earshot of him. He didn't seem to care. In the end, Matt went over Sammy, which was filmed shortly before daylight. Again, she just wondered how much money the whole operation was and if this made any money. Again, I just felt embarrassed. My question, Jim, if you had to give an estimate on when AEW gets the plug pulled, when would it be? When the guy in the hoodie quits being giddy. You know, I got to jump in real quick. That email came in last week. Yes, it's and, uh, dated, wait a minute, it's dated uh, November 2nd. And one of the reasons, and I kick myself for this, one of the reasons it wasn't on last week's drive through was I'm reading it and I'm saying, this person could be working us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you I'm, mean you'd seen it? I saw it and I said to myself, <laughs> there's no way, <laughs> little did I know, and I should have known better. I said, this person could be a mega AEW fan just trying to mess with us, sending us a false report for this match. And it was because of that that I didn't read it on last week's drive through And when I was watching the little bits of this match, I actually watched because I executed my Matt Hardy rule, which is back uh -oh. now. I realized that the email was 100% factual. And I, I kicked myself. I should have read it on last week's show. That's 100% my fault. Well, I'm pissed at you for another reason, because I sat down and watched this thing for quite a while. And by the way, the Rebby Hardy thing, when I worked at Sony Music, that was the Jennifer Lopez thing. When she came in the building, you weren't allowed to make eye contact with her. <laughs> and when Lauren Hill came in the building, you weren't allowed to call her Lauren. She was Miss Hill. Those were the two big ones I remember. And then there were people like Ricky Martin who would come in and were just fantastic human beings. And it made you want to help them and work with them. Uh, but don't speak unless you're spoken to. Don't make eye contact with J-Lo. Which is fine. Just, you know, it gives you more time to look at her ass. Well, I wish I... That's very sexist and mis misogynistic. Yeah, I wish... It is. That's true. I wish that I had not made eye contact with this match. Or I can't say match. Come on. Uh, so it's at, obviously, Matt's house out in Cameron, and they just start, and they're, I just wrote down something. Why are there metal garbage cans in the forest? They started this fight where if Sammy had pulled up in a golf cart, but Matt had a drone, and the drone disabled the golf cart, and then Matt's talking like fucking Vincent Price again, and and dressed like Beatrice Arthur again. And then they get into this and they're hitting and they're bouncing each other off the trees. And the announcers forgot for the first two minutes to announce it or they didn't look like it should have been announced. And then when I heard them doing it, I realized that the announcers talking over it made it worse. It, <laughs> it did. It did. It made it even worse because now they're in. It's burying them, too. And it's so fucking stupid. And what can they say? So they have to make fun of it. It was for AEW. It was mystery science theater commentary. Well, as a matter of fact, that's that's where I wrote. Jr. is really now saying stuff that he says when he's embarrassed by what he's seeing, and he's starting not to give a fuck, and he's just yeah, they're giving each other suplexes in the front yard. And I wrote they couldn't even do this in daylight, so you wouldn't see all the lighting trees set up in Matt's backyard. But then I realized well, then it, the fireworks wouldn't have looked so good if it was daylight. They went into the ring in Matt's yard. At least they're in a ring, but there's tables set up. They got to have tables. This is one of the stupider things that I've seen people risk their health and physical safety on, especially with what happened to Matt before. And then I didn't think it could get rottener, and it got rottener. Matt power bombed Sammy through a table in the ring in his warehouse or wherever the fuck. No, that was still the outdoor ring. 
but uh, Tito and Ortiz came out and fucking attacked Matt Hardy. Tito and Ortiz, Santana and Ortiz, or Tito and Ortiz. Um, <laughs> and they beat him up. So then Matt, while he's being mugged by these two street thugs, gets a walkie-talkie out from under the ring and calls for help, and you instantly cut to a camera shot. You see a camera inside Private Party's car, and they say, okay, 10-4, like they're on the other end of the walkie-talkie. But then the heels are continuing to just beat the shit out of Matt Hardy. The next time they cut back to Private Party is like 45 seconds or a minute later. They're still in the car. They're like, okay, we got to go now. Well, thanks for being in a fucking hurry, two goddamn nitwits. I'm glad it's not me getting the shit kicked out of me. It, this is embarrassing. And then they finally hit the fucking ring, and I guess that's where they were. They did some cheerleading routines, uh, Private Party and Tito and Ortiz, an entire cheerleading routine with the flips and the yay and the cartwheels, while Matt got fireworks from under the ring and started shooting them in the sky. Everybody ducked like it was acid rain, and then Sammy got one and fired them back. But then I think fucking Matt at one point shot fireworks up Sammy's taint. God damn it. You know what? Manscaped isn't even a goddamn sponsor this week. That would have been a segue. Don't burn your taint hair off. <laughs> Shave it with Manscaped. But anyway, <laughs> so then suddenly somebody stops Matt Hardy in his tracks and he's got, the guy is a hooded figure who's got a hold of Hurricane Helms, Shane Helms. And he's speaking in a grovelly voice and they reveals the hood off the robe off the thing. It's Gangrel. And then Private Party came in and jumped on Gangrel and started fighting him. And Matt Hardy and Shane Helms stood there and did some kind of verbal exchange about hurricanes. Like, where you been, Matt? And Matt said, well, it's long-term storytelling. I had to get out of the previous company. That's it. I'm done. I'm going to say this. I watched enough of this to know that everybody involved in it ought to be ashamed of themselves. And I've already written Matt Hardy off. This is why... I escaped watching apparently all the shit that they were doing in TNA with the broken Matt Hardy thing. He was doing teleportation or the drone or whatever. I missed all that. I never saw a bit of it because I like the Hardy boys so much. And I didn't want to change that opinion. And nobody really gave a shit whether we watched Impact or not because nobody else was either. But now that it has been forced in front of me again, not only did he kept by the time he came out of the goddamn ice machine from another dimension or whatever, the teleportation rule went in effect. But now I like Shane Helms. I like him as a wrestler. I like him as a person and I love his Twitter. So I determined that I was done because if I had watched any more of this, I would not like Shane Helms anymore either. I could tell that as soon as I heard the long-term storyline or long-term storytelling bit, so I watched no more of it. I fast forwarded. I saw they were in another ring somewhere. I didn't stop to find out what everybody involved in whatever the fuck this was should be ashamed and leave the business in disgrace. And I've crossed at least one other old friend off my list, Matt Hardy. And I didn't watch Shane do whatever the fuck that he did that would make me do the same thing. This was fucking embarrassing. <laughs> it's what I just did to my microphone. What was that? That was me spitting on my fucking microphone. Why would you do that? You have to talk into it for the rest of the show. Because it won't stink as bad as this match did, and I wanted to spit on this fucking match and everybody involved in it. You know, I gave Matt Hardy like a little bit of leeway after he got his concussion doing something stupid. And I said, you know what? Maybe now he's going to abandon. Are you wiping the spit off the microphone? Trying to get the spit off my fucking nice little screen there. Oh, I have to wipe it up underneath the... Here, I'm wiping this. You just... I'll use some of these notes to wipe this spit up. Continue. Well, now they'll be even more valuable. I said, you know what? Maybe I'll cool it a little bit with my Matt Hardy ban for all the stupid shit that he's a part of. And, you know, he did a regular promo. And then they got him back with Sammy. I said, oh, no. Maybe they won't go back to the broken Matt Hardy shit. And wouldn't you know it? The, be the best promo he's done since they've been on television was the one where he just spoke as himself. And then I started watching this, and it was almost instantly I said no. And I fast-forwarded. I stopped at a few points when I saw the hooded figure 
when I saw the hurricane get released from what appeared to be invisible handcuffs. I didn't realize it was a lake. It was so dark. I thought it was a black curtain. And then I realized, oh, shit, that's a lake. I didn't get to the lake. I didn't even know what was going on. When I stopped the fast forward and I realized, son of a bitch, that email was on the money. I was mad at myself. <clears throat> but this was garbage. I don't want to see Matt Hardy ever again. This is a waste of Sammy Guevara, bringing him back into this garbage feud. I don't have too many other thoughts I could add to this other than, you know, Jim, when I was done with this pure garbage, I was disgusted with myself, and I felt the need to go into the bathroom and wash up and rinse myself. Clean yourself. Of this filth. I'm talking my body, my hair. I'm talking about after I get out, some nice deodorant. Your nails. I couldn't deal with this anymore. And luckily, thanks to our good friends at Hawthorne, I was able to cleanse myself of the filth that was the elite deletion. That's exactly right, folks. And I'll tell you what, we got new friends. We're making new friends all the time. The folks at Hawthorne are our new friends. And they've got products, if you have to watch matches that reek of the stench of grisly death like this one for your line of work, nobody would do this for recreation. But if you have to watch this stuff, you need to visit our fine friends at Hawthorne. Folks, they've got lotions, they've got soaps, they've got a variety of things to clean you from head to toe to make you feel better, smell better, moisturizers, lotions, and potions. I'm going to tell you, first of all, you go there and they don't just give you what they give anybody. Your orders, your, your, your picks, your, your choices are customized specifically for you from a survey that you take. It's easy. It's not intrusive. What's your favorite drink? How do you like to spend a night out? That type of thing. And then they factor your answers into the results. It's an easy quiz. It's quick. It's fun. And then they recommend things for you, specifically tailored to you. And I'll tell you what, to be honest, I'm cheating a little bit. The face lotion, I can't even pronounce this. I've got it right over here so I can read it, but it, it contains centella asiatica and aloe. But it's a medium weight lotion that both moisturizes and hydrates because I mentioned about my dry skin and the face lotion, I'm cheating. I'm using it on my elbows. My elbows felt like sandpaper because I'm constantly leaning on something as I address all these Cornets collectibles on envelopes. No more. My elbows, Brian Last, are as smooth and soft and hydrated as a baby's keister. The folks at Hawthorne, they, they've got all kinds of... What did you like the best? I'll tell you what I like the best. There was a hand soap that they sent me based on me filling out this quiz they have. It's dark rum. I was about to say flavored. I don't know if flavor is the right term. Well, I don't know. Well, why don't, you, why don't you have Suzanne wash your <laughs> mouth out, you foul thing, and we'll see if it's flavored. It is dark rum hand soap that every time I wash my hands with it, I just smell my hands. It smells so good. I will say, on the topic of the lovely Suzanne, she loves the colognes they sent me. There's one they labeled as work. And one they labeled as play, uh -huh. and they both smell fantastic. And I feel really good wearing this when I go out. I'm afraid that women are going to rip my clothes off and just. I think I think you're you're fairly safe there. But so if, if you wear both of them, you can have kind of work in the front and play in the back kind of thing. I think that may be a bit much. I would conserve these colognes because they're so nice, and use one at a time. Well, you're also you're very conservative anyway. You don't want to drive the women mad. And folks, you can build personalized gifts for other people, too. You can give gifts to your friends and family from Hawthorne anyway. It's a fun, convenient way to get super high-quality products tailored specifically for men. And they take the risk out of it by giving you free shipping on your order and free returns. If you don't like their products, they'll even retailer them based on the feedback you give them. So get special offers for the holidays going on right now by visiting Hawthorne.co. That's Hawthorne, H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O to check out all the special holiday offers 
You will smell so good it'll give people a headache. Holy mackerel, you'll be slicker than cum on a gold tooth. You'll be moisturized, sanitized, homogenized, and pasteurized with Hawthorne. I love that dark rum. Yeah, you know, you're sipping on that soap. I'm not drinking the soap. Yeah, well, you're drinking the Kool-Aid then. But every time I burp, there are bubbles. I just come out yeah. of my mouth. <laughs> I knew a girl in Jackson, Mississippi that had that trouble. Let's not do that right now. Uh, well, you just want to get to the next segment because it was your all-time favorite. Let me, let me just say, I'm going to say something before we get going. This next segment is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. This is the best segment in the history of AEW. You get every emotion, every feeling you would get from AEW in this one segment. It starts off and you're like, all right, let's see where this goes. And then you're like, what the hell is this? And then you're like, oh my God, this is awful. And then it's, holy shit, where did that come from? This is awesome. And then it goes right back to, oh, it's AEW. There is so much that happens here. I rewound and watched this three times. I watched this live. I had to do something at 8.30. So I only had a half hour window I could watch one of these shows live. I chose AEW. So I watched this live as it happened. I sat at my desk. I was howling with laughter. I thought this was the greatest thing ever. I couldn't believe it. I, at first, I thought they were going to do a Cody's having an affair angle. And I was like, oh, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. This is the greatest. <laughs> but then it went in a completely different direction. And it was one of the most beautiful train wrecks I've ever seen. (laughs) And at its peak, at its greatest moments, it was fantastic. And at its worst moments, it was something I could just be entertained by. It, it didn't have the, 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 the shock appeal, no pun intended of the shock master, but it was really spectacularly bad television in the same vein. It was beautifully bad television. I couldn't look away. I laughed. I covered my mouth and said, oh, my God. It was it was perfection. It was, in, right, in, the, well, in the world of AEW, it was perfection. This is the greatest segment in the history of AEW. Well, let's explain for the folks who don't either didn't watch the program or don't watch until we talk about it so you know what to look out for. Cody has his big entrance. He's dressed in a suit. He looks professional except for the neck tattoo, but he's coming out and the music and the cheers and everything. And I thought this was going to be some kind of serious interview segment or something involving Cody. And, And the first thing that I wrote down was that I know we've talked about this before. I like, I like Cody's promos even if you think sometimes they veer into, and I agreed with you a time or two, the theatrical or maybe too grandiose in their in their soliloquy, he he delivers things easily. He likes being out there. He's he's relaxed. I hear I hear Dusty in his cadence, if not in the actual verbiage. And by the time that I said that, he's talking and a woman walks into the ring that we've never seen before (laughs) from behind him. And, you know, he realizes that she's there and he turns around and he says, can I help you? (laughs) I was dying by this point. I was like, what is going on here? This is amazing. (laughs) Because this woman, she... She she's a tall, a, a striking looking black woman with blonde hair and a red outfit, and she's got abs. As a matter of fact, at first I thought, "Oh my God, it's Linda Miles. She's back." Oh, don't say that. Um, well, and the, now I don't want to. I don't want to besmirch the name of Linda Miles after I heard this promo. And this woman starts trying to talk to. Cody Rhodes. And as my as Mama Cornette used to say, she couldn't say Suey if the hogs had her. She couldn't say shit if she had a mouthful. It was Big Mama 85 Jim Crockett <laughs> level bad. I said, I wrote, oh my God. 
she's like, Cody, I've, I've looked for you or I've tried to find you or I've wanted to confront you or whatever. I've looked in bars. I've looked in cars. You see, that's why at the and beginning I, I thought it was going to be, Cody, you know we've been having an affair. I was like, oh, my God, where are they going with this? <laughs> well, I, I didn't even I didn't even think that because I thought, my God, I don't I don't know what I thought. But this girl was awkward. She was gangly and nervous, had no idea what she was doing, had no business being on national television. She had memorized some shit she was supposed to say. She couldn't get her name out. I th- is it Jane Cargill? <laughs> Why, might as well have given her, you know, fucking uh, Eustace McFinger Mang McGee. Give her something else even harder to pronounce. Von Hepper Trepper. <laughs> Von Hepper Trepper. <laughs> and with... She was trying to lay out some kind of story and Cody kept standing there and you could tell by mental telepathy, he was trying to will her to get this out. And I just, I wrote, why is this happening? It sounded like the, the fucking County fair speech in by Don Knotts and the ghost and Mr. Chicken. What do you know about giants? Who are giants? What are giants? Let me <laughs> clarify this. I know a giant. And this, Cody's looking at his watch, right? And Jr. says, well, "This has been riveting." She has in a monotonous, like machine-like delivery, beating around the bush. Then she l- finishes apparently what she's saying and leaves the ring. But then when she gets to the stage, she turns around and there's more, and it starts going longer. And she reveals her giant friend's name because that's the whole thing. Is Dustin been saying or Dustin? Cody's been saying he's a giant killer. Well, you you shouldn't say that because I know a giant. And the giant's name is Shaq. Well, nobody popped because the last thing that anybody sitting at home or probably in that building was thinking about when they're talking about giants and wrestling is Shaq. I thought she said Shrek. I thought they're they're doing a crossover with the goddamn <laughs> Pixar or whatever. And then the announcers had to jump in and say, oh, she means Shaquille O'Neal? <laughs> well, now if she'd have said that, everybody had known who the fuck she was talking about. Even on a wrestling program. Well, now everyone, if you say Shaq, everyone knows what you're talking about. I, did, I didn't get Shaq in the context of this unknown woman that's never been seen before out on a fucking outlaw wrestling program and suddenly she's going to be talking about a giant basketball player it didn't register to me i bet it didn't register to a lot of people where so did she, she come me, from think, jumped in did she hop the rail like, no where, she walked she's... out behind the <laughs> ring down the ramp yeah where did she come from <laughs> she came from the entrance way no she didn't come from the entrance way i thought she came up from the floor i thought she came from the entrance way I like when she would just randomly pose, when she would randomly hit the double yeah, bicep. She, she, she would stop talking and just get back and flip her hair and pose because she was lost and couldn't remember what to say. So, and I bet you Cody was doing some ventriloquism. and talk about the giant. So let, uh, let me stop you real quick. Because she's now on the, I guess, the staging area. Cody's still in the ring. Cody is... Has this look on his face, like you said, like, oh my God, what is going on? And this on here? has taken a long time. It has gone on for so long that it went from this is bad to this is amazingly bad. Fantastically bad. And see, I didn't like it that much at that point because I've been out there on live TV for some segments when other people shit the bed and it's, it's, it just seems like forever. How many times has this happened to Cody where he gets in the ring, he gets his long, long entrance with the dramatic music that goes on longer than anyone else's music before you see him. And then he finally gets in the ring and he's on the mic for 30 seconds and boom, Jake, the snake Robert shows up. Yeah. Like, this has happened before. So she's now on the, uh, entrance ramp area, the entrance way. It's not really a ramp. She's standing there. Cody's in the ring. My first thought after she says Shaq is, thank God they're going to do Shaq and Cody and not Shaq and Jericho. Thank God they didn't let Jericho latch on to this. Well, but now, do you even think, how old is Shaquille O'Neal now? He's, I would guess, at least 45, at minimum 45, maybe closer to 50. And 300 and some pounds easily and whatever the fuck. Do you think even Cody can get this done? 
I, I I don't know. He's been teasing wanted to do something in wrestling forever, and I don't think he's ever actually done anything. But she's on the stage, and I'm like, this is amazing. And then somehow, somehow, <laughs> it got turned up to 10, and it became all-time classic. It became one of the greatest things ever. And it was easily the best thing at AEW. I didn't expect this. From an unlikely source. An unlikely source, and I'm not going to spoil it. I'm going to let you have this. But an unlikely source came out and delivered the promo of a lifetime. (laughs) Thank you for the handoff. Ladies and gentlemen, as this Linda Miles-looking woman named Jane Cargill was standing there and had dropped the Shaquille O'Neal bomb, here comes Brandy Rhodes. And she's pissed. And she launches into old Jane with the goddamnedest promo that I've ever heard in my life. She (laughs) meant every word of it. She was cussing. She was pissed off. She told her everything that she should shove up her ass and exactly which fucking direction to do it in. I mean, it was great. And it was Brandy. And it was great. I mean, she, she... her promos go from sounding like Meryl Streep to sounding like Butch Reed. That was it. It was Butch Reed 85 calling Dark Journey a heifer on Mid-South TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was incredible. Incredible. Oh, so and where so did this then, come from? Where this- right then I wrote Oli, Piper, Foley, CM Punk, <laughs> Brandy. <laughs> In the all-time pantheon of promos in pro wrestling. And then, as she basically told her to get her bitch ass out of her building there, that here comes Jerry Lynn to separate. Oh, no, no, uh, no, no, no. You're you're skipping over some of the most important parts. Okay, well, go ahead. Go ahead. While Brandy is cutting this, the, the, the greatest promo of her life on this woman, and totally believable and great. Cody's never cut a promo this good. No, no. This woman is standing there and she's posing and she's like, smiling. Yeah, she's and she, it. <laughs> and she's not so. So then Brandy says, convincingly, you better get out of here. But then Brandy gets out of there and turns around and starts walking away, and the girl just pats Brandy on the ass. <laughs> and that caused Jerry Lynn and all the officials to run out. Uh, and well, and that and that's the thing. If you'll notice, they pick their spots on when to run out. And they did it another time on this program. But uh, so Jerry Lynn's separating the women, and then but in the then they can't leave well enough alone because <laughs> then Cody's still in the ring watching all this go on. Cage attacks Cody from behind and power bombs him, and here comes Starks, and they're kicking the shit out of Cody. Well, then Darby Allen's music starts playing <laughs> and they just freak out and stop beating up on Cody and Darby Allen is a hundred feet away. They stop beating up on Cody when the music hits for this brooding twink to walk as slow as he can <laughs> down the entire building <laughs> yeah. to get to the ring. <laughs> and then he rolls in the ring and they charge at him and he hits him with his thumbtack jacket he's wearing a jacket covered in thumbtacks everybody has one of those they were all the rage back a few years ago and you got one sitting in your closet and he hits them with his thumbtack jacket and then the fucking heels bail out and and are leaving Taz and Starks Taz is standing on the stage saying like okay all right." Yeah, Taz, you have to come on back, come on back. The, the, the guy with the thumbs, the, the 150-pound guy with the thumbtack-covered jacket just beat up my giant bodybuilder, my sexy, you know, Ricky Starks, uh, star stroke daddy. And besides the fact that they they waited for him to come in the ring, stopped beating up the guy that they were beating up and waited for him to come in the ring and then got beat up by him, then... If they hadn't blown enough heat off of these heels already, as the heels are leaving, going down the fucking tube, somebody had told Will Hobbs in the back, hey, Will, go out there and throw a chair at him, because here comes Will Hobbs, the heels are leaving, going down the fucking passageway, and Hobbs (laughs) comes out and throws a chair at him. You better get out of here. 
It's like the time that Heyman threw the garbage can at Ric Flair after Flair had already left the room. And everyone calls him Will Hobbs, except for Jim Ross, who keeps calling him Willie Hobbs. Willie Hobbs, baby. <laughs> Willie Hobbs, but I can hear Dusty saying it. Dusty would I call Willie Hobbs the same thing. As a matter of fact, Dusty would have, would have written Willie Hobbs on his lineups. He had nicknames for everybody, either initials or nicknames. Dennis Condry was DC Cab because that movie came out and, and Dusty saw it on a <laughs> fucking pay-per-view channel in the hotel one night. And Dennis Condry forever after became DC Cab on the lineups. Oh, awful movie. Anyway, so that was certainly a segment of renown. We'll remember that one. That was the greatest segment in AEW history. It hit every, every, like, if you're someone who enjoyed AEW, there was something for you. For me, it was everything. Like I said, it started out with, okay, let's see where this is going. And then what the hell is this? And then, oh my God, I can't believe this is still going. And then out of nowhere, out of nowhere, this is one of the greatest things ever. And then right back to AEW where just unnecessary stuff is happening that makes no sense. This was my favorite thing in the history of AEW. I love this segment. I wish... It would have kept going. I wish it never ended. I wish it was still happening right now. Nothing else on this show was able to stand up to this. It was all downhill from here. And you know what? I got to agree with you. You say it. It's always Cody's segments that are the greatest. This was... I don't know if they planned it this way, though, that this would be the greatest for this reason. This was the best segment in modern wrestling in, in forever. This was so good. I watched it over and over. I'm going to watch it again after we're done recording. I love this segment. I encourage everyone, go out of your way but Boogie, to see this. I've looked in bars. I've looked in cars. Yeah, this. Oh, boy. The balance anyway, of you, power changed with this segment. <laughs> honestly, I thought this was kind of what it must have been, right? But uh, No, apparently it wasn't. Uh, Brandy Runnels having the greatest promo in the history of wrestling. Is this equivalent to a, a rookie golfer hitting a... Hole in one. It's like when all of a sudden Sonny King would hit like a great promo. Like all of a sudden Sonny wow, King. That's a, that's an interesting. That's an interesting comparison. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Like all of a sudden, yeah. Sonny King, you'd be like captivated by what he said. Yeah. <laughs> and then every other time you'd be like, oh my god, this guy sucks on the mic. Well, Jim, before we get to that watch along, let's get a few questions in here and actually something that several people have sent in in the last couple of hours. You mentioned earlier, The Undertaker is now on Cameo. <laughs> and of course, for a long time, they were trying to get you on Cameo. They approached you a long time ago, and you just said, I don't have the time, the patience, the desire, <laughs> the knowledge, to well, no, the technology. Well, no, here, here was what it was good of, because people keep asking me about it. And it's not that I don't want to do it. It's just that you know as well as I do, I do not have another 10 minutes in a day and I can't imagine I would have to arrange to close down something else, either the podcast or the merchandise business or whatever, to have time because I know that it would be somewhat popular. And then I'd have to figure out, I'd have to hire a camera person with the phone and the apparatus. Because I don't think Stacy would have the patience to do 400 one-minute fucking promo. So I don't want to open that can of peas just yet. I'm not against the concept. Well, of course, The Undertaker went the other way, he charged $1,000, so fewer well, people, but more money. And I'm not going to, I can't, in good conscience, ask anybody to pay, I mean, The Undertaker, that's a special thing, yes, but I've cussed many people, so I can't ask them to pay $1,000 a piece for me to cuss them. We have some sound bites of The Undertaker on Cameo, would you like to hear No, them? we don't. Yes, we do. Can we play this? We will be playing them. Well, I mean, I don't mean can we, but I mean, will we get in trouble? Do we need to call Steven at 888-692-8084? <laughs> I don't think so because it's on Twitter. It was posted by someone. Uh, I'll give him credit. Oh, so it's somebody else's fault. That's right. Okay. It's someone. His name is Boss Moz. And here are some Undertaker cameo clips. Let me play the first one. It's the Undertaker. And your mom reached out to me. She told me. You started a new school this year. In fact, she also said that you were quite the baseball player. Oh, no. All right, hold on. That's the, uh, it loops itself. That was the first one. Here's another one. I just wanted to reach out 
and tell you it's gonna be okay. You just keep waking up every morning and putting one foot in front of the other and it's all gonna work out eventually. You can do this. I have faith in you. And if you can't believe the living incarnation of death when he reaches his hand out to touch you, that everything's going to be okay, who can you believe? And he's in a black Undertaker coat. He's wearing his (laughs) Undertaker (laughs) outfit underneath it. He has the hat. Hey, some guy's hooked up to all kinds of fucking tubes in the hospital. And they feel, well, he's a wrestling fan, so we'll get him this. He'll make him feel better. And he regains consciousness through a haze of his medically induced coma. And the first thing he sees on a screen is the undertaker saying, I'm reaching out to you. (laughs) Fuck. Give the guy some fucking acid. You'll really fucking. (sighs) Let's play this one. It's the undertaker. And all the votes have been cast and they've all been tallied. And it looks like you, Robbie, are the greatest Undertaker fan of the last 30 years. With you and your collectibles, (laughs) you've become the number one fan of The Undertaker. The number one fan. (laughs) The number one creature of the night. Robbie, you are the man. And you are the number one fan. All right. That's, that's that's the Undertaker's. I've looked in bars. I've looked in cars. <laughs> and here you are. What did Robbie have to pay extra? Or who stuffed the ballot box? Was this a rigged election? I'm you know, not- we've, we've gotten in a lot of trouble talking about rigged elections here on the program lately. We have. Let's uh, hear another one from The Undertaker. The Undead Undertaker. I got your note. <laughs> what? And before I thank the McMahons, I want to thank you for being such a fan. (laughs) I don't know if I've ever heard either The Undertaker on television or Mark Calloway in real life say, I got your note. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for being such a great husband. (laughs) Thank you for being such a wonderful father. Thank you. Jim, you got to start doing cameos. you got to start doing these. Oh, uh, I don't know if I could say thank you for being such a wonderful husband with the same <laughs> gravitas that, uh, hmm. You should give your mom a big hug. Courage <laughs> from the Undertaker. Oh, God. Yeah, scare, scare mom to death. Hey, mom. Give me a big hug for you. <laughs> Did you ever see the movie Death Takes a Holiday? <laughs> oh, fucking. It. Oh, my God. AJ, you're fine. Real fine. <laughs> what? Darrell. <laughs> and anybody who doesn't like it can rest in <laughs> peace on. Was that your your fine, your real fine? <laughs> That's what it was, yeah. So can you can you use your own verbiage or are they giving him verbiage? Well, specific verbiage. I think some of this has my to be face hurts. Some of this has to be directed by the person paying, but like the Robbie, you're my number one fan, where he ran out of things to say, so he just kept repeating over and over uh, new ways to say you're hey, my you're number, number one. one. Fan. <laughs> Of all the numbers, you're one of them. Here's another one. You take day by day, step by step, and each day things are going to get much better. And one day, your heart surgery will be a distant memory. Oh, Jesus Christ. But I won't, (laughs) because I'll be haunting your dreams. (laughs) (laughs) So, So if you make it through this heart surgery, just remember... I'll be haunting you forevermore. (laughs) That's something to look forward to. That'll get me right through that surgery. And if people don't go out and buy that book, they may come face to face with horror. Horror of the Undertaker. Buy the book. (laughs) Okay, that was that one. That's just a simple extortion threat, isn't it? That is. We have one last one that I see here. Let's go to this one.
all elite Scooby Doo. <laughs> That's how I'm going to address you. Well, all elite Scooby Doo. Congratulations on getting married. You did the right thing. Undertaker on cameo. I mean, at least he's in gimmick. I'll give him that. Hey, you've hurt me. <laughs> I've got a chest pain here. <laughs> My face hurts. Uh, oh, that that is not. You know, that's not a gimmick. It's the greatest gimmick in the history of wrestling, but it's not a gimmick that lends itself to fan greeting messages. It's not like Jimmy Hart's, hey poo-poo, love you guys. Hey, keep it rocking and rolling, baby. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to, to exhort people to want to live another day when you're actually the, the reaper of death. Does this change the way you think of cameo? <laughs> you can do these. You can crank these out. It, well, let's okay. Uh, uh, let's get the feedback from the cult of Cornette audience. Who wants to pay a thousand dollars a piece to see me? Cuss you out. I want to know who all of these Scooby-Doo is who wanted to get a congratulations on their wedding. <laughs> I thought they were going to. Did you see the Trump Scooby-Doo? Yes. You I saw, saw the Trump yes. Scooby. Yes. I thought they were going to Scooby-Doo. What does Scooby-Doo? Scooby doesn't do. It should be Velma. You know, and he says it so slowly. I didn't know where he was going. All elite. I was elite. like, oh, my God, where's he going? Where's he going here? <laughs> Well, it sounds like a that lot of people. One, that one had to raise an eyebrow when they were shooting it. All elite. Huh? Scooby-Doo. I think mm. a lot of people got their money's worth. Actually, that may be the next all elite superstar. All elite Scooby-Doo. All elite Scooby-Doo. <laughs> they're, the, they're the Cartoon Network. They're in the same family over there. Turner. That's right. Right? Well, All elite Scooby-Doo. Let's not give Chris Jericho any ideas. <laughs> 